they averted their eyes, having been taught as children that if their eyes met his for even a fraction of a second, they would be struck blind. They believed him to be the 124th direct descendant of the Emperor Jimoteno, who had ruled their ancestors in the 7th century before Christ. In his divine role Hirohito had begun his reign by christening it Shoah, which means, of all things, bright peace, but during the war the irony had passed unnoticed, no Japanese would have dreamed of forming an opinion about anything the emperor said, even when they understood him, which was seldom. His ministers found conversations with him extremely difficult. He often expressed himself vaguely, sometimes by reciting a 17-syllable haiku which seemed irrelevant to the discussion. As a rule, he received them sitting silently on his throne atop a high dais draped in gold brocade, a traditional six-panel gilt screen behind him, his mere presence making their decisions official. Yet he could be trenchant when necessary. He had approved the surrender in two sentences, I cannot bear to see my innocent people suffer any longer. Ending the war is the only way to restore world peace and to relieve the nation from the terrible distress with which it is burdened. B-29 bombardiers had been ordered to spare his curved, tile-roofed, pagoda-styled, grey-walled imperial residence, but flying debris had leapt over the palace moat during several raids. The pavilions of the crown prince and the Daiger empress had been reduced to cinders. Hirohito and his empress, Nagato, were now living with their children in the imperial library, the Abunko, situated in the imperial garden, about a half mile from the palace. A long stairway led down to a bomb-proof underground complex where the emperor received his advisers. Having listened to the Missouri ceremony over his radio, he awaited Case's account of it. No imperial decision could alter the course of the new MacArthur regime, but public approval of it by Hirohito would avoid a great deal of heartache for both the occupied country and its occupiers. 157 Shai Jemitsu and the other members of Prince Higashikuni's cabinet felt certain that the emperor would sanction full cooperation with the Allies. He had already suggested as much. During an audience the morning after the capitulation he had produced a clipping from a Tokyo newspaper, the main Ikai. The author of the piece, Baron Kantaro Suzuki, had been prime minister at the time, he had stepped down since, to assist in the transition to peace, and in his article he had written that he had one absolute conviction as to what to do, which was to trust the enemy commander. The Bushido is not a Japanese monopoly. It is a universal code. Although he did not know the Allied Supreme Commander, he said, he had a firm trust in this soldierly spirit. Japan had been defeated, and once defeat was acknowledged, as it had been, the only manly thing to do was to leave everything to the victor. In veiled phrases, and with sympathetic gestures, the Emperor had signified that he concurred. 158 Now he read Case's report. It was an extraordinary document. Clearly MacArthur had made a proselyte here. The little diplomat wrote of the general, he is a man of light. Radiantly, the gathering rays of his magnanimous soul embraced the earth. It was, he went on a piece of rare good fortune that a man of such caliber and character should have been designated as the supreme commander to shape the destiny of Japan. In the dark hour of our despair and distress, a bright light is ushered in in the very person of General MacArthur. The big day on the Missouri will stand out as one of the brightest dates in history, with General MacArthur as a shining obelisk in the desert of human endeavor that marks a timeless march onward toward an enduring peace. There was much more, all in this vein. MacArthur himself could hardly have improved upon it. K's struck three other notes, all of them peculiarly Japanese. No other World War II power, not even Germany, was so arrogant in triumph and so abject in defeat. Humbly, the diplomat wondered whether it would have been possible for us, had we been victorious, to embrace the vanquished with similar magnanimity. Clearly, it would have been different. Second, he wrote bluntly, almost masochistically, after all, we were not beaten on the battlefield by dint of superior arms. We were defeated in the spiritual contest by virtue of a nobler idea. The real issue was moral, 
beyond all the powers of algebra to compute. The final note was poignant. Kays wrote that while on the American battleship he had noticed many miniaturizing suns, our flag, painted on a steel bulkhead, indicating the number of Japanese ships, submarines, and planes sunk by the Missouri. He had tried to count them, but a lump rose in my throat and tears quickly gathered in my eyes, flooding them. I could hardly bear the sight. Heroes of unwritten stories, these were young boys who defied death gaily and gallantly. They were like cherry blossoms, emblems of our national character, swiftly blooming into riotous beauty and falling just as quickly. 159 According to members of the imperial household, the emperor lingered over this passage a long time, then he sighed deeply, nodded, and murmured, Ah so, ah so Deska. Summoning his foreign minister, he disclosed an unprecedented decision. As signs of the sun goddess, Amaterasu Suomi Kami, Japanese emperors had never called upon anyone, but once MacArthur had established himself in Tokyo, Hirohito let it be known in an oblique, periphrastic way, he would pay him a formal visit. Shai Jemitsu was delighted, almost overcome, no other gesture would be so propitious for the difficult period of occupation. Bowing like the destroyer Hatsuzabura, the foreign minister backed out, leaving the imperial presence. 168 Last post 1945 1950 It was characteristic of Japan in 1945 that the emperor's palace, in the western sense of the word, or even in the Chinese sense, had never existed. There were, to be sure, palatial grounds. They were immense. A wide, tranquil, algae-covered moat encircled them. Yet all that could be seen from the outside were old stone tura lanterns and boughs of sycamore, bamboo, cypress, cryptomeria, and majestic pines towering over bonsai, those cultivated 200-year-old dwarf evergreens which, revealing the Nipponese gift for miniaturization, mimic great gnarled trees in every detail down to the tortured angles of limbs twisted in their joints by the arthritis of time. Tourists who tried unsuccessfully to peer past their artfully arranged branches missed nothing except disenchantment. Within there were no soaring wings of stone, no sharp gables, no crenellated towers or spires. Instead the royal family lived in a series of wooden paper villas, a kind of elegant oriental shantytown embellished here and there by shoji paper sliding doors bearing 16 petal chrysanthemums, Hirohito's personal sigil. One among his relatives on the premises that September was a bandy-legged, hard-drinking, suburitic uncle who had condemned captured American airmen to death by beheading, and who now expected to be indicted as a war criminal. Actually he was quite safe. MacArthur had concluded that bringing him to justice would lead to Hirohito's abdication, which, in turn, would bring anarchy, chaos, and guerrilla warfare. That was wise of the new supreme commander for the Allied powers. Scap's critics often mocked his claims that he could fat the Asian mind, and he himself later said that even after fifty years of living among these people I still do not understand them. Nevertheless, few Occidentals have come closer to it than he did. He had studied Nipponese folklore, politics, and economy. Most of all he had pondered how Hirohito's people lived, worked, and thought. He sensed their stupendous energy and vast potential, knew that although most people think of Japan as small, it is, in Edwin O'Riskale's words, considerably larger than Italy and half again the size of the United Kingdom with roughly twice the population of each of the Western European Big Four, West Germany, the United Kingdom, Italy, and France. The general perceived that, like England, the country had been shaped by its silent outlook and vigorous climate, which stretches, in latitude, from that of Montreal to that of Florida. He was not deceived by its 90% literacy, for he was aware that the sensei, the quaint teachers with yellow buck teeth and baggy pants, merely taught rote memorization of the language's complicated kanji, characters derived from Chinese ideograms. The meaning behind the words eluded their pupils and, indeed, the sensei themselves. Every textbook in geography, history, 
martial sports, ethics, and even mathematics, was used to disseminate superstitions. The Japanese lived, quite simply, in a world of make believe. To the world may be explained in sociological terms. David Riesman describes three basic social personalities in the lonely crowd. Other directed people pattern their behavior on what their peers expect of them. Suburban America's men in gray flannel suits are other directed. Inner directed people are guided by what they have been trained to expect of themselves. MacArthur was inner directed. The third type, the tradition directed, has not been seen in the West since the Middle Ages. Tradition directed people hardly think of themselves as individuals, their conduct is determined by folk rituals handed down from the past. The general knew that this described the Japanese, and that it could be seen most clearly in their absolute fealty toward their emperor. Neither the arrival of modern technology nor the lost war had diminished their respect for the godhead. On the Nijibashi, an arch double bridge spanning Hirohito's moat, reverent Japanese still bowed deeply toward the grounds. Until the B-29S came, trolley conductors would halt in front of the Sakradaman, the Sakrada gate, lead their passengers off, and genuflect before re-entering the streetcar and proceeding. After the war they merely slowed to a crawl and ducked their heads. But as recently as the 1950s, scores of Japanese perished by suffocation when an enormous mob, inspired by a case of Kanii, a breath from above, spontaneously rushed toward the gates on April 29th, the birthday of the Emperor, Tencho Setsu, to pay their respects to their ruler. Three officials did not dream of reporting the tragedy to him. They merely carried the bodies away and checked to make sure that the devout throng, in its zeal, had harmed nothing. Isolation of their sovereign has always been important to the Japanese. Even the shoguns, the feudal overlords who once governed in the name of the Almighty One, were elliptically described as the men behind bamboo screens, a detail well known to MacArthur, who planned to lurk behind such a screen himself. The moat symbolizes this gulf between mortals and the divine. It is, in fact, quite lovely. White swans glide over its surface, merging with their own bright reflections, and fat carp lurk below. Before the coming of MacArthur, poaching was not only a form of les majest, it was a capital offense. Three strangers who cast their lines after fish reserved for imperial hooks paid for it with their heads. In those theocratic days Japan was possessed by what Wayne Wright, brooding in his Manchurian cell called fundamental dark age philosophies. The sovereign's powers were as absolute as Henry Witt, as unyielding as the stone walls on the palace side of the moat. For these walls, in many ways Tokyo's most imposing feature, are of considerable historical interest. In 1542 the Portuguese, the first Europeans to discover Japan, arrived and, in the decade which followed, introduced Christianity and gunpowder. The Japanese were appalled by both. They concluded that if this was the best the newcomers could do, Dinapon would be better off without them. Jesuits and their converts were deported, no Japanese were permitted to travel abroad, lest they become infected with the Christian virus. The gunpowder remained, however, the shoguns decided that it might be useful against new invaders. At the same time, huge earth packed walls were constructed around strongholds to ward off future European cannonballs. The palaces is among those which have survived. It is gigantic, great blocks of grey rock, all different sizes, fitted together so marvelously that they seem to curve smoothly upward with effortless grace. In the 16th century it would have been impossible to breach them. That was no longer true in 1853, however, when Perry's ships anchored off Tokyo, or Edo, as it was then called, and demanded that the islands of Dinapon be opened to trade. Yielding to force majeure, the shogun signed a treaty ending two centuries of seclusion. At first the changes wrought elsewhere were slow to reach Nippon's shores. Not until the close of the century did Japanese peasants learn that locomotives were not dragons. Then, however, the curses of industrial society followed swiftly, child labor, pollution, factory accidents, 
the rapid spread of contagious diseases, and frantic competition with other big powers, including entry in the international arms race. With unerring instinct, the Japanese chose all the wrong role models. They bought their guns from France's Schneider Creusot, whose clients arrived on battlefields at a disadvantage because their artillery was inferior to Krupp's, Vickers's, and Armstrong's. Nipponese ambassadors imitated the diplomatic manners of the British, who always managed to give offence. And in the 1880s the advisers of Masu Ito, Hirohito's grandfather, asked the Germans to help them create a legislature. Under the Meiji constitution, which followed, the Japanese diet provided only the trappings of democracy. It was more authoritarian than the Reichstag. There was no middle class. Women were formally ranked as inferior beings. Real power was vested in the Gumbatsu, the militarists, and, later, the Zeibatsu, the eleven great industrial families, the Mitsubishis, Mitui's, Sumitomo's, Yasuda's, and the rest, who controlled 75% of the country's commerce, raw materials, and transportation. Peasants were sharecroppers, shackled to the land by ground rents and surcharges, supporting 100,000 absentee landlords. The Japanese religion, Shinto, which had been declared a national structure, Kokotai, in 1884, was not really a religion at all, it was what National Socialism would later be to Germany, an indigenous folk creed promoting the national character, the martial virtues, and the inferiority of other races. There were 110,000 Shinto shrines, all supported by the state. In addition, every home, down to the last thatched hut beside the most remote rice paddy, had its small shrine, or god shelf, Kamidana, at which the family would gather at certain times of the day to genuflect in the direction of the imperial palace. The people had no civil liberties, no civil rights, no habeas corpus. Instead they were given the absolute obligation to obey orders. Truth was unknown. The purpose of conversation was to be polite, not to convey information. The smallest departure from courtesy was prohibited by law. The Kempeitai, the Japanese Gestapo, imprisoned countless thousands for harboring, or giving the impression of harboring, dangerous thoughts. It was, MacArthur wrote, more akin to Sparta than to any modern nation. It was also imitative of European totalitarianism. 5A Japanese wrote unhappily, some of the roses of the West, when cultivated in Japan, lose their fragrance. Yet beneath the imported cosmetics, beyond the concrete highways, behind the elaborate mannered facade, Dinipon remain the most oriental of nations. Half the people, over 35 million people in 7 million households, toiled on 5,698,000 farms, working in their wide straw hats and shaggy rice store crane coats, looking like feudal wood blocks, tilling land as old, as tired, and as wrinkled as themselves. To celebrate their harvests, priests opened festivals by striking temple bells which had been in use for centuries. Order was maintained by feudal Tonarigimi, neighborhood associations. Samurai warriors displayed athletic prowess and periodically thinned their ranks by committing seppuku. Newspapers celebrated a charming medieval custom by printing in their New Year's editions 31 syllable loads, tanka, and 17 syllable haiku, imitative of the great poet Basho and written by every educated Japanese, including Hirohito, though of course, being a god, he was awarded no prizes. Puppet art, Bunraku, flourished, so did Gagaku, the ancient court music, so did sumo wrestling, the national sport, so did Kabuki plays glorifying feats of war. Six in peacetime, before the arrival of the B-29S and after MacArthur's restoration of the metropolis, Tokyo has always been one of the world's most colorful cities, and the 300-meter-tall Tokyo Tower provides a panoramic view of the beguiling, frightening, puzzling, infuriating, and delightful race which brought out the best in Douglas MacArthur, who in turn brought out the best in the Japanese.
peering down through the damp fragrant haze which always seems to hang over the city, one's first impression is of seething multitudes. Perhaps even the inhabitants have become confused by the capital's lack of street signs, one thinks, or perhaps something remarkable has happened, to bring out so many people, but no, it is always this way, always teeming, always congested. The countryside is not much different. Japan is chronically overpopulated, only 15% of the land is arable, and even that is not particularly fertile. With space at a premium, it was inevitable that Nippon should become the homeland of tiny radios and tiny television sets. It must either export enough such goods to pay for imported food or settle its surplus population elsewhere. That was why it attacked China in 1937 and then the United States, China's protector, four years later. The second impression, listening from the tower, is of an incredible cacophony. Drifting up, all together, are melancholy notes from a Japanese guitar played by an itinerant musician, a merry tune bubbling like a fountain out of a bamboo flute, another melody from a trio of flagellettes, still another from a harp like koto, all of them competing with the more familiar sounds of internal combustion engines, of the babbling of shoppers on the Ginza, the silver place, so christened in the early 17th century, when the reigning shogun minted his coins there, and, in counterpoint, evoking memories of Yum Yum, Pity Sing, and Peep Bo, of clouds of gay little girls in school uniforms, chattering like starlings. Next one notices the almost promiscuous use of lacquer and its plastic equivalents. Telephones are bright red. Priests carrying symbolic flails wear black lacquered hats above their immaculate white robes, capes of gold, and straw sandals, red lacquered, cockaded hats crown horsemen, lacquer brightens the flower-decked bridles, high wooden saddles, and colorful stirrups of their mounts. Lacquer also highlights the wooden sold gator, the clogs, of passing geisha, who move in shattering swarms and even the heavy black beehive quaffs of their married sisters, rising over white, wide-eyed, tiny, exquisitely shaped, porcelain faces, look as though they had been lacquered, or even shellacked, into place. Kimonos are worn by most of the older women, but by fewer of their daughters. That is part of the diversity, one's final impression of daytime Tokyo. One notices Dior fashions, blue jeans, mini skirts, and even tight shorts on the younger women. And the costumes of the men are even more varied. Fifth Avenue, the Strand, the Faubourg Saint Honor, the Curvus Tendarm, and the Via Veneto are dull compared to the Ginza. Gentlemen wear Hurian Hakama, the ceremonial clothes of old Japan, other gentlemen wear double knits and denim. A solemn procession of men in cream and green uniforms appears from an alley beside one of the city's huge new ferro-concrete structures, no one seems to know who the marchers are, but they bull their way through the incredible, swelling crowds. Another procession approaches from a different direction, youths with exalted expressions are bearing on their shoulders a swaying palanquin from whose struts flutter strips of scroll bearing prayers of the devout. Again identifying their sect appears to be impossible. Probably they are Shintoists, though no longer subsidized, the religion is not extinct. They vanish and are followed by a band of archers whose arrows, lacquered, jut from their quivers like the spreading spangles of a peacock. The archers in turn give way to a horse-drawn rig loaded with a heap of plum blossoms, iris, and wisteria. 7 The riotous display continues until evening. Then there is a subtle change. Dinipon is a different nation after sundown. The moon is somehow larger and grander than in any other part of the world. Paper lanterns, and soft lights glowing behind paper walls, suggest intricate secrets. In the darkness one remembers that if occidental countries are ruled by governments of laws, the Japanese are governed by emotions. Upton Close, who wrote several books about them, observed that they are a race who hate tremendously, who can give themselves to the most unspeakable savageries, and yet, when the fury passes, are the most gentle-mannered people in the world.
The Japanese themselves are fascinated by this aspect of their national character. They have an entire vocabulary to describe their many moods. Fury I, for example, is a state of mind signifying communion with all that is creative and lovely in nature. Chikata Ganei is resignation. Mono no aware denotes an awareness of the world's transience and man's mortality. Zanyakus is a brutal and savage spirit. Weariness of living is ensai. The Japanese soldiers who raped Manila were obsessed by Zanyakus. The country which lay prostrate at MacArthur's feet after the surrender on the Missouri was in the grip of the most depressing ensai in the history of their race. Riskeyer observes that at the outset of the war their leaders had expected to win through the superiority of Japanese willpower, and the people had responded with every ounce of will they possessed, until they were spiritually drained. Not just the cities but the hearts of the people had been burned out. Eight and no wonder. Before Pearl Harbor, Japan had been called the workshop of Asia. Now it was Asia's scrap heap. Hirohito's empire had been reduced by 81%. From 773,781 square miles to 146,690. The metropolises were unlivable. There were few phones, fewer trains, and virtually no power plants. Soon thermometers would drop. Japanese crickets, more eloquent than Occidental katydids, are said to sink at Isase, Suzose Samusaga Kurozo, meaning so your sleeves sew your skirts, for the winter is coming, and each evening after the surrender they grew louder, but coal production was at one-eighth of its peacetime level. Textiles had been the backbone of the country's pre-war economy. In putting the nation on a war footing, 80% of the textile machinery had been converted to other uses, and now it lay shattered in the ruins of bombed buildings. Nippon's merchant fleet was rusting on the floors often Oriental seas. Hiroshima and Nagasaki had been reduced to barren pits of glazed rubble. And virtually all other major cities, including the capital, were ghastly wastelands. Here and there one could make out the twisted skeleton of a roof, a thumb-like bathhouse chimney, a squat house safe, or, very rarely, a structure with heavy iron shutters, now blackened a relic of an ancient samurai stronghold. Nine, with the exception of an occasional fireproof, earthquake-proof building, most of the rest was cinders and flinders. People were subsisting in it, in shacks and huts fashioned of corrugated iron strips. They had nowhere else to go. Over two million homes had been destroyed by Lamaze air fleets, and the Japanese themselves had raised another half million to make firebreaks. Nearly 7 million Nipponese soldiers stationed in China, Korea, French Indochina, Malaya, and other outposts still guarded by the Emperor's armies would soon be demobilized and repatriated. Once they had returned, accompanied by the Japanese civilians like Yoshio Kodama who had ruled subjugated populations, Nippon's home islands would need at least 4 million new dwellings. And the people must be fed. Women hid their nakedness having exchanged their last kimonos for a go of seed. The clothing for whole families was reduced to a single yukata, a simple cotton kimono. Kodama, awaiting trial as a war criminal for the plunder of Shanghai, wrote in prison that the Japanese nation must rely upon the cooperation of the American army authorities for the very rice it eats. MacArthur set up army kitchens and cabled Washington that he needed 3,500,000 tons of food immediately. The Pentagon quibbled, the State Department demanded details, there were forms to be filled out, officials to be consulted, bureaucratic channels to be explored. The general grimly cabled again, give me bread or give me bullets. Ten most of the empire's natural leaders were dead. Over 1,270,000 Japanese had been killed in action during the last four years of fighting, and 670,000 civilians had died in the bombings. MacArthur wrote, Never in history had a nation and its people been more completely crushed. Kenny thought they were suffering from shell shock. John Gunter wrote that the bitter sting and humiliation of defeat had left the people dazed, tottering, and numb with shock. 
Six days after the formal surrender, MacArthur rode into the capital. Except for the Emperor's gleaming fleet of limousines, there seemed to be no other cars in the city. The general found himself looking out at a pulverized moonscape inhabited by staring scarecrows of men and women who giggled hysterically and fled, it was just 22 miles from the new Grand Hotel in Yokohama to the American Embassy, which was to be my home throughout the occupation, but they were 22 miles of devastation and vast piles of charred rubble. 11 Hardly had the Japanese become accustomed to the sight of their conquerors when Hirohito, without consulting the general, dealt them another blow in an imperial rescript, we stand by the people and we wish always to share with them in their moments of joys and sorrows. The ties between us and our people have always stood upon mutual trust and affection. They do not depend upon mere legends and myths. They are not predicated on the false conception that the emperor is divine and that the Japanese people are superior to other races and fated to rule the world. In other words, they had fought for a lie. American wartime propaganda had been right. Their sovereign was not an oriental counterpart of Wotan and Thor. They had been ruled by a man, not a god, and their ancestors, 123 generations of them, had been equally gulled. Kenny recalls that the emperor's edict meant they had nothing spiritual to cling to. There was complete apathy everywhere. MacArthur noted that their whole world had crumbled, it was not merely the overthrow of their military might, it was the collapse of a faith, it was the disintegration of everything they believed in and lived by and fought for. It left a complete vacuum, morally, mentally, and physically. Their past meant nothing now. They must say sayonara to all that. Their future depended upon whatever flowed into the vacuum, upon what was done with the great mass of emotion which lay ready for a new sculptor. 12 President Truman had appointed MacArthur supreme commander for the Allied powers, SCAP, without consulting anyone outside his immediate staff. Later he regretted the decision, but except among Pacific veterans and liberal ideologues it was a popular choice in the United States. If the Poles are to be believed, the new Scap was the second most admired hero among his countrymen in the high summer of 1945, second only to Eisenhower. He himself clearly savored his role as Viceroy of Japan, calling it Ma's last gift to an old warrior. He began his new assignment by startling everyone. Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau, who had drawn up a plan to scourge the Germans, had prepared a similar punitive blueprint for the Japanese. Morgenth assumed that the proud officer who had been mortified on Corrigidor would support it. To his consternation the general said, if the historian of the future should deem my service worthy of some slight reference, it would be my hope that he mention me not as a commander engaged in campaigns and battles, even though victorious to American arms, but rather as one whose sacred duty it became once the guns were silenced, to carry to the land of our vanquished foe the solace and hope and faith of Christian morals. 13 At the time those words sounded singular, even bizarre. Few other victors felt that way. They had cheered when Halsey kept his promise by riding a horse, not the emperor's, but white and handsome, through gutted Tokyo, and when 41 the United States correspondents had been invited to attend an extraordinary session of the 84th Diet on September 4, which Hirohito had personally addressed, urging reconstruction in every field, 37 of the reporters refused to attend because they were told they must check their weapons at the door. But MacArthur had been determined from the beginning to be conciliatory. As Prime Minister Higashikuni had followed the Emperor to the podium, Explaining the decision to capitulate, each Elberger's 8th Army had been following the 4th Marines ashore. His soldiers had expected that they would be told to disarm the 250,000 enemy soldiers still entrenched on the Kanto Plain. Instead, Scap's General Order No. 1 directed the enemy's own commanders to do it. 14 It was, MacArthur explained to his troubled staff, a matter of face. If the Nipponese troops were humiliated now, they would be difficult later. He had another, practical reason. There were millions of bejeweled samurai swords in Japanese closets, a potential threat to the occupying army. 
once the people learned that surrendering them was to be voluntary, he predicted they would give them to G.I.s. Precisely that happened, presently a ship sailed for San Francisco bearing seven tons of glittering souvenirs for the folks at home. Next the general vetoed suggestions that he summon Hirohito to appear before him. Better the patience of the East than the haste of the West, he said, in time the Mikado would come to him, if only out of curiosity. The following day Scap angered the United States Navy by countermanding a halcy order. The admiral had forbidden Nipponese fishermen to cross Tokyo Bay, suspecting that some of them might plant mines beneath warships of the Third Fleet. Nonsense, said MacArthur, fishing was a life or death matter for these men, and for the starving people who needed their catches. When there were no incidents, he shone still brighter in the eyes of his new oriental constituency.15 in Tokyo, as in the past, part of the general's problem with his own countrymen was his magniloquence, which would have pleased his father's contemporaries but which sounded tinny to Americans of the 1940s. As correspondents assembled for the reopening of the battered granite the United States Embassy on Renanzaka Hill, and on a guard of the old 7th Cavalry fell in, and bugles sounded, the general turned to each Elberger and intoned, have our country's flag unfurled, and in the Tokyo sun let it wave in its full glory, as a symbol of hope for the oppressed and as a harbinger of victory for the right. American intellectuals jeered. But they should have watched his performance more carefully. Richard H. Rovier and Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., who did, wrote of post-war Japan that the overpowering need was for faith, for a mystique, for a moral revival in the midst of moral collapse. The powerful and dedicated figure of MacArthur filled that need, as probably no other American general could have filled it. 16 In the beginning there was little reason to believe that his achievements as proconsul would eclipse those on the battlefield. He himself said, it was different when we were on the axis, fighting the war. But this is something new, and there is nothing about it in history. Actually there was, and most of it was depressing. Most illustrious commanders who had tried their hand at civilian administration, Wellington, Kitchener, Pitain, had dulled their luster. MacArthur regarded Napoleon as the greatest soldier who ever lived, yet he said of him, Napoleon was a genius on the battlefield. He could make combinations that no one else thought of, but in political affairs he listened to his advisers too much. He had some excellent ideas but he lost his belief in them when he listened to those around him. And he was tired. The drive that kept him going was wearing out. 17 The general retained his own drive. In 34 years he hadn't lost a day to illness. His physician found that his reflexes were those of a man of 50. Shortly after the occupation began he developed a strep throat, waving away the doctor, he recovered with the help of a dubious patent medicine gargle he had used off and on since his gassing in 1918. He was still charged with vitality, still flamboyant, still haughty. Though thinner now than during the months in New Guinea, the Supreme Commander, wrote Russell Brines, chief of the Associated Press's Tokyo Bureau, did not mellow with the years, nor relax with the considerable, but largely unpublicized, achievements of the occupation. He drove onward with the same energy, the same impatient obduracy, the same confidence. Time, to his annoyance, reported that his hair, flecked with grey, is usually carefully brushed to cover a bald spot. C. L. Salzberger thought him a remarkable physical specimen. I am told he dyes his hair. Be that as it may, he is a handsome, well set up man filled with youthful energy. He is taller than I expected. He eats and drinks sparingly but does no exercise. In a uniform he cuts a very lithe figure. 18 Ambassador William J. Sebald, who was the ranking the United States diplomat in Tokyo, believes that had MacArthur been a less resolute commander, the occupation might have been a complete fiasco. Because he had held such a wide brief during the war, the general assumed that he needed little or no advice from Washington now. Unlike the brisk Lucius Clay in Germany, he regarded his task as an exalted historical mission. And, unlike Napoleon, he had always been ready to turn a deaf ear to appeals from his subordinates. 
In Japan he heeded their advice less and less, sometimes my whole staff was lined up against me. But I knew what I was doing. After all, I had more experience than they. And most of the time I was right. His instincts told him to work through the emperor, combining the best of ours with the best of theirs, and his brief tour in occupied Germany after World War I had convinced him that banning social contacts with the defeated population was poor policy. Soldiers will be soldiers, he said. He thought GIs were more interested in companionship than in sex anyhow, though he wasn't against that, either. During one of his drives through the capital he saw an American soldier embracing a Japanese girl in a doorway, fondling her breasts as she reached between his thighs. Look at that, the general said to Major Forbian Bowers. They keep trying to get me to stop all this Madame Butterflying around. I won't do it. My father told me never to give an order unless I was certain it would be carried out. I wouldn't issue a no fraternization order for all the tea in China. Nor would he deliberately offend the nation which lay at his feet, though some of his officers were less generous. Whitney, in his memoirs, proudly describes his treatment of Jiro Shirasu, a Nipponese statesman who kept him and several other officers waiting. Shirasu apologized for the delay. Whitney writes, I replied with a smile, not at all, Mr. Shirasu. We have been enjoying your atomic sunshine. And at that moment, with what could not have been better timing, a big B-29 came roaring over us. The reaction upon Mr. Shirasu was indescribable, but profound. 19 MacArthur was above such crude gloating, too respectful of Japanese feelings. Luckily for him, and even luckier for them, he had a free hand in charting Japan's course. Theoretically he was governed by directives from Washington. Secretary of War Robert Patterson and Secretary of State James F. Burns insisted that he had no voice in occupation policy, and Under Secretary of State Dean Akeson claimed that it had been worked out by the State, War, and Navy departments. But Akeson conceded that Averill Harriman couldn't present an occupation proposal to Stalin because of last-minute objections from MacArthur which hardly makes the general sound like a subordinate. In fact, Ambassador Sebald's reports to his superiors in Foggy Bottom had to be approved by SCAP, Sebald couldn't even accept an invitation to visit the Emperor and Empress in their Hyama villa without the Supreme Commander's permission. SCAP was in effect an absolute monarch. Yet his goals were anything but monarchical. Spending a million dollars a day, he was introducing a new concept, and a new word into the Japanese language, democracy. It would have been easy for him to have remained a dictator, his critics had expected him to do just that, and easier for him to have restored pre-war Japanese society. Instead he was taking a line so liberal that it would have cost another officer, Clay, for example, his commission. Scap's staff followed him blindly, often despite their deeply held conservative beliefs. Thus Whitney, the very paradigm of a Taft Republican, was overheard telling a Japanese politician, the only thing that will save your country is a sharp swing to the left. Twenty diplomats' fussiness over legal proprieties had nettled MacArthur in the past, and would again in Korea, but during his first four months in Tokyo he benefited from it. His viceregal authority derived from the Potsdam Proclamation demanding Japan's unconditional surrender. That ultimatum had been broadcast on July 27, 12 days before the Russians entered the Pacific War. Therefore all other allied belligerents enjoyed seniority over them, and they, feeling slighted, angrily refused to sit on an allied council organized to advise the general in late August. Thus torn by dissension, the council was impotent during the autumn, when he was establishing precedents. Among other things. He excluded the establishment of different occupation zones. On December 27, when the Council finally met in Tokyo to plan Japan's future, the Soviets were reminded that four months earlier Stalin had approved the appointment of a single American commander in Tokyo. Now they wanted to change that. They proposed that MacArthur be supervised by a four power council. In Washington some members of the Truman administration wanted to divide SCAP's authority with the Russians and the British. The general, 
however, leaked word of this to an American reporter, saying he would quit and go home if that happened, and Washington backed down. In the end the Four Power Council was established, but he largely ignored it. In Sebald's words, thereafter he conducted a successful rearguard action against any dilution of this autonomy. 21 Theoretically, he was answerable to four men in Washington, the President, the Secretary of War, later Defense, the Army Chief of Staff, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Technically, he should also have been guided by a directive instructing him to take no steps toward the rehabilitation of Nippon's economic life, the relief of civilian suffering, or the restoration of a decent standard of living. However, Burns and Aikson notwithstanding, he had also been designated the only American official abroad who could make policy statements without consulting the State Department first and had been informed by the President, you will exercise your authority as you deem proper to carry out your mission. Our relations with Japan do not rest on a contractual basis, but on unconditional surrender. Your authority is supreme. The General characteristically chose the broadest possible interpretation of his mandate, and it should be noted that Truman was content then to find the new scap freely making sweeping judgments in political matters. Everyone except the Russians agreed, by sheer force of personality and what Ambassador Sebald calls the wizardry of MacArthur, he turned the occupation into a one-man show. The Ambassador concludes, never before in the history of the United States had such enormous and absolute power been placed in the hands of a single individual. 22 Never in American history, but it had happened before in Asia. Japanese shoguns during the Tokugawa regime of 1598-1868, the Dutch in Indonesia, the French in Indochina, and such Englishmen as Clive and Warren Hastings in India had been benevolent despots. Yet none of them ruled more absolutely than MacArthur in Japan, and, though most of his countrymen were unaware of it, his powers extended to the Philippines and the Mariana Islands, the homelands, altogether of over a hundred million people. He was the last of the great colonial overlords, remote and unapproachable by all except a few natives. I had to be, he wrote afterward, an economist, a political scientist, an engineer, a manufacturing executive, a teacher, even a theologian of sorts. If that suggests that he regarded his task as a burden, it errs. He enjoyed it enormously. He intended, he said, to convert Dynapon into the world's greatest laboratory for an experiment in the liberation of a people from totalitarian military rule and for the liberalization of government from within. In short, he, acting as an autarch, meant to impose freedom on the conquered nation. The Diet agreed that Shinto, the way of the gods, should be replaced by Minshushugi, the way of democracy. Presently Japanese practicing their first English words, would approach G.I.s and say, Hero, Joe. Democracy must be good, yes? Good to be. It is unlikely that any of them understood democracy then, that first winter it merely signified chocolate bars, pop music, jukeboxes, cigarettes, soap operas, and B-29 burgers. But it meant little more to each L. Burgers soldiers, and even MacArthur confused it with baseball. George M. Cahan, firecrackers, memorial day parades, reliable plumbing, John Philip Sousa, and nostalgic memories of America at the turn of the century. The astonishing paradox remains. The experiment succeeded, and it probably would have failed if the general had been less than omnipotent. 23 He was certainly that. At his discretion he could suspend Hirohito's functions, dissolve the diet, outlaw political parties or disqualify any man from public office. When he decided to dismiss all legislators who had belonged to militaristic, right-wing societies, Prime Minister Kijuro Shidehara's entire cabinet threatened to quit in protest, letting the Prime Minister form a new government. The Foreign Minister brought MacArthur the news. The General said coldly, if the cabinet resigns en masse tomorrow it can only be interpreted by the Japanese people to mean that it is unable to implement my directive. Thereafter Baron Shidehara may be acceptable to the Emperor for reappointment as Prime Minister, but he will not be acceptable to me. 
the ministers withdrew their resignations, MacArthur's order was obeyed. 24 Japanese newspapers were required to carry the full text of every scap message. They published at his pleasure, which could be withdrawn at any time. American correspondents did not have to submit to censorship, but if one of them left the country the general could forbid him to return, and that happened to a Newsweek reporter whose copy had offended MacArthur. American businessmen could not enter Japan without his permission. SCAP controlled them throughout their visit, they couldn't even register for hotel rooms until their applications had been approved. American money was worthless until it had been exchanged for army scrip or yen, at 360 yen to the dollar, a rate which had been set by the general. Foreign diplomats presented their credentials to him, not Hirohito. As overlord he never returned their calls, and he could declare them persona non grata at any time. Sebald suggested in behalf of the United States State Department that he confer with various chiefs of mission in Tokyo to brief them on Korean developments. MacArthur saw no point in it, since he was not responsible for Korea. He added, and, why, as a sovereign, should I? President Truman doesn't do so, nor does the King of England or any other head of state. 25 In Japan the winds of change always seem to blow from the south. The annual Hanami, or flower viewing, begins when the white buds of the first cherry blossoms appear in Kigoshima, the country's southernmost port, whence they spread over Kyushu, cross Bungo straight to Shikoku, and then traverse the inland sea to Honshu. The Yamato, the Stone Age tribesmen who first settled these islands, had followed the same route. And so, in the autumn of 1945, did the six and a half million Japanese troops returning home from the Emperor's lost empire. Dinipon's 16,000 communists, released from Kempeitai prisons as part of MacArthur's program to honor freedom to dissent, were on hand to greet the despondent veterans. Clearly a political Han army lay ahead, but the general's liberal programs were preempting the reform issue. Some Japanese had even made a pun of their pronunciation of his name, Meikasa, since the kanji characters for it can be read as left read, and it became more appropriate with each decision he made. Moreover, the number of Marxist converts dropped sharply when Stalin, breaking a wartime commitment to Roosevelt and Churchill here as in so many matters, decided to keep 376,000 Japanese soldiers of the Kwantang army who had been stationed in Manchuria, as Siberian slave laborers. 26 at home their compatriots were working just as hard, but their labor was freely pledged. The general took every opportunity to remind them that they must shape their own destiny. Scap is not concerned with how to keep Japan down, but how to get her on her feet again, he said. He added, we shall not do for them what they can do for themselves. And one of his spokesmen said, we must restore security, dignity, and self-respect to a warrior nation which has suffered an annihilating defeat. SCAP would not interfere with their culture or their peaceable customs system. They would rebuild their country under their own leaders. With as little American intervention as possible. He wanted them to regard him as a protector, not a conqueror. 27 Thus, the GIs were largely spectators, watching the beaten Nipponese repair their shattered machinery, set up little assembly lines in their makeshift shacks, and rebuild houses, factories, and shipyards. MacArthur praised the dignity with which they bore their defeat. The Japanese have got the spirit of the Sermon on the Mount, he said. Nothing will take that away from them. Other Americans, trying to translate the attitude of the crushed people into terms they could understand, called it good sportsmanship. But it lay deeper than that. One Nipponese historian writes that to the Japanese there was a large measure of self-gratification and comfort in conforming to an exacting set of new rules. During the war American officers had noted how the few Japanese prisoners who were captured would pass through a stage of shame and then become enthusiastically cooperative, having served one set of masters, they had switched to another overnight. It was a form of political masochism, and MacArthur was just the man to compliment it.
of the 12 nations under conqueror's boots at the end of World War II, Japan alone seemed to relish the experience. The very qualities which had made the Japanese a formidable foe sustained them now. Their remarkable discipline held. Russell Brines wrote that despite the shortage of materials they erected new houses on the sites of the old with the ageless patience and fatalism of a race that had been burned out, flooded out and shaken out of its homes many times by natural disasters long before it was bombed out. Uneasy GIs awaited signs of the unspeakable cruelty which had inflamed the rapists of Nanking, the perpetrators of the Bhutan Death March, the baby slaughterers of Luzon. None emerged. By December the last Japanese infantryman to return from Rabaul had been deprived of his Arisaka rifle, MacArthur had sent Kruger's 6th Army home and reduced each Elberger's 8th to Kada's. Altogether there were just 152,000 GIs and 38,000 British Tommies in Nippon. Now an allied soldier could travel alone from one end of the country to another in complete safety. 28 Another vanquished people might have been offended by the speed with which the victors took over all steam heated buildings at the first frost. The Germans certainly resented it, but the Nipponese were too humble, and, apparently, too shocked by accounts in their own newspapers of their troops' atrocities in China, Burma, the Philippines, and the Indies, to protest. They now loathed Tojo, though their scorn may have been inspired, not by his wartime behavior, but by his attempt to commit Harakiri in defiance of an imperial rescript. In Shugama prison, Kodama wrote, We Japanese have the national duty of atoning for our sins to the Allied powers. In a report to Washington MacArthur noted a growing consciousness of Japan's war guilt. There is no doubt that this was genuine. Scholars believe that the difference between Dai Nippon and the devastated Third Reich, where the guilt was greater, is that the Nipponese had been changed into a new people. This is hard to credit, but it is very oriental. The new Japan read of the old Japan's war crimes, evidence of which was now being produced at trials in Tokyo and Manila, found it sickening, and was transformed. 29 A happier surprise for them was the conduct of the GIs. In the weeks after the surrender the new Japanese, aware that some of the old Japanese were still among them, feared that some of them might commit some outrage which would bring allied retribution. After that danger had passed, they thought that the disclosures at the war crimes trials might provoke vengeance by the occupation army. Nothing of the sort happened. Instead American soldiers were a constant fount of unexpected kindnesses, rushing ill Japanese to hospitals returning lost children to their parents, and yielding their streetcar seats to elderly women, something which, in the past, Nipponese had done only for their own relatives. Do the Japanese despise us for having been soft? John Gunter asked a large sample of Nipponese. After the poll he answered his own question, no. They think we are being astute. Time after time he was told that they had expected punishment, starvation torture, looting, rapine. Their own troops, they knew, had forced the Chinese to display miniature flags of the rising sun, at the very least they had assumed that they would have to wave the stars and stripes. Then they discovered that the GIs were generous and affectionate. MacArthur, they learned, had ordered a five-year jail sentence for any American court slapping a Japanese. That, one man told Gunther was when we knew we had lost the war. 30 after the Imperial Palace had disclosed that 15-year-old Crown Prince Akihito, heir to the throne, was being tutored by Elizabeth Gravining of Bryn Mawr. Akihito's future subjects pondered ways to incorporate American influences in their own lives. Two million of them became Christians. Congress was petitioned to admit Japan as America's 49th state. A translated study of an outline of government in Connecticut enjoyed a brisk sale. On St. Patrick's Day in 1946 six Nipponese Defense Council appeared at the Capitol's War Crimes Tribunal wearing green lapel ribbons, and the Tokyo Asahi began running Sheik Young's comic strip Blondie with Japanese captions. A school opened in Yoshiwara, the old brothel district, to teach American slang. 
A last Changku filling station opened outside Kyoto. Ginza stalls sold toy jeeps, jeepu, geisha crooned you are my sunshine, musicians learned to play boogie woogie, and movie fans waited in line for hours to see G Nautry in Call of the Canyon. Most of this was superficial, tawdry, and temporary. One of MacArthur's goals was to turn the idolatry for their warrior class into hatred and contempt. But before he left Japan, a vast popular literature would panegyrize Nippon's wartime heroes. It happened in German apostrophe, it happened, for that matter, in the United States. Nevertheless it is significant, for in their American affiliate they also adopted institutions of popular government which have survived the pop culture. 31 Douglas MacArthur was the most popular man in Japan. He had been the only Allied commander whose name the Japanese people had heard during the war, and in the Missouri surrender ceremony he had made a tremendous entrance into their lives. The very characteristics which troubled Americans, his flair for the dramatic, his insistence on absolute loyalty and unquestioning obedience from his soldiers, appealed to the Nipponese. He projected a Jovian image of decisiveness and absolute authority. If a Japanese man was dominated by a strong minded wife, his neighbors would say, Too bad, she's a MacArthur. The Tokyo Jiji Shimpo warned that the nation's hero worship was making a god of General MacArthur, and indeed, Richard H. Rovier and Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., quoted a Japanese as saying, After Hirohito had renounced his divinity, we looked to MacArthur as the second Jesus Christ. Some the United States Orientalists were afraid his monocracy might undermine the concept of self-rule, but a Nipponese historian believes that the general's imperious aloofness and lordly graciousness established the prestige of the occupation. 32 as his headquarters he had chosen one of the few structures in the capital to withstand the bombings, a six-story insurance building which was situated, in MacArthur's words, in downtown Tokyo across from the moat surrounding the emperor's palace. Equally important, it overlooked the imperial plaza, the traditional parade ground of the Mikado's guard divisions, where, Tokyo Rose had assured the world during the war, the general would be publicly hanged. The symbolism was not lost on the Japanese. Overnight the edifice became known as the Daiki, number one, building. Hirohito's new style of reigning led him to move among his people like an English or Scandinavian monarch. They saw him opening flower shows, trade fairs, and baseball games. Newspaper photographs showed him kissing babies on sidewalks, wading in surf with his trousers rolled up to his knees and a fedora perched jauntily on his head, and wandering through public parks, collecting moss and lichen for his laboratory or seated on a stone bench, writing his bizarre poetry. At the same time that they were discovering that his presence didn't blind them, they became aware that another man now directed their fate, and they revered him. 33 The Nipponese equivalent of John Q. Public is Jino Tanaka, and Tanaka's curiosity about the general was insatiable. Crowds gathered every day just to see him come and go from the Daiki. Newsweek reported. The presses can hardly keep up with the demand for the 62-page book General MacArthur. There were rumors that he had royal blood, that he was descended from Japanese ancestors, that he had a nice-eyed daughter. Nipponese women wrote him, begging him to serve as their stud so that they might bear great children. That was only part of his correspondence from Japanese, each month they sent him over a thousand letters. Two-thirds were in English the rest had to be translated. Prostitutes wanted to form a union because we are just working girls. A Buddhist priest explained that he, not Hirohito, should live in the imperial palace, because my throne was deprived me 554 years ago. Japanese policemen wanted to wear GI combat boots. Victims of chronic illnesses asked for cures. Mothers begged toilet training advice. Most of these appeals to him arrived in the mail, but many were hand-delivered, sometimes by peasants who had traveled to Tokyo from outlying provinces. Like the weighty submissions from the Guy Musho, the Nipponese Foreign Office, where the Prime Minister worked, these were condensed and the condensations placed on the General's desk.
Every correspondent who enclosed his address received a reply. 34 You have a feeling, C. L. Salzberger wrote in his diary, that people almost bow when they mention General MacArthur's name. One woman did prostrate herself as she was leaving his headquarters, he picked her up, brushed her off, and admonished her. On another occasion, which became famous throughout Japan, the general was entering the Daiki elevator when a small Japanese, already in it, began to bow himself out. MacArthur signaled him to remain. Later he received a letter which, translated, read, I am the humble Japanese carpenter who last week you not only permitted but insisted ride with you in the same elevator. I have reflected on this act of courtesy for a whole week, and I realize that no Japanese general would have done as you did. Newspapers ran the story, a one-act play was written about it, and a Tokyo artist painted a heroic canvas of the elevator confrontation which was reproduced and hung in Japanese homes, like the Iwo Jima flag raising in the United States. The fact that MacArthur himself was probably behind the campaign to publicize the incident does not diminish its significance. 35 In Nipponese eyes, two of MacArthur's most appealing traits were his austerity and his personal courage. Like a medieval Japanese warrior, the supreme commander's dedication to duty was total, Scap worked seven days a week, including Christmases and his own birthdays, and never took a vacation never even toured the country's scenic wonders. In the five years between VJ Day and the Korean War he left Tokyo just twice, to attend proclamation of independence ceremonies in Manila and Seoul, and in each case he was back before evening. He turned down a million dollar offer to write his memoirs because he wanted to devote all his energies to the Japanese recovery, which he felt would be the capstone of his career. He never used the private railroad car which the Japanese railways had placed at his disposal. Unless he rode to Haneda Airport to greet visiting dignitaries, Congressman, Eisenhower, Marshall returning from his frustrating attempt to mediate the Chinese Civil War as Tinman's special representative, he was seen only when commuting daily between the American Embassy and his headquarters in a sleek black 1941 Cadillac which had been acquired from a Manila sugar baron was now driven by an army non-com, master sergeant at his Edwards, and bore fender flags, and the license number one with five silver stars on a bright blue background in front and back. 36 preceded by two white helmeted MPs on motorcycles, Scap usually left the embassy at 10.30 a.m., returning there for lunch in the early afternoon and then, after a siesta, motoring back to the Daiki for another work session which would last until night had fallen on Tokyo. Everyone in the city knew of his movements, all other traffic halted as Japanese policemen turned traffic lights green for him and saluted as he passed. Since he always followed the same schedule, he would have been easy prey for an assassin. When anxious aides pointed this out, however, he merely changed the subject. In Australia he had been accompanied by men with submachine guns, but now, even after Tokyo plainclothesmen discovered that communist terrorists were planning an attempt on his life, he refused to agree to bodyguards. Among themselves staff officers decided to have a jeep of armed GIs follow him. Since they didn't want to incur his wrath, however, the jeep was told to stay a block behind the limousine, where he wouldn't see it, and where. Of course, it was virtually useless. Every officer who tried to raise the issue of security with him was waved away. Finally the staff suggested that an officer ride in the front seat beside the driver. Reluctantly he consented. 37 Major Bowers, who drew this duty, thought they could at least cover the mile long distance quickly. The Cadillac crawled. That seemed to suit the Supreme Commander, who, in the beginning, ignored the Major. According to Bowers, the general leaned back on the soft, faded grey upholstery, reading newspapers, or sat in total repose, like a monk after a successful session of meditation. His white hands were smooth as wax, only blemished by brown spots of age. His fingers were exquisitely manicured, as if lacquered with polish. He held them in his lap, peacefully. His profile, which I knew better than his full face, was granitic. 
He was always immaculately clean shaven, and I never saw a nick on him. The skin was tightly drawn and almost translucent. He had large bones, an oversized jaw that jutted a little. From face to walk, from gesture to speech, he shone with good breeding. He was really very beautiful, like fine ore, a splendid rock, a boulder. Bowers thought him full of majesty. 38 Like others on the staff he also considered him extremely vulnerable to thugs and snipers. The colonel who had given the major this job as escort had said, he's a target slower than a duck at an amusement park, and another colonel had added, with the current switched off. At that time the terrorist threat was great. A band led by a former Camp Atai lieutenant named Hideo Takiyama planned to toss grenades into the car and pour bullets into it as it moved past them. MacArthur was unimpressed. He predicted they would be caught, as they were, but there was no guarantee of that at the time. Everyone was apprehensive except him. He could scarcely have been more nonchalant. He even hummed to himself as they crept along. After several trips Bowers shifted around and said, Sir, a couple of minor matters. It's about how fast the driver drives. The general looked up from the stars and stripes and asked, what's wrong with it? The major said, it's slow. The general, leave it be. The major, sir, may I ask another question about security? The general, fire away. The major, what does the general feel about carrying firearms? The general, me? The major, no. I. MacArthur, Bowers recalls, stopped reading. He looked at me. I had the feeling he had never seen me before. Scap replied, suit yourself. Just don't make a fuss. To others the Supreme Commander said, in the Orient, the man who shows no fear is master. I count on the Japanese people to protect me. And they did. 39 on his arrival at the Daiki, one spectator remembers. MPs in starched uniforms and mirror-like helmets went through an elaborate manual of arms, a jig with rifles, executing a parade ballet of thunder and blazes, turning, stepping, snapping to, and saluting in four directions, like Tibetan lamas at prayer while MacArthur, head lowered, indifferent, tossed a massive salute to cover the guard and those civilians and Japanese who always clustered there but were harshly cordoned off at a distance. White lines painted on the sidewalk marked the general's route, and Bowers, watching him proceed between them, would breathe more freely, glad to be relieved of the responsibility. He often wondered what had passed through the general's mind in the car, and occasionally during their trips he tried to strike up a conversation with him. Once he had the temerity to ask him his opinion of Eisenhower's European campaigns. MacArthur said, he let his generals in the field fight the war for him. They were good and covered up for him. He drank tea with kings and queens. Just up Eisenhower's alley. His former aide's name came up on another occasion, when a Stars and Stripes headline reported that the Canadians had named the mountain after Eisenhower. MacArthur was glum. He said he knew the place. Then he brightened. He said, you know, it's a very small peak considering the Canadian terrain. 40 His views of the Japanese countryside were largely confined to the tree-lined embassy drive, the pink wall or a museum of Chinese art, a baseball sandlet, the Mantetsi apartments, the concrete finance building, the fire-bombed ruins of the Navy Ministry, the Sakurada Gate of the Imperial Palace, and the Palace Moat. Unless a sandlet game was in progress, he peered out keenly when there was one, the only Nipponies he saw on a typical day were the bowing policemen, the worshipful group outside the daiki, and selected officials. But he hadn't seen much more of armies he had directed in battle. He knew how to use his staff, how to cross-examine visitors, and how to glean information by scanning official documents. Rising at 7.30 a.m., he read the New York Times and wire service copy after breakfast frequently sending instructions on urgent matters to his staff, which was preparing for his arrival. Once in the daiki, he never used the phone. Nor did he have a secretary or an assistant through whom he could work. He wanted to see men, they had to be men, 
he hated to receive women, and almost never did, face to face. Customarily, writes Sebald, he would think out loud, using others as a sounding board. 41 It was an oddity of the building that fire escapes were concealed tubes, or chutes, which, having been built for Japanese, were too small for American men. Jean would have fitted, but she never came here, most of the rooms were spacious enough, though crowded, running an entire country required many men, and although MacArthur mainly relied on the officers who had been with him since Australia, he also needed 2200 civilian officials. Soon Scap had to erect Quonset huts and take over, first the adjacent forestry ministry, and then other nearby buildings. 42 MacArthur's roost was on the Dyke's top floor, as might be expected, but his quarters were not particularly desirable, he assigned the large corner offices to his chief aides and chose for himself a small interior room which had been used for storage. The walls were walnut panelled, the rug cadet grey. In the beginning there was no air conditioning, and here, as in the Southwest Pacific, everyone sweated except the general. An onyx clock stood on a bookcase. Worn leather chairs were placed on either side of a long, scarred leather divan where, Bowers remembers, visitors sat like Hudson Valley family portraits. A pipe rack held seventeen pipes, five of them corn cobs. Scap's swivel chair face to base covered mahogany table desk on which lay a letter opener, pencils, and in and out baskets. At the end of each day it was as neat as a West Point locker. His firmest rule was that nothing should be postponed until tomorrow. 43 During the uproar over his refusal to readmit the uppity Newsweek correspondent, the Supreme Commander told the news magazine's foreign editor in ringing tones, I love criticism. He didn't, of course, and two framed quotations on his walls attested to his hatred of it. One of them, from the Roman general Lucius Aemilius Paulus, ran, in every circle, and truly, at every table, there are people who lead armies into Macedonia. These are great impediments to those who have the management of affairs. I am not one of those who think that commanders ought at no time to receive advice. If, therefore, anyone thinks himself qualified to give advice respecting the war which I am to conduct, which may prove advantageous to the public. He shall be furnished with a ship, a horse, a tent, even his travelling charges shall be defrayed. But if he thinks this is too much trouble, and prefers the repose of a city to the toils of war, let him not, on land, assume the office of a pilot. The heart of the other quotation, from Lincoln, was, if I were to try to read, much less answer, all the attacks made on me, these shops might as well be closed to any other business. I do the very best I know how, and I mean to keep doing so to the end. 44 MacArthur told a reporter, my major advisers now have boiled down to almost two men, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. One founded the United States, the other saved it. If you go back in their lives, you can find almost all the answers. Clark Lee, however, believed that the two greatest influences on his political thinking were the two Roosevelt's, and those who were with him in Tokyo recall that he often quoted Plato's Republic. Certainly his philosophy of government belonged to an earlier time. In an age of pragmatic politicians, the general sought footholds on the bedrock of principles. To him, Frazier Hunt wrote, issues automatically became moral issues, his decisions resting on the simple test of what is right and what is wrong. The ancient verities still remained the basis of the great decisions that MacArthur made. One of his great strengths in Asia was his open contempt for advocates of white supremacy, what Lee called his complete absence of any trace of racial prejudice. 45 The general appointed no deputy, and, loving detail, he insisted on making such minute decisions as whether a visiting American should stay at the Hotel Imperial, or, if not, where. Most 20th century statesmen employ speech writers. Scap regarded that as deceitful, he also doubted that anyone else could match his eloquence, and he spent hours drafting remarks for such occasions as New Year's Day, the anniversary of VJ Day, and, later, 
the promulgation of the new Japanese constitution, in the creation of which he took the greatest pride. Although he seldom allowed anyone else to act in his behalf, he relied heavily upon his officers for information. I-7 p.m. summons to the Daiki was not unusual, nor was a phone call in the small hours of the night if the midnight radio news had aroused his interest. He pushed himself hard. Sometimes refusing to quit until he could no longer focus on the clock. He goaded his staff, too. One civilian advisor told him that he was working them to death. The general snapped, what better fate for a man than to die in the performance of his duty. 46 he permitted himself three diversions, reading, private movie showings, and, in the fall, Monday morning quarterbacking. As the years passed. His emotional tie to West Point had grown ever stronger. From the Daiki he sent the long grey line a message recalling the day he took the plebs oath and adding that his pride and thrill of being a West Pointer has never dimmed. And as I near the end of the road, what I felt when I was sworn in on the plane so long ago I can still say, that this is my greatest honour. His mystic commitment to the plane expressed itself most clearly in his love of football. He watched the progress of all the United States college teams in the sports pages of American newspapers, and his predictions of each Saturday's results were surprisingly accurate, with one exception, he always picked Army to win. When the Black Knights lost, he felt the squad would benefit from his advice. A lively correspondence developed between him and coach Red Blake. Blake sent him long data sheet, and MacArthur could reel off the height, weight, class, and position of every player. Once he dismayed a recent West Point graduate by asking why a certain tackle hadn't started the Navy game. The unfortunate shave till hadn't even noticed the lineman's absence, and in the middle of a complex discussion of occupation policy one Sunday he startled his officers by suddenly saying, I see Army started its second string backs yesterday. That's good generalship. Blake treasures a sheaf of Baroque correspondence from the Daiki, including such vintage MacArthur as, the introduction of the new substitution system opens up a wide range of ramification in the tactical handling of a football game. It makes the game more and more in accord with the development of the tactics of actual combat. And, it could not have failed to be a great blow to lose simultaneously your line and backfield coaches, both apparently excellent men. However, this again follows the technique of war, for you always lose your best men in the heat of battle. 47 Except on autumn mornings after army games, the general's first task, on arriving at the office, was to go through his mail. Two neat stacks awaited him, one of dispatches that had arrived overnight and demanded his immediate attention, the other of mail addressed to him personally. Unless they were in Japanese, letters to him reached his desk unread, as always, the envelopes were partially slit so he could open them easily. Touching a buzzer, he summoned Whitney or Larry Bunker, handing him some reports and mail with instructions for disposition of them. The rest of the letters he retained. Since he hated to dictate, he composed his replies in longhand on ruled pads, these were then given to a typist. Many of his holographs survive among his papers. They are remarkable for their immaculateness and their sheer bulk. On his birthdays, for example, about 300 congratulatory cables would arrive, each well wisher received a personal answer. 48 staff meetings were infrequent. When one was necessary, he would invariably open it by saying, Gentlemen, sit down, and then greeting each officer by his first name. They called him Sir, or General. Behind his back he was Mac, Old Mac, the Old Man, the Sea. In Sea, or, more obscurely, Bunny. Individually, they could confer with him by scheduling an appointment with Bunker, who sat in his outer office. Whitney was an exception. A back door near his own office gave him access to MacArthur. The general let him use it. He also permitted Whitney to continue his practice of eavesdropping on MacArthur's meetings with important visitors. Bunker thinks that irritated them, but he may reflect the staff's jealous sparring for the general's attention. Close to the throne, 
Bowers recalls, was the expression they used. Like FDR, the Supreme Commander tolerated, and even encouraged, the cliques competing for his favor. 49 The only Japanese politicians to whom the general was always available were the Prime Minister, the Chief Justice, and the two leaders of the bicameral diet. Americans were another matter. Almost any the United States visitor of stature was welcomed, politicians, businessmen, clergymen, editors, Washington officials, professors, diplomats, traveling generals and admirals, distinguished journalists, or anyone else MacArthur wanted to impress. Most of them seem to have found the experience electrifying, or at the very least flattering. He would have a staff officer prepare an advance memorandum on a visitor's field and interests, so that the caller would be impressed by the range of the Supreme Commander's knowledge. These briefings were supplemented by his extraordinary memory, talking to a man who had once been his neighbor, MacArthur recalled particulars of a house he hadn't seen in forty years. His familiarity with contemporary America, which he had last glimpsed during his 1937 honeymoon, was astonishing. Roger Baldwin of the American Civil Liberties Union told Bunker as he left, why, he knows more about civil liberties than I do. James M. Gavin was amazed by his familiarity with airborne operations in Europe. A labor leader, after a MacArthur lecture on the history of collective bargaining, said, why, he even knows union lingo. John J. McCloy said simply, what a man. 50 expecting 5 minutes with him, they would find themselves remaining for a half hour, or even an hour. He liked to give each the impression that this meeting was the high point of his day. Extending his thin, finely wrinkled hand and gazing into his visitor's face with his penetrating eyes, he would wave the man to the couch and sink into a chair himself, filling and lighting his pipe as though he had nothing else to do. If the visitor also produced a pipe, MacArthur would sigh, ah, a man after my own heart. He knew the master politician's trick of establishing immediate rapport. Callers from Milwaukee, New York, or Manila returned home with the impression that the general meant to retire to, respectively, Milwaukee, New York, or Manila. Europeans heard glowing praise of their homelands, churchmen of their churches, Patriots of the flag. 51 crooking his leg over an arm of his chair, he would begin the overture softly, pausing to relight his pipe from time to time and shaking a box of matches for emphasis. Then, springing up, he would begin his pacing, gesticulating with a sweeping arm or stabbing the air with his forefinger for emphasis. His vocabulary, a journalist wrote, ranged from double barreled phrases to surprisingly blunt idiom. His voice would be low and guttural one moment, high, thin, and dramatic the next. In a few sentences he could pass from serenity to amusement to trembling excitement. Knuckling his thinning hair and requiring several matches to relight his pipe, his tone now quivering with anger and now humming resonantly, he would approach his climax, America's role in Asia. Japan was the bulwark of freedom, the springboard of the future. Though the United States frontier lay here, where more than half the world's population lives. Americans hadn't begun to realize its vast potentialities. 52 Seldom searching for ideas or phrases, he so overwhelmed most men that afterward they did not realize, as Frank Kelly and Cornelius Ryan wrote, that it had been a very one-sided conversation, that you do not talk with MacArthur, he talks at you. These sessions were more than exhibitions of vanity, however. In his talks with congressmen, the general planted the seeds which later bore fruit in the peace treaty between the United States and Japan, and according to Brines, two allied foreign ministers changed their policies after visiting him. Few of his callers, whatever their profession, departed unconverted, though some had reservations. Gunter wondered whether it was wise to have a supreme commander who, apparently, had never had a pessimistic moment in his life. Of course, he observed, great egoists are almost always optimists. More tellingly, he wrote, MacArthur's qualities are so indisputably great in his own field that it comes as something of a shock to explore the record and find that in others he can be narrow, gullible, 
and curiously naive. He treads on unsure ground when he steps off the path of what he really knows. He knew almost nothing, Gunther found, in two unhappy realms, politics and the realm of news. Sulzberger reported that what the general had to say was a curious cocktail of earnest, decent, hopeful philosophy, a certain amount of rather long-range thinking and a good deal of highly impractical poppycock. Fifty-three visitors found little opportunity to question him, and one question, which fascinated many of them and was put to him from time to time when he paused for breath, was never answered. They wanted to know what the future might hold for Douglas MacArthur. As a military man he had won virtually every decoration from the Medal of Honor down, victories which outshone those of any other commander in the United States history and political omnipotence matching Caesars and Napoleons. Only the White House had eluded him. Leading Republicans still regarded him as a serious candidate, but if he coveted that grand prize, he should have shown himself to the voters after VJ Day. Among those baffled by his failure to do so was President Truman. In his memoirs Truman notes that twice in 1945, on September 17 and October 19, he invited MacArthur home to receive the plaudits of a grateful nation. I felt that he was entitled to the same honors that had been given to General Eisenhower. And, like Eisenhower, he could have returned to his post after a brief sojourn here. But the general declined. MacArthur's reply to the first of these communications was, Appreciate very much your message. I naturally look forward to a visit home from which I have been absent more than eight years. The delicate and difficult situation which prevails here, however, would make it unwise to leave until conditions are more stabilized than at present. I believe a considerable period of time must elapse before I can safely leave. On October 21st he answered the second invitation, the desperation of the coming winter here cannot be overestimated. I would feel as though I were failing in my duty and obligations were I to delegate this responsibility. 54 Truman was dissatisfied with these explanations, so was George Marshall. And they were right. His real reason for remaining in Tokyo was far less rational. It was fascinating, even fantastic. In what may have been the most egocentric statement in an immodest career, he told one of his officers, if I returned for only a few weeks, word would spread through the Pacific that the United States is abandoning the Orient. 55 Before Dinapon could be reformed, defeated officers accused of war crimes had to be tried before military tribunals, and there is little about the Japanese which is more enigmatic than their failure to resent the verdicts against Masaharu Homa and Tomoki Yamashita. To be sure, the evidence of wartime atrocities was indisputable. Individual soldiers under Homa and Yamashita had behaved barbarously. But their outrages had not been committed on instructions from their commanders. There was no parallel with Germany, where the head of state and the entire apparatus of government had connived in torture and mass murder. Furthermore, the Germans, as MacArthur himself pointed out, should have known better. They were traitors to Western culture. The Japanese, on the other hand, were following holocaustic precedents which went back to Genghis Khan. 56 In the early months of the occupation, 1,128 Nipponese, from former Prime Ministers Hideki Tojo and Koki Hirota to POW guards and Tokyo Rose, were incarcerated in Tokyo's Squat Shugamo prison. The Potsdam proclamation had directed that stern justice shall be meted out to all war criminals including those who have visited cruelties on our prisoners. An eleven-judge tribunal chaired by Australia's Sir William Webb was instructed to try and punish Far Eastern war criminals who are charged with offences which include crimes against peace. In the Japanese War Ministry, on the outskirts of the capital, court stenographers took 48,412 pages of testimony from 1,198 witnesses. In the end 174 men were sentenced to death. Later this list was paired to seven, including Tojo and Hirota. MacArthur had the power to commute their sentences. He declined to exercise it, telling Sebald afterward, in a husky whisper, Bill, 
that was a difficult decision to make. The general barred photographers from the executions but instructed each allied power to send a representative. Unrepentant, the seven condemned men mounted the scaffold shouting, Banzai! Fifty-seven most of the other defendants, together with some 210,000 minor wartime functionaries, were simply purged, that is, forbidden to re-enter public life under SCAP Order No. 550 which informed the Japanese government that it must remove and exclude from public office all persons who in one capacity or another had been influential in promoting militarism. MacArthur wrote that he was pleasantly surprised at the attitude of the Japanese people during the period of trial. They seemed to be impressed both by the fairness of the procedures and by the lack of vindictiveness on the part of the prosecutors. The prisoners themselves and their families made it a point to write letters to me and to the tribunal after their conviction to express thanks for our impartiality and justice. No perceptible ill will was generated in Japan as a result of the trials. Yoshio Suzuki, the Nipponese foreign minister, pointed out to his countrymen that German jails were crowded with Nazis who had been fined, sentenced to menial labor, and deprived of their property while in our country. Those who precipitated the nation into war are only barred from office, which, we must explicitly bear in mind, is due to General MacArthur's generous occupation policy. 58 That was one side of the coin. The other, darker, side, which Suzuki tactfully ignored, was that Homa and Yamashita, MacArthur's chief adversaries, were tried and convicted by kangaroo courts which flouted justice with the supreme commander's approval and probably at his urging. The courts martial were held in the ornate reception hall of Manila's High Commissioner's residence, under the eyes of Filipinos still enraged by the savaging of their capital. The tribunals consisted, not of lawyers, but of regular army officers who were answerable to the five-star general in Tokyo. They could have been under no illusions about what he wanted them to do. He had drawn up the charges. He repeatedly goaded them to move swiftly. And he had established the rules of evidence, such as they were. The court determined the credibility of witnesses. Hearsay, double hearsay, and even triple hearsay based on conjecture were admissible as proof, so was extremely prejudicial material. Cross-examination was aborted, or omitted entirely, at the whim of the presiding officer. When defense attorneys tried to discuss SCAP directives governing the proceedings, they were reprimanded and forbidden to mention MacArthur's name in the courtroom. 59 After the Yamashita verdict was in, Newsweek commented, in the opinion of probably every correspondent covering the trial, the military commission came into the courtroom the first day with the decision already in its collective pocket. The twelve reporters who heard all the testimony polled one another and found for the defendant, 12 to 0. Some idea of what passed for evidence may be inferred from a motion picture, a fake documentary, which was shown by the tribunal. AGI was depicted as bending over the body of a dead Japanese soldier, slowly drawing a piece of paper from his pocket, and reading it as a narrator's voice intoned, orders from Tokyo. We have discovered the secret orders to destroy Manila. There was no explanation of how the GI could read Japanese. In bitter understatement, one defense counsel said of this shoddy film that it was not at all conducive to the calm, dispassionate sifting of the facts which has always been the cornerstone of American justice. Another said that no American who loves his country can read the record of the prosecution's efforts in this respect without an abiding and painful sense of shame. 60 It is too much to say of Homer, as H. L. Mencken did, that MacArthur slew the man who beat him in a fair fight on Badan. There was nothing fair about either the Japanese conquest of Luzon or the American reconquest of it, war is never even handed but no hard evidence linked Homer with the death march of 1942. At most he was an ineffectual commander, unable to control the brutality of his men. Both he and Yamashita were found guilty on the ground that they had held command responsibility, but if they were thus accountable, so was their emperor. Indeed, Webb held that Japan's ruler could not be relieved from responsibility for the events for which the defendants were convicted. He reasoned that Hirohito's authority was required for the war. 
If he did not want war he should have withheld his authority. It is no answer to say he might have been assassinated. That risk is taken by all rulers, who must still do their duty. Then, backing away from his own argument, Sir William said he did not want the emperor sent to the gallows, he agreed that extending immunity to him was in the best interests of the allied powers. That can hardly be contested, but it is difficult to understand why, if Hirohito was to be spared, his generals should have to die. The London Daily Express's Manila correspondent cabled home, the trial is supposed to establish that a military commander is responsible for any acts of any of his troops. At the same time, under British law, anyway, he's supposed to have rights. So far Yamashita's American council haven't had a hearing. 61 MacArthur appears to have regarded Yamashita as the guiltier of the two commanders. Passing final judgment on Homer was, he said, a repugnant duty. He received Mrs. Homer in the daiki, allowing her to plead for clemency. It was one of the most trying hours of my life and though he denied her request, he ordered that her husband be shot rather than sent to the more dishonorable scaffold. By contrast, he seems to have relished the end of Yamashita, ordering that before his hanging he be stripped of uniform, decorations and other appurtenances signifying membership in the military profession. Yet one the United States Supreme Court Justice suggested that Homer's guilt under the law of war is more direct and clear than in the case of General Yamashita, and the 423 exhibits in the Yamashita case and the trial transcript, which exceeds 4,000 pages, expose a clear miscarriage of justice. To the end of his life MacArthur insisted that the verdict had been above challenge, that there had been no mitigating circumstances and that his American critics either favored arbitrariness of process above factual realism or shrank from the stern rigidity of capital punishment. None of this survives scrutiny. The truth is that the prosecution had no case at all. 62 During the pre-trial interrogation of Yamashi to a team of American psychiatrists reported, the general appears more as a benign, aging Japanese officer than the formidable tiger of Malaya. He was, throughout, the interview, alert, interested, courteous, and cooperative. One was, against one's will or better judgment, inclined to credit him as being sincere in his answers. Why physicians conducting an objective interview should reach conclusions against their will or better judgment is unclear, but by most accounts, including theirs, Yamashita was an extraordinary man, by far the more interesting of the two major defendants in Manila a forceful, brilliant commander who had been Japan's ablest tactician. Outnumbered better than three to one, he had nevertheless defeated the British defenders of Malaya in the tenth week of the war, Churchill had admitted to a secret session of the House of Commons that Singapore, with a force of 100,000 men, surrendered to 30,000 Japanese. After that, he had been transferred to inactive fronts because his popularity threatened to match Tojo's and because, ironically, Yamashita opposed the militarist clique in Tokyo and believed its war policy was doomed. He hadn't been returned on stage until MacArthur's 1944 drive had reached the threshold of late, and one of his first orders to Japanese troops in the Philippines then had been to handle the Filipinos carefully, to cooperate with them. Yet MacArthur charged him with Philippine atrocities committed in September 1944, when Yamashita had been stationed in Manchuria, thousands of miles away. His chief crime, according to the Supreme Commander, had been the callous and purposeless sack of the ancient city of Manila, with its Christian population and its countless historic shrines and monuments of culture and civilization. Actually, as Yamashita testified, he had declared the Philippine capital an open city for three reasons, he couldn't feed its million inhabitants, the buildings were highly inflammable, and the flatland surrounding the city made defending it strategically unsound. Accordingly, he had withdrawn his soldiers and established new headquarters in Baguio, 150 miles away. On February 3, 1945, GIs had entered the northern outskirts of Manila. Not until nine days later did Yamashita learn that Japanese sailors and marines, troops he had never trained, 
inspected, or even seen, were still in the capital. He had promptly radioed their commander, Admiral Iwabuchi, now dead, ordering him to withdraw from the city immediately in accordance with our original plan. Japanese communications were so poor that the general didn't learn of their atrocities until long afterward. At his trial he testified, I positively and categorically affirm that they were against my wishes and in direct contradiction to all my expressed orders, and, further. They occurred at a place and a time of which I had no knowledge whatsoever. His American judges didn't believe him. Neither did MacArthur. President Truman refused to intervene. The New York Times denied that the death sentence had been imposed haphazardly in thoughtless haste, and the United States Supreme Court upheld the verdict 7-2. Yet the court dissents by Frank Murphy and Wiley B. Rutledge were both vehement and persuasive. Rutledge said the proceedings had been no trial in the tradition of the common law and the Constitution. Murphy wrote that the spirit of revenge and retribution, masked in formal legal procedure for purposes of dealing with a fallen enemy commander, can do more lasting harm than all of the atrocities giving rise to that spirit. The two judges called the Manila verdicts legalized lynching. Murphy concluded, today the lives of Yamashita and Homer, leaders of enemy forces vanquished on the field of battle, are taken without regard to the due process of law. Wainwright asked that Yamashi to be given fair treatment and every right due him under the Geneva Convention, and Merlo J. Pusey observed that the disquieting and really significant aspect of the military tribunals was that the responsibility for maintaining civil liberties had passed from the courts to the army, in the face of the performance to date. It would be pretty difficult to show that we have come through the war with our constitutional liberties unimpaired. Yamashita's real crime, in the opinion of A. Frank Creel, who defended him, was that he was on the losing side. 63 Once MacArthur had decided to put the two enemy generals to death, his wisest course would have been to issue a crisp order and then turn to other matters. But that wasn't his way. To him warfare would always be tinged with the romantic tones of Arthurian legend, with the magic nimbus of the round table, and he believed that Shinto, Bushido, and the samurai code were oriental extensions of it. In his view, therefore, these two Japanese commanders had betrayed, not just Dinapon, nor even Manila's violated Filipinos, but MacArthur's own profession. Thus he drew up long bombastic statements denouncing the men whose lives he was about to take. Homer, he said, had violated a fundamental code of chivalry, which has ruled all honorable military men throughout the ages in treatment of defeated opponents. Expatiating at greater length on the Yamashita verdict, he wrote, rarely has so cruel and wanton a record been spread to public gaze. The soldier, be he friend or foe, is charged with the protection of the weak and unarmed. It is the very essence and reason for his being. When he violates his sacred trust, he not only profanes his entire cult but threatens the very fabric of international society. This officer, of proven field merit, entrusted with high command involving authority adequate to responsibility, has failed this irrevocable standard, has failed his duty to his troops, to his country, to his enemy, to mankind has failed utterly his soldier faith. The transgressions resulting therefrom as revealed by the trial are a blot. A stain upon civilization and constitute a memory of shame and dishonor that can never be forgotten. 64 at 3 a.m. on February 23, 1946, the trap was sprung beneath Yamashi to in Los Banos, a town about 35 miles south of Manila. His last words were, I will pray for the emperor's long life and his prosperity forever. Eight days later Homer's body was riddled by a firing squad in the same courtyard. Both men were calm and stoical at the end, and had they worn the uniform of another country, they might have been revered as martyrs. Partly because MacArthur's occupation of their homeland was such a success, the two generals were quickly forgotten. So, mercifully, were the supreme commander's final words and enunciation of them.
nothing he had written in his refusal to stay their executions bore any relationship to the two men as they actually were. He had, however, said a great deal about both the bright and the shadowy places in the character of Douglas MacArthur. 65 Just as water piles up behind a ship's keel in a typhoon, baffling the screws and forcing helmsmen to violate every principle of seamanship to avoid broaching to, so national anguish foils the human mechanism. In times of social upheaval dazed populations turn to the irrational, the bizarre, the macabre. Laws of social gravity are suspended. People take up wild crazes, behave like freaks, laugh at horror, weep at wit. One of the surest signs of this psychedelic mood is popular music. Nonsense songs catch on, perhaps because sensible lyrics mock a demented world. John Reed heard such ditties hummed in Russia on the eve of the October Revolution, so did Christopher Isherwood in Wimar Berlin. A British band played the world turned upside down at Yorktown, and Americans, during the throes of the Great Depression and World War II, sang The Music Goes Round and Round, Three Itty Fishes, Huts at Song, and Maisie Dotes. 66 It happened thus in post war Japan. Shortly after the capitulation on the Missouri, Tokyo Rose was replaced by Tokyo Mose, a nice eye whose broadcasts were beamed across the land by the Armed Forces Network. At the same time, a the United States journalist composed an odd verse of phrases which seemed to be spoken by the Japanese with astonishing frequency. Tokyo Mose crooned it over the radio to the tune of London Bridges Falling Down, Moshi, Moshi, Anone, Anone. Anone, Moshi, Moshi. Anone, ah, so deska. Roughly translated, this meant, hello, hello, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Hello, hello, are you there? Ah, is that so? MacArthur's troops liked it, it seemed to sum up their amiable bewilderment in this strange country. And the Japanese accepted it enthusiastically. During that first post-war winter it was heard everywhere, until some people, both the occupiers and the occupied, cringed when they heard its first notes. One reason for its popularity among the Nipponese was that it pleased the American army, and they wished to be hospitable. Another reason may have been its repeated question, for Hirohito's stunned subjects really didn't know where they were or what had happened to the institutions they had been taught to cherish particularly the imperial system. 67 If there was one fixed star in the Shinto constellation, it was the sanctity of the Tenno, the Emperor of Heaven. Situated at the center of the nation, he was immovable, untouchable, a sacred being who never visited anyone except the Council of Shinto Gods. Even after the surrender, die-hard samurai were predicting to Hirohito's benumbed subjects that he would soon call for a return to Fuko, antiquity or even broadcast the slogan Sono Joy, Revere the Emperor. Drive out the barbarians. Then they picked up their newspapers on September 28, 1945, and beheld a photograph of their little sovereign standing beside Douglas MacArthur. He had called on the general, top hat in hand. Some Japanese thought the picture had been faked, and some, for a few dangerous hours believed that Hirohito must have been prodded into the American embassy at Bayonet Point, but the visit had been the Emperor's idea. As MacArthur had foreseen, curiosity or an appreciation of his country's new realities had prompted Hirohito to make the move. According to Larry Bunker, the first inkling of it came when Nippon's foreign minister, Shigeru Yoshida, had crossed the moat the previous morning, ridden up to the sixth floor and informed the general's staff that his sovereign wished to talk to the supreme commander. MacArthur sent back word that he had no intention of setting foot in the palace, his position wouldn't permit it. At the same time, he realized that expecting Hirohito to call on his conqueror at the Daiki, a public building, would be needlessly mortifying. Therefore he would receive him at the embassy. The emperor could be accompanied by an interpreter one picture would be taken. Then they would talk for half an hour. 68 The general hurried home and went directly to the drawing room. He was wearing simple suntans, with no decorations or insignia of rank. 
His collar was open. It was a warm day, and he saw no reason to change. Presently lookouts at the dike he phoned that a motorcade of old-fashioned black Daimlers was emerging from the Sakurada gate. Crossing the moat at 10 a.m., it passed the demolished naval ministry, the Sandlet game, and the Opera Museum, and rolled up the embassy drive. Bonafellas, stationed by the embassy portico, spotted the emperor first. In addition to his silk top Hirohito was wearing an ancient claw hammer coat and striped pants. Facing him on the jump seats were the translator and the Lord Privy Seal, the Marquis Koichi Kaido, a small, compact man in his fifties whose habits were so precise that other members of the court called him Kaido the Clock. Lesser officials, Chamberlains, heads of protocol, the keeper of the treasures, and all manner of imperial household staff, trailed in the other cars. 69 Hirohito and Kaido emerged, fellas saluted, and another officer politely asked the Marquis to step to one side. It was an awful moment for the Emperor. Except when on his throne he had never spoken for himself. Always the Privy Seal or another nobleman had explained that the Emperor feels that, or the Emperor has decided after great consideration or it is the emperor's wish. Frantically Kaido struggled to accompany his monarch into the building, but it was impossible, smiling, courteous the United States colonels blocked him on every side. Hirohito, with his interpreter at his heels, advanced, trembling. On the threshold of the reception hall he suddenly confronted MacArthur, who murmured, Your Majesty, and gripped his hand warmly. Speaking through the translator, the general recalled having been received by the emperor's father at the close of the Russo-Japanese War. He motioned him to a chair beside the fireplace and, as MacArthur later recalled, offered him an American cigarette, which he took with thanks. I noticed how his hands shook as I lighted it for him. I tried to make it as easy for him as I could, but I knew how deep and dreadful must be his agony of humiliation. 70 The general later told a visitor, I came here with the idea of using the emperor more sternly, but soon discovered that Hirohito was a sincere man and a genuine liberal. Perhaps he also felt the compassion of one aristocrat for another, I was born a democrat. I was reared as a liberal. But I tell you I find it painful to see a man once so high and mighty brought down so low. MacArthur did concede that he had had an uneasy feeling that the Emperor might plead his own cause against indictment as a war criminal. Despite strenuous objections from the Russians and the British, the Supreme Commander had already struck his name from the list of defendants, but Hirohito didn't know that, and a plea for clemency would have been understandable, if unseemly. Instead he said, I come to you, General MacArthur to offer myself to the judgment of the powers you represent as the one to bear sole responsibility for every political and military decision made and action taken by my people in the conduct of, their, war. MacArthur felt moved. To the very marrow of my bones. He was an emperor by inherent birth. But in that instant I knew I faced the first gentleman of Japan in his own right. After thirty-eight minutes of mannered civility they rose, bowed, and parted. As Hirohito retraced his steps toward the frustrated, perspiring Kaido, the general heard a faint, rippling laugh. It was his wife. Jean and Dr. Edgeberg had been peering out from behind folds of red drapes. 71 The visitor's impressions of his host were, in the oriental way, elusive. The first inkling his subject said of his post-war mood was in a poem he published in the Tokyo newspapers The Pine is Brave that Changes Not Its Color, Bearing the Snow. People, too, like it should be. 72 The snow was the Allied army occupying his country, the people were the Japanese, he was telling them not to temper or alter their national character. In many ways they did not, but the abolition of absolute monarchy was bound to bring shifts in outlook particularly in the monarch himself. After that first visit, the emperor called on the supreme commander twice a year. They developed a father-son relationship which would have been unthinkable before VJ Day. At first the people said of each precedent-shattering scap decision, what will the emperor say? They stopped because Hirohito endorsed all of them. He played, MacArthur wrote, 
a major role in the spiritual regeneration of Japan. Japanese politicians believed that the general was responsible for this. Yoshida, who was prime minister during most of MacArthur's viceregal years in Tokyo, concluded that the supreme commander's respectful bearing with the Mikado, his order that every honor due a sovereign is to be his and his insistence that he not be tried and executed, more than any other single factor made the occupation an historic success. 73 It also made SCAP policy controversial. Dr. Richberg's observation that MacArthur had a poor press was true even during his proconsular years in the Daiki, when his stature and achievements were at their peak. Much of this was his own fault. His approach toward reporters was much like his attitude toward Isabel Cooper, his Eurasian mistress in the early 1930s, they were there to be used as he saw fit and should remain mute and docile if he was busy elsewhere. He was indignant with them, and censored their dispatches sharply, when they reported the fact that other Asian nations, still fearing a strong Japan, regarded his policy as flabby and were disappointed when he didn't punish the emperor. Once he scorned them as illiterate police reporters. Some, indeed, weren't much more than that. Before I had been in Tokyo a week, John Gunter wrote, I became convinced that the MacArthur story is one of the worst reported stories in history. It is startling to discover aspects of the general which were largely ignored by correspondents covering SCAP. We are informed, not by the big dailies, but by a magazine writer that the Supreme Commander reddened with anger when he discovered American Lend-Lease armor being used against the people of Indochina, the little people we promised to liberate under the Four Freedoms and the Atlantic Charter. There is little inkling in contemporary dispatches of MacArthur's feelings, expressed to Robert Sherwood, that American influence and strength must be expressed in terms of essential liberalism if we are to retain the friendship of the Asian peoples. Even more striking, we find in one journalist's observations, set down after a meeting with MacArthur, that the general believes the press, right now, ought to quit making heroes of generals and admirals, as the first step in doing its job. The press of the world, too, ought to quit glorifying war in general. He feels that the business of making heroes of generals and admirals and glorifying war has a lot to do with influencing public opinion to accept war. MacArthur felt that to delionize the generals and admirals and to deglorify war is a job the press can tackle right now. 74 Scap's difficulty was that he had created a vivid public image of himself and could no longer alter it. His paranoia is illustrative. Powerful forces in Washington opposed American commitments to the Far East on the ground that they would weaken the United States effort in Europe, and this was an issue which deserved debate, but when he accused them of lopsided policies, he was ignored. He had cried wolf too often. His overwhelming pride provides another example. Millions throughout the world, Frank Kelly and Cornelius Ryan wrote, think of him as an egotistical dictator. As astute an official as James Burns said in 1946, he has done a marvelous job, nevertheless, he is a prima donna as though his prima donna qualities weren't essential to his job as supreme commander. Except among Ambassador Sebald and other American diplomats on his staff, what Sebald called his courteous and cooperative treatment of the United States Foreign Service officers went unnoted. Yet he made headlines when he threatened to blast the State Department wide open. 75 His blunder here was grave, for it brought him the enmity of a man just as able and just as vindictive as himself, D. Nixon. On September 17, 1945, Harry Truman writes in his memoirs, MacArthur gave out word that the strength of the occupation forces could be paired to 200,000 men. The Joint Chiefs of Staff the State Department, and I first learned of this announcement through the press. It was certainly news. His earlier estimate had been 500,000, later cut to 400,000, and Acting Secretary of State Aikson was deeply offended. At a press conference in Washington the next day, Aikson said tartly that I am surprised that anyone can foresee the number of forces that will be necessary in Japan. The occupation forces are the instruments of policy and not the determinants of policy. 
Here the acting secretary erred. He was citing the theory, the realities in Tokyo, as he should have known, were very different. Aixon's remark stirred up a minor o at the time. His appointment as undersecretary was up for confirmation. Senator Kenneth Wherry of Nebraska voted against it, charging that the nominee had blighted the name of a great military hero. No one joined the Nebraskan, even Robert A. Taft approved the president's choice, the roll call was 69 eyes to the one nay, but later Wherry would have company. As Aixon notes in his memoirs, if we could have seen into the future, we might have recognized this skirmish as the beginning of a struggle. 76 It is unsurprising that Scapp's critics should have included American liberals and intellectuals, though the grounds for their disapproval seem odd now. Like the Australians, of whom James Forrestal wrote in his diary that they wanted a far harder policy than the Americans. A severe, even a punitive policy, the United States liberals believed that MacArthur was too generous a conqueror. I. F. Stone thought it wrong to retain Nippon's structure of government, it takes little reflection to realize that we can hardly hope to break the power of Japan's ruling classes, the aristocracy, the plutocracy, the bureaucracy, and the military, if we confine ourselves to operating through a government which remains their instrument. The New Republic regretted the general's appointment as scap because it felt he would appease. The conservative social and economic elements in Japan which were behind this war, and would be glad to get behind another one. The nation quoted Halsey as saying that he had wanted to kick each Japanese delegate who signed the instrument of surrender in the face. It commented, not elegant. Not polite. But very exact and satisfying, and somehow reassuring. 77 MacArthur's retention of the emperor his decision to let the Japanese disarm themselves, his refusal to ban fraternization, and his threat to punish any GI who struck a Nipponese were ill received by the Filipinos, the French, and the Dutch, as well as the Australians and the British. Whitehall was also displeased because MacArthur had declared that he wanted Japan to rebuild its competitive position in world trade and had refused to ally it with the Sterling bloc. George Kennan, attacking from another quarter, expressed amazement and concern over Scap's dismantling of both the Kempeitai and the country's armed forces. He later wrote, Japan's central police establishment had been destroyed. She had no effective means of combating the communist penetration and political pressure that was already vigorously asserting itself under the occupation and could be depended upon to increase greatly if the occupation was withdrawn and American forces withdrawn. In the face of this situation the nature of the occupational policies pursued up to that time by General MacArthur's headquarters seemed on cursory examination to be such that if they had been devised for the specific purpose of rendering Japanese society vulnerable to communist political pressures and paving the way for a communist takeover, they could scarcely have been other than what they were. 78 Outside Japan, the opinions of the communists themselves were divided. After lunching with Yuri Zukov of Pravda, C. L. Sulzberger noted in his diary that Zukov thought the Supreme Commander was doing a good job in Japan, but in New York a daily worker banner read, MacArthur linked to fascists. The non-communist American left, the progressives then rallying behind Henry Wallace, regarded Scap as their natural enemy. A patrician, political five-star general, whose chief of staff thought America needed a reactionary dictatorship, was the kind of man Wallace followers loved to hate. Yet American right-wingers were by no means sure that he was in their camp. MacArthur was their once and future hero, but those who visited him returned troubled. They knew that the Pentagon wanted the United States bases maintained in Japan in perpetuity, whether the Japanese liked it or not, and they approved. The Supreme Commander, however, rejected this as colonization. And his attitude toward businessmen, American and Japanese alike, alarmed them. 79 because MacArthur wanted what one observer called an absolutely immaculate occupation, he sharply limited the profit foreign traders could take out of the country. This was one scap answer to communist charges of exploitation. Another was his breakup of the old feudal oligarchy, the Zaibatsu 
by draconian levies. Neither pleased the National Association of Manufacturers, the, the United States Chamber of Commerce, and their spokesman. Fortune attacks capitalism. The general, irate, sent it said it as a 6,000 word rebuttal, but Senator William F. Noland of California demanded a congressional investigation of SCAP's economic policies. Then Newsweek ran a story about James Lee Kaufman, an American with interests in Japan, who denounced MacArthur's emancipation of labor, purge of militarists, and dissolution of Nipponese industrial combines. The United States taxpayers were being saddled with great unnecessary costs, he charged, while recovery was delayed and the economy recklessly fractionalized. Even Sebald wondered whether the assault on the Zaibatsu wasn't vindictive, destructive, and futile. Colonel Robert R. McCormick of the Chicago Tribune flew to Tokyo and protested SCAP's socialistic economic policies. The general replied, This is not socialism. Rut it would be better to have real socialism than the socialism of the monopolies. Until then McCormick had supported MacArthur's presidential hopes. Flying home, the colonel switched to Taft.80 that should have stirred the curiosity of the United States journalists writing about the policies being made in the Daiki. Any conservative who incurred the wrath of Rutty McCormick was worth another look. Rut their lack of sympathy for the general persisted and he continued to rub them the wrong way. Although his manner with them was distant, he remained extremely attentive to what they wrote about him, and easily wounded. Sebald comments that his public quarrels with individual news correspondents became celebrated. His reaction to press attacks was painful to watch. His chief of public relations officer in Japan, Frayn Raker, testily told reporters, from now on you will get your news of the occupation from PRO press releases. Raker further affronted them by writing letters to their editors and publishers in the United States, complaining about specific stories, and, in one instance, charging that seven of them were playing the communist game. He abandoned this approach after Edward R. Murrow of the Columbia Broadcasting System, replying to a Raker grievance against William Costello, CRS's man in Tokyo, wrote, Your letter has greatly increased our confidence in Mr. Costello's work. 81 All this was unfortunate and unnecessary. Most Americans who followed developments in Nippon closely knew that the occupation was going remarkably well. The New York Times observed, Japan is the one bright spot in allied military government. General MacArthur's administration is a model of government and a boon to peace in the Far East. He has swept away an autocratic regime by a warrior god and installed in its place a democratic government presided over by a very human emperor and based on the will of the people as expressed in free elections. Returning to America after a tour of Japan, Ambassador Philip C. Jessup told the press that his visit had given him a vivid impression of the extraordinary progress which the Japanese people have made since the end of the war. General MacArthur has rendered a service of extraordinary distinction and of great historical significance. Roger Aldwin found in the general qualities that a great military career had concealed, a profound commitment to democratic liberties, an instinct for the equality of peoples, and respect for the sensitivities of the defeated Japanese and reformers' zeal. However one judges his historic role, None would deny the impressive impact he made on all by powerful human qualities, his deep dedication to whatever he undertook, his sense of justice, his high principles and his firm ideals. Edwin O'Riskea wrote, General MacArthur has been one of the great figures of the post-war world and may have accomplished more in Japan than any other man could have. Certainly none of the other leaders of occupation forces elsewhere in the world have accomplished proportionately as much. His place among the great names of history is doubly secure. 82 Riskair added, some of his qualities are less admired by Americans than by Japanese. That was perceptive. The Nipponese still believed in heroes, MacArthur's countrymen had grown distrustful of them. Another root of the difficulty was his neglect of the Tokyo press corps. Justifying his exposure to enemy fire he had repeatedly said, you can't fight them if you can't see them. 
he couldn't win the confidence of journalists unless he saw more of them than he did, and the fact that he didn't is sad, because the few who did interview him left the dikey walking on air. Frank Kelly and Cornelius Ryan wrote, he can be a very warm and human person. So much so that often the visitor wonders where he got the impression that MacArthur was aloof. Those who meet him for the first time leave his office completely hypnotized, muttering such words as genius, brilliant, great. Some of his most hardened critics have come out of his office completely converted. By his very brilliance in conversation one truly gets the impression of being in the presence of greatness. After his fall, Richard H. Rovere and Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., gently taunted those who had adored him, noting that though he had always had many admirers, the MacArthur cult had its origins after the war in Tokyo's Daiki building, where high priests conducted daily devotions and sought to make converts of visitors. Undoubtedly individuals on his staff flattered him excessively. Bowers recalls a postcard to Scap from his pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony F. Story, who was on leave in Manila, which began Dear General, I write this card to one who talks and walks with God. To Edward M. Marmont Scap was the greatest man alive, to George E. Stratmeyer, the greatest man who ever lived. Another officer told Gunter, he's too enormous, too unpredictable. I really don't understand him. No one could. 83 These were career officers whose futures depended upon MacArthur's estimation of them. Their judgments are rightly suspect. But others confirmed them. Risquet felt the general's deep sense of mission. Sebald, noting that Scap had eliminated the menace of Japanese military power, introduced the way for democratic government, and kept Nippon out of the communist orbit concluded that the achievement of these three major objectives was in large measure the result of the initiative of General MacArthur. After dining in Paris with Alfred M. Gruenther, C. L. Sulzberger wrote, Gruenther admitted that when he went out to Tokyo last summer, he had a preconceived prejudice against MacArthur, but by the time he left Tokyo, MacArthur's charm and personality had won him over. How long did he take to get you in his pocket? Al asked me. About 30 seconds. Oh, Al sneered, it was about 30 minutes for me. After Henry Luce had been received at the Daiki, life observed, Greece, Rome, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the age of Britain's greatness, all the splendid and tragic meanings of the drama of these centuries are the constant prompters of his mind and spirit. One theme runs through all such testimonials to him. He is seen as a benign, patriarchal figure whose wisdom guided the destinies of those in his charge and shielded them from malevolence. Philip Lafollette writes, There was something about him that kept reminding me of my father. Eighty-four Japanese were reminded of the Genro, or senior statesman, who had dominated their nation's politics from the promulgation of the Meiji Constitution in 1889 to the early 1930s. As men who had played a leading role in the Meiji Restoration, the overthrow of absolute feudalism, the genera became councillors to the throne and virtually ran the country by directives and discreet suggestions. MacArthur, similarly, managed Japan through the Emperor, the Cabinet, and the Diet, thus preserving the continuum of government. Legally, Nipponi's rule of Nippon never lapsed. Even at the moment of surrender on the Missouri, the people were governed by their own politicians and civil service. MacArthur had another great advantage which the Allies in Europe lacked. Soviet attempts to sabotage the occupation continued to be thwarted at every turn. In Washington an allied Far Eastern Commission settled down, in Riskaya's words, to a genteel position of pompous futility, while the Allied Council in Tokyo first became an arena for acrimonious argument and then lapsed into a moribund state. The Council, which met in a panelled second floor boardroom of the Meiji Insurance Building, just down the street from the Daiki, had been assigned a vague advisory role. MacArthur attended only one of its first meetings. As the functions of the Council will be consultative, he said pointedly, it will not divide the heavy administrative responsibility of the supreme commander as the sole executive authority for the allied powers in Japan. 
Thereafter he let it drift. Sebald represented him at its meetings. Most of them lasted less than a minute, those that ran longer dealt with the emotional issue of Soviet-held Nipponese prisoners and usually ended with the Russian delegate, Lieutenant General Kuzma Endivyanko, stalking from the room, his crimson shoulder boards, big as shingles, swinging angrily. MacArthur handled Divyanko by writing him from time to time, informing him that his views were very helpful to Scap and that the Supreme Commander was very grateful to have them. 85 Most Americans, and indeed many Scap officials, were under the impression that the Supreme Commander had been instructed to introduce democracy in Japan. Actually he had been told that it is not the responsibility of allied powers to impose upon Japan any form of government not supported by the freely expressed will of the people. But that was enough for him. Early in October 1945, after Japanese troops had been demobilized, he issued a civil liberties directive lifting all restrictions on political, civil, and religious freedom. The Kempeitai was abolished and its torture chambers destroyed. All political prisoners were released. Newspapers, including the communist Takahata, until the prospect of a general strike threatened the entire nation, were free to publish whatever they liked, provided, of course, they did not criticize SCAP. Probably it never occurred to MacArthur that they would have anything to complain about. At all events, few of them protested. Their columns were full of information which had previously been withheld from their subscribers, and the general had taken the first step toward responsible elections, an informed electorate. 86 That same week Toshihiko Higashikuni resigned the office of Prime Minister, as Hirohito's uncle, he did not want to preside over the scuttling of imperial powers, and Baron Kijuro Shidehara, a 73-year-old statesman who had opposed the war succeeded him. Shidehara crossed the moat to pay what he thought would be a courtesy call on the Supreme Commander. MacArthur handed him a list of reforms he wanted as soon as they can be assimilated. These were, woman's suffrage, encouragement of the unionization of labor, liberalization of schools to teach a system under which government becomes the servant rather than the master of the people, an end to secret inquisition and abuse by officials, an end to monopolies, a wider distribution of income, and public ownership of production and trade? The general said he assumed these steps would require sweeping constitutional reforms, and he wanted the government to get cracking on that. 2.87 Shidehara blinked, left, and appointed a committee to rewrite the Meiji constitution. The committee knew that a MacArthur wish was a command. Its chairman, Dr. Joji Matsumoto, a member of the cabinet, called on George Atchison, Jr., then the general's chief political adviser, and asked him what it should do. Atchison told them to write a few amendments, reducing imperial power and abolishing the army. Those measures were, in fact, all that MacArthur had in mind at the time. Weeks passed. Nothing happened. The general called in Whitney and said, that committee is not catching its cue. They're not moving step in and help them out. Whitney found them deadlocked. The liberals wanted radical changes, the conservatives would accept none. Since Matsumoto himself was reactionary, the conservatives had their way, and in January 1946 a draft reached the supreme commander, who later wrote that it turned out to be nothing more than a rewording of the old Meiji constitution. The power of the emperor was deleted not a whit. He simply became supreme and inviolable rather than sacred and inviolable. And instead of incorporating a Bill of Rights, the new constitution took away some of the few rights that already existed. In other words, after three months of work, the constitution was the same as always, worse, perhaps. 88 MacArthur faced a delicate situation. Rather than use fiat to dismiss the die-hard diet carried over from the Tojo regime, including such bitter enders as Matsumoto, the general had scheduled a general election for April 10, and he wanted it to be an unofficial plebiscite in which the electorate approved or disapproved a new constitution. If the Matsumoto draft went before the people, they would merely be voting for or against a carbon copy of the Meiji Charter. The plebiscite was essential 
because word had reached him that the Far Eastern Commission, reflecting allied wishes for a tougher occupation policy, frowned on constitutional reform and the re-emergence of a strong Japan. If the Nipponese endorsed a draft he liked, he could present the commission with a fetak armed plea. It was a public relations problem, though hardly cosmetic, without the legal underpinning of a national charter, he could not begin to pass his legislative program through the diet which would be chosen in April. He decided that the only way he would get the version he wanted would be to write the key sections of it himself. As it happened, he had become interested in democratic constitutions, and over the holidays he had read all then in force. Tearing off a sheet of yellow legal paper from a pad, he wrote his first memorandum on the subject, starting, four points for a constitution. By the middle of February he had what he wanted. He proudly wrote, it is undoubtedly the most liberal constitution in history, having borrowed the best from the constitutions of many countries. A Japanese scholar, while critical of the general's high-handedness in forcing it on Nippon, concluded that it was a good one, although in places its turgidly MacArthurian language was annoyingly un-Japanese and although it was loosely organized and redundant, its provisions did conform to the best standards of a truly parliamentary democracy. Many Japanese were offended by the concept of public servants traditionally, Nipponese officials were responsible only to the throne and some thought that Jeffersonian pursuit of happiness was immoral. Nevertheless its structure was sound. The emperor was reduced to a symbol. He couldn't even vote. The diet was empowered to make laws. The feudal aristocracy was abolished, popular liberties were guaranteed, the voting age was reduced from 25 to 20, collective bargaining was guaranteed, and essential equality of the sexes established. The form of government was a blend of Americas and Britons. Supreme power was vested in the Diet, and three separate branches of government were established. The Prime Minister, elected by the upper house of the bicameral legislature, would serve for four years, if defeated on an issue. He could either ask the lower house to choose a successor or call for new elections. The most striking provision was what came to be known as the No War Clause, Article 9, aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renowned swore as a sovereign right of the nation. Land, sea and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. Robert T. Ward writing in the December 1956 issue of the American Political Science Review, concluded that MacArthur himself had directed the inclusion of a prohibition against going to war in the present Japanese constitution. The general, sensitive to the charge that he rammed it down Nipponese throats and belatedly aware that the country might need to defend itself against Russia or China, later wrote that the idea had been Shidehara's and that he had agreed to it, saying, for years I have believed that war should be abolished as an outmoded means of resolving disputes. And my abhorrence reached its height with the perfection of the atom bomb. Riskea merely writes that Scap and the Japanese happily agreed to the article. In any event, in the light of what happened afterward, it is worth noting that, on the strength of the no war clause, American pacifists in the late 1940s regarded the 33rd president as a hawk and the supreme commander as a dove. The Christian Century observed in its April 17, 1946, issue, Mr. Truman is still living in a departed age which thinks only that if war comes the nation must win it. General MacArthur knows that if war comes there will be no victor. 89 The final version became known throughout Nippon as the MacArthur Constitution. The general had made the new constitution an amendment to the older Meiji one because I felt that by using this particular device we could ensure a continuity, and continuity is important in Japan. On March 6 he announced that the final draft had his full approval. The cabinet grudgingly ratified it, and so, with equal reluctance, did the hand-picked Tojo Diet. Some of them, scandalized, trembled at the thought that Hirohito might feel they had gone too far, but when Shidehara and Foreign Minister Shijo Yoshida called at the palace and fearfully laid the charter before the emperor, he told them that he supported everything in it, including the repeal of his authority. 
the text having been published in all Japanese newspapers, the people were invited to offer suggestions. MacArthur wrote, I know of no similar document that ever received so much attention and open debate, including our own constitution. That is absurd. Press criticism of it was suppressed, official radio broadcasts surged support of it. It was hardly likely that a race tightly sheathed in Shinto discipline would reject an instrument sanctioned by their own leaders and the new man behind the bamboo screen, and they didn't. In April candidates publicly committed to the new constitution received heavy majorities. 95 weeks later the Elephantine Far Eastern Commission warned MacArthur that it disapproved of the swiftness with which he was freeing defeated Japan, but by then it was too late. The people of Nippon had spoken, Scap had congratulated them. The overruling of the supreme commander by United Nations governments now would amount to reneging on allied war aims, since most provisions in the new charter had been taken from their own constitutions. So they sulked while Hirohito proclaimed a national holiday to celebrate acceptance of the document. In a ceremony before an entrance to the palatial grounds, the emperor held his own umbrella during a torrential downpour, proclaimed the constitution the law of the land, and called on his ex-subjects to defend and exercise their new rights. Newly enfranchised women wore their best kimonos to local celebrations, men pledged hot sake toasts, and the illiterate American police reporters the general scorned wrote a great deal of mumbo jumbo about temple gongs and throbbing drums echoing through the night. Few then could have guessed how well the MacArthur Constitution would stand the test of time, how, a third of a century later, it would endure, observed in every particular, how, under it, Japan would become a mighty industrial power, second only to the United States in the non-communist world. But the general had an inkling. In his memoirs he called it probably the single most important accomplishment of the occupation, for it brought to the Japanese people freedoms and privileges which they had never known. And I am certain, he added, that it would never have been accomplished had the occupation been dependent on the deliberations of the Far Eastern Commission, with the Soviet power of veto. 91 If MacArthur is to be seen in the round, the magnitude of this viceregal triumph, and those which followed it in Tokyo during the post-war years, must be grasped and understood as expressions of the very hub of his character. During his lifetime, his admirers saw only his victories, his critics saw only his defeats. What neither appreciated was that identical traits led to his winnings and his losses. His auteur, his willingness to defy his superiors, his fascination with the political process, his contempt for vacillation, these would be his undoing in the end. But along the way they reaped historic fruit. There can be no doubt that they made a great democracy of Japan. Even before the first election, Scap had been reshaping Dai Nippon at tremendous speed. Like his father in the Philippines nearly a half century before, MacArthur had quickly established habeas corpus. The infamous Soshi, the so called patriotic gangsters whose blackjacks had intimidated opponents of militarism, had been outlawed. The warlords themselves had been forbidden to enter public life. Governors of the country's 46 prefectures, who by tradition had been appointed in Tokyo, were being chosen locally. Teams of technicians were being sent out to repair trains and telephones. Public health and agricultural programs were being launched. And to a considerable extent, Russell Brines wrote, all this was being accomplished in cubby holes of the Daiki by two groups of men speaking in a sign language, each without a ghost of an idea of the other's thoughts. At first, the Allies and the government between them could muster no more than a relative handful of competent interpreters. Only a small number of the occupation force were specialists in Japanese affairs, and none who could be considered an overall expert had any position of influence. MacArthur himself, Brines said, was shadow boxing with intangibles, yet obviously determined that the occupation and all its ramifications would become his self imposed destiny the crowning event of a distinguished career. 92 The general was at his most protean in those early months of the occupation. He could be curt with Di Vianco, jovial with a visiting delegation of American businessmen, 
and elaborately polite in the Japanese way to Shidehara, all within the space of a few hours. He was covering a remarkable range of issues. In that first January of the occupation, he sent Washington a 100,000 word account of his stewardship, covering, among other things, crop yields, foreign policy, urban traffic problems, school textbooks, civil servants, the rights of prisoners, a tenfold increase in the number of magazines, and the debuts of three new Tokyo radio programs the man on the street, the woman's hour, and the voice of the people. That same month he addressed the Nipponese, a new year has come. With it, a new day dawns for Japan. No longer is the future to be settled by the few. The removal of this national enslavement means freedom for the people, but at the same time it imposes on the individual, their duty to think and act on his own initiative. The masses of Japan now have the power to govern and what is done must be done by themselves. 93 He was telling them to vote on the second Wednesday in April. Three out of four did, including 14 million women. Probably some who stayed away were bewildered by the complicated ballots. 2,781 candidates, representing 257 parties, were campaigning for the 466 seats in the Diet. MPs cruised around the voting places, partly to maintain order but also because there was concern that among the thousands of repatriates from Soviet camps there might be some brainwashed troublemakers. A number of veterans from Manchuria had indeed organized Marxist cells, but there was little block voting. When the last ballot had been counted, it was clear that the political complexion of Nippon had been transformed. Only six Tojo men had been returned. The new diet included 49 farmers, 13 physicians, 32 teachers, and 22 authors. Best of all, MacArthur said, they included 38 women. Confusion may have had something to do with that. Many women were under the impression that they could not vote for men. One prostitute, astonishingly, had polled over a quarter million votes. MacArthur sent a message of congratulation to each of the women including the whore, and then studied the electoral statistics, searching for patterns. The people had chosen 383 nominees of 33 parties and 83 independents. The big winners were the liberals, with 140 seats, the progressives, with 93, and the social democrats, with 92. Only five communists had won. The general tinge was conservative. Shigeru Yoshida formed the first of several governments which, constantly goaded by SCAP, passed 700 laws. 94 This vast body of legislation, much of it drafted on the sixth floor of the Daiki, is a far more reliable guide to MacArthur's political philosophy than his later speeches, when he delivered ritualistic peons to free enterprise at American businessmen's dinners. Like the Code Napoleon, to which it may be compared, it represented a determined effort to create rational law which derived its content from what Bonaparte called sublimated common sense and its moral justification, not in custom or divine right, but in conformity to the dictates of reason. In post-war Japan, as in Napoleonic France, hereditary nobility and class privileges were abolished. The French commander had scrapped Roman Catholic control, the American commander rejected Shinto. The purpose of the code promulgated in Paris was to effect a smooth transition from the past to the present. The same was true in Scaps Tokyo. In each case, everything from civil rights and property rights to mortgages and divorce was eventually covered by statute. Divorce was one of the first issues the new diet tackled. MacArthur Outraged to learn that a woman whose soldier husband had returned from Borneo with a native woman and two children had no legal recourse, gave priority to the elimination of sex discrimination. His strong support for the liberation of women may puzzle some, he was a male chauvinist if there ever was one, but his feelings about it were genuine, and ran deep. He was, after all, his mother's son, and in his ambivalent attitudes toward war, the anti-war side sought allies in those who suffered most from it. 
his passion for social justice was another likely motive. The general, like Franklin Roosevelt and Adlai Stevenson, was an aristocrat who believed in noblesse oblige. He was jealous of his prerogatives and implacable toward those of his own class who pitied themselves against him. But he believed that rank had responsibilities as well as privileges. A fighting commander exposed himself to enemy fire in front of his troops. A general did not allow officers to drink scotch when the men had only beer. And a gentleman did not look upon women as inferiors. To do so was, by definition, ungentlemanly. It was more, it was, he told those who disagreed with him, sacrilegious. Women, like men, had souls. Therefore they should be treated equally. 95 in Japan they had never been equal. Concubinage and family contract marriages, consigning wives to servility, had been lawful. Women had been forbidden to own property, indeed, they had had no economic, legal, or political rights at all. Girls had gone to their own schools, if there were any, after the sixth grade. Public school courses had been segregated by sex with the curriculum and texts pitched lower for girls, and there had been no colleges for women. Adultery had been licit for husbands but illicit for wives. The new diet had to face this form of sexism squarely in an early session. Under the MacArthur Constitution, the lawmakers had a choice, either both partners to an adultery were punishable, or neither was. After anguish debate, the legislators invited correspondence from their constituents. In the past, voters had never written the Diet, they had read its edicts, trembled, and obeyed. Now, in the new spirit, a blizzard of mail arrived, and after reading it the delegates abolished adultery as a crime. Contract marriage went, so did concubinage. Marriage and divorce statutes were rewritten. High schools became coeducational and 26 women's universities opened. In the provinces women were elected to public office in increasing numbers, 23 to the prefectural assemblies, 74 to city councils, and 707 to town assemblies. By the third year of the occupation a tradition had been established that every national cabinet must include a woman vice minister, and before MacArthur left Japan, two diet committees would be chaired by women. Mrs. Kanju Kato, a feminist leader, became a regular visitor to Daiki Cubby Holes. Soon 14,000 women were serving in villages as social workers, and in Tokyo, this sent a shockwave through all Asia, there were 2,000 uniformed women police officers. Girls in shorts began to compete with boys on playgrounds, MacArthur, to his great satisfaction saw them rapping out hits and chasing flies on the sandlet his Cadillac passed daily. 96 The police women, like the male cops, received instructions from MacArthur's Public Safety Division, whose teachers were led by former New York Police Commissioner Louis J. Valentine and Oscar Rolander, Michigan's Commissioner of State Police. Valentine and Olander emphasized respect for the country's new civil liberties and the tactics of controlling unruly crowds. Some labor unrest had become inevitable after 5 million Japanese workers, including 1.5 million women, had joined the 25,000 new unions. Their guides in the Daiki were James J. Killen, an American labor official, and Theodore Cohen, a former history teacher. After a brief spurt in the 1920s, collective bargaining had been suppressed in Japan. Tojo had enrolled all workmen in a nationalized company union patent after the Nazi labor front, and Killen and Cohen had to steer a tricky course between the Sila of the Zaibatsu, to whom older workmen still deferred, and the Charybdis of communism, to which some young veterans accustomed to obeying military orders were turning for discipline. 97 Early bread and butter strikes were charmingly Japanese. A chorus line went on half strike by kicking only half as high as usual, but then the Stalinists became bolder. Killen had told MacArthur that he believed unions were the best defense against Marxism, but he had added, labor in Japan must probably learn the hard way by participation in strikes, unrest, and, for a time, false leadership. When the laboring man has been sufficiently fooled by his communist leaders, he will throw them out. 
that was sound liberal theory, and the general nodded in approval. Actual violence in the streets was another matter, however, and as the Reds grew bolder he grew edgier. Not for the last time, he and they had misjudged one another. On the first May day after the war's end, thousands of them roistered through the capital. Then, exploiting a food shortage, they massed outside the imperial palace, waving red flags, and tried to cross the moat. Yoshio Kodama wrote that their cries reached into my cell through the barred windows of Shugamo prison. Kodama thought he saw the root of the problem. MacArthur had given the Communist Party legal existence and tolerated its newspaper. Kodama wrote, There is, of course, a great difference in the recognition of freedom of activity and support of these activities, but the majority of the Japanese nation had made the mistake of interpreting the freedom given to the communists as general support. As a result of this grave misconception, numerous Japanese without any critical examination of communism had supported the Communist Party and had been duped by their tactics. 98 Increasing in audacity, the Reds acquired control of several unions and, the following January, threatened a general strike unless Yoshida resigned and wages were increased threefold. The walkout was to start at midnight, February 1st. Ordinarily the Supreme Commander let his wishes be known through exquisitely worded letters to the Prime Minister, raising philosophical questions or offering gossamer hints of the course of action he would prefer. A general strike could not be approached obliquely, however. It required direct, decisive action. Even some officers in the Daiki had forgotten how firm MacArthur could be. Now he reminded them. 99 he waited until seven hours before a quarter million workers were due to leave power plants, utilities, schools, and trains, with another 1.5 million to stage sympathy strikes at dawn. Then he issued a statement, a general strike, crippling transportation and communications, would prevent the movement of food. And would stop such industry as is still functioning. The paralysis which would inevitably result, would produce dreadful consequences upon every Japanese home. Therefore, I have informed the labor leaders whose unions have federated for the purpose of conducting a general strike that I will not permit the use of so deadly a social weapon in the present impoverished and emaciated condition of Japan, and have accordingly directed them to desist from the furtherance of such action. On his instructions, Yoshida announced the immediate introduction of a bill banning strikes by public employees. The communist newspaper Akohata was censored. Literature from communist countries, and visits to them by Japanese, were sharply curtailed. It worked, there was no walkout. MacArthur later told C. L. Salzberger that the Reds had failed and have been going down ever since. Kodama agreed. The defeat of the February 1st strike proved to be a big blow to the activities of the Communist Party, he wrote, the chief reason for their loss of ground. They would have been a far greater threat if SCAP hadn't moved more quickly against the Zai Batsu. MacArthur's encouragement of labor unions had arisen in part from his determination to provide a counterpoise for capitalistic exploitation. One American businessman, offended by the Daiki's economic policies, demanded to know what possible connection they could have with the Potsdam Declaration, the bedrock on which SCAP had been built. The general's disingenuous reply was that Potsdam enjoined SCAP to destroy sources of militarism, that the planes which had bombed Pearl Harbor had been built in factories, and that he was therefore compelled to make factory owners tow his line. His rationalization for Japanese social security legislation, he proposed, in his words, to ensure the well-being of the entire nation from the cradle to the grave, was similar. Discontented employees, he reasoned, swelled the ranks of aggressive armies. Social security diminished their discontent and was thus anti-war. Truman and Dixon could have saved MacArthur, themselves, and the American people a lot of grief if they had reflected upon the skill with which their proconsul in Tokyo was finding a military justification for every political act. But in those years they approved his goals and therefore gave him a free reign. 100 Despite Willoughby's admiration of Spanish phalangists, 
The mood in MacArthur's Dyke headquarters reminded Gunter of Republican Spain in the early 1930s, before it was hijacked by the Communists and then destroyed by Franco's counter-revolution. Even the programs were the same, he wrote, an attempt to end feudalism, drastic curtailment of ancient privilege, land reform, liberation of women, extremely advanced labor legislation, education for the masses, bookmobiles out in the villages, abolition of the nobility, wide extension of social service, birth control, public health, steep taxation of the unconverted rich, discredit of the former military, and, embracing almost everything in every field, reform, reform, reform. 101 It is a pity that the nation, the New Republic, and MacArthur's other liberal critics in the United States weren't following his progress more closely. Even I. F. Stone could scarcely have improved upon the general's drive against reactionary industrialists. He suspended banks which had financed Nipponese imperialism, seized their assets, and ordered all war profits returned to the government. Then he set about smashing the great monopolies. Holding companies, subsidiary and interlocking family directorships were dissolved. The major firms were broken up into independent concerns, most of them run by their pre-war managers, whose salaries, with few exceptions, were limited to 36,000 yen, $2,400, a year, the top was 65,000 yen, $4,333, a year. Members of the 11 biggest families were required to exchange their industrial securities for non-negotiable government bonds, the value of which was reduced by deprivative taxes and the balance frozen for 10 years, to give the managers time to consolidate their positions and resist efforts by their former employers to buy them out. In addition to the huge Zaibatsu trusts, 83 other companies were broken up, and 32 of them were completely liquidated. 102 originally SCAP had planned to dismantle 1100 industrial plants and move them to allied countries, as part of a reparations program. This was being done to Germany's Schlebar own in the Ruhr, but the general abandoned the idea as senseless. Japan, on VJ Day, was faced with a stark problem of survival. MacArthur was no Keynesian. He believed in balanced budgets. But that was out of the question in 1945. He later wrote that he had never seen a more tangled financial mess than that into which the Japanese government had fallen by the end of the war. Taxes on the poor had been confiscatory, and toward the end the peasants had revolted. Tax collectors didn't dare appear in some villages. Industrial production was 16% of the pre war figure. MacArthur brought in tax experts from the United States and asked Washington for economic aid. He got a lot, $2 billion, though it is worth noting that the American zone in West Germany, with one-fifth the population of Japan, received, per capita, three times the money sent to Tokyo. Europe's press, and to some extent America's, wrote dazzling accounts of West Germany's industrial recovery what the Germans themselves called their work after wonder, their economic miracle. The greater miracle in Japan was virtually ignored. MacArthur, predictably, felt persecuted. 103 predictably, he also did the job. Under his supervision, Brigadier William Marquot established an economic and scientific section, with over 20 subdivisions, in a rickety little annex of the Daiki. Military government teams supervised the collection of rice, the production of coal, and the fishing industry. Bombed out shops were rebuilt, machinery reassembled, transportation and communications nets restored, and foreign trade revived. The general invited Joseph M. Dodge of Detroit, a former president of the American Bankers Association, to serve as a consultant to the Daiki. The result was a comprehensive plan leading to stabilization, retrenchment, and realistic budgets. With improved management, technical advice from Americans, a rapidly increasing workforce, and a high percentage of savings, Japan's commerce expanded spectacularly. In three years Japanese imports from the United States were cut in half. In five years, national income had passed the pre-war level and Japan's public debt was $2 billion, 
roughly the same as post-war New York cities. That pleased American conservatives, sustained Yoshida's moderates, and cut deeply into communist strength in the cities. 104 red flags had never appeared in the countryside, because MacArthur's land reform program, probably his greatest achievement in Japan, had eliminated the chief source of peasant discontent. He himself called it extraordinarily successful, adding, I don't think that since the Gracchi effort of land reform in the days of the Roman Empire there has been anything quite so successful of that nature. In effect, he preempted the issue which Mao Zedong, on the other side of the East China Sea, would soon ride to power. Riskea, indeed, believes that the general's objectives went far beyond those of the Chinese communists. He writes the author, the Japanese land reforms ended up with 90% or more of the land in the hands of the people farming it, while the Chinese farmers ended up working on big collective farms with little or no land of their own. It is ironic that MacArthur should be remembered by millions as a man who wanted to resolve the problem of communism on the battlefield. Actually his approach to agrarian unrest in Nippon was so radical that it shocked Americans who believed in large corporate farms. Wolf Ladajinsky, the Russian-born expert whom MacArthur employed in 1945 to draft Scap's land reform legislation, was blacklisted by many right-wing groups during the McCarthy years, and Ezra Taft Benson, Eisenhower's Secretary of Agriculture, fired him, calling him a security risk. But Ladajinsky had only followed MacArthur's instructions. 105 At the beginning of the Supreme Commander's reign, Nippon's landscape was checkered with paddies, sloping upward toward the mountainous spines of the islands and worked by peasants for whom the land was urgent, relentlessly demanding, but seldom rewarding. As late as the end of the war, MacArthur wrote, a system of virtual slavery that went back to ancient times was still in existence. Most farmers in Japan were either out and out serfs, or they worked under an arrangement through which the landowners exorbited a high percentage of each year's crops. Power resided in a rural oligarchy of some 160,000 absentee landlords, each of whom owned, on the average, 36 farms. This was feudalism in its purest sense, and the general resolved to stamp it out. In the fourth month of the occupation he told the old Diet to pass the necessary legislation. Intimidated by the threat of political purging, the delegates had rubber-stamped his other demands, but serious land reform meant a total restructuring of rural Japan's society. They themselves, most of them, belonged to the oligarchy. So they balked. The law they passed exempted 70% of the country's tenant lands. It left the peasants' shackles intact. Nearly a year passed before the first post war diet gave MacArthur and Ladajinsky what they wanted, but it was worth the wait. I am convinced, the general said of it, that these measures will finally and surely tear from the soils of the Japanese countryside the blight of feudal landlordism which had fed on the unrewarded toil of millions of Japanese farmers. The program as finally approved should be acceptable to the most liberal advocate of rural land reforms. The new act freed Nippon's farmers by what amounted to expropriation of the gentry's holdings. All land held by absentee owners was subject to compulsory sale to the government. Because the resale prices did not allow for inflation, they were absurdly low, each acre went for the equivalent of a black market carton of cigarettes. Then tenants were invited to buy at the same rate. The sum could be repaid over a 30-year period at 3.2% interest. The farms of the new owners, each of whom was required to cultivate his own land, ranged from 3 cho, 7.5 acres, on fertile Honshu to 12 cho, 30 acres, on barren Hokkaido. Altogether, 5 million acres changed hands, and when the transactions were complete, MacArthur announced that 89% of the country's farmland belonged to the people who tilled it. 106 harvests became more abundant, as might be expected, but each year there were more small Nipponese to be fed. The lack of effective contraception was one explanation for this. Another was MacArthur's public health drives. Fewer people were falling ill, more were living longer. 
The Japanese had always been an extraordinarily clean race, but they hadn't mastered modern hygiene. Murderous epidemics had swept through their islands from time to time. They accepted this as fate. Scap didn't. He created, first, a public health section in the Daiki, headed by Dr. Crawford Sams, an army physician, and then a Ministry of Health and Welfare in Yoshida's government. Sams conducted a national sanitation campaign, followed by a massive immunization and vaccination program. At the end of it, cholera had been wiped out. Tuberculosis deaths were down by 88%, diphtheria by 86%, dysentery by 86%, and typhoid by 90%. In the first two years of the occupation, Sams estimated, the control of communicable diseases alone had saved 2.1 million Japanese lives, more than the country's battle deaths during the war, over three times the number of Nipponese civilians killed in the wartime bombings, including Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The life expectancy of men had been increased by eight years and of women by nearly 14 years, a phenomenon, in Sams's words that has been unequaled in any country in the world in medical history in a comparable period of time. Thus Japan joined the family of nations whose population problem has been exacerbated by science. To those still alive because of it, however, it was a pleasant problem to have, and later it would become subject to control by the pill, its, and abortion. 107 Japanese schools taught dietary principles at MacArthur's direction and served pupils balanced meals. But that represented only a fraction of the general's educational effort. If the reform of Nippon was to last beyond the occupation, he knew, it must concentrate on the next generation. Gumbatsu indoctrination had reached into every classroom. In the entire country there had not been a single school superintendent, let alone a parent-teacher association. Everything had been controlled by a Ministry of Education in Tokyo, which had prescribed course schedules and approved all textbooks. MacArthur asked 27 leading American educators, led by Dr. George D. Stoddard, the future president of the University of Illinois, to visit classrooms and make suggestions. He appointed a Marine Corps officer, Donald Nugent, to act upon their recommendations, and he personally drafted a new education bill. The public response provided the most impressive evidence of Japan's awakening. An astonishing six million letters were mailed to delegates, urging them to support the bill, and another two million, bearing the same message, went to SCAP.108 after the Diet's passage of the liberalized education law. Nugent and his Japanese advisers approved textbooks from which militaristic propaganda had been removed, and MacArthur established academic freedom as SCAP policy, teachers and educational officials who have been dismissed, suspended, or forced to resign for liberal or anti-militaristic opinions or activities will be declared immediately eligible for reappointment. Discrimination against any student, teacher or educational official on grounds of race nationality, creed, political opinion or social position, will be prohibited. Students, teachers and educational officials will be encouraged in unrestricted discussion of issues involving political, civil and religious liberties. About all that was left of the pre-war school system was rote learning of the complicated kanji characters. MacArthur seriously considered replacing them with anglicized dramaji and then decided that the cultural jolt would be too great. As it was, Japanese parents were dismayed by the change in their children. The first perceptible shift came when a study revealed that fewer and fewer maturing Nipponese sought familial permission before marriage, they now felt free to make their own decisions. Then, eight years after VJ Day, Theodore Gay Eisel, Dr. Sue S., visited Japan and conducted a survey of pupil attitudes with the help of a hundred Japanese teachers. Children were encouraged to submit drawings of what they wanted to be when they had grown up. They received pictures of doctors, statesmen, teachers, nurses, trolley conductors, and even wrestlers, but only one had drawn a military officer. He wanted to be MacArthur. 109 Nugent's Civil Information and Education section also kept an eye on the Japanese media. 
it is too much to expect that the Supreme Commander's press policy would be wholly permissive, and in fact it was not. In the first months of the occupation a Tokyo Daily tested his tolerance by running false stories of allied atrocities during the war. Scap struck back swiftly, issuing a code for journalists, nothing should be printed which might, directly or indirectly, disturb the public tranquility. There shall be no destructive criticism of the allied forces of occupation and nothing which might invite distrust or resentment of these troops. That was reasonable then, but the trouble with inhibiting freedom of the press is that once a line has been drawn, excesses always follow. Nugent's officers, acting as censors, were erratic, slow, and often inept. Inoffensive stories were frequently spiked for days, and then heavily cut. Nipponese reporters asking for explanations were curtly told that there would be none. Eventually controls were relaxed, but by then editors were censoring themselves, when in doubt. They did not publish. Although Lola's Majest was no longer a crime, newspapers carefully refrained from running stories which might reflect on the Emperor and the Imperial Court. Controversy, in short, was carefully avoided. American correspondents felt that there was another factor here, that MacArthur's treatment of the press was being carefully watched by Japanese journalists, who concluded that the general believed authority should be treated with inordinate respect. Radio was another matter. The general took the spoken word less seriously, he thought of the airwaves as vehicles for entertainment. Before the war, Japanese broadcasts had been neither informative nor colorful. 60% of the programs had featured dull government speeches, followed by as much as 10 minutes of dead air. MacArthur established the Japan Broadcasting Corporation, modeled after the BBC. The owners of Nippon's 5 million radio sets paid a listener's tax, and no advertising was permitted. Over half the programs were devoted to soap operas and popular music, Japanese and American, but news commentators were alert and impartial. Reports of cabinet changes were on the air three minutes after they had been announced to the Diet, followed by brief biographies. Public affairs were discussed on Information Please, 20 Questions, and the National Radio Forum. In the beginning, street corner interviews with passers by were dismal. Shocked Japanese told announcers that they had no opinions on current events, and that they wouldn't divulge them to broadcasters if they did, it would be vulgar. Then they learned that Americans felt otherwise. Public opinion polls, another innovation, recorded a shift. Presently men and women on the street were ashamed to be caught without an opinion on anything. Twenty Questions was receiving a thousand letters a day from listeners commenting on the views of interviewees and offering suggestions. Some wanted to know if the United States had such programs. It did, but none was as successful as, say, the JBC Round Table on Romantic Love vs. Arranged Marriages, which involved millions of listeners and led to the setting up of receivers in public parks for those who didn't own sets. Live Theatre, which had always played a major role in shaping the opinions of the Japanese elite, was pitched at a higher level. Its producers adjusted to scap quickly. In the fifth month of his rule, MacArthur observed that the stage, which during the war had been solely a military propaganda medium, had now been given liberal themes from which new educational plays can be drawn. Most conspicuous by their absence were dramas praising Shinto virtues, though here, as elsewhere, the issue of what the defeated Nipponese were to believe in, what faiths would support them now, confronted the supreme commander with momentous questions. The answers were ambiguous because MacArthur had never resolved his own relationship with God. He believed in him. He said, The more missionaries we can bring out here and the more occupation troops we can send home, the better. Ten million Bibles were imported on his recommendation, and he credited Scap with the greatest spiritual revolution the world has ever known. A second reading, however, reveals that he was talking about the democratic concept. He had always been evangelical about that but it was scarcely a religion. Indeed, his objection to Shinto was that it was undemocratic, he didn't mention its false idols. 
He said vaguely that although I was brought up as a Christian and adhere entirely to its teachings, I have always had a sincere admiration for many of the basic principles underlying the Oriental faiths. Christianity does not differ from them as much as one would think. There is little conflict between the two, and each might well be strengthened by a better understanding of the other. 110 No serious theologian could endorse that. It was Rotarianism, Norman Vincent Peelism, a man with MacArthur's intellect should have been reasoning on the level of Reinhold Niebuhr. And his affirmations of piety might have carried greater weight had he joined the congregation. Instead he had celebrated his own secular liturgy on battlefields, and now preached it in the Daiki. The Japanese were confused. They had accepted their new ruler, but couldn't identify his creed. Therefore they adopted the United States plastic mass cult as a substitute, with jeans as cassocks, tin pan alley tunes as hymns, and the almighty yen as their graven image. American salesmen visiting ancient Japanese temples found that a small fee entitled them to a dance by shrine virgins who weaved to the sound of muted flutes and recited interminable prayers for the welfare of General Motors, or United Fruit, or Hoover vacuum cleaners. This was not godly by the canons of any faith. Yet Douglas MacArthur was no worshipper of materialism. He could pray eloquently. On the second anniversary of Hiroshima, when a bell of peace was rung at the very spot where the bomb had exploded, he asked that the agonies of that fateful day serve as a warning to all men of all races that nuclear weapons challenge the reason and the logic in the purpose of man. This, he said, is the lesson of Hiroshima. God grant that it not be ignored. MacArthur acknowledged a higher power. He was even capable of humility in its presence. But he never really came to terms with it. And that, perhaps, is why so many thought that he knelt only before mirrors. 111 The wife of the man who emancipated Japanese women took her son to Episcopalian services every Sunday. It was her sole act of independence. Occasionally she would appear in public alone to attend a party, take a trip, or cut a ribbon to celebrate the revival of the silk industry, but only at his request. Even so, she cut short a five-day tour of the countryside with two staff officers after the third day because, she said, five days is too long to be away from the general. She told a woman reporter, my whole life is the general and our son, and I take care of them as best I can. When others praised MacArthur she nodded vigorously and said, you couldn't be more right. I agree with anyone who says good things about my general. To Jean marriage was bound by a sacred chain of command. Her husband had the responsibility. He made the decisions, and she obeyed, setting an example for everyone else and stifling any qualms she might have had. 112 She had worried about flying into Atsugi with Arthur a few days after the Japanese surrender. MacArthur had been waiting for her at the bottom of the ramp. Isn't it dangerous? She had whispered as he embraced her. He had smiled and said, not at all. And, of course, he had been right, although afterward she said she wouldn't care to relive that first week. First they had stayed in the new Grand Hotel, then in a house owned by the Sun Oil Company on the bluff, a cliff overlooking the capital, where they shared quarters with Dr. Richburg, an interpreter, and the general's military secretary. Finally the Supreme Commander took his wife and son to the embassy and told them this was to be their new home. He was delighted to find a portrait of George Washington inside. Coming to attention, he snapped a stiff West Point salute and said crisply, General, it's been a long time, but we finally made it. He immediately jotted down a note to tell the Dar about the incident. It moved me more than I can say, he would write the daughters. Then he would describe, with precision, exactly how moved he had been. 113 Jean, on the other hand, felt near despair. The portrait appeared to be the only thing intact. Built fifteen years earlier and meant to impress the Japanese, the million dollar embassy, which had been christened Hoover's Folly, was a huge, white walled, earthquake proof structure, half Moorish, half pseudo colonial. There were wrought iron gates, a courtyard, a reflecting pool, a swimming pool, a consulate, 
and, in addition to the main building, the big house, the MacArthur called it, two apartment houses for staff. Once it had been stately, but each Elberger, who had been the first officer to inspect it, had warned them that a bomb had gone through the roof, that there was enough water on the floor to make a wading pool, and that the furnishings were ruined. It seemed almost beyond repair. Every room was stained and pocked with blockbuster fragments. Jean estimated that replacing the drapes in the normal way would cost at least $5,000, and rugs even more. Outside, trees and shrubs in the formal garden had been denuded, even grey rocks had been shattered. The general said cheerily, do what you can to fix it up, but she still felt overwhelmed, it looked so ponderous, so dirty, so barren. The boy, sensing her mood, tugged at her hand and asked, do we have to live here? His father put an arm around him. Brace up, Atha, he said. Your mother will take care of us. To Jean he said, we'll do simply here. There isn't time for splendor. 114 But then Jean decided to make it splendid. She felt she had no choice. If you are going to live in a monument, she thought, you must live monumentally. She began by filling empty niches with Japanese obis, colorful sashes. Curtains were improvised, using bright native materials. Nipponese workmen laid carpeting. Linens were ordered from Hawaii. Nukes and crannies held jeweled cigarette boxes, lacquered fans, and hand-beaten silver, walls were hung with paintings and delicately painted screens. A red wicker rocker the general had liked was shipped from Brisbane. A round table in front of a fireplace, Arthur's whatnot, held his toys, his wood carving set, a little silver pipe like his father's, his collection of tiny ivory figures, and another collection of porcelain animals. Japanese servants with names like Kuni-san and Kaio-san were hired and outfitted with chocolate brown kimonos bearing the great seal of the United States. One day the family's Filipino houseboy identified a newspaper picture as that of a Japanese officer who had looted MacArthur's Manila penthouse. He and Huff Jeep to Shugama prison, questioned the man, and recovered a hundred books. By Christmas the embassy was beginning to look like a home. Then Senator Homer Ferguson arrived on a fact-finding mission. Suspecting that taxpayers' dollars were being wasted, he asked slyly, who owns this magnificent palace? Sebald explained its history. Well, the senator sniffed, it still looks pretty ritzy to me. Jean didn't know whether to be indignant or proud. 115 Sid Huff and his new Australian wife, Kira, were installed in one of the apartments, Bowers. Bunker, and other aides in the rest. Jean set up household accounts and began doing the family banking. Like a monarch's wife, she reviewed parades on patriotic holidays, represented her husband as head of the Girl Scouts and Red Cross, and, occasionally, threw out the first ball at baseball games. At home, surrounded by roses, she would receive visiting dignitaries in the drawing room pouring coffee from a large silver pot and slicing slabs of cake. Many left with the impression that she had little else to do. Actually she led an extremely busy life. Each day she had to supervise six meals, three for the general and herself and three for Arthur. She spent a lot of time standing in line at the bank and the post exchange. Others, recognizing her pert figure and a little felt hat she had liberated from the embassy attic, waved her to the front, but she always insisted on waiting her turn. She wouldn't reserve items, and once, when she forgot her ID card, she went home to get it. Mrs. MacArthur, the PX manager told her, you are almost the only general's wife in Japan who has never asked for special privileges. 116 Every evening she struggled over Arthur's bath, and most days she found time for a game of Chinese checkers with Archie, who, being illiterate, had few diversions. But Jean's duty to the general always came first. Because he hated telephoning, she would make most of his morning calls. She clipped newspapers and magazines for him. He never carried money, aides would pay and Jean would reimburse them. She awakened him at the end of his afternoon siesta, 
chose the six weekly films that were shown after dinner in the drawing room, Monday through Saturday, and, every evening, sat up yawning, sometimes as late as 1 a.m., while the general paced the hundred-foot hall, thinking out loud. Her final ritual each night was to check Arthur and, literally, tuck her husband in. 117 She never adjusted to her celebrity status. Once while shopping she came upon a crowd waiting outside a building. An aisle had been left open from the doorway to the street, clearly someone important was about to emerge. Curious, she joined the throng and waited. Nothing happened. Because she was so small, smaller even than most Japanese, she was thrust to the front. There she spotted one of MacArthur's officers. She asked who they were waiting for. He didn't know but said he'd find out. Presently he returned and whispered, the people are expecting General MacArthur's wife to come out. Eyes twinkling, she went to the back of the building and came out the front, bowing as the confused spectators bowed back. 118 One of Arthur's first questions, when he heard about the Army's point system for demobilizing GIs, so many points were awarded for each month overseas so many for battles and decorations, and so on, was, do I have enough points to go home? The boy was picking up a British accent from Phyllis Gibbons, the general worried about that, but no, he was told, he didn't have enough points. We've been too close, through too many things, for any of us to go alone, Jean told Nora Wayne. I couldn't send Arthur. I couldn't go without the general. When we go, we must go together. We three are one. MacArthur told his wife that he believed his reformation of Japan would take about five years. Then, he said, he expected to tell her, it's time to mount up, Jeannie. In the meantime, his son would be allowed to grow up normally. 119 It became an article of faith among his men and members of the household staff that this was happening, that he was being raised like any child in Peoria or Dubuk. He's such a nice youngster, Jibby would say. He's very nice. He played with family pets, idolized John Wayne, was an eager Cub Scout, read Joe Paluka, and drank Coke and et B29 burgers in the PX. His mother and Archer took him to museums, parks, the zoo. On one of MacArthur's birthdays, Arthur gave his father bookends he had carved, on another, a handmade pipe rack and on a third, a tiny Japanese clay pipe from Kyoto, though he told the general, if the pipe's too small for you, I'll put it in my collection, and Scap, taking the hint, left it on Arthur's whatnot. MacArthur tried to shelter the boy from excessive publicity, permitting cameramen to approach him only when he appeared in public with his mother on ceremonial occasions. Officers in the Daiki scarcely saw him. They believed that the son of Scap was just another army brat, living much as his father had lived in the isolated frontier forts of the 1880s. Arthur MacArthur, Kenny said, is just another normal, healthy, attractive American boy. 120 He was indeed healthy, if somewhat delicate, and attractive, favoring his mother more than his father. But it was absurd to call him normal. That was impossible. His life had swung back and forth between the extremes of intense excitement and sheltered calm. At his first birthday party in Tokyo he played musical chairs with a dozen grizzled colonels and generals, twelve beribboned commanders kicking each other in the shins, struggling for seats, and, of course, making sure that the eight-year-old sergeant won the game. Similarly, he regularly trounced adults in tiddlywinks and karaoke, Hi, champ. His father would cry on returning home after such matches. What Arthur needed was to lose, and lose badly, to others his age. But there was a shortage of small boys in the diplomatic community. Once his mother was elated to hear that a new envoy had brought a little son with him. By evening she was dejected. Unfortunately, she told MacArthur, Arthur can't speak Afghanistanese, or whatever you call it. Eventually Edgeburg went home and was replaced by another army physician, Lieutenant Colonel C.C. Canada, whose boy was just Arthur's age. 
the Canada child was followed by three others, and soon Arthur had one or two house guests sleeping over every weekend. But he still spent hours playing cops and robbers with the servants, or paddling around the reflecting pool in a red, white, and blue rowboat, with Badan neatly painted on the bow. It was rather sad. 121 His mother and Jibby stood up to him. The governess insisted that he improve his spelling, which was dreadful, and she disciplined his musical talent. With her help, he composed two piano pieces. After seeing the movie The Third Man, theoretically he was only allowed to stay up for Saturday films, but he often sneaked down for others. He was given a zither. He immediately picked out the movie's theme. It was a modest achievement and deserved modest recognition. The general told his staff that he had sired a genius. When the boy painted a watercolor for his daiki office, MacArthur proudly showed it to the press. He called it better than a Rembrandt. 122 Arthur's only real peer was Crown Prince Akihito. They were introduced and photographed together, making Arthur the only MacArthur in those years to meet any member of the royal family except Hirohito. Jean was never introduced to the emperor, the empress, or their son, like Akihito, Arthur was treated with excessive deference by almost everyone. Tony Story took him to the airport, put him in the cockpit of the general's plane, and let him handle the controls. Japanese policemen saluted him. When he took up horseback riding, his mount was an imperial thoroughbred. His tennis coach was a Japanese Davis Cup winner. At Tojo's trial he was given a front seat and earphones. There was a small ceremony on the day MacArthur was made a permanent five-star general. Press photographers moved in and then were waved aside so Arthur, with a new camera, could get the first picture. 123 Sebald recalls the general as a fond, but perhaps indulgent father. There was no perhaps about it. His son broke his arm skating. It was a simple fracture, with no complications, but his father, an aide recalls, went crazy. The hospital was in a turmoil. MacArthur visited the boy's bedside three times, followed each time by an entourage of bone specialists. He demanded dozens of x-rays when one would have been enough and ruled that Arthur would never be permitted to skate again. An officer's first duty is to stay fit, he told Bowers. He recalled his own difficulties in passing the United States Military Academy physical examination and wanted no recurrence of them. There was, of course, no doubt in his mind that his son would eventually join the Long Grey Line. He wrote the Corps of Cadets, I hope that God will let me live to see the day when young Arthur MacArthur is sworn in on the plane as a pleb at West Point. 124 Arthur was the last person MacArthur saw before retiring with Jean and the first to greet him each morning. At 7 a.m. the boy would rush into the general's bedroom and pummel him. Simultaneously, a Japanese servant would open a door and hiss a signal to four dogs sitting expectantly in a row at the foot of the hill behind the big house, Blackie, a Cocker, Yuki, a White Akita, Brownie, a Shiba Terrier, and Coco, the Huff Spaniel. Barking joyously, the four pets would race up and into the bedroom, where the supreme commander, his son, and the dogs would chase each other about, MacArthur shouting exultantly, Arthur shrieking, and the spaniels and terriers yelping and wagging their tails in frenzy. 125 Another servant would place four small dishes of egg and milk on the dining room floor, near the breakfast table. After the dogs had licked them clean they would gather around the general's table. Slipping into his old grey West Point bathrobe with the black over the heart, he would feed them scraps while he ate his most substantial meal of the day, fruit, cereal, eggs, toast, and coffee without cream but with plenty of sugar. Jean sat at the other end of the table, sipping coffee and chatting, Arthur watched his father adoringly and the dogs patiently awaited the next part of the morning rites, MacArthur's shave. He and Arthur sang their duets while his straight razor whipped back and forth. Then came the general's calisthenics. He never golfed, fished, hunted, cycled, jogged, or even used the embassy's swimming pool, but these setting up exercises were vigorous workouts. 
the dogs knew which was the last one, and they bounded up to nuzzle him when he had finished it. Yuki was Arthur's favorite, he liked to dress her up in outlandish costumes and tie hats on her head, but his father preferred Blackie. The other three pets left while he dressed, but Blackie was permitted to stay and watch. One morning Jean walked in and found him in an upholstered chair. Oh, General. She said disapprovingly. Look at Blackie ruining that chair. I simply will not let the dogs sit on my chairs. MacArthur replied firmly, Jeannie, that is my chair and Blackie can get into it any time he wants to. At eight o'clock the family gathered for prayers, the general's substitute for formal church attendance. Jibby read the service from the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, and MacArthur followed with a short passage from the Bible. At 8.30 Jibby rang a large brass school bell relentlessly until Arthur joined her for his first lesson of the day. Meanwhile the general had begun scanning dispatches, telling Jean which calls he wanted her to make and grumblingly placing a few himself when instant decisions were needed. Two or three times a week he told her, before leaving for the office, to expect luncheon guests. He disliked entertaining, it usually meant he would miss his siesta, but as he told Bowers, it can't be helped. Now that the war's over, every Tom, Dick and his cat's coming over. I don't want to fuss. Can't have them hoping for a visit and then leaving saying I wouldn't see them. The visitors would begin to arrive shortly before two o'clock. Jean, Huff, and sometimes Bowers would greet them in the huge drawing room. Often she was the only woman at the noon meal, and sometimes the only civilian because Scap had ruled that military officers took precedence over diplomats, many nations' representatives in Tokyo were generals and admirals. Those expecting cocktails were disappointed. If they hinted that they were thirsty, Jean would turn to Bowers and say vaguely, We have a little sherry, I believe, don't we, Major? Moving quickly among them, she would deftly elicit from each why he was here and what he wanted. After a half hour's wait, the Cadillac would purr up the drive. The general is coming. She would say breathlessly, and then, as he entered the room, she would sing out, Why, it's the general. Hi, general. Ignoring the others, he would stride quickly to her, kiss her, and then pivot toward his visitors. Having welcomed all, he would turn toward the dining room, beckon the guest of honor to his side, and rumble, You must be hungry. I know I am. 126 he wasn't at all hungry. His noon and evening meals were identical and frugal, soup, salad, and coffee. But valuing his time, he wanted to get through lunch and back to his desk. He was always quietly amused at the polite jockeying for position as the visitors approached the table. Sebald recalls that Scap's residence was the only establishment of the occupation which lacked protocol. MacArthur Protocol, as the general called it, meant that he sat at one end of the table and Jean at the other, with everyone else except the guest of honor, at his right, left to fend for themselves. Often this meant that senior officials would end up in the middle, with more vigorous juniors close to the supreme commander. It didn't matter. Jean would catch Scap's sigh and adroitly mention that so and so wanted to talk to him about such and such. He would break off whatever he was saying, explaining with heavy humor, any husband will tell you that the wife really rules the family. In this fashion everyone had a word with the host. 127 over coffee he would dominate conversation in his euphonious way, analyzing the world situation and predicting what the future would bring. Then he and Jean would rise together. Often he would let her escort the guests out while he slipped away through another door. This offended some. They thought he felt himself too important for conviviality. Few suspected that this Olympian figure was painfully shy in intimate social situations, wretched in the easy give and take of idle conversation, jollity, and good fellowship. He vastly preferred his quiet luncheons with his wife listening for the 3 p.m. news over a portable radio on the table, and then lying down for his hour of rest. He could hold listeners spellbound with his visions for Japan, but the kind of verbal fencing at which Franklin Roosevelt excelled, 
the art that all great politicians must master, was beyond MacArthur. His definition of a good meal was a quick meal. Jean had his supper on the table when he reached home, and within twenty minutes he would rise from it and enter the pantry outside the dining room, where a hole had been cut through the wall and a large motion picture screen erected. There, sitting in his red rocker, he would subject a cigar to its ritualistic circumcision, light up, and puff happily away. During the show Jean sat on his left, half on his right. About fifty folding chairs would be set up, because all staff officers, servants, and even the embassies on a guard had standing invitations to attend. Though most enlisted men continued to mock his lordly air, his stock was high with those who saw him every day. The big house sentries had chipped in to give him an ashtray table, which stood beside the rocker, and an English tweed jacket, which on cool evenings he would slip on before the lights were dimmed for the short subjects. MacArthur watching a newsreel, according to Norman Thompson, his projectionist of those Tokyo years, was a spectacle in itself. If an army-navy game was shown, he would cheer the Black Knights hoarsely, even though he had known the final score for weeks. Joseph Stalin on the screen would bring him to the edge of the rocker, tense with concentration, watching Stalin's every gesture. Scenes of natural disasters would evoke muttered stratagems for outflanking the elements, cutting off their ear, mopping them up. 128 He liked light comedies, musicals, westerns, any action film, in fact, particularly if Arthur was there to share it with him. On Sundays, when there were no movies, he sprawled on a divan in the big house's small library, his smoking corn cob jutting up like a listing periscope. All his life he had enjoyed reading books, particularly history, before bedtime. Now he preferred talking to Jean and listening to phonograph records. Bing Crosby was his favorite crooner. One evening she put on a new Crosby hit, Now is the Hour, and asked him if he could identify it. Of course I can, he said. It's an old Maori song. Humming, he would ascend the stairs and, like Roosevelt, fall asleep the instant his head touched the pillow. That, he told a friend, was one of the three reasons for his superb physical condition. The other two were abstemiousness, he never drank more than an occasional glass of wine during his Japanese years and his naps. 129 A journalist asked Dr. Canada if the general was a good patient. I don't know, the physician replied. He's never sick. There was, Martin Sommers reported in the Saturday Evening Post, not a line on his face. George Greel of Colliers wrote, I first met him in 1917 when he was a young major. He oozed energy, ability and ambition from every pore. Meeting him here in Tokyo 31 years later, it amazed me to see how few changes had been wrought by time. Still arrow straight, and with the same flash of eye and aquilinity of features, he justified what I had been told by his personal physician. Few members of his staff, even though many years his junior, can match his physical endurance. So remarkable was his youthful appearance that gossips claimed he wore rouge. He himself said jocularly to Sebald, Bill, I feel like a one-horse shay. I am the only one on active service from the military academy prior to the class of 1909. 130 An artist commissioned to paint his portrait confided to an acquaintance, of course, MacArthur has never known what to do with his hands. It is impossible to paint them because they are never still. That is why he usually stands with his hands behind his back or otherwise contrives to hide them. This restless energy, pent up all the more because he denied himself every pleasure outside the home, continued to fuel Japan's progress year after successful year. Still alert, still ascetic, the general gradually changed from a vigorous advocate of reform to the defender of the transformations he had wrought. Like his old trench coat, which grew dirtier and dirtier as the end of the 1940s approached, and his celebrated, oil-soaked cap, which he finally, and reluctantly, allowed Huff to recover with part of an old uniform, the general had become a Nipponese institution. Clearly the Japanese wanted him to remain, equally clearly, he intended to stay. 
At his direction, fifteen trunks had been filled with documents against the day he wrote his memoirs, but he never even opened them. Remington Rand invited him to serve as chairman of its board if and when he retired. He casually acknowledged the proposal, it was, he said, a big if and a bigger when. Orientalists began to believe that Douglas MacArthur was destined to grow to a great old age in Tokyo and die among the conquered Nipponese. There appeared to be only two forces which might alter that future. The first was the possibility, which seemed remote, of a new war in Asia. The second was his undiminished ambition to become President of the United States. 131 In the summer of 1946, George Kenney, reading of the tremendous homecoming parades New York had been staging for other victorious the United States generals, speculated aloud on the number of tons of ticker tape the city would dump on MacArthur. The general smiled and shook his head. He said he had no intention of returning to Manhattan. When he did fly home, he told Kenny, I expect to settle down in Milwaukee, and on the way to the house I'm going to stop at a furniture store and buy the biggest red rocker in the shop. I'll set it up on the porch and alongside it put a good sized pile of stones. Then I'll rock. Kenny asked, what are the stones for? The general's smile broadened. He replied, to throw at anyone who comes around talking politics. 132 He might have begun by stoning himself. Like most Americans, he assumed that Harry Truman would lose in 1948, and that the Republican nominee, whoever he was, would become president. In 1944 he had been demure. Now he put coyness aside. In uniform, and situated 5,000 miles from the White House, he couldn't seek the office openly, but as early as the autumn of 1947 he let visitors from the United States know that he was engrossed in the coming race. On October 6 Forrestal noted in his diary that Eisenhower had returned from Tokyo to tell the president that he must face the prospect of MacArthur's returning here in the spring to launch a campaign for himself, while Scapp had sent word from the Daiki warning the president that Eisenhower would be a candidate for the presidency. 133 The following month, Joseph Choate, a Los Angeles lawyer, wrote the general, urging him to run. MacArthur didn't say yes and he didn't say no. He replied, the need is not in the concentration of greater power in the hands of the state, but in the reservation of much more power in the people as intended by constitutional mandate, more leadership and less direction. Choate thought that sounded like a grand old party rallying cry and it did. He read it to a Milwaukee meeting of MacArthur for president delegates from 16 states, and they voted to enter a slate of delegates in Wisconsin's April primary. The New York Times commented, there can be no doubt that his candidacy would command wide support in a national election. Colonel Mee Cormack was still appalled by the general's socialization of Japan, but William Randolph Hearst hailed him as a world statesman we must draft General MacArthur for the presidency. Beyond any rivalry and any partisanship, Douglas MacArthur is the man of the hour. 134 In his memoirs the general writes, I was not a candidate and declined to campaign for the office. It was a great mistake on my part not to have been more positive in refusing to enter into the picture. The fact is that he was a candidate and very eager to enter that picture. In Sidney Elmire's words, a military strategist without parallel, a modernizing reformer of great stature, MacArthur now sought to establish himself as a major political thinker. It was a folly which was to lead to disaster. The road to the debacle began in February 1948, when it became clear that the struggle for the Republican nomination would be determined in 10 or 12 states, mostly in the Middle West, where the general was strongest. Now, if ever, he must make his move. On March 9 he buzzed for Whitney and handed him this statement, scrawled in pencil on a yellow pad, I have been informed that petitions have been in Madison signed by many of my fellow citizens of Wisconsin, presenting my name to the electorate for consideration at the primary on April 6. No man could fail to be profoundly stirred by such a public movement. I can say, and with due humility, 
that I would be recreant to all my concepts of good citizenship were I to shrink because of the hazards and responsibilities involved from accepting any public duty to which I might be called by the American people. 135 Tokyo's newspapers ran one page extras, Nipponese shopkeepers hung we Japanese want MacArthur for president signs in their windows, and Japanese wore MacArthur pins in their labels. Japanese editorial writers, who in this case probably reflected accurately the feeling of nearly all their readers, the New Yorker observed, hailed the MacArthur announcement with a mixture of approval and regret. Typically, the Tokyo Mainichi declared, we would, of course, be gratified if General MacArthur were elected president, as it would mean that we would have the United States president who would fully understand us. This benefit would offset our loss of the great general. Japan's leading financial paper, Nihon Kiaisai, predicted widespread disappointment among the Nipponese should MacArthur leave the country, but after expressing its profound confidence in him and the sincere thanks of the people for everything he had done, and observing that probably Scap feels toward the Japanese not so differently from the way he feels toward his own countrymen, the leader concluded that its readers should be willing to share him with the United States, since he is not an individual the Japanese should monopolize but a character of world importance. Tokyo's Minpo reported that Taft and Vandenberg are rapidly fading out of the picture, and Daiki commented that it was regrettable that the 80 million Japanese people do not have the right to vote. 136 But Taft and Vandenberg, and Thomas E. Dewey, were not fading rapidly, and American voters were not at all sure that they wanted President MacArthur at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, no doubt about it, time noted, in the first week the boos were larger than the cheers. A grand old party poll reported that Dewey's strength among Republicans was triple MacArthur's, and that Stassen, Taft, and Vandenberg had more support than the general. William Z. Foster, the communist leader, attacked Scap, which helped. Hearst's endorsement, on the other hand, hurt his chances. The Los Angeles Examiner wickedly predicted that MacArthur will wade ashore at San Simeon when he comes home, and the script's Howard Pittsburgh Press observed, it looks as if General MacArthur has been booby-trapped. Some weird things have been happening already in the campaign but nobody else has suffered so extreme a handicap as that of becoming the Hearst candidate. MacArthur's first wife, now on her fourth husband, told a reporter, if he's a dark horse, he's in the last round-up. 137U.S. News and World Report observed that MacArthur sentiment is rising in Wisconsin and Illinois. Nevertheless Arthur Crock noted a growing feeling, even among his supporters, that if he meant to be an active candidate he should resign his commission and come home. The Pentagon prohibited political involvement by serving officers, and the general's position was becoming increasingly difficult. He didn't help it by his treatment of reports that veterans against MacArthur clubs had been formed in a dozen large American cities. He took the news hard, and barred any mention of it in Stars and Stripes or over Tokyo's Armed Forces Radio explaining that it was controversial. Washington heard about it and sent him a rocket. Embarrassed, he lifted the band. 138 Japanese support MacArthur's presidential aspirations, 1948 another such Japanese sign it was ironic that many members of the old isolationist movement, the conservatives who represented his natural constituency, spurned him because he had become a symbol of America's global presence. As former chairman of the America First Committee, his old friend Robert E. Wood of Sears, Roebuck could have helped him here, but Wood, fearful of damaging the general with moderate and liberal Republicans, remained silent. The Sears chairman did solicit support from friends in Wisconsin, however. That would be a key primary, and insofar as MacArthur had a home state, Wisconsin was it. The most telling blows against him there were being delivered by Senator Joseph R. McCarthy, a Stassen backer. Philip LaFollette was hiring his own radio time to court votes for the general in the state, but McCarthy, though still obscure, was beginning to display his unique gifts as a gutter fighter. He accused MacArthur of railroading Billy Mitchell, 
dredged up details of his divorce, hinted broadly that he was a homosexual, and charged that the general was Stalin's candidate. 139 MacArthur victory due in Wisconsin, a New York Times headline guest on March 29. It was wrong. The general won only eight delegates to Stassen's 19. The following morning, when Sebald arrived on the Dyke's sixth floor for a conference, Paul J. Miller, then SCAP's chief of staff, held up a warning hand. The general is as low as a rug and very disappointed, Mueller said. He wouldn't quit, though. Two days later he cabled the president of the Nebraska MacArthur for president organization that he was definitely still in the race. He ran fifth in the Nebraska primary, and that was the end of it, he asked that his name be withdrawn. Senators Kenneth Werry and Stiles Bridges wanted him to come home in May and testify before the Senate Appropriations Committee, reasoning that he would receive a hero's welcome and thus raise his profile. MacArthur refused. It would be beneath him, he said, and he was right. 140 probably he would have made a poor president. His introversion, his aloofness, and his contempt for the science of the second best would have crippled his administration. Moreover, his choice of subordinates, the officers who had been arguing that march over who would have which cabinet post, was not reassuring. Yet he deserved more from the Republicans than a deliberate show of disrespect, which was what he got at their national convention that June. Millions of slips supporting him, clipped from Hearst papers, had been mailed to the delegates in Philadelphia. Philadelphia Inquirer newsboys had been hired, at five dollars each, to distribute MacArthur for President leaflets during the demonstration for him, and Jonathan Wainwright, still weak from his imprisonment, was waiting in a hotel room to deliver a nominating speech. The managers of the convention delayed the speech and the demonstration until 3.40 a.m., when all the newsboys had gone home and Wainwright faced an empty auditorium. MacArthur received 11 votes on the first ballot and 7 on the second. On the third ballot Dewey was chosen unanimously. The next day Whitney told a friend that he had never seen the general look so disappointed. It is impossible to tell which stung more. His poor showing or Wainwright's mortification. 141 Manuel Roxas, MacArthur's protege in Manila, had been luckier. Defeating O's Mena in a close race. Roxas became the first president of the Republic of the Philippines and, as expected, amnestied colleagues accused of wartime treachery. Collaboration had been the chief issue in the election. Osmena had asked the Commonwealth's Congress to establish a people's court which would try the accused, but Roxas had argued that re-arresting those who had been freed in 1945 would put them in double jeopardy. In a series of brilliant parliamentary maneuvers, he had forced those men to grant bail, assuring his own continued control of a legislative majority until he could take office and grant blanket pardons. MacArthur had done Roxas several good turns during the campaign, permitting him to exploit their friendship, tacitly approving his split of the Nationalist Party, and declining to lend SCAP's legal staff and counterintelligence files to the prosecutors of collaborationists. Harold Ix unwittingly hurt Osmena by threatening to cut off relief funds for the stricken islands unless the guilty were convicted and punished. This was resented in the islands, many thought it made Osmena look like a stooge for the Americans. Others thought him a dupe of the Hucks, now threatening reprisals against the Philippine establishment unless the new government introduced radical reforms. Frightened by the prospect of renewed bloodshed, Middle-class Filipinos stomached their disdain for the wartime turncoats and rallied behind Roxas, who promised to enforce law and order and respect the sanctity of private property. 142 Once the votes had been counted, the new president decided to fly to the United States. He asked Paul McNutt, back in the Philippines for his second tour as High Commissioner, to accompany him, and when their plane refueled at Atsugi, MacArthur was there to greet them. The general told the press, Roxas is no collaborationist. I have known him intimately for a quarter of a century and his views have been consistently anti-Japanese. The recent election, which selected Roxas for the presidency, 
reflected the repudiation by the Filipino people of irresponsible charges of collaboration made in foreign countries by those who lack an adequate knowledge of the circumstances. So much for X. Then McNaught, speaking to the National Press Club in Washington, said, General MacArthur, under whose orders Roxa served during the war, has vouched for his military record. The New York Times took note of the clean bill of health given Roxas by the late President Gerson and by General MacArthur. 143 David Bernstein, a nose men a partisan, writes bitterly, the whitewash had succeeded. The French executed Laval, while the Filipinos elected Roxas as president. The analogy is inexact and unfair but Bernstein is on firm ground in contending that MacArthur had determined the future course of Philippine politics. By the morning of July 4, 1946, when Manila sirens screamed, church bells sounded, and the American flag was lowered over Dewey Boulevard for the last time, the domestic policies of the emerging nation had already been determined by leaders whom the general had endorsed. He was the idol of the crowds that day but his cheerers might have been less enthusiastic had they known what lay ahead. In vouching for the new president, he had absolved the whole oligarchy of upper-class politicians, Roxas, who died two years later, would be succeeded by another oligarchist, El Pidio Quirino, and the new leader of the Nationalist Party would be Jose Laurel, the wartime leader of the Japanese puppet state. In effect, MacArthur, with the full approval of McNutt and Truman, was supporting the Manila elite as a counterpoise to Filipino Marxists. This outcome was a dark mirror image of his bright record in Japan. 144 The Hucks opened a seven year insurgency which was ultimately suppressed with American military assistance. At one point, they were fighting in the suburbs of Manila, armed escorts were needed to transport government officials from the capital to Clark Field. A the United States mission led by Daniel W. Bell. A Washington banker, reported that the rebels' grievances were valid, that the Roxas Quirino administrations were squandering resources through graft, poor planning, and ineptitude. Bell found that the Filipinos had been better off before Pearl Harbor, yet while the standard of living of the mass of people has not reached the pre-war level, the profits of businessmen and the income of large landowners have risen very considerably. 145 support of these oppressors by the United States makes no sense unless it is seen against the backdrop of the United States post-war foreign policy. On Independence Day in Manila, MacArthur had slapped Romulo on the back and said, Carlos, America buried imperialism here today. It had done nothing of the sort. Even as the stars and stripes slid down Philippine flagpoles, the United States was embarking on a new wave of expansionism. The Manila Washington Pact provided for 99 year American leases on military bases in the archipelago, part of a global net designed to contain, or encircle, communism. The Pentagon wanted MacArthur's cooperation in fashioning the Asian links of this chain. Naturally, he needed no persuasion, he loathed Soviet aggrandizement as much as, though no more than, Truman. Later the general and the president would disagree over whether policy should be made in the Daiki or the White House, and over the value of airfields on Formosa, but their goals were identical. 146 In those early post-war years MacArthur saw Russia in 19th century terms, inspired less by Marxist idealism than by Slav imperialism under the guise of working class solidarity. He liked to talk about their Muscovite bulging his muscles and lusting for power or the menace of imperialist mongoloid pan-slavism. He told Salzburger that the Soviets, in their few days of war against Japan, had achieved what had eluded the Tsars for a century, total control over a large part of Korea. Therefore, he reasoned, I think it is foolish to assume that the Russian would start an aggressive war now. He is doing so well under the present no shooting war that he would probably and logically wish to continue the present successful system. Scap pointed out that although Stalin had 750,000 troops in the Far East, this army had to be supplied by a single railroad, had no amphibious capability, and lacked bases east of Lake Baikal. He argued, the Soviet is a patient man. 
he thinks in terms of decades or centuries. He is not an Occidental but an Oriental. He is white, he is partially located in Europe, he has our gregarious instincts. But at heart he is a Tatar. He is like Genghis Khan. It is an Oriental trait to be patient. 147 The General's Chief Miscalculation, shared by every other major Western strategist, lay in his failure to anticipate client wars. Russian logistics were irrelevant if their fighting was to be done by surrogates, Koreans, Chinese, Vietnamese. Otherwise MacArthur understood the communists and addressed them in language they understood. Tokyo was an eye in the Cold War hurricane, and from time to time Divyanko or another Soviet leader would accuse the supreme commander of anti-democratic measures which threatened a revival of the old fascist order in Japan. That was the kind of meat on which this Caesar fed. He called them moth-eaten charges which had been dusted off to act as a smoke screen, unadulterated waddle representing a callousness of hypocrisy I cannot fail to denounce and an outrageous evasion of the searchlight of public scrutiny. A Soviet letter of complaint to him which was released to the press before its arrival in the Daiki was a provocative impertinence. Another drew the reply, I have received your note and have carefully considered its context in vain search of some semblance of merit and validity. Rarely indeed have I perused such a conglomeration of misstatement, misrepresentation, and prevarication of fact. He was shocked by its blatant, gruesome, wicked, malicious, and egregious distortions, and said so in overripe metaphors. One has the impression that both sides enjoyed these exchanges. They released immense voltage, stimulated the participants, and harmed no one. 148 They were largely irrelevant to SCAP policies, of course, and the Supreme Commander knew it. In conversations with subordinates and visitors, he was matter of fact, even understated, on the communist issue in Nippon. He knew that Stalin had once said, With Japan, we are invincible, believed it to be true but dismissed the possibility of Russia's achieving it as an impossible Kremlin dream. To Salzburger he said, I don't think that more than one or perhaps two percent of the, Japanese, population can be called communist, and he told G. Ward Price, a British journalist, that he doubted those few had any direct link with Moscow. He said to another correspondent, I think practically all Japanese have a fear and hatred of the Russians. Everything emanating from Russia is detested. The fact that communism comes from there makes it impossible to introduce in Japan. I haven't the slightest fear of any internal trouble with the Japanese communists but one must realize that external pressures are increasing. 149 That was the rub. Japan did not exist in a vacuum. Its people affected, and in turn were affected by, events elsewhere, particularly in the Far East. Once its recovery had begun, once the hungry had been fed and the homeless housed, the shifting geopolitical kaleidoscope overseas became a factor in the daily reckonings of its prime minister, its cabinet, its diet, and its supreme commander. MacArthur's priorities were subtly altered. In the beginning he had been preoccupied with eliminating Nippon's capacity for aggression. By the time he had finished the rebuilding of the country, he was weighing its role in the family of nations, particularly in that branch of the family then known as the free world. Now he was less concerned with protecting Japan's neighbors from Japan, more concerned with shielding Japan from them. Nippon, even more than the Philippines, was an invaluable military base. MacArthur would have been a poor general if he hadn't seen it in that light. But he saw it in another light, too. In the Philippines he had been guided by the dead hand of the past, the Filipinos, his father's, his own, and the pre-war agreements which paved the way for the 99-year leases. Japan was a clean slate, and the messages he wrote on it in the Daiki were very different. One was fundamental, Dai Nippon was a sovereign power, and Tokyo must be permitted to negotiate with Washington as an equal. The difficulty here was Japan's vulnerability to an enemy attack. By 1947 it was clear that the no-war article in the MacArthur Constitution, hardly a year old, was already obsolete. 
MacArthur now foresaw the need for a national security force, or Jayatai, to cope with subversion and public disorder. The Jayatai's initial strength would be 75,000. Later it would grow to 100,000, and its officers would be recruited from veterans of the old Imperial Army. But this was too slight a to force to repel a full scale assault from the Asian mainland. Should that come, it would have to be met by American troops, American ships, American planes. 150 The Pentagon, accepting this responsibility, opposed an early peace treaty between the United States and Japan on the ground that only an army of occupation could guarantee Nippon's defense. MacArthur thought that absurd, he believed, Sebald writes that United States forces could be retained in Japan through a voluntary agreement with the Japanese government. The Joint Chiefs wouldn't budge, so the General, for neither the first time nor the last, resorted to a dangerous stratagem, manipulation of the press. Twice Scap had been invited to lunch at the Tokyo Correspondents Club, twice he had refused. At noon on March 17, 1947, he entered unannounced, took a chair, and said he was prepared to talk for the record. Some newsmen were taken so unawares that they lacked paper and pencils. While the others fumbled hastily, MacArthur told them that he divided the occupation tasks into three phases, demobilization of the Nipponese, political reform, and economic revival. The first was complete and the second was approaching completion. As for the third, he declared continued scap interference would only bring economic strangulation. Then he went to the heart of the matter. He said, the time is now approaching when we must talk peace with Japan. When, one man inquired, might a treaty be negotiated? He replied, I will say as soon as possible. Afterward, William Costello reported in the New Republic, MacArthur laughed heartily when asked to name his favorite song. He said unhesitatingly, you can say my favorite tune is home, sweet home. 151 According to Sebald, the general's highly articulate and well-prepared comments on a peace treaty were astounding. I doubt if any correspondent had spent any time, up to that point, in exploring a peace treaty, amid the other chores of keeping abreast of the fast-moving occupation. MacArthur's gesture succeeded, however in implanting the subject so firmly that speculative stories on the piece were not unusual thereafter. I have no doubt that this was his major purpose. With the Washington press corps clamoring for comment, the Truman administration could not ignore the issue, though it might as well have done so. Its first draft treaty, Sebald recalls, was based upon the then prevailing concept that resurgent Japanese militarism was Asia's greatest menace and, to prevent it, Japan must remain indefinitely under Allied control. This was, in general, a draconian approach which would have perpetuated the bitterness of World War II. To my mind, the draft was unworkable and self-defeating and made the approach to peace retaliatory. It was the Treaty of Versailles all over again, and this indicated that we had learned little from the experience of the previous 27 years. The draft was not made public of course, but it served as an explicit example of the psychology then prevailing in Washington and in the capitals of most nations which had suffered from Japanese aggression. 152 The Joint Chiefs voted to continue the occupation indefinitely. MacArthur, for his part, was content to let his proposal ferment in the olipore drider of world opinion. He had not changed his mind. However, and after Truman's surprise victory over Dewey he began corresponding with political figures who shared his view of Weltpolitik. Some of them, like John Foster Dulles, another advocate of a quick treaty with Japan, were eminent. Others were less respectable. He wrote with alarming candor to right-wing Republicans who had backed him in Wisconsin and Nebraska, speculating, for example, on how many hisses are there in the State Department and regretting the absence of a sound the United States foreign policy. William Noland and Senator H. Alexander Smith of New Jersey received a scap opinion that Formosa was vital to the United States defense, thereby drawing fire from Walter Lippmann, who observed that soldiers had no right to conduct a public agitation, 
using the press and politicians as their mouthpiece, to challenge and discredit the policies of their government. Can't a general speak to a senator, even in confidence? Asked an editorial headline in the Republican Saturday Evening Post, even more unpropitious, MacArthur was in touch with Joe Martin, now minority leader of the House of Representatives. This was one of the Supreme Commander's more unfortunate correspondences. Martin had led the pre-war fight which had rejected legislation to fortify Guam and Wake, arming them, he had said, might provoke the Japanese, and he had voted against providing Americans with programs which SCAP was giving the Nipponese, including the right to collective bargaining, public housing, and a social security base for medical aid for the elderly. But he distrusted the Truman administration, and that, apparently, was enough for MacArthur. Later it would be the general's undoing. 153 with the Japanese no longer his enemies, it was perhaps inevitable that his need for foes in Washington would grow. Some were old adversaries, like the stoic George Marshall, some, like the elegant Aikson, were new. Much of the time the bland Eisenhower's name was at the top of his list. As Ike grew in stature across the sea, in the dike his stock dwindled. The Supreme Commander later wrote virtuously of him, I have always felt for him something akin to the affection of an older man for a younger brother. In fact it was more like the feeling Cain had for Abel. That anyone should surpass MacArthur was bad enough, that the surpasser should be a former subordinate was almost unendurable. Scap thought the point system preposterous, troops should have been sent home by units, he thought, and he blamed it on Eisenhower. As Chief of Staff, Ike visited Japan. His reception in the Daiki was tepid. Later MacArthur said of him, he came out and told the soldiers he would get them home to mother, and they gave him, three cheers and a tiger. Hip, hip, hooray. So our army dissolved. 154 decimated divisions, sinking morale, the general wondered whether he could, if pressed, throw an invader back into the sea. To top it all, he had to train one chief of staff after another. Sutherland, sent home for reasons of health, had no fewer than five successors. Increasingly the general leaned on Whitney. Everyone then in the dike seems to have agreed that Whitney was a deplorable influence, and two men, McNutt and Dick Marshall, told Scapso. MacArthur's response to each was identical, I know. Don't tell me. He's a son of a bitch. But, by God, he's my son of a bitch. That was tart but unconvincing. Surely he could have found a better officer, equally loyal. Whitney was just the man to encourage his letters to men like Nolan and Martin, to whisper rumors about other hisses in Washington, to put in a friendly word for Oaxes and call the Hucks Bolsheviks, and, on top of that, to fuel the general's hostility toward Washington officials especially Aikson and Secretary of Defense Louis Johnson. 155 MacArthur and Eisenhower in Japan, May 1946 Johnson was Truman's son of a bitch, a rumpled, bumbling, Democratic Joe Martin who Aikson thought was afflicted with a brain malady. By 1949 he had become the worst stumbling block to a U.S. Japanese treaty. He and Omar Wren Bradley flew to Tokyo to argue that such a pact would be premature. Aikson, who agreed with MacArthur, noted with satisfaction. The oracle gave his military colleagues small comfort. The general said he thought the United States should ignore its foot-dragging allies, sign a covenant with Japan, and support its application for membership in the United Nations. In a memorandum to Johnson, he wrote, the Japanese have faithfully fulfilled the obligations they assumed under the instrument of surrender and have every moral and legal right to the restoration of peace. The non-communist powers should guarantee Nippon's borders and respect its right to abstain from war, he continued, failure to do so would be a foul blemish upon modern civilization. The United States should not be deterred from moving invincibly forward. We should proceed to call a peace conference at once. In a characteristic touch, he told Sebald that he would not refuse an invitation to act as its chairman. Although Johnson and Bradley were unconvinced, 
The tide of opinion in Washington was moving against them as the decade ended. MacArthur by then was wholly preoccupied with the pact, he told J. P. McAvoy that it was long, long overdue and with thoughts of the future's judgment of him, historians a thousand years from now may give the last war only a line, saying, and then the whole world was swept by a conflagration. But I believe there will be a page, maybe a chapter, telling how freedom and democracy were brought to the Far East by the United States, one of the greatest and perhaps the noblest single achievement of our country. He was proud of his viceregal accomplishments and resentful that so many Americans, their eyes still focused on Europe, did not share his pride. He had not, however, forgotten his professional identity. Proconsul he might be, military officer he had to be. That was why he felt entitled to a voice in America's debate over the tumultuous developments on the Asian mainland. Indeed, his most effective argument for a swift settlement with Japan was, not a plea for justice, but a calculated appeal to the self-interest of the United States. The United States needed a friendly power in the Far East, he advised Washington, because it was about to lose its old ally, China. 156 The collapse of nationalist China, like the fall of Rome, or that of the British Empire, did not happen in one day, one month, or even one year. The strength of Chiang Kai shek's Kuomintang KMT, crumbled slowly, village by village and province by province, the victim of a metastasizing malignancy whose many remissions could not alter the inevitable outcome. Every old China hand turned away with the same diagnosis. It was a lingering, terminal case. As time is measured in Asia, however, the end came suddenly. On April 4, 1949, the day the NATO alliance was signed in the new State Department building under Ixon's approving eye, a communist general named Chu Te began massing a million of Mao Zedong's troops on the north bank of the Yangtze, the last natural barrier between Mao and the few southern outposts still loyal to Chiang. Chu Te's veterans lunged across the Yangtze on April 24, meeting only token resistance. Chiang had withdrawn 300,000 of his most reliable soldiers to form a rearguard perimeter around Shanghai. In the first week of May, Chu Te was hammering at Shanghai's gates, and Chiang fled to Formosa, taking as many nationalist Chinese with him as he could. By now the mainland was lost to him. A few formalities remained. On June 26, KMT gunboats began blockading mainland port. Mao proclaimed Red China's sovereignty on September 21, and on December 8 Chiang announced the formation of his new government in Taipei. The world now had two Chinas. Sun Yat-sen's fifty-year-old vision of a democratic China was dead, and Franklin Roosevelt's expectation that Chiang would provide the non-communist world's eastern anchor had died with it. The American public's response was slow. Troops had been fighting in China under one flag or another since September of 1931. The United States newspapers had carried regular accounts of Mao's offensives since VJ Day. But China was so vast, the movements of its unmechanized armies so sluggish, and its geography, like that of the Southwest Pacific, so unfamiliar, that the general reader in the United States had lost interest in the distant battles. If developments that became important, he reasoned, his government would tell him about them. It did. With the collapse of the Kuomintang, Aixen decided to lay the whole story before the people. On August 5, 1949, the State Department issued a 1,054 page white paper, conceding that the world's largest nation had fallen into communist hands, announcing the cessation of aid to nationalist China and setting forth the chain of events which had led to the tragic end. Three American generals, Stilwell, Patrick J. Hurley, and George Marshall, had tried in vain to persuade Chiang to break the power of his KMT warlords and rid the nationalist army of corruption and defeatism. Over two billion dollars of the United States aid, as much as Japan had received, had gone to Chiang since VJ Day. Virtually all of it had been wasted. 
over 75% of the arms shipped to the KMT had wound up in Mao's hands. In his introduction to the white paper Ixon bluntly called Chiang's regime incompetent, venal, and insensitive to the needs of its people. He added, the unfortunate but inescapable fact is that there result of the civil war in China was beyond the control of the government of the United States. Nothing that this country did or could have done within the reasonable limits of its capabilities could have changed that result. It was the product of internal Chinese forces, which this country tried to influence but could not. To the knowledgeable this was apparent, but the United States public was bewildered. All this talk of KMT ineptitude was a switch. The China it knew, Pearl Bucks peasants, rejoicing in the good earth, had been dependable, warm, and, above all, pro-American. Throughout World War II the United Nations Big Four had been Roosevelt, Churchill, Stalin, and Chiang Kai-shek. Stalin's later treachery, though lamentable, had been unsurprising. But the disintegration of Giang's forces was shocking. Aixen's strategy to contain red aggression seemed to have burst wide open. His own white paper admitted that Mao's regime might lend itself to the aims of Soviet Russian imperialism. Everything American diplomats had achieved in Europe, the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, NATO, seemed momentarily annulled by this disaster in Asia. A benign China, grateful for American generosity and reciprocating its friendship, had been replaced by a titanic red monster which appeared to be intent upon devouring everything in sight. Nations which have suffered severe setbacks look for whipping boys. New Somstrahis, cried the retreating French in 1870, 1914, and 1940. Americans at the turn of the half century were not immune to this impulse. Indeed, they were particularly susceptible to it, for having won a great war they had assumed that they would spend the future in tranquility. Then Stalin had gobbled up Eastern Europe, the native lands of millions of Americans. Next, strands in the Red's espionage net had been uncovered and now China was gone. Thus an earth-shaking event on the Asian mainland became the most highly charged the United States political issue since the Depression. Its force was multiplied by the anger of conservative Republicans, the very men who had stumped for MacArthur in the primaries of 1944 and 1948, and who were now keeping him abreast of political developments in Washington. Aixon called them primitives, and their behavior was certainly inelegant, as graceless, in fact, as the general's paranoia which fed it and fed upon it. But their frustration was understandable. Roosevelt had whipped them in election after election. Then Truman, whom they had ridiculed as a political valetudinarian, had added fair deal insult to New Deal injury, using tactics in his 1948 campaign which can only be described as regrettable. Later, when America's image of Truman had mellowed, his uphill campaign came to be regarded as an inspiring folktale. By the 1970s even grand old party leaders like Nixon and Ford openly admired it. But at the time it had been less than admirable. The Republicans, he had said, were trying to nail the American consumer to the wall with spikes of greed. He had called them gluttons of privilege, described Dewey as a fascist and compared him to Hitler and charged that Dewey's party had stuck a pitchfork in the farmer's back. Bitter after their out that November, grand old party senators and congressmen were determined to flay Truman's administration with any weapon that came to hand, and the Asian situation provided them with the handiest. Increasingly one heard from the Republican leadership on the hill that the administration had deliberately lost China, that the responsibility for Chiang's defeat lay in Washington, among traitors who had cunningly worked with other communists abroad to bring Mao to power. It was all a conspiracy, the litany ran, and it had all begun when Alger Hiss accompanied Roosevelt to Yalta. Robert A. Taft said, the greatest Kremlin asset in our history has been the pro-communist group in the State Department who promoted at every opportunity the communist cause in China. And Taft was a gentleman. William E. Jenner called George Marshall the front man for traitors, a living lie who had joined hands with this criminal crowd of traitors and communist appeasers who, 
under the continuing influence of Mr. Truman and Mr. Aixon, are still selling America down the river. Joe Martin declared that Aixon was an appeaser responsible for Mao's takeover of China and added that he considered Truman's plan to aid emerging nations an extension of the plot which had destroyed Chiang. Joe McCarthy denounced the administration as one of egg-sucking phony liberals whose pitiful squealing would hold sacrosanct those communists and queers who had sold China into atheistic slavery. All this would sound fantastic later, but at the time it was powerful political medicine. Gallup found that only 29% of the American people disapproved of McCarthy. Even Democratic Congressman John F. Kennedy, after reading his mail from Massachusetts, charged that the State Department had squandered the United States wartime gains by listening to such advisers as Owen Latimer of Johns Hopkins University. This, Kennedy concluded, is the tragic story of China, whose freedom we once fought to preserve. What our young men saved, our diplomats and our president have frittered away. 157 far from the storm but fascinated by it, MacArthur remained silent. He believed his own record on the Chinese issue would bear scrutiny, and by and large he was right. In February 1945 he had predicted that Manchuria, Korea, and, perhaps, North China would be lost to the communists, it was. He said then, inevitable. That, however, had been merely a military appraisal. At the time of the surrender on the Missouri General Albert C. Wedemeyer had asked him for seven divisions to strengthen Chiang's position, and MacArthur, as Wedemeyer later testified before a Senate committee, had refused to make them available to me. But this was normal prudence for a commander who was about to occupy Japan, then still armed to the teeth, and needed every GI he could muster. Most Americans of both parties had welcomed the presence of their Russian ally on the mainland that summer. On July 25 Senator Alexander Wiley, later one of Aixon's most savage primitives, had said, in millions of American homes, mothers, fathers, and sweethearts are waiting anxiously for news of Russia's intentions. Countless American lives are at stake in Russia's decisions. Why should we follow the lead of the nice Nellies of our State Department who have been more concerned with diplomatic niceties than with the preservation of American interests and lives? Let no one say that we are meddling in Russia's business when we tell them that we want them to carry their load in the Far East. We will not easily forget Russia's contribution in the Far East if she pitches in with us and will not easily forgive her shirking of her responsibility if she remains on the sidelines. 158 MacArthur never went that far. Four months after Wiley's speech the general told Lord Alan Brooke that although he was still resigned to the loss of North China, he felt that further Russian intrusion in Asia should be met by force. Thereafter his reports of the growing disaster on the mainland were models of precision, they were even, Aixon's jibe notwithstanding, oracular. But he could hardly be called a passive spectator. His feelings, an aide recalls, were a mixture of disappointment and frustration because of his lack of control over developments outside his authority in Japan. Chagrin turned to neopathological rage as he helplessly watched Chiang Kai-shek's regime being systematically overrun. Long before the Kuomintang's last stand, he had prophesied the forfeiture of the Lower Yangtze Valley and Shanghai. In 1949 Clara L. Chenault bluntly told those who would listen to him that the United States is losing the Pacific War, and foresaw a ring of red bases. Stretched from Siberia to Saigon. MacArthur had been telling Washington the same thing for some time. He was especially exasperated with the liberal argument that KMT rule had been less than exemplary. To Carl L. Rankin, who visited him in Tokyo, he said of Chiang, if he has horns and a tail, so long as he is anti-communist, we should help him. Rather than make things difficult, the State Department should assist him in a fight against communists, we can try to reform him later. Walter Judd of Minnesota would later remember the general telling him, for the first time in our relations with Asia, we have endangered the paramount interests of the United States by confusing them with an internal purification problem in Asia. This, Richard H. Rovier and Arthur M. Schlesinger, 
Jr., note, was a penetrating statement of a complex situation. 159 MacArthur says fall of China imperils the United States, a life headline had read on December 20, 1948. The story had vexed the Joint Chiefs, who had agreed that Red Conquest of the mainland would constitute no threat to American security in the Pacific, and later it would be cited as an example of the General's bypassing of authority to appeal directly to the public. But in this instance he was blameless. Earlier in the year the House Foreign Affairs Committee had asked his opinion of Mao's victories, and he had replied that it would be utterly fallacious to underrate either China's need or its importance. Two months later a Senate committee had asked him to return and testify on Far Eastern affairs. He had declined, but more cables had been exchanged between the Daiki and the Capitol. As long as the initiative remained on the Hill and his replies were non-partisan, his behavior was above reproach. Congressmen paid his salary. He had to respond to their official inquiries. 160 MacArthur's view was that American policy in China was suicidal, that the United States could not escape sharing in the KMT's defeat. Once Chiang had been vanquished, he said, Japan would be threatened. Indeed, he suggested, Nippon might become a latter day Bataan. That was extravagant but his requests for aid were sensible. It was unthinkable, he said, to land GIs on the mainland, but he thought a strengthened the United States military posture in the Far East was reasonable. He asked for more ships, clouds of airplanes, and six divisions of infantrymen, and he believed Chiang should continue to receive all the military equipment and technical advisors he wanted. In 1944 he had disagreed with the view that Formosa was the key to the conquest of Japan and that the Philippines weren't. Now, however, with Japan secure, strategic priorities had changed. He recommended to the Joint Chiefs, this was confidential, no word of it reached the Hill at the time, that Washington should proclaim to all the peoples of Asia our firm intention to safeguard the Pacific by declaring its vital interest in Formosa. While he doubted that American troops would be needed to prevent Mao from leaping over Formosa Strait and seizing the island, he thought transports should be prepared to carry them. The dot 161 This was a highly sensitive point. The Republican leadership wanted an American commitment to Formosa, together with an administration announcement that no Peking regime would ever be recognized by the United States. The second could wait, the first was urgent and was being quietly debated in the Pentagon, Foggy Bottom, and the White House. In late December of 1949 the National Security Council convened to resolve the issue. The Council's mood was dovish. Some participants even wanted to abandon all the United States military positions in the Western Pacific, retreating to Hawaii, if necessary. The chiefs submitted MacArthur's appraisal but reported that they were opposed even to sending Formosa a the United States military mission. Exxon agreed that MacArthur should be overruled, reasoning that the American military establishment lacked sufficient force to defend Formosa while meeting commitments elsewhere, and Truman took this line on January 5, 1950. The United States has no desire to obtain special rights or privileges or to establish military bases on Formosa at this time. Nor does it have any intention of utilizing its armed forces to interfere in the present situation. The United States government will not pursue a course which will lead to involvement in the civil conflict in China. Similarly, the United States government will not provide military aid or advice to Chinese forces on Formosa. 162 In the ensuing tumult, MacArthur continued to hold his tongue. Privately he told his staff that he believed America had suffered a grave defeat, but, for the present, at least, he kept his temper. A public quarrel would have been devastating to American interests, disclosing that in one respect Aixon was right, that the United States armed forces, less than five years after the great Allied victories of 1945, were far weaker than its adversaries suspected. In the Far East, Robert D. Heinl, Jr., writes, thanks largely to the wise proconsulship of Douglas MacArthur, the position of the United States appeared strong. On paper, Walton H. Walker, 
who had succeeded E. Chelburger as commander of the 8th Army, led one regimental combat team and four divisions, the 7th, 24th, and 25th Infantry, and the 1st Cavalry. In fact, his units were undermanned and flabby, they had, in the later words of William F. Dean, one of their commanders, become accustomed to Japanese girlfriends, plenty of beer, and servants to shine their boots. Altogether, Walker could field less than 80,000 soldiers. Aircraft were few and obsolescent. Scapp's naval forces comprised just one light cruiser and four destroyers. None were fit, because no one dreamed that they would ever be needed. MacArthur himself, in withdrawing the last of his troops from Korea in the early summer of 1949, had observed that the country was not a proper place for the employment of American troops because stationing United States ground troops and continental Asia involved inherent dangers. If left there, he said, they might be trapped. 163 Not only is it easy to be wise after the event, it is, for military historians, almost irresistible. The strategic value of Gibraltar, Gettysburg, and the Dardanelles was obvious once they had been won or lost, and the eyes of any veteran of the Korean War, if confronted with a map of the Pacific, will instantly dart to the peninsula where he fought. It is incredible to him that the nation's leaders did not see it there before the first shots were fired. Yet the chances are that he himself had never heard of it before the last weekend of June 1950. The day it became newsworthy, Time reported. A Dallas citizen was on the telephone, calling his local newspaper. Where was Korea, anyway? Were the people Indians or Japanese? And what time was it there? Millions were in the same fix. Certainly few of them knew the land's unhappy history, which had begun, discouragingly, with a partition in 108B.C.164 America's leaders had long been aware of the peninsula though neither they nor their allies knew quite what to do with it. At Cairo in 1943 the Big Four had pledged themselves to its independence in due course, whenever that was. At Yalta Eftia had suggested a four-power trustee for the country. After a general discussion, however, the matter had been dropped. The Potsdam Proclamation had nebulously promised that steps leading to its autonomy shall be carried out but at Potsdam the Joint Chiefs had turned down a Russian proposal for a joint amphibious operation against enemy troops in Korea, explaining that they needed all available landing craft for the coming invasion of Japan. The day after Stalin declared war on Japan, his infantrymen began landing on Korea's northern tip. A week after the Missouri surrender ceremony, American troops arrived to join the Russians in disarming local Japanese forces. The Red Army, which had already occupied Seoul and Incheon, retired north of the 38th parallel, leaving MacArthur's men to receive the surrender of Nipponese units in the more populous half of the peninsula. According to Lewis Haskins, several one-star generals hurried into an office of the Pentagon with the statement, We have got to divide Korea. Where can we divide it? A colonel with experience in the Far East protested to his superiors, You can't do that. Korea is a social and economic unit. There is no place to divide it. The generals insisted that it had to be done and the colonel replied that it could not be done. Their answer was, we have got to divide Korea and it has to be done by four o'clock this afternoon. In his memoirs Dean Aikson writes, a young officer recently returned to the Pentagon, Dean Rusk from the Chinese theater, found an administrative dividing line along the 38th parallel. 165 There was no long-range planning, no ulterior motive on either side. More or less by chance, Soviet and the United States commanders had squared off with the Russians north of this 50-yard line and the Americans south of it. In the north, the Reds set up the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in Pyongyang, with Kim Too sung who had been a major in the Red Army, as Premier. The United States didn't recognize Kim's government. In the south, Syngman Rhee proclaimed the Republic of Korea in Seoul. Russia didn't recognize his government. Both men were despots, there was little to choose between them. The United Nations adopted a resolution calling for general elections under a UN commission, 
but since the USSR wouldn't permit the commissioners north of the 38th parallel, the impasse continued. It was all very unsatisfactory, but to almost everyone except the Koreans it was also boring. Like Germany, the peninsula seemed destined to survive with a split political personality, the two adversaries swapping polemics and, from time to time, random gunfire. Sebald recalls, we expected an indefinite prolongation of the tension and small-scale guerrilla action which had become commonplace in Korea. In March 1950 the United Nations announced that military observers would report on incidents along the border. Everyone assumed that there would be many of them. They would be duly reported by the wire services and the New York Times in a paragraph or two. Stiff notes would be exchanged, outrageous claims made, border guards doubled. Then watchful calm would return. Bloodshed would be slight. No armies would clash. Certainly the peninsula would never become a great world battlefield. 166 On arriving in Seoul after VJ Day, John R. Hodge, MacArthur's local commander, had remarked unforgivably that Koreans are the same breed of cats as Japanese. Neither Scap nor the Pentagon had reprimanded him. The American attitude toward the country, insofar as it existed at all, was almost contemptuous. On September 25, 1947, Eisenhower, Lee He, Nimitz, and Karl Spatz had reported to the President, the Joint Chiefs of Staff consider that, from the standpoint of military security, the United States has little strategic interest in maintaining the present troops and bases in Korea. In envisioning the Pacific as an Anglo-Saxon lake, even MacArthur excluded Korea, and in April 1948, on the advice of the chiefs, Truman declared that military action by either side of the divided country would not constitute a casus billy for the United States. 167 Scap flew to Seoul on August 15, 1948, for the formal inauguration of Rhee as President of the South Korean Republic. Larry Bunker remembers it as a clear day, with the Supreme Commander wearing all of lovely flowers and reading, with conspicuous pleasure an editorial in welcome of General MacArthur by Hong An Chai in the Hang Sung Ilby. The general delivered the principal address. He called the splitting of the country one of the great tragedies of modern history, and in an aside to Rhee he said, I will defend Korea as I would my own country, just as I would California, but that was merely MacArthur bombast. The decision to shield the new nation or let it fall was not his to make. Besides, he was about to relinquish all responsibility for the peninsula. On New Year's Day, 1949, Moscow announced that all Soviet forces had been pulled out of North Korea, and in February the general told Secretary of the Army Kenny Troyal that he favored the prompt withdrawal of all the United States troops from the peninsula. In June the last of the GIs left Pusan. The Daika South Korea file was closed. MacArthur was no more responsible for the Republic of Korea than for the Republic of France. The State Department, not the Pentagon, exercised control of the United States' interests on the peninsula. Even before the American soldiers had departed, MacArthur later testified before a Senate committee, my responsibilities were merely to feed them and clothe them in a domiciliary way. I had nothing whatever to do with the policies, the administration or the command responsibilities in Korea until the war broke out. 168 in May, as transports bore GIs away from him, Re had said, whether the American soldiers go or stay does not matter very much. What is important is the policy of the United States toward the security of Korea. The Truman administration, however, had decided to let the United Nations worry about the eventual reunification of the divided land. George Marshall, Aixon's predecessor as Secretary of State, Aixon replaced him in early 1949, had held that America should not strengthen Rhee's army once South Korea was an independent nation, no longer under Washington's control. His real concern was that Rhee might pounce on North Korea. At the time this was considered likelier than a move southward by Kim Too sung and indeed Rhee's militant statements supported this opinion. Accordingly, Seoul's defenses were limited to 65,000 Republic of Korea infantrymen, ROCs, organized in eight divisions. 
because of Rees' constant belligerency, Sebald writes, though the United States refused to provide him with tanks, medium or heavy artillery, or military aircraft. North Korea had plenty of such offensive weapons, but no one in the United States was paying them much attention. In October 1949 Shin Sung Mo, Rees Minister of Defense, had confided in Sebald that much more work remained to be done before their ox could match the North Koreans, but the United States Brigadier William L. Roberts, who had headed an advisory team in Seoul, and who was speaking proudly of my army and my forces, was saying that they could hold the commies should war come. Sebald says of Roberts, I could hardly imagine a more vociferous advocate of South Korean military prowess. 169 in Washington, Mo's and Roberts's reports were filed and forgotten. Indifference to the peninsula was shared by both parties. It is a point of some interest that congressional Republicans fought all appropriations for Seoul. They torpedoed Truman's request for $60 million of Korean economic aid, and on January 19, 1950, the lower house, at their urging, defeated by a 193 to 192 vote a small measure which would have provided 500 the United States Army officers to supervise the equipping of South Korean troops. That evening Ixon wrote his daughter Mary, we took a defeat in the house on Korea, which seems to me to have been our own fault. We were complacent and inactive. 170 no one has faulted the secretary for the failure of that bill but he has been rightly reproached for extemporary remarks that same month before the National Press Club. America's line of defense, he said, runs along the Aleutians to Japan and then goes to the Ryukyus, chiefly Okinawa. We hold important defense positions in the Ryukyu Islands, and these we will continue to hold. The defense perimeter runs from the Ryukyus to the Philippine Islands. He continued, so far as the military security of the United States is concerned and here he obviously had Formosa and South Korea in mind, it must be clear that no person can guarantee these areas against military attack. Should such an attack occur? The initial reliance must be on the people attacked. If they proved to be resolute fighters, he vaguely concluded, they were entitled to an appeal under the charter of the UN. To the end of his life Exxon would vigorously deny that this had given the green light for aggression in South Korea by excluding it from the perimeter, but when he told the press club that the United States was waiting for the dust to settle in China after declaring that America's line of resistance lay south of the Korean peninsula, the communists could only conclude, as they did, that the United States was leaving Re to fend for himself. Students of the USSR were appalled. Moscow knew that the Americans were drafting a Japanese peace treaty without consulting Stalin. Since VJ Day the Russians had been hoping that Washington would give them a free hand in Korea. In George Kennan's opinion, when they saw it wasn't going to work out that way, they concluded, if this is all we are going to get out of a Japanese settlement, we had better get our hands on Korea fast before the Americans let the Japanese back in there. 171 It was not like Aixon to misstate American foreign policy, and in fact he had not done so. He was of one mind with the President, the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Chiefs, and the Congressional leadership. In May 1950 Tom Connolly, Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, explicitly stated that Russia could seize South Korea at her convenience and the United States probably would not intervene, since Korea was not very greatly sick, important. And Douglas MacArthur, a year earlier, had sounded the same theme. On March 1, 1949, he had told a New York Times correspondent in Tokyo, our defensive positions against Asiatic aggression used to be based on the west coast of the American continent. The Pacific was looked upon as the avenue of possible enemy approach. Now, our line of defense runs through the chain of islands fringing the coast of Asia. It starts from the Philippines and continues through the Ryukyu archipelago, which includes its main bastion, Okinawa. Then it bends back through Japan and the Aleutian island chain to Alaska. In subsequent interviews he said substantially the same thing to G. Ward Price and to William R. Matthews of the Arizona Daily Star.
like Aixen, he omitted both Formosa and Korea. 172 What is significant here is that the general, unlike Aixen and Connolly, did not say this after Chiang's flight to Formosa. He saw, as they did not, that an American people aroused by the fall of China would not stand for the sacrifice of another Asian country to communist aggression. The McCarthy's, Wherries, Dafts, and Wileys had won their suit in the court of public opinion. Democrats like Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson knew it, to the end of their lives they would believe that the relinquishment of another oriental state to the communists would be political suicide. And Harry Truman had grasped it by April 25, 1950, when, running scared from Republican critics, eager to prove that Alger Hiss was not a typical Democrat, he instructed the National Security Council to approve the policy paper that became known as NSC 68. Among other things, this historic document specified that henceforth up to 20% of America's gross national product would be devoted to the military establishment and that the United States would resist any red threat to non-red nations anywhere. 173 After the president initialed it approved, NSC 68 was classified, even Dean Nixon, writing his memoirs 19 years later, could not quote it. Actually it should never have been kept secret. Had it been published the day it was adopted, the Korean War would almost certainly have been avoided. Unaware of it, Stalin and Kim Tu Sung assumed that South Korea was ripe for the plucking. If one assumes that totalitarian governments are immoral and hence ethically blameless, then the Truman administration, through its spokesman, had stumbled badly. MacArthur was hardly prescient, but although half a world away from Washington, he saw his countrymen's mood more clearly than the White House, the Pentagon, or Foggy Bottom. It is a pity that he was excluded from their councils. As it was, the first inkling he had of the NSC 68 switch was a speech by John Foster Dulles. In the Far East as a special representative of the Secretary of State, working on the Japanese peace treaty, Dulles took time out to tour the 38th parallel and speak in Seoul. On June 17, 1950, very late in the day, he told the South Korean National Assembly that the American people remained faithful to the cause of human freedom and loyal to those everywhere who honorably support it. A new line had been drawn. Unfortunately, the language was imprecise, and Moscow, Peking, and Pyongyang, aware that the Speaker's party was out of power in the United States. Ignored the warning. 174 MacArthur, however, perked up. On May 18, when C. L. Salzberger solicited his opinion of the containment policy in Asia, Salzberger had written in his diary, he smiled and said he was astonished to hear me refer to an American policy. The general himself later said he had just about concluded that the administration wasn't much interested in the Far East. He had urged Dean Aixen to visit it, but Aixen had replied that the pressure of his duties prevented him from leaving Washington. Heretofore, MacArthur wrote afterward, he had assumed that under no circumstances would the United States engage in the military defense of the Korean Peninsula. Now Dulles, Aixen's personal envoy was saying that it would. The Supreme Commander noted that apparently Dulles had reversed the previous policy enunciated by the State Department. 175 MacArthur's admirers later insisted that he had sought the reassignment of American garrison troops to Seoul, on the ground that his officers were more reliable than the untrustworthy State Department types in Seoul and because he suspected an approaching North Korean attack. There is no record of this. And it is unlikely, as late as May of 1950 he said, I don't believe a shooting war is imminent. He had complete confidence in Sebald, who was briefing him on developments across the Korea Strait. And he ignored accumulating evidence of an imminent attack by the In Minutes gun, the North Korean People's Army, PA. On March 10, 1950, the CIA had predicted that the PA will attack South Korea in June 1950. Willoughby, who maintained an extensive intelligence net on the peninsula, filed 1,195 reports between June 1949 and June 1950, reporting, 
among other things, that Chinese communist troops of Korean descent had been entering the Democratic People's Republic in great numbers since the defeat of Chiang, and that a massive build-up of Red Shock troops, far in excess of Rhee's forces in the south, was underway north of the 38th parallel. In the third week of March Willoughby's G2, agreeing with the CIA, prophesied war in the late spring or early summer. 176 Despite this, MacArthur now, as in pre-war Manila, radiated optimism. Five weeks before the conflict, he delivered a MacArthurian lecture to Salzburger on the history of war. He began, you have got to remember that war at the beginning was a sort of gladiatorial contest. You might start with the basis of the fight between David and Goliath. Professional units replaced individual contestants, he continued, and then the concept of peace treaties emerged, to safeguard victories. However, he said, as the world became more closely integrated and war became a more total concept involving every man, woman and child, and as destruction became so terribly great, war has ceased to be a medium for the settling of quarrels. The opinion of the masses is against it. Therefore, I don't believe that war is imminent because the people of the world would neither desire it nor would they be willing to permit it. That goes for both sides. That is the basic reason for my belief that war is not upon the doorstep. It was, Salzberger thought, a fascinating performance. It was also dead wrong. 177 clocks in Washington read 3 p.m. on Saturday, June 24, 1950 and Dean Aikson was gardening on Harewood Farm, his Maryland home. Stealthy figures moved in the nearby woods, since the advent of McCarthy, the secretary's hate mail had become so great that he needed bodyguards around the clock. On Morningside Heights Dwight Eisenhower, president of Columbia University, was holed up with the Maverick Queen, a Zane Grey novel. It was 2 p.m. in Kansas City, where Harry Truman's aircraft, the independence, was entering its glide pattern. The president was about to take a Missouri holiday. Over the Pacific, where Omar Bradley and Louis Johnson were flying homeward from the Far East, it was mid-morning. In Tokyo, on the other side of the international dateline, timepiece hands stood at 5 a.m. on Sunday, June 25. Atop Renanzaka Hill everyone in Hoover's Folly was asleep. The first streaks of dawn had flushed the eastern sky 34 minutes earlier, and the sacred snows of Fuji were beginning to be visible to the southwest, but sunrise was still an hour away, and the dogs had not yet begun to stir. Sentries had a joke about Blackie, MacArthur's Caucus Spaniel. Soldiers weren't needed outside the embassy, they said, because the slightest noise would bring the cocker to his feet, barking but not even Blackie could hear the shattering crescendo of sound 700 miles to the west as a 1,122 mm Pahawetsas, erupting in a single sheet of flame, split the night just above the 38th parallel. Though the sweep second hands of watches on North Korean officers' wrists had just touched 4 o'clock a.m. wartime, once more. On all the Angeluses of the world. 178 9 a sunset gun 1950 1951 Korea hangs like a lumpy phallus between the sprawling thighs of Manchuria and the Sea of Japan. Roughly the size of England and Scotland, it was, in 1950, the home of about 20 million people, most of whom lived in the south. The peninsula has sometimes been called the Hermit Kingdom and most visitors have been only too happy to leave it alone. Sebald had crossed it six times in the 1930s. He had thought then that it was a nation of sad people, oppressed, unhappy, poor, silent, and sullen, and he hadn't changed his mind since. A Korean proverb for the country runs, over the mountains, mountains. The hills in fact seem interminable. They are also dun-colored, granitic, steep, and speckled here and there with boulders, scrub oaks, and stunted firs. In the valleys, streams meander past rice paddies, walled cities, and pagodas fingering drab skies from terraced slopes. The landscape is colorless. There are almost no flowers. 
The hillsides are gouged with thousands of dells and gorges, many deep enough to conceal battalions of troops. It is ideal terrain for guerrilla fighting. One that first in minutes gun blitz was, however, a conventional offensive. Under the tactical command of senior Colonel Lee Haku, gunners manning the howitzer batteries studied the bursts of their exploding shells and corrected their ranges. Then, as Lee lowered his upraised arm in an abrupt gesture of command, wedges of growling, low slung Soviet T 34 tanks lurched across the parallel. Overhead, yaks and storm of X winged toward Seoul, a few minutes away. Like the Chinese, the North Koreans still used trumpets to herald charges, and with their first notes, PA infantrymen lunged across the border toward their first objectives. Despite the weather, the summer monsoon had just begun, and a heavy rain was falling. PA General Chai and June put 90,000 men into South Korea without any traffic jams. Already junks and sampans were landing amphibious PA troops behind rock lines to the south. As MacArthur later put it, North Korea had struck like a cobra. Too awakening to the din, Syngman Rhee's constituents fumbled for their clothes. In a few hours they would be on the roads, hurrying from the battlefront, which nevertheless crept ever closer to them. Some would be refugees for the rest of their lives. Their ox, helpless against the tanks, panicked, buckled, and broke in a sudden plebiscite of feet. After a brief stand at Chunchun, resistance collapsed. Retreat became a rout. Suddenly the T-34s were reported to be approaching the northern suburbs of their capital. Re prepared to move his government to Tejun, 90 miles to the south. Meanwhile, word of the catastrophe which was overtaking him had reached Washington. John J. Musio, the American ambassador in Seoul, had cabled the State Department, North Korean forces invaded Republic of Korea at several places this morning. It would appear from the nature of the attack and the manner in which it was launched that it constitutes an all-out offensive against the Republic of Korea. Next, the United Press correspondent in Seoul began sending out fragmentary bulletins describing heavy fighting all along the receding rock line. D. Nixon, summoned from his garden to his telephone, listened in horror and immediately decided to propose that Secretary General Trigvlai of the United Nations convene an emergency session of the UN Security Council. Then Nixon phoned Independence, Missouri. His first words were, Mr. President, I have very serious news. The North Koreans have invaded South Korea. Three flying back to Washington the next morning, Truman ordered an immediate conference of his diplomatic and military advisers around the large mahogany dining table at Blair House, 1651 Pennsylvania Avenue, diagonally across the street from the White House. By the time they convened, there were more messages from Musio, all of them discouraging. Among other things, a strong part-tank column was driving toward Seoul and Kimpo Airport, apparently advancing at will. South Korean arms, Aixen concluded, summing up the situation, were clearly outclassed. On the bright side, the UN Security Council had just voted 9 to 0 to condemn the PA aggression as a breach of the peace, and America's UN ambassador, Warren Austin, was drafting a second, stronger resolution, calling upon member nations to render such assistance to the Republic of Korea as may be necessary to repel the armed attack and to restore international peace and security to the area. Truman had already decided that the principal assistance should be provided by the armed forces of the United States. In a stunning reversal of its previous public policy, the administration was moving to defend a peninsula which was of negligible strategic value posed no threat to the United States security, and had been, so far as the world knew, written off by Washington. Later MacArthur would write, I could not help being amazed at the manner in which this great decision was being made. With no submission to Congress, whose duty it is to declare war, and without even consulting the field commander involved, the members of the executive branch, agreed to enter the Korean War. He added, all the risks inherent in this decision, including the possibility of Chinese and Russian involvement, apply then just as much as they applied later. 
for although the commander in Tokyo was not consulted at that stage, he was an invisible presence at the Mahogany Blair House table, and his name was mentioned repeatedly. After canvassing the group, which the president christened his war cabinet, Truman made three decisions. MacArthur would be ordered to evacuate the 2,000 Americans in Korea, covering the operation with fighter planes which would avoid airspace north of the parallel. Simultaneously, he would send ammunition and every available piece of military equipment in Japan and on Okinawa to the rocks. Last, his theater was expanded to include Formosa and the Pesco Doors, and the 7th Fleet, now placed under his command, was to patrol the Formosa Strait, quarantining the fighting, in Aixen's phrase, within Korea. In those days it was assumed that all communist nations acted in concert. Truman was worried about Soviet strikes in the Middle East or Berlin, and in official Washington there was a very real fear that Peking, coordinating its movements with Pyongyang, might sail against Formosa. The last thing the United States wanted now was a resumption of the Chinese Civil War. Five. If anyone in Blair House had misgivings about the mandate which was being given to the general, he kept it to himself. Shaken by Republican charges that they were impotent against communist challenges, the leaders of the Democratic administration were resolved to take the hardest possible line against the in minutes gun. They desperately needed a victory to refute McCarthy and his fellow grand old party demagogues, that, not strategic considerations, nor the possible conquest of millions of hearts and minds throughout the world, a catchword of the day was their chief motive, and Douglas MacArthur, whatever his defects, was adroit at producing victories. As they broke up, some of them were warmed by another flicker of satisfaction, a glint of gallows humor. Had Mao pursued Chiang to Formosa a year earlier, the United States would have stood aside. Since then domestic politics had made official the United States' indifference to Chiang's fate impossible. Thus Formosa had become a festering sore, a source of endless embarrassment to the White House. Now they would let the Republican conservatives' favorite general see how he liked it. Six, because the enemy had attacked on a Sunday, telephone circuits between Tokyo and Seoul were closed. As a consequence, most SCAP staff officers were spared a rude awakening. It was a sunny, pleasant morning. The Huffs and several others were lounging beside the embassy's swimming pool, enjoying it, when Edith Sebald arrived and mentioned casually that she had just heard about the hostilities on the radio. Huff questioned her excitedly and rushed to tell MacArthur, but the general already knew, had known, in fact, for hours. In the first grey moments of daylight a duty officer had phoned from the Daiki, General, we have just received a dispatch from Seoul advising that the North Koreans have struck in great strength south across the 38th parallel at 4 o'clock this morning. MacArthur, remembering Manila nearly nine years earlier, felt an uncanny feeling of nightmare. It was the same fell note of the war cry that was again ringing in my ears. It couldn't be, I told myself. Not again. I must still be asleep and dreaming. Not again. But then came the crisp, cool voice of my fine chief of staff, General Ned, Edward M. Armand, any orders, General? Seven barring urgent developments, the Supreme Commander said, he wanted to be left alone with his own reflections. Stepping into his slippers and his frayed robe, he began striding back and forth in his bedroom. Presently Jean stepped in from her room. I heard you pacing up and down, she said. Are you all right? He told her the news, and she paled. Later Blackie bounded in, tried to divert his master with coaxing barks, and failing, slunk off. Then Arthur appeared for his morning romp with his father. Jean intercepted him and told him there would be no frolicking today. MacArthur put his arm around his son's shoulders, paused, thrust his hands in the pockets of his robe, and renewed his strides. Eight his moods in those first hours of the new war were oddly uneven. At the prospect of new challenges, he became euphoric. George Marshall, during a recent stop in Tokyo, had thought that the Supreme Commander had aged immeasurably since their last meeting, but now Larry Bunker discovered him reinvigorated. 
like an old fire horse back in harness. Another aide believed the general had peeled ten years from his shoulders, and Sebald noted, despite his years, the general seemed impatient for action. Yet at the same time he appeared to be trying to convince himself that there would be no need for action. That noon a correspondent about to catch a plane for home asked him about the significance of the Korean developments, explaining that he would remain in Japan if there was any likelihood of a widening conflict. MacArthur told him it was merely a border incident, that he shouldn't be concerned over such a trifle. He took the same line with Dulles. The rocks would hold, the general predicted, a few LSDs, landing craft, could bring out any Americans who wanted to leave under an umbrella of fighter planes, and that would be the end of it. Dulles was unconvinced. Later in the day he called again, and was dismayed to find that MacArthur was still confident. The general said that he had heard he might become responsible for Korea, but it was his impression that his duties would be administrative. At all events, he saw no cause for alarm. Dulles was unconvinced. Always the superhawk, he wired Dixon, believe that if it appears the South Koreans cannot contain or repulse the attack, United States forces should be used even though this risks Russian counter moves. To sit by while Korea is overrun by unprovoked armed attack would start a world war. How a big war could be prevented by waging a small one was not mentioned. It didn't have to be, since Munich the proposition had been accepted as an article of faith by American diplomats in both parties. Later, in the debates over Vietnam, it would be incorporated in the domino theory. Nine Monday morning, Sunday evening in Washington, MacArthur's first Korean orders came in over his telecon, a form of communication comprising two typewriters and two screens. Messages punched out on the Pentagon keyboard appeared on MacArthur's tube. Operation of all the United States forces in Asia was now officially vested in him. His new title, added to SCAP, was Commander in Chief, Far East. Sinkf. He was instructed to support the Republic of Korea with warships around, and warplanes over, South Korea. He could expect broader powers as Austin applied greater pressure on UN allies. Already America had one foot on the battlefield. By now reports from Taejeon had eclipsed any hope that the invaders could be swiftly driven back, and both he and Dulles were gloomy when he drove the envoy to Haneda for his flight home. MacArthur, as pessimistic as he had been ebullient before, now spoke darkly of writing off the entire Korean peninsula. He had just radioed Truman, South Korean units unable to resist determined North Korean offensive. Contributory factor exclusive enemy possession of tanks and fighter planes. South Korean casualties as an index to fighting have not shown adequate resistance capabilities or the will to fight and our estimate is that a complete collapse is imminent. In his reply the president again cautioned him to send no flyers or vessels north of the parallel. 10 MacArthur heartily approved of the administration's decision to intervene, though it was an even greater surprise to him, he said, than the invasion, but he had many reservations and some of his assumptions would have alarmed the Blair House planners. He believed that they understood little about the Pacific and practically nothing about Korea, that they were certain to blunder because errors were inescapable when the diplomat attempts to exercise military judgment. The President's war cabinet was determined to confine the war, but the new Sinkf believed in the Timis doctrine of just wars, believed that if the battlefield was the last resort of governments then the struggle must be waged until one side had been vanquished. And while he scorned the military opinions of civilians, he didn't think that soldiers should shirk civil decisions, he had pointedly suggested to Dulles that he was quite prepared to deal with policy questions. This was more than presumption. He had made such decisions in Australia, the Philippines, and Japan. Few world leaders, let alone generals were more experienced in governing nations. It is understandable that Washington should want only his military talents in this fresh crisis, but it was unreasonable to expect him, of all men, to leash himself. 11 The issue was further complicated by his stature among Americans. The grand old party might not want him as a presidential nominee, 
but he remained one of the most popular military leaders in the country's history. Delighted by his new appointment, Republicans regarded it as a sign that the administration might be veering away from its Europe first policies. The general, they thought, didn't share the liberal conviction that Asian unrest arose from poverty and the rejection of Western colonialism. They were wrong there, but right in assuming that he didn't believe that Peking might be detached from Moscow if the United States courted Mao by abandoning Formosa, that he would not, in their words, sell out Chiang to appease the mainland Chinese. Above all, both the United States political parties recognized SCAP as a powerful Pacific force whose views about the Far East carried great weight with his countrymen. This was to have grave consequences in the conduct of the Korean War. Reluctant to offend him, and thereby risk accusations of playing politics while men were dying, virtually all of Truman's advisers, including the Joint Chiefs, including even the President himself, would prove timid and ambiguous in many key directives to him. That was inexcusable. By now they should have learned that if he were free to construe unclear orders, he would choose constructions which suited him, not them. Sebald, the Foreign Service officer closest to him, observes, with his sense of history, experience, seniority, reputation, and temperament, he did not easily compromise when his judgment or his decisions were questioned. He was never reluctant to interpret his authority or to make decisions and act quickly, arguing the matter later. 12 In any political contest with him, the president would suffer from certain peculiar handicaps. One was his own fault. In his determination to achieve what he called an economy budget, he had rashly slashed the Pentagon budget to $13.2 billion, cutting, as Cabell Phillips of the New York Times put it, bone and sinew along with the fat. Secretary of Defense Louis Johnson became the goat for this. After events in Korea had exposed the Pentagon's vitiation, Truman fired Johnson and appointed George Marshall in his place, no improvement in MacArthur's eyes, though more acceptable to the country. But the president, despite the buck stops here sign on his desk, was the real culprit. And he hardly improved matters by attempting to intimidate antagonists by brandishing military might which no longer existed. In those first turbulent days of the Korean crisis he impetuously announced that the United States would not only defend Rees and Chiang's regimes, it would, he said, also support the Philippine campaign against the Hucks and the French drive against Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. This was NSC 68 with a vengeance. It was also ludicrous. He lacked the muscle to back it up, and foreign leaders knew it. As MacArthur noted, Five years before Korea that the United States had been militarily more powerful than any nation on earth, but now it would be hard put to push the fledgling in minutes gun back across the 38th parallel. American power, Scapp said, had been frittered away in a bankruptcy of positive and courageous leadership toward any long-range objective. 13 The general believed he was a more eloquent advocate of traditional American idealism than the president. He may have been right. NATO, the Marshall Plan, the Berlin Airlift, the shining monuments of Truman's foreign policy, were relatively sophisticated concepts. His constituents approved, but for the most part they were unstirred. They believed that democracy, the American way, was the sole answer to the world's problems. The more democratic a European nation, the more they admired it. But Europeans were prosperous. The real test, as they saw it, lay in Asia. In some mysterious way they had regarded the triumphant end of World War II as a victory for American ideals. The successful reformation of Japan and the new Philippine Republic were cited as evidence of it. That was one reason the cataclysm in China had shaken them. MacArthur believed that the post-war struggle lay between Christian democracy and imperialistic communism. Most of the United States agreed. As Walter Lippmann pointed out, it is hard for Americans to feel secure in an environment not governed by Christian concepts, though there was a subtle difference between the general's view and theirs. As the popularity of McCarthyism attested, they were more offended by Marxist zealots, particularly American Marxists.
than by Sino-Soviet hunger for power. MacArthur, with his 19th century credo, believed that the greater enemy was Muscovite adventurism. He would have been just as antagonistic toward them had Azar ruled in Moscow and Mandarins in Peking. As he had repeatedly demonstrated in Tokyo, he was capable of adopting radical solutions as long as they weren't called radical. He had always paid lip service to conservative shibboleths. In practice, he had ignored them. It was Truman, after all, who wanted to fight the Hux and Hokimans v. Et Ming. It was MacArthur who had understood the motivation of both. 14. It is a massive irony that this Victorian liberal should have become the first commander of a United Nations army. Thanks to Warren Austin, and to the Russian walkout from the Security Council, UN prestige was now committed to the South Korean cause, and 13 countries had promised troops if the United States committed its own ground forces. In his first press conference since the rupture of the parallel, Truman had agreed with a reporter who had asked, would it be correct to call it a police action under the United Nations? The phrase was unpopular in the United States, few Americans thought it's an acceptable substitute for war, or felt allegiance to the world body. Many who did had doubts about the choice of a commander. James Reston wrote in the New York Times that General Douglas MacArthur, at 70, was being asked to be not only a great soldier but a great statesman, not only to direct the battle, but to satisfy the Pentagon, the State Department, and the United Nations in the process. Reston noted that unlike Eisenhower, with his genius for international teamwork, MacArthur is a sovereign power in his own right, with stubborn confidence in his own judgment. Diplomacy and a vast concern for the opinions and sensitivities of others are the political qualities essential to this new assignment, and these are precisely the qualities General MacArthur has been accused of lacking in the past. 15 In a little right atop the Daiki roof on July 14, J. Lawton Collins, then the Army Chief of Staff, presented the Supreme Commander with the blue and white UN colors. Sonorously Scap responded, I accept this flag with the deepest emotion. The rest of his speech was forgettable. As a turn of the century officer, bound by the oath he had taken on the plane at West Point in 1899, he could not transfer his loyalty from the stars and stripes to this bunting from Lake Success. It should be noted that this did not, however, prevent him from trying to exploit his dual allegiance. In the White House view, Sinkf's chain of command ran from the Army Chief of Staff through the Joint Chiefs to the President, who acted as agent for the United Nations. The General disagreed. As Sebald notes, I recall several instances in which MacArthur's status as a public official became a prime topic. In the light of subsequent events, there was more than academic significance to the question whether the general was acting purely as an American official in his positions as SCAP and United Nations commander or whether he was an international officer. In the prevailing Washington view, MacArthur was an American official, and subject to all the requirements of such a position. The general had different ideas. He expressed the opinion that SCAP was an international officer. He could be called to account, MacArthur said, only in consequence of an agreed allied position. When I repeated the Washington attitude on this point, the general called it incorrect. Sixteen later this would cause problems, but apart from his attempts to manipulate his twin titles, Sinkf never mentioned the rooftop ceremony again. He even omits it from his memoirs. Possibly he thought it somewhat incongruous. In a way it was. The situation in Korea was Orwellian. A former ally of the United States, the Soviet Union, was championing a captive state, North Korea, in a conflict in which the South Korean foe was being supported by the United Nations, to which the Russians belonged, while the Soviets, meanwhile, were demanding the right to participate in treaty negotiations with a former enemy of the Americans and the Russians, Japan, which would bring peace between Japan which was becoming the base for anti-Pyongyang forces, and the United States, now the Soviets' arch-enemy. To crown it all, 
the Grand Alliance fighting the puny North Koreans seemed to face imminent defeat. Truman had begun the first week of the war by instructing MacArthur to supply the rocks from his quartermaster's stores. Then he had directed him to assist Tree's troops with air and sea support along the 38th parallel. It wasn't working. On the fifth day, Brigadier John Church, sent to the front by MacArthur, reported that the situation appeared to be hopeless. The president approved warplane missions north of the parallel, on the condition that bombardiers confine themselves to military targets. But flight times from Japanese airdromes were too great to make the missions effective. Therefore the White House authorized the transfer of a contingent of the United States troops, men of the 507th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalion, to Korea. They were told to hold so on airfield while other American soldiers and sailors secured fields and docks in the vicinity of Pusan, on the southeast tip of the Korean peninsula. A deadly sequence was forming. Once aircraft are committed, they must have airstrips. Airstrips need ground crews, and these crews have to be protected by the United States infantry. The same pattern would emerge later in Vietnam.17 on Wednesday. The fourth day of the war, MacArthur decided that it was time he visited the front. At dusk he summoned four American correspondents to his Daiki office. He told them he didn't know whether the United States air, naval, and logistical support would be enough to save the rocks, in past wars there has been only one way for me to learn such things. There is only one way now. I have decided to go to Korea and see for myself. The Batan would fly him the tomorrow, June 29. The plane was unarmed. He didn't know where they would land. Kimpo Field, the airstrip closest to Seoul, had been captured, and Sawon, 20 miles south of the capital, was considered unsafe. His staff wanted him to settle for Pusan, the port closest to Japan, but he rejected that, it was too far, 200 miles, from the fighting. The reporters were invited to accompany him to Sawan, but he wanted them to know he couldn't guarantee fighter cover. If you're not at the airport, he said, I'll know you have other commitments. All four replied that they would be there. He smiled. I have no doubt of your courage, he said. I just wanted to give your judgment a chance to work. Eighteen Thursday morning dawned windy, foggy, and rainy. A fine spray whipped up by the park but Anne's propellers, hung in the air for a moment and then lashed back across the concrete runway. The old man should be here any minute, the lieutenant shouted to the newsman, but the first general to appear was, not the commander-in-chief, but George E. Strittmeyer, Kenny's successor as MacArthur's air chief. According to Tony's story, the Batan's pilot, Strittmeyer told him they were grounded, ceiling was zero. Then MacArthur strode up with his jaunty, swinging gait, carrying field glasses and wearing faded, almost white suntans, a leather windbreaker, his crushed cap, and, despite the poor visibility, sunglasses. He promptly overruled Strittmeyer. The airman protested strenuously. The general said, but you'd go yourself, wouldn't you? Strittmeyer answered, yes, but I don't count. You're a different matter. The commander-in-chief turned to Story. He said, we go. 19 airborne, he lit up his outsize corncob pipe. I don't smoke this back there in Tokyo, he told one of the newspaper men, they'd think I was a farmer. The reporter noted that his fingers were quavering, but guessed it was from age, not fear, he was, after all, in his 71st year. Rising. He thrust his hands in his hip pockets and began pacing the aisle. He's always this way, a staff officer told a newsman. He'll walk half the way there before we set down. Strittmeyer had produced some Kova, four Mustangs which hovered overhead like alert terriers, bunched together, wing tip to wing tip. They were needed, as the baton entered its glide pattern over Sir One, a yak closed fast and dove toward it. An aide shouted Mayday. Everyone but MacArthur ducked. He darted to a window and saw a Mustang peeling off to intercept the North Korean fighter. We've got him cold, the general said eagerly, but Story took swift evasive action, 
depriving him of his ringside seat. 20 They made a rough landing on the Poc Tear Strip. Re, disheveled and distraught, greeted the general, and John Musio led them to a nearby schoolhouse, temporary headquarters for the American advisors in the country. Brigadier Church stood by a wall map and explained the deteriorating situation. He had scarcely returned the pointer to its rack when MacArthur slapped his knee, rose, and said, let's go up to the front and have a look. In a black dodge, trailed by a procession of jeeps, they drove north toward the Han River, the Han being to Seoul what the Potomac is to Washington. 21 In plain speaking Merle Miller quotes Aikson as saying, General MacArthur flew over the battlefields that day. Actually Scap spent eight hazardous hours touring the Rocklines. Eighteen in minute scun divisions were smashing southward, and he and his entourage were surrounded by chaos. According to Russell Brines, one of the four correspondents who were there, they drove through the swirling, defeated South Korean army and masses of bewildered, pathetic civilian refugees for a first-hand look at the battlefront. Throughout the journey, the convoy constantly risked enemy air action, against which there was no adequate protection. The crump of mortars was loud and clear, and the North Koreans could have seriously endangered the party with gunfire from only moderately heavy artillery. 22 Like Napoleon at Ratishpan, MacArthur stood, Willoughby Wright, on a little mound just off the road, clogged with retreating, panting columns of troops interspersed with ambulances filled with the groaning, broken men, the sky resonant with shrieking missiles of death and everywhere the stench in misery and utter desolation of a stricken battlefield. Another aide recalls that the general's sharp profile was silhouetted against the black smoke clouds of Seoul as his eyes swept the terrain about him, his hands in his rear trouser pockets and his long-stemmed pipe jutting upward as he swung his gaze over the pitiful evidence of the disaster. Scap himself later wrote, Seoul was already in enemy hands. Only a mile away, I could see the towers of smoke rising from the ruins of this 14th century city. It was a tragic scene. Twenty-three mangled corpses littered the south bank of the Han. The Americans had just missed a ghastly spectacle. Cabell Phillips wrote that with the thunder of communist guns roaring in the northern reaches of the city, a milling, screaming mass of humanity choked the river bridges, seeking a way to freedom. The destruction of these bridges had been ordained by the Rock High Command as a last ditch deterrent to the invaders. At 2.15, the bridges were engulfed in simultaneous dynamite blasts, sending hundreds of refugees still struggling across them to a fiery death. Most of the rock troops in Seoul, with their equipment and transport, were trapped on the north bank. Now only one lone railroad bridge still spanned the Han. Enemy tanks and trucks could cross it at any instant. MacArthur studied it briefly through his field glasses. Take it out, he said, issuing an order for which he had, at that moment, no authority. Then, backing and filling in the narrow dirt road, the motorcade headed back toward Story and the waiting Badan. Masio phoned Sebald in Tokyo, the big boy had a lot of guts and was magnificent. No one knew then how magnificent, much later the general would reveal that during his twenty minutes on that little knoll he had conceived a great amphibious landing, tentatively coded blue hearts, behind the North Koreans.24 returning from this, the first of what would be seventeen flights to Korean battlefields. He remained seated on the Badan, puffing his corn cob, spectacles perched on his nose, scrawling his appraisal of South Korean chances on a yellow scratch pad with a soft pencil. Clearly, he wrote, the rocks couldn't defend their own country. In Japan he had only his four the United States Infantry Divisions, all one-third below strength, and the lone regiment. He knew that an American battleground commitment now would mean entry into action as is no time out for recruiting rallies or to build up and get ready. It would be move in, and shoot. This would put the bulk of the burden on the GI in an aside to an aide he said that he knew his occupation troops were unprepared to fight a war on such short notice, that soft duty had taken its toll. Characteristically, 
he assumed no responsibility for this, blaming frills and fancies inspired in the Pentagon which militated against producing good soldiers. He had told Major Bowers that a soldier's first duty is to keep fit, but he had let his men grow flabby. Somebody else had blundered. MacArthur didn't make mistakes. Other men did, undermining him, making his tasks harder. 25 Nevertheless, in his role as a fighting general he was the absolute professional, and he gave Washington his impersonal opinion. The only assurance for holding the present line and the ability to regain later the lost ground is through the introduction of United States combat forces into the Korean battle area. To continue to utilize the forces of our air and navy without an effective ground element cannot be decisive. If authorized, it is my intention to immediately move a United States regimental combat team to the reinforcement of the vital area discussed and to provide for a possible build-up to two division strength from the troops in Japan for an early counter-offensive. Unless provision is made for the full utilization of the Army Navy air team in this shattered area, our mission will at best be needlessly costly in life, money, and prestige. At worst, it might even be doomed to failure. 26 He realized that this recommendation was political, not military. Strategically, he still believed that Korea lay well outside America's defensive perimeter in the Pacific, but he was convinced that, given the men and the guns, he could save Rhee's regime. Unfortunately, there was a catch here, the seed of a grievous misunderstanding. Truman, Aixon, and the Joint Chiefs were pursuing a negative goal, the ejection of the invaders. The war they foresaw would resemble the wars of Frederick the Great in that it would be a struggle for limited objectives. But MacArthur assumed that his purpose was to defeat the enemy. Years afterward he wrote, the American tradition had always been that once our troops are committed to battle, the full power and means of the nation would be mobilized and dedicated to fight for victory, not for stalemate or compromise and I set out to chart the strategic course which would make that victory possible. Not by the wildest stretch of imagination did I dream that this tradition might be broken. 27 It was 5 p.m. in Tokyo, 3 a.m. in Washington, when the general reached his Daiki office. Immediately he telecoded his report to the Pentagon, where the duty office aroused Chief of Staff Collins who was sleeping on a cot upstairs in an anteroom to the Joint Chiefs' quarters. Collins replied that this issue was too momentous for the Chiefs, it would have to be laid before Truman later in the morning. MacArthur objected. Time was the enemy's ally. The North Koreans would soon be racing toward Pusan. He wanted an immediate answer. Reluctantly Collins called Secretary of the Army Frank Pace at 4.30. Pace telephoned the White House at 5 a.m. and was surprised to learn that the president, always an early riser, had shaved, dressed, and breakfasted, and was seated at his Oval Office desk, ready to make decisions. 28 Ever since Roosevelt had goaded the Japanese into attacking Pearl Harbor, the war-making powers of Congress had been atrophying. Truman believed in what John W. Spanier approvingly called his right to send American troops anywhere in the world to protect American interests, and journalists of all persuasions supported him. Richard A. Trovier later wrote in The New Yorker that the President of the United States has the right to take whatever action he deems necessary in any area he judges to be related to the defense of this country, regardless of whether it is related to the defense of Formosa or anything else so the chief executive felt no obligation to consult senators and congressmen. He did, however, tell Pace that he wanted to call a few advisers. The previous evening Chiang Kai-shek, in a shrewd political move, had responded to the UN resolution to render such assistance to the Republic of Korea as may be necessary to repel the armed attack by volunteering to send 33,000 of his best equipped KMT troops. Truman writes in his memoirs that he told Aixon that my first reaction was to accept this offer because I wanted to see as many members of the United Nations as possible take part in the Korean action. Aixon, already awake, studying Masio's report, was appalled by the President's proposal. In present at the creation he explains, I argued against on the ground that these troops would be more useful defending Formosa than Korea. 
In addition, he predicted that KMT reinforcements of the rocks would bring Mao into the peninsula. The president wasn't so sure, I was, he writes, still inclined to accept the Chinese offer but the Joint Chiefs, polled by phone, told him they regarded Chiang's men as untried, ill-trained, and ill-equipped. Therefore Truman, agreeing to grant SCAP full authority to use the ground forces under his command, gave the go-ahead to Pace, who gave it to Collins, who gave it to MacArthur. Later in the morning the White House announced that the President had authorized the United States Air Force to conduct military missions on specific military targets in Northern Korea and had ordered a naval blockade of the entire Korean coast. Then, tersely, General MacArthur has been authorized to use certain ground units. In less than 24 hours the first battalions of American infantry were being flown from northern Honshu to Pusan. 29 later the general would bitterly protest the enemy's privileged sanctuary in Manchuria, but he ignored his own sanctuary in the Japanese islands. It is a tribute to his successful five-year proconsulship that he could strip Dine upon of every the United States combat unit in the islands without jeopardizing his bases there. Ichiro Ono, Tokyo's Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, told Sebal that 99% of all Japanese support the Korean operation, despite the widespread anti-war sentiment throughout the country. They did more than endorse it. Japan became an important supplier for UN forces on the peninsula. Airfields built by Nipponese became invaluable to MacArthur's Far East Command, Japanese vessels carried UN troops across the Korea Strait, Japanese minesweepers swept both coasts of the peninsula, and Nipponese stevedores volunteered to cross the strait and unload cargo in such frontline ports as Wonsan, Hungnam, and Injun. This naturally infuriated the Russians. Major General A.P. Kislenko, then the Soviet member of the Allied Council in Tokyo, drew up a long bill of particulars documenting Nipponese cooperation in the UN effort, but, Sebald recalls, although he evidently expected to create an adverse reaction in Japan strong enough to raise demands for strict non-involvement, he received no support whatsoever from the Japanese press or public. 30 had they found Kislenko's arguments persuasive, had they chosen to remain aloof, MacArthur would have been driven from the peninsula. It was a close shave as it was. The enemy crossed the Han, MacArthur recalled, and South Korean resistance became increasingly unsuccessful. The first GIs from Japan were little help. Americans had assumed that the fighting would take on a new aspect once those two the United States divisions, the 24th and 25th, arrived in Korea. If the North Koreans didn't panic and flee, it was thought, they would at least lose their momentum. In fact, the, the United States units began crumbling as fast as those of their new rock allies. MacArthur's hopes that two the United States divisions could check the enemy had been dashed. Out of condition and outnumbered by as much as 20 to 1, the first detachments to arrive were for the most part green troops, fewer than 20% of them had seen action in World War II. Their only anti-tank weapons were obsolete bazookas, helplessly ineffective against the mighty Soviet T-34S. Isolated and cut off from one another, many, including the commander of the 24th, surrendered in the first days before learning that the Inminits gun took few prisoners. More often the part tied the hands of captives behind their backs and bayoneted them. GIs then became afflicted with bugout fever a yearning to return to their comfortable billets in Japan. Defeatism crept into the high command. Correspondents wrote grimly of an imminent American Dunkirk. MacArthur sent the Joint Chiefs a request for five more divisions and was outraged when they demurred explaining that they were buttressing the United States forces in NATO against the possibility of Russian moves there. At least in the early 1940s, he fumed, there had been a war in Europe. Now troops were being sent to a continent where, he believed, Soviet commanders were adopting a defensive stance, while the Pacific Basin, around which most of the human race lived, was being shortchanged. It was the old faulty issue of priorities, he wrote, under which the Far East was again at the bottom of the list. The quarrel was familiar, 
but this time it was invested with long-range significance which both he and the chiefs missed. If Washington was determined to increase and strengthen the United States' commitments to NATO despite the growing demands of the Korean War, the Korean effort must be finite, a prospect which the general, either then or later, could not accept. The short-range implications were also somber, but here MacArthur found an imaginative solution. He introduced what he called a buddy system, under which each GI was assigned rock to fight beside him. This immediately increased his 8th Army by 30,000 men. Then he set about doing what he did best, outwitting a powerful foe by skillful disposition of his own forces. 31 His most perceptive critics give him high marks here. Spanier writes that although self assurance and self confidence were responsible for some of MacArthur's more reprehensible qualities, they were also the virtues which heartened and benefited the free world in the dark days of July and August 1950. Rovier and Schlesinger conclude that he did what he had to do superbly. The general himself summed up his plan in four words trade space for time, time to land more men from Japan time to bring in heavy weapons, tanks, and supplies. His tactics were both brilliant and unorthodox. As he testified on Capitol Hill the following spring, he hoped by an arrogant display of strength to fool the enemy into the belief that I had a much greater resource at my disposal than I did. I managed to throw in a part of two battalions of infantry, who put up a magnificent resistance before they were destroyed, a resistance which resulted, perhaps, in one of the most vital successes that we had. The enemy undoubtedly could not understand that we would make an effort with such small forces. Instead of rushing rapidly forward to Pusan, which he could have reached within a week, without the slightest difficulty, he stopped to deploy his artillery. We gained ten days by that process. By that time we had landed. The 1st Cavalry Division on the east coast, and they moved over and formed a line of battle. From that time on I never had the slightest doubt about our ability to hold a beachhead. And on July 19, in the first communique that I recall I issued, I predicted that we would not be driven into the sea. 32 The Pentagon wasn't so sure, neither was the American public. Ozan, Yongdok, Danon, Chinongmi. The Nakdong Bulge, the strange names appeared in the United States headlines as a succession of front page maps depicted the Pusan perimeter, smaller each day. Ferocious PA attacks nearly chewed the 24th Division to bits and threw the survivors out of Tejun in July, then in minutes gun columns began hammering the 25th at Tegu, the main the United States supply base and communications hub. Gloomy and doubtful as was the situation at this time, MacArthur said, the news reports painted it much worse than it actually was. Certainly those dispatches were dark. Correspondents were wondering whether, in the tough phrase of the time, the general might run out of real estate. But Walt and Johnny Walker, Sinkf's troop commander, sounded equally desperate. There must be no further yielding under pressure of the enemy, he said rallying his men. From now on let every man stand or die. 33 Then, as July melted into August, the long retreat ended. Infantrymen of the 27th Regiment and their rock buddies dug in their heels and stopped the red tide at the walls of Tegu. MacArthur had been vindicated. The New York Times observed editorially that welcome as the news from the battlefront was. The chief cause for satisfaction and assurance surely to be found is the fact that it is Douglas MacArthur who directs this effort in the field. Fate could not have chosen a man better qualified to command the unreserved confidence of the people of this country. Here is a superb strategist and an inspired leader, a man of infinite patience and quiet stability under adverse pressure, a man equally capable of bold and decisive action. In every home in the United States today there must be a sure conviction that if any man can carry out successfully the task which Truman and the Security Council of the United Nations have given him, that man is the good soldier in Tokyo who has long since proved to the hilt his ability to serve his country well.
MacArthur reported that he believed that the enemy's plan and great opportunity depended on the speed with which he could overrun South Korea, once he had breached the Han and with overwhelming numbers and with superior weapons shattered South Korean resistance. This chance he has now lost through the extraordinary speed with which the 8th Army has been deployed from Japan to stem his rush. Late in August 9 North Korean infantry divisions and one armored division staged a massive attack in an attempt to overpower the defenders, but by now the general had the United States tanks and heavy artillery ashore, and the in minutes gun, weakened by casualties, its supple lines mercilessly savaged by Strutmeyer's bombers, was losing some of its vim. MacArthur's troops held on a 145-mile arc where, as summer waned, the lines of opposing trenches steadily grew stronger. 34 within that arc, which was small enough to be quickly crossed by jeep, the stockpiles of UN men in steel around Pusan grew larger every week. The 1st Cavalry Division arrived from Japan and the 2nd Infantry from home, then came 2,000 Tommies from Hong Kong, the first of 40,000 Commonwealth soldiers, followed by Frenchmen, Turks, Dutchmen, and Filipinos the van of supporting units from 13 other UN members. A Times correspondent cabled home, the outskirts of Pusan to a depth of 15 miles have become a vast arsenal and supply depot. 45-ton Pershing tanks with their 90mm guns are arriving in quantity. So are the big 155mm howitzers. There is plenty of oil, fuel, and motor transport. There are supplies for a winter campaign, tents, heaters, sleeping bags, and cold weather clothing. 35 it was a draw, and newspaper men wondered how it could become anything else. The mood of the GIs was fatalistic. They sang, the Dow, the GIZ, and Re, what do they want from me? Douglas MacArthur was too gifted a strategist to be bottled up indefinitely in a narrow enclave, however. Operation Blue Hearts, originally scheduled for July 22, had been cancelled because every available soldier had been needed in the southeastern tip of Korea that month, but soon he would have plenty of men. The United States, led by its president, was thoroughly aroused. Selected National Guard units were being called up. Recruiting drives had been intensified and draft quotas increased, to put 600,000 men in uniform as quickly as possible. To be sure, many of the replacements were neither enthusiastic nor cheerful. No one called them gung-ho, a Corporal Stephen Segg of Chicago doubtless spoke for thousands of others in the perimeter when he told a reporter, I'll fight for my country, but I'll be damned if I can see why I'm fighting to save this hellhole. Yet there were few organized protests against the war at home and fewer demonstrations. The new infantrymen were the younger brothers of the men who had fought in World War II. Patriotism was still strong, and the early rout of GIs by the in minute scum had stung the country's pride. 36 heavy fighting continued along the hot, dusty, 4,000 square mile beachhead fanning out around the port of Pusan. The first two weeks of September were particularly bloody, but the general, with complete mastery of sea and air, assured Washington that he now had a secure base. Losses were no longer greater than arriving replacements. His infantry outnumbered the foe, 92,000 to 70,000, and each day he had more material. As early as late July, convinced that the period of piecemeal entry into action was over, that the fight for time against space was won, he had felt confident enough to entrust the safety of the battlefield to Walker while he flew to Formosa for a conference with Chiang Kai-shek. 37 MacArthur had agreed with Washington's decision to decline Chiang's offer of three KMT divisions. Stilwell had warned him that the Chinese Nationalist Army was led largely by mere job holders and sustained only by its numbers, American support, and a cadre of leaders committed to a dog defensive, there. Old China. If the general needed raw manpower, he had plenty of eager South Korean volunteers. The prospect of transporting 33,000 men from Formosa was a logistical nightmare, the commander in chief concluded, so he advised the Pentagon that the Chinese nationalist contingent would be an albatross around our neck. At the same time, 
he couldn't ignore the Generalissimo, the Gimo, as he was known to old China hands. Truman had charged him with the defense of Chiang's island, you are to repel any attack upon Formosa and the Pesco doors, and MacArthur felt it necessary, in his words, to visit the island in order to determine its military capabilities for defense. Moreover, Washington wanted him to go. In its response to the KMT aid memo of June 29, the United States had advised Taipei that no final decision could be reached on the offer of the three divisions until the general could spare the time to consult with KMT authorities. In the last ten days of July the Joint Chiefs had repeatedly reminded MacArthur of their anxiety over the Formosa situation, and two of the chiefs, Collins and Hoyt Vandenberg, had flown to Tokyo to explain the president's concern over possible nationalist raids on the mainland. The general was given the unenviable job of explaining to Chiang, as tactfully as possible, that the Seventh Fleet would intercept any such raiders and send them home. 38 The date for his journey was fixed, July 31st. Then the picture blurs. The Pentagon advised the Daiki that certain policy matters relevant to Formosa were being discussed with the State Department, pending their outcome. The chiefs intimated, MacArthur might desire to send a senior officer to Formosa with the group on July 31st and go yourself later. However, the message concluded, please feel free to go, since the responsibility is yours. Evidently no copy of this telekin reached the State Department. Exxon was later under the impression that the MacArthur Chiang meeting was the general's idea. He writes, Instinct told us what experience later proved, to fear General MacArthur bearing explanations. Furthermore, better uses for the theater commander at this juncture came to mind, so a State Department officer was sent from Tokyo to Formosa with the explanation. But that cannot be the story. The senior the United States diplomat in Tokyo was suballed and he received no such instructions. Instead, two C-54s took off bearing 16 officers, including Willoughby, Armand, Strutmeyer, and Whitney. MacArthur had told Sobol that he wouldn't be a member of the party. Sobol sent word of this to Dean Rusk, then Assistant Secretary of State for Far Eastern Affairs, and Rusk routinely filed the report. I expected to play no role in the affair, Sobol recalls. He was satisfied with the general's explanation, which was that since only military matters would be discussed, he wanted to avoid any suggestion of political implications. But Exxon, unhappy over Truman's pledge to defend Formosa, would see this as subterfuge to exclude a state representative from the group. He was as suspicious of MacArthur as MacArthur was of him, and, at times, as paranoid.39 bad weather kept the C-54S circling over Taipei for an hour and a half. Bounding down the ramp at last, the general gave Chiang what his staff called his number one handshake, right hands clasped, his left hand gripping Chiang's right elbow. How do you do, Generalissimo? He boomed. It was nice of you to come down and meet me. The Jimo didn't understand a word of this but interpreters were everywhere, and the American staff officers plunged into a busy day with their KMT counterparts, studying maps and examining beach obstacles while their commander conferred with Chiang. At the end of the day MacArthur said he believed he had a feel of the island's defensive plans and a grasp of the KMT intelligence net on the mainland. At a formal dinner, Madame Chiang, who spoke fluent English, personally greeted by name every guest as he arrived, Whitney recalls, though she had never met most of us and probably had only heard of us through an official briefing for the occasion, how she did it I do not know. Forty back in the Daiki, the Supreme Commander issued a brief statement. His visit to Formosa, he said, had been primarily for the purpose of making a short reconnaissance of the potential of its defense against possible attack. The policy has been enunciated that this island, including the Pescadores, is not under the present circumstances subject to military invasion. Sinkf KMT conferences on all levels had been most cordial and responsive in every respect. Among the problems which were discussed was the prompt and generous offer of the Chinese government to send troops to join the United Nations forces in Korea. 
Both parties had agreed that because such action at this time might seriously jeopardize the defense of Formosa it would be inadvisable. The general concluded, it has been a great pleasure for me to meet my old comrade in arms of the last war. His indomitable determination to resist communist domination arouses my sincere admiration. His determination parallels the common interest and purpose of Americans, that all peoples in the Pacific shall be free, not slave. 41 As MacArthur prose went, this was subdued. On the other hand, the Generalissimo's communique, which followed it, was roguish. The Gimo crowed that the talks had covered, not just the joint defense of Formosa, but also Sino-American military cooperation. Obviously he was trying to drive a wedge between the diplomats in Foggy Bottom and the UN Commander-in-Chief in Tokyo. Over half the pronouncement was devoted to expressions of admiration for MacArthur's determined leadership in the common fight against totalitarianism in Asia and for his deep understanding of the menace of communism. Now, he declared, victory over Mao's mainland armies was assured. 42 This was front page news in America. MacArthur affected surprise, but he should have known that newspapers, ever in search of controversy and aware of the delicate relationship between the United States and Formosa, would seize upon every phrase and read labyrinthian meanings into it. He and the Generalissimo should have said nothing. Instead, as Truman noted, the visit raised much speculation in the world press. Chiang Kai-shek's aides let it be known that the Far East commander was in the fullest agreement with their chief on the course of action to be taken. The implication was, and quite a few of our newspapers said so, that MacArthur rejected my policy of neutralizing Formosa and that he favored a more aggressive method. Trumbull Higgins observed that the Generalissimo's pointed remarks about the general's grasp of communism left the impression that the government in Washington understood communism rather less well. For Chiang an opportunity such as this to retaliate against a long series of Truman administration rebuffs must have been sweet. The United Press quoted a State Department spokesman as saying, in response to a question, that the department did not know why MacArthur had failed to take his political advisor with him. Many commentators in the United States, including some who held a high regard for MacArthur, were dismayed. David Lawrence's conservative The United States News and World Report said, there are those who doubt that a general disposed to brusqueness, independence and personal decisiveness is the best of diplomatic material. Certainly some of the men around him weren't. Time quoted a reliable source in the Diakias saying that MacArthur believed, 1, the Korean War would be useless if the United States did not fight communism wherever it arose in Asia, 2, this meant backing Chiang's nationalists, the British in Hong Kong, and the anti-communists of Indochina, Siam and Burma, 3, anything less than this firm, determined action would invite communism to sweep over all of Asia. 43 Chiang accepted, that had been the United States foreign policy since the National Security Council adoption of policy paper NSC 68 in April, but the administration in Washington had no intention of applying that doctrine retroactively to the decrepit regime in Taipei. Exxon was apoplectic. He had been bumfounded, he writes, just to read in the press on August 1 that General MacArthur had arrived in Formosa, kissed him. Chiang's hand, and gone into conference with her husband. The secretary fired off a message to the unfortunate Sebald, demanding a full report on the talks from MacArthur. Sebald says that he tried to get one, but the general first appeared to be tired and promised to tell me about the trip later, and then made it clear that he had no intention of providing details, explaining that he had been careful to confine the discussions to military talks of a technical nature and that hence what had been said and done was his sole responsibility, not that of the State Department. Sebald protested, military agreements, he pointed out, had a direct bearing on foreign policy. MacArthur replied irritably, Bill, I don't know what you're talking about. The Formosa policy has already been established by President Truman's order of June 28 directing the Seventh Fleet to prevent any communist attack from the mainland or any assault from Formosa against the mainland. He had, he said, 
sent a full account of his meeting with the Jaima to the Defense Department. But that didn't satisfy Aikson. He wanted a report to him, through his ambassador in Tokyo. He didn't get one. They reached an impasse. Sebald, unhappy, sensed a growing rift between the American authorities in Tokyo and Washington which, if uncorrected, could only lead to disaster. 44 Apparently MacArthur shared his apprehension. Privately he told Sebald that his task of protecting Formosa was complicated by state's unfriendly attitude toward Chiang, that chances of defending it would be improved by more cordial relations between the Generalissimo and the United States, but publicly he issued one of his rare conciliatory statements. It hadn't dawned on him, he said, that his visit to Taipei would be interpreted as being sinister in any way. He still didn't see how it could be so construed. If he was wrong, he was sorry. It is, he told the press on August 5, extraordinarily difficult for me at times to exercise that degree of patience which is unquestionably demanded if the long-time policies which have been decreed are to be successfully accomplished without repercussions which would be detrimental to the well-being of the world but I am restraining myself to the best of my ability and am generally satisfied with the progress being made. Thus far, one's sympathies are with MacArthur. The mission hadn't been his idea, he had behaved scrupulously, and his statement, if he had to issue one, had been discreet. His difficulty was that Chiang was then the typhoid Mary of American diplomacy. Any contact with him was risky. 45 Aikson insisted that the general's knuckles be wrapped, so Secretary of Defense Johnson reminded him that he must continue to block any KMT forays against the Chinese coast, adding sharply, no one other than the president as commander in chief has the authority to order or authorize preventive action against concentrations on the mainland. MacArthur replied that he understood and would be meticulously governed by the directive, but to make assurance doubly sure and avoid any further embarrassment, Truman sent his roving envoy, Averill Harriman, to Tokyo so that, in the president's words, the general might be given a first-hand account of the political planning in Washington. 46 accompanied by Generals Loris Norstad of the Air Force and Matthew B. Ridgway, the Army's Deputy Chief of Staff, Harriman was met by MacArthur at Hanadu at 9.15 on the morning of August 6. During their drive to the embassy guesthouse, Harriman later reported to Truman, the general enthusiastically described the satisfactory political development in Japan since my last visit. He spoke of the great quality of the Japanese, his desire to work, the satisfaction of the Japanese in work, his respect for the dignity of work. He compared it favorably to the desire in the United States for more luxury and less work. Although Americans might forget it, the Supreme Commander was still carrying his full burden as ruler of Nippon. It was clear to Harriman that pacificatory scap, not warring synth, was the role he enjoyed most. 47 Over the next two days, the presidential envoy flew to Pusan for a quick inspection of UN lines and conferred with the general for more than eight hours, sometimes alone, sometimes with Norstad and Ridgway. After the first day an aide confided in a correspondent that the two men were pretty much in agreement. There were no details, however, not even for SCAP officials. In fact, Sebald notes, the underlying purpose of Harriman's visit never was entirely clear to us. Although we had a definite stake in it, we could only guess, as did many others, that the president was seeking to reinforce his strict policy that Formosa should not be used as a base of operations against mainland China. 48 That was the gist of it. MacArthur promised a swift victory in Korea, said he hoped he could launch his offensive there before the onset of winter because delay would increase the chances of Chinese intervention and predicted that if Mao tried to seize Formosa he himself would assume command there and deliver such a crushing defeat it would be one of the decisive battles of the world, but most of the time was spent discussing the shaky relations between Taipei and Washington. The general acknowledged that Chiang could never reconquer China, though he suggested facetiously that it might be a good idea to let him land and get rid of him that way. His own problem, he said, was strategic. He had been charged with the defense of Formosa, 
and in that role he was crippled by the tension between the KMT and the United States administration. We have not improved our position by kicking Chiang around, he said, and I hope that the president will do something to relieve the strain between the State Department and the Generalissimo. That was reasonable. But then he encroached on diplomatic prerogatives by adding that he would never recognize Peking because that would strengthen Mao's prestige. It should be the, the United States goal, he said, to destroy that prestige. 49 Harriman explained that the president wants me to tell you that you must not permit Chiang to be the cause of starting a war with the Chinese communists, the effect of which might drag us into a world war. Reviving the KMT forces for a full-scale attack on the mainland, he said, had not been the intent of America's UN allies in supporting the United States' resistance to North Korean aggression on that peninsula. MacArthur replied, as a soldier, I will obey any orders I receive from the president. However, he thought it his duty to point out that in his view the Seventh Fleet's patrolling of the Formosa Strait cut two ways. It shielded Chiang but it also protected the Red Chinese. According to his intelligence, it had released two Red Field armies from defensive positions in South China. Later he would remind Washington of that warning. 50 Seeing his visitors off at Hanada, the general shouted loudly, Harriman recalls, so all could hear, the only fault of your trip was that it was too short. The envoy wrote his report to Truman during the return flight. MacArthur's trip to Formosa, he wrote, had been perfectly natural, and he was convinced that the Supreme Commander was loyal to constitutional authority. On that basis he felt that political and personal considerations should be put to one side and our government, should, deal with General MacArthur on the lofty level of the great national asset which he is. Yet, Harriman continued for reasons which are rather difficult to explain. I did not feel that we came to a full agreement on the way we believe things should be handled on Formosa and with the Generalissimo. He accepted the president's position and will act accordingly, but without full conviction. He has a strange idea that we should back anybody who will fight communism, even though he could not give an argument why the Generalissimo's fighting communists would be a contribution towards the effective dealing with the communists in China. I pointed out to him the basic conflict of interest between the U. S. Position as to the future of Formosa, namely, the preventing of Formosa's falling into hostile hands. While, Chiang, on the other hand, had only the burning ambition to use Formosa as a stepping stone for his re-entry to the mainland. I explained in great detail why Chiang was a liability and the great danger of a split in the unity of the United Nations. I pointed out the great importance of maintaining UN unity among the friendly countries, and the complications that might result from any missteps in dealing with China and Formosa.51 On the whole Truman felt reassured. Formosa accepted, he and the National Security Council now shared the General's conviction that we should back anyone who will fight communism, and since his Far East commander had apparently agreed to toe the administration line, he told a press conference that he and MacArthur saw eye to eye on Formosa. The president assumed, he later wrote, that this would be the last of it. It wasn't, even cautioning the general, he would learn, was hazardous. Three days after Harriman's departure Scap issued a new statement excoriating those who had interpreted his trip to Formosa as a political move. The visit, he said, had been maliciously represented to the public by those who invariably in the past have propagandized a policy of defeatism and appeasement in the Pacific. Since defeatism and appeasement were precisely the words Republican critics were using to describe administration courses of action in Asia, MacArthur appeared to be back in the fray. Sebald expressed deep distress over this new incident. These public statements, he wrote, gave aid and comfort to the enemy by demonstrating divisions in our leadership and weaknesses in our national purpose. During World War II, he later noted, the general had presided over the victorious alliance which had defeated Japan. Now the alliance itself became the second front in MacArthur's constant skirmishing with the outside world. 52 That was on a Thursday. 
On Monday Secretary of Defense Johnson sent SCAP fresh instructions, once more forbidding any KMT sallies across Formosa Strait on the ground that the most vital national interest requires that no action of ours precipitates general war or gives excuse to others to do so. The general tartly replied that he fully understood the presidential determination to protect the communist mainland. That was insolent. If Washington meant to take a hard line with him, this was the time to do it. Instead Truman encouraged him by altering his stand on Formosa. MacArthur had recommended a military mission for Formosa. The president now approved it, ordering a survey by MacArthur's staff of Chiang's army's needs, reconnaissance flights along the Chinese coast, and extensive military aid to nationalist China. Actually these were political, not military, actions stratagems designed to relieve grand old party and China lobby pressure on the White House. But the general could not have been expected to know that. He was, as Clark Lee put it, jubilant over the apparent reversal of American policy of abandoning Chiang Kai-shek. That same week Clyde A. Lewis, the leader of the veterans of foreign wars, invited him to send a message to be read at the forthcoming VFW annual encampment. Whitney tells us, MacArthur decided that this was an excellent opportunity to place himself on record as being squarely behind the president. 53 It was an excellent opportunity to remain silent. The United States policy in his theater was changing so swiftly that even those close to the Oval Office had trouble keeping up with it, and a general halfway around the globe, anxious to see in it what he wanted to see, had no business interpreting it for veterans or anybody else. But MacArthur plunged ahead. He wrote Lewis that in view of misconceptions being voiced concerning the relationship of Formosa to our strategic potential in the Pacific, he deemed it wise to set forth his own opinions on it. Nothing, he said, could be more fallacious than the threadbare argument that if we defend Formosa we alienate continental Asia. Those who spoke thus do not understand the Orient. They do not grasp that it is in the pattern of oriental psychology to respect and follow aggressive, resolute, and dynamic leadership, to turn quickly from a leadership characterized by timidity or vacillation, and they underestimate the oriental mentality. Nothing in the last five years has so inspired the Far East as the American determination to preserve the bulwarks of our Pacific Ocean strategic position. Chief among these was Formosa which he described as an unsinkable carrier tender. He said, the geographic location of Formosa is such that in the hands of a power unfriendly to the United States it constitutes an enemy salient in the very center of America's strategic dispositions in the Pacific, and he noted that historically, Formosa has been a springboard for aggressive powers, the most recent example of this being the utilization of it by the Japanese in World War II when, at the outbreak of hostilities, it played an important part as the staging area and supporting base for the various Japanese invasion convoys. It was essential, he continued, to counter the lustful thrusts of those who stand for slavery as against liberty, for atheism against God. He concluded that the president's decision to stand fast against North Korean aggression had lighted into flame a lamp of hope throughout Asia that was burning dimly towards extinction. It marked for the Far East the focal and turning point in this area's struggle for freedom. It swept aside in one stroke all the hypocrisy and the sophistry which has confused and deluded so many people distant from the actual scene. 54 According to Whitney, and no one ever contradicted him, a duplicate of this remarkable epistle was sent to the Department of the Army on August 18, ten days before it was to be read to the VFW delegates. Then it languished, filed or unread, until advance copies were distributed, as a routine courtesy, to correspondents covering SCAP. The first high official in Washington to learn of it was the man who, in the opinion of the Grand Old Party, was the government's chief hypocrite and sophist. An Associated Press man called Dean Aikson on the evening of Friday, August 25th, and read it to him over the telephone. The secretary consulted his colleagues, all of whom, he writes, were outraged at the effrontery and damaging effect at home and abroad of MacArthur's message and agreed that this insubordination could not be tolerated. 
by then the White House press room had brought a copy of the statement to the Oval Office. Truman interpreted it as a call for a military policy of aggression, based on Formosa's position. The whole tenor of the message was critical of the very policy which he had so recently told Harriman he would support. There was no doubt in my mind that the world would read it that way and that it must have been intended that way. 55 The Veterans Convention was still three days away, but it was too late to suppress the General's message. Life, which was running it as its editorial that week, was already on the presses, the United States News and World Report, carrying the full text, was in the mails. In England, The Observer, The Manchester Guardian, and the Times of London were preparing to condemn it. As Wayne Morse later pointed out, its impact could not have been greater had it already been delivered in person. And the timing, from the President's point of view, could hardly have been worse. He had just proposed that the UN investigate the Formosa situation in the hope of reducing the areas of conflict in the Far East. He felt that General MacArthur's message, which the world might mistake as an expression of American policy, contradicted this. Nor was that all of it. The day before, Secretary of the Navy Francis Matthews had delivered a speech in Boston openly advocating a preventive war with Russia, and Louis Johnson had confided to reporters that he agreed. It looked as though Truman might be losing control of his administration. 56 The President gave serious thought, he wrote, to relieving General MacArthur as our military field commander in the Far East and replacing him with General Bradley. I could keep MacArthur in command of the Japanese occupation, taking Korea and Formosa out of his hands. But after weighing it carefully I decided against such a step. It would have been difficult to avoid the appearance of a demotion, and I had no desire to hurt General MacArthur personally. My only concern was to let the world know that his statement was not official policy. He had at least two other concerns. Even then, he knew that curbing MacArthur's authority would set off a major political firestorm in the United States. And he could not have done it without dismissing Matthews and Johnson, who were friends and good Democrats. Still, he felt he had to do something about the general. He summoned Aikson, Johnson, Harriman, the Joint Chiefs, Secretary of the Treasury John W. Snyder, and Steve Early, Johnson's deputy, to a Saturday morning council of war. 57 His lips white and compressed, in Aikson's phrase, the president dispensed with the usual greetings and polled them, asking each man whether he had known of the VFW letter in advance. None had, it had come, Truman later wrote, as a surprise and a shock to all. He said he wanted a public retraction from MacArthur and then, still in a cold anger, he stalked from the meeting. His instructions had seemed concise, but after his departure there was no unanimity among the others over what the next step should be, and how it should be taken. MacArthur was a fearsome figure to the chiefs. Early was uneasy, he felt that a public retraction would violate MacArthur's right to free speech and suggested that the president and the general confer on telecon screens. Johnson, who as Secretary of Defense would have the thankless task of dealing directly with MacArthur, proposed that they let the letter be read to the veterans and then announce that it was only one man's opinion and not the official policy of the government. The Secretary of State disagreed, commenting caustically that the issue seemed to him to be who was president. Johnson, still unhappy, persisted. Do we dare send a message that the president directs him to withdraw his statement? Since those were Truman's orders, Aikson replied, there was no alternative. That afternoon the reluctant Johnson cabled the Daiki. The president of the United States directs that you withdraw your message for national encampment of veterans of foreign wars, because various features with respect to Formosa are in conflict with the policy of the United States and its position in the United Nations. 58 MacArthur instantly complied, but he was, he said, utterly astonished. Sending for a copy of his VFW statement and re-examining it, he wrote, he could find no feature that was not in complete support of the president. He replied to Johnson, my message was most carefully prepared to fully support the president's policy position. 
My remarks were calculated only to support his declaration and I am unable to see wherein they might be interpreted otherwise. He was hurt and angry, and with some justification. He was capable of impudence and provocation, but in this instance his only sin was in taking Truman's pronouncements on Formosa at face value. The president was following one course in the United Nations and another in fencing with his critics on Capitol Hill. MacArthur, believing that the administration was determined to keep the island out of hostile hands as a link in the, the United States defense system, had unintentionally embarrassed the chief executive in the World Forum. He was wrong to have said anything, the contratom over his trip to Taipei should have taught him that but right in his paraphrasing of what the White House was telling the American people. He was a casualty of rough politics, a loser in a game whose rules he never mastered. 59 This bruising encounter fueled his paranoia. To this day, he wrote at the end of his life, I do not know who managed to construe my statement as meaning exactly the opposite of what it said, and how this person or persons could have so easily deceived the president. Somebody had to be to blame, there must be a villain somewhere, so his reasoning went, and Whitney, his starets, encouraged him in it. It was logical, Whitney told him, to assume that the VFW letter had innocently run afoul of plans being hatched in the State Department to succumb to British pressure and desert the nationalist government on Formosa, and it was a clear illustration of the devious workings of the Washington London team. As Walter Millis observes, a theater commander in wartime who really believed that the civil authorities were working against him would surely be compelled to resign. Instead MacArthur nursed this new grudge, watched warily for more blows from Washington, and vowed to confound his enemies by unsheathing his sword in a dazzling stroke that would blind them all. 60 Over his desk the general had hung a framed message, Youth is not a time of life, it is a state of mind. By all accounts, he himself continued to be buoyant. Visitors found it hard to believe that he was in his 71st year. In October 1950 George Kenney found him still tall, erect, graceful, and a fine figure of a man. His step is firm. His eyes are clear and alert. His face and hands are without wrinkles. His dress is meticulous. His hair is thin on the top of his head, but there is no grey in it. Kenny had heard the gossip that Scap dyed his hair, watching him washing it in the shower. The airman said, General, I wish you would tell me what brand of hair dye you use. My hair is beginning to show quite a bit of grey. MacArthur laughed, stepped out of the shower, toweled his head vigorously, and held out the unculled cloth. He said, It's good at that. See, it doesn't even stain the towel. But I won't tell you what it is. 61 Had he needed dye, he might have used it. He was as vain as ever. Like President Eisenhower and Kennedy, he rarely permitted himself to be photographed wearing glasses. In the privacy of the embassy, however, he was rarely without them. There he could be himself. Within its walls the only visible reminders of the horrors across the Korea Strait were silent motion pictures from the battlefield, according to Norman Thompson. These reels were rushed back to Tokyo each afternoon and shown evenings before the feature films. Yet in conversations afterward he avoided discussions of them. Mostly he preferred familial topics, the flowing diplomatic career of his nephew, Douglas MacArthur II, for example, or his twelve-year-old son's first dance. Wearing the thick soled shoes then fashionable among American teenagers, Arthur had escorted Joyce Yamazaki, the nice eye daughter of a scap employee, and like most boys on such occasions, he had been painfully shy. The general was eager for every detail. Fully debriefed, he then offered several suggestions on how to outmaneuver rivals for the prettiest girl. MacArthur's first words on landing at Hanada after a tour of the front were always, Where's Jean? She was always on the tarmac, bounding up and down for a glimpse of him. She wanted his family to be, so to speak, a privileged sanctuary. At home she hid newspapers and magazines criticizing his conduct of the war, though she knew it was pointless, others mailed clippings to his office from the states, 
and she watched over him anxiously, more like a mother than a wife. She insisted he slip between the sheets at bedtime before she opened his window. But, Jean, I can open windows. He would protest. Ignoring his objections, she would finish the job and retire to her own bedroom, though not to sleep, in ten minutes or so she would peek in to be sure he had drifted off. Despite his remonstrances, his need for her attentions grew as the peninsula conflict grew. He seemed to sense whether or not she was nearby in the night. Once, when he returned from Korea fighting a cold, she put him to bed early, after he had dropped off, she tiptoed downstairs to read to Arthur. Ten minutes later they heard him shuffling down in his slippers. Entering in his old robe, he grinned sheepishly and said to them, where is everybody? It's lonesome up there. 62 in the morning he would be the five-star general again, however, pacing about briskly and dictating crisp memoranda while she typed. Other thoughts he jotted on the backs of envelopes or any other scrap of paper handy, these would be crammed into his pocket and transcribed in the diary. Revising and editing typescripts, he was polishing his plans for his great end run around the enemy. Blue Hearts had been revived and rechristened Cremite. He had told Harriman that the North Koreans were as capable and tough of foe as he had ever faced, but that they were vulnerable because the best of them were concentrated in the southeast tip of the peninsula, hammering at Johnny Walker's 8th Army perimeter. Now he meant to exploit that vulnerability. Earlier, he had reported to the Pentagon that an attempted UN breakout on the Pusan front would be costly and indecisive redolent of World War I siege warfare, impaling UN troops on the in-minute scun's spearhead instead of moving against its exposed sides and rump. Therefore he had radioed the Joint Chiefs on July 23rd, operation planned mid-September is amphibious landing of a two-division corps in rear of enemy lines. The alternative is a frontal attack which can only result in a protracted and expensive campaign. Afterward he would write in his reminiscences, I was now finally ready for the last great stroke to bring my plan into fruition. My Han River dream as a possibility had begun to assume the certainties of reality, a turning movement deep into the flank and rear of the enemy that would sever his supple lines and encircle all his forces south of Seoul. Sixty-three great turning movements are as old as warfare though only commanders possessed of military genius have been able to execute them successfully. Hannibal did it repeatedly by adroit deployment of his cavalry in the Punic Wars, so did Napoleon, who wrote of his maneuver against Treviso to relieve enemy pressure on the Adige River in 1813. It is my style, my manner of doing things. It was Robert T. Lee's style, too. His use of Jackson at Chancellorsville is a classic example and it had long been MacArthur's manner of doing things, as he had demonstrated along the New Guinea-Philippine axis, most memorably at Hollandia. A victorious blow in Korea, however, depended on speed, the Russians were rushing naval mines to their power puppets, and soon every South Korean port would be sown with them. The general had no doubts about his ability to move his men rapidly, to display, in Churchill's words, that intense clarity of view and promptitude to act which are the qualities of great commanders. One of MacArthur's greatest attributes, recalls Vice Admiral Arthur D. Struble, was to get going and to hit quick, but persuading the Pentagon to match his pace was more difficult. 64 During Truman's second administration the chairman of the Joint Chiefs was Omar Bradley. MacArthur was convinced that the chairman hated him because in 1945, when planning the invasion of Kyushu, he had rejected Bradley as a senior commander. It seems extremely unlikely that the chairman would have borne such a grudge, though it is true that he took a dim view of a Korean seat to sure envelopment. Testifying before a Senate committee in 1949, he had said, I am wondering whether we shall ever have another large scale amphibious operation. Frankly, the atomic bomb, properly delivered, almost precludes such a possibility. That was not Bradley's most prescient moment, but neither was it the only basis for the Joint Chief's reluctance to approve MacArthur's grand design. The army was desperately short of troops, a partial consequence of Washington's determination to reinforce European garrisons. 
Collins told Sinkfin the Daiki, General, you are going to have to win the war out here with the troops available to you in Japan and Korea, and MacArthur, according to Arthur W. Radford, smiled, shook his head, and said, Joe, you are going to have to change your mind. In message after message the UN commander bombarded the Pentagon with reasons for an amphibious assault, it would present the PAR with a two-front war, starve their troops, cut their communications, seize a large port, and deal the enemy a devastating psychological blow by recapturing Seoul. He believed the chiefs would yield to him because he knew, like John Jervis before Cape St. Vincent in 1797, that a victory is very essential at the moment. Sure enough, on July 25th they gave in and agreed to provide him with marines to lead the way. MacArthur's scheme, writes Robert D. Heinl, Jr., now had its cutting edge. 65 Almost immediately Washington had agonizing second thoughts. The general was maddeningly vague about just where he proposed to put his troops ashore, and now the chiefs began to suspect he had reason to conceal it. He did. He had chosen the unlikeliest harbor on the peninsula, Incheon, on the Yellow Sea, 150 miles north of Pusan and the landing area nearest Seoul. Incheon is about as large as Jersey City, as ugly as Liverpool, and as dreary as Belfast. Its anchorage is sheltered and its waters always ice-free, but this, notes Heinl, is about all that can be said for Incheon as an amphibious target. When MacArthur confided his plan to Rear Admiral James H. Doyle, who would have to execute it, Doyle was dumbfounded. He knew that Incheon had no beaches, only piers and sea walls. The attack would have to be launched in the heart of the city. The waters approaching it could easily be mined, possibly they already were. Currents there ran as high as eight knots. In any one of a hundred turns, a sunken or disabled ship could block the little bay which was interlaced with moles and breakwaters. Steaming shoreward from the sea, vessels maneuvering through the rocks and shoals of flying fish channel would find their objective masked by a squat, fortified obstacle, Wolmidu, Moon Tip Island, which jutted into the channel and would have to be captured before any landings on the wharves could be attempted. 66 Worst of all were the tides, among the highest in the world. Indeed, the tidal range, some 32 feet, was greatly exceeded only by that in the Bay of Fundy. Except at high tide, the port was reduced to wide, oozing, grey mud flats, rendering it wholly unusable by moving boats. The only dates upon which surf would be high enough to accommodate amphibious ships and landing craft in 1950 were September 15, September 27, and October 11. September 15th was best, MacArthur never considered any other date, but high tide then crested first at dawn, too early for awkward troop transports to maneuver beforehand in the narrow passage, and again a half hour after sundown, too late for a daylight attack. The general had chosen 70,000 marines and GIs for the assault and placed this force, X Corps, under his chief of staff, the bilious Ned Armand. As many marines as possible would have to be put ashore during the two hours of the first flood tide, twelve hours would pass before the second flood tide would permit reinforcement. The oil's gunnery officer said afterward, we drew up a list of every natural and geographic handicap, and engine had them all. The oil's communications officer said, make up a list of amphibious don'ts and you have an exact description of the engine operation. 67 MacArthur turned a deaf ear to them. He noted at the time that in 1894 and 1904 the Japanese had landed at Incheon, seized all Korea, and pursued the enemy across the Yalu into Manchuria. The anguished naval officers pointed out that 19th century vessels had much slower drafts. The general serenely replied that he was sure that the problem could be solved. They were unconvinced, so were the Marines, Strutmeyer's flyers, and MacArthur's own staff. Every flag and general officer in Tokyo, including Walker, whose Eighth Army would be freed by a successful drive against the North Korean rear, tried to talk him out of it. Meanwhile, time was growing ever shorter. 
some of the Marines had already sailed from San Diego, yet the Pentagon, in one officer's words, did not yet know the name of the game. On Sunday, August 20th, the Joint Chiefs, thoroughly alarmed now that they knew Synth's target, sent two of their members, Collins and Admiral Forrest P. Sherman, to Japan to find out, in Collins's later words, exactly what the plans were. MacArthur met their plane and, at 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday, convened a major strategic conference in the Daiki to thrash the matter out. 68 It was clear from the outset that the two chiefs had come to dissuade the general. Collins, describing Inchin as an impossibility, proposed Kansan, a hundred miles to the south, as an alternative. It lacked Injun's drawbacks and was much closer to the Pusan beachhead. Lemuel C. Shepard, Jr., of the Marine Corps fervently seconded the motion. Sherman, the man, MacArthur knew, that he must convince, said nothing, but his expression was grim. The day before, according to Shepard's journal, the Admiral had vehemently expressed himself as opposed to the proposed plan. Lesser naval officers took the floor to point out that the general's objective violated all seven criteria set forth in USF-6, their amphibious Bible. Synth's officers were glum and silent. Finally, after nine critics had completed an 80-minute presentation, MacArthur rose. Afterward he wrote, I waited a moment or so to collect my thoughts. I could feel the tension rising in the room. Armin shifted uneasily in his chair. If ever a silence was pregnant, this one was. I could almost hear my father's voice telling me as he had so many years before, Doug, councils of war breed timidity and defeatism. 69 of the 30-minute performance which followed, Doyle said, if MacArthur had gone on the stage, you never would have heard of John Barrymore. The general began by telling them that the very arguments you have made as to the impracticabilities involved confirmed his faith in the plan, for the enemy commander will reason that no one would be so brash as to make such an attempt. Surprise, he said, is the most vital element for success in war. Suddenly he was reminding them of a lesson they had all learned in grammar school. The Marquis de Montcalm believed in 1759 that it was impossible for an armed force to scale the precipitous river banks south of the then walled city of Quebec, and therefore concentrated his formidable defences along the more vulnerable banks north of the city. But General James Wolfe and a small force did indeed come up the Street Lawrence River and scale those heights. On the plains of Abraham, Wolfe won a stunning victory that was made possible almost entirely by surprise. Thus, he captured Quebec and in effect ended the French and Indian War. Like Montcalm, the North Koreans would regard an Incheon landing as impossible. Like Wolfe, I could take them by surprise. 70 The amphibious landing, he said, is the most powerful tool we have. To employ it properly, we must strike hard and deep. Injun's hurdles were real, but they are not insuperable. He said, My confidence in the Navy is complete, and in fact I seem to have more confidence in the Navy than the Navy has in itself. Looking at Sherman, he said, The Navy has never let me down in the past, and it will not let me down this time. As to a constant landing, he believed it would be ineffective. It would be an attempted envelopment which would not envelop, a short envelopment, and therefore futile. Better no flank movement than one such as this. The only result would be a hookup with Walker's troops. This would simply be sending more troops to help Walker hang on, and hanging on is not good enough. The enemy will merely roll back on his lines of supply and communication. Kunsen, the only alternative to Injun, would be the continuation of the savage sacrifice we are making at Pusan, with no hope of relief in sight. He paused dramatically. Then, are you content to let our troops stay in that bloody perimeter like beef cattle in the slaughterhouse? Who will take the responsibility for such a tragedy? Certainly, I will not. 71 By pouncing on Inchin and then Seoul, he said, he would cut the enemy's supply line and seal off the entire southern peninsula. By seizing Seoul I would completely paralyze the enemy's supply system, coming and going. This in turn will paralyze the fighting power of the troops that now face Walker. 
without munitions and food they will soon be helpless and disorganized, and can easily be overpowered by our smaller but well supplied forces. Pointing to Injun on the wall map, he said, gentlemen, this is our anvil, and Johnny Walker can smash against it from the south. If he was wrong about the landing, I will be there personally and will immediately withdraw our forces. Doyle, stirred, spoke up, no, General, we don't know how to do that. Once we start ashore we'll keep going. MacArthur had reached them. When another man pointed out that enemy batteries could command the dead end channel, Sherman, intractable till then, sniffed and said, I wouldn't hesitate to take a ship in there. The general snapped, spoken like a Farragut. He concluded in a hushed voice, I can almost hear the ticking of the second hand of destiny. We must act now or we will die. Injun will succeed. And it will save 100,000 lives. 72 It was almost a minute before his audience shifted in their chairs. Then Sherman said, Thank you. A great voice in a great cause. The Admiral told Shepard that he thought the General had been spellbinding, and he said to another officer, I'm going to back the engine operation. I think it's sound. As Sinkf's charm wore off, they began to have second thoughts. The next day Sherman said uneasily, I wish I had that man's optimism. Collins wanted Conson kept alive as an alternative, and one general officer, believing now that he had been mesmerized by MacArthur, gloomily called Injun a 5,000 to one shot. Nevertheless, the following Monday, four days later, the chiefs wired scap, we concur after reviewing the information brought back by General Collins and Admiral Sherman in making preparations and executing a turning movement by amphibious forces on the west coast of Korea, either at Incheon in the event the enemy defenses prove ineffective, or at a favorable beach south of Incheon if one can be located. We understand that alternative plans are being developed to best exploit the situation as it develops. 73 It was a green light, though a dim one. Obviously the chiefs were watching their own flanks. On September 7, eight days before the landing, MacArthur received a message from them which, he wrote afterward, chilled me to the marrow of my bones. They informed him that they had noted with considerable concern the recent trend of events in Korea. In the light of the commitment of all the reserves available to the Eighth Army, they continued, we desire your estimate as to the feasibility and chance of success of projected operation. MacArthur's pencil slashed out his reply, there is no question in my mind as to the feasibility of the operation and I regard its chance of success as excellent. After Bradley had conferred with Truman, the chiefs huddled again. Then they sent the general a cryptic cable, we approve your plan and the president has been so informed. MacArthur dryly told his staff that this message, set alongside the other, meant that the Pentagon was establishing an anticipatory alibi in case the expedition should run into trouble. What none of them foresaw was that a victory at Incheon would make him appear invincible and the chiefs impotent, that should he then suggest that one battalion walk on water, in Ridgway's words, there might have been someone ready to give it a try. 74 In the history of arms certain crack troops stand apart, elite units which demonstrated gallantry in the face of overwhelming odds. There were the Greeks and Persians at Thermopylae, Xenophon's 10,000, the Bowman of Agincourt, the Spanish Tercios, the French Foreign Legion at Cameroon, the Old Contemptibles of 1914, the Brigade of Guards at Dunkirk. And there was also the 1st Marine Division at Incheon. Veterans of Guadalcanal, Cape Gloucester, Peleliu, and Okinawa. The Levinecks were the cutting edge of the force which the hesitant Joint Chiefs agreed to let MacArthur put ashore behind enemy lines on September 15. In peak condition, thoroughly trained in amphibious warfare, they were now in the hands of the only army commander who really understood that kind of fighting. They represented America's boldest service and Douglas MacArthur was the country's senior officer, senior, said one of his subordinates, to everyone but God. Heinle writes, to find a parallel to MacArthur, in seniority, in professional virtuosity, and in autocracy, egotism and personal style, too, 
would take us back to Winfield Scott. 75 of his stormy relationship with the Polk administration, Scott said, I do not desire to place myself in the most perilous of positions, a fire upon my rear, from Washington, and the fire in front from the Mexicans. He solved the problem by mingling with his troops, beyond the reach of couriers from the War Department, and MacArthur, similarly, had decided to take the field tactically. Rather than risk the gusts of Typhoon Kazir, now between Iwo Jima and Kyushu, the general left Tokyo three days early, carrying a cloth bag into which Jean had packed an extra pipe, tobacco and cigars, two changes of clothes, toilet articles, his straight razor, a razor strop, and his lucky robe. He and his staff left Haneda on the scap, his new constellation, with the press following on the Badan. Landing at Itazuki Airfield, on Kyushu, they drove 86 miles over bumpy Japanese dirt roads, he in a new Chevrolet a sedan and they in blue MP jeeps, to Seisebo, where he boarded the command ship Mount McKinley.76 because he hit them their first night at sea. Pitching and rolling, wrapped in sheets of spray, the vessel labored westward and then northward until, as day broke, a nauseated MacArthur struggled topside to see the clayed, silted, mustard-colored waters of the Yellow Sea beneath him. The typhoon blew away, and he entertained the marine and naval officers with his impressions of celebrities while white-coated mess stewards hovered over him and eavesdropped. Harriman, he thought, would be the next Secretary of State. Everyone seemed happy over Louis Johnson's resignation and his replacement by George Marshall. Truman hated the Jimo on Formosa, he would never provide him with solid help. Surprisingly, MacArthur spoke up for Eisenhower when one officer suggested that he lacked leadership. Shepard later remembered the general's monologue as a most illuminating conversation, but Oliver P. Smith, commander of the Marine Division, preoccupied with the coming struggle over the horizon, found the pomposity of his pronouncements a little wearing. 77 on Wednesday, September 13, four Allied cruisers entered Incheon Harbor, and the United States destroyers darted in to defy shore batteries. Next, warplanes from four carriers blasted defense redoubts. Then, the following night, the bulk of the UN fleet, 261 ships from seven nations, negotiated flying fish channel. MacArthur retired early the night before the landing hoping to catch a few winks of rest, but he couldn't fall asleep. A marine sentry awoke Whitney with word that the general wanted to see him. Pacing his little cabin, his hands thrust deep in the pockets of his robe, Scap said, sit down, caught, and continued to tread the deck, thinking aloud. He knew he was gambling, he said, knew they might be sailing toward a disaster. Then he reviewed his options. Clearly the siege of Pusan must be lifted. Could it, he wondered, be done any other way? No, he concluded. The decision was a sound one. The risks and hazards must be accepted. Patting his aide on his shoulder, he thanked him, climbed into his bunk, and opened a Bible. Outside, Whitney heard the ship's clock strike five bells. 238.m.78 at 5.08 the Mount McKinley drop tanker, at 5.40 the great 8-inch guns opened up on Walmidu and Doyle broke out the traditional signal, land the landing force. At that point two North Korean MiG-15 s started toward the cruiser just ahead. Both were shot down, but Whitney hurried below to alert the general to danger. MacArthur, who had fallen asleep at last, yawned and turned over. Wake me up again, court, he said, if they attack this ship. As the din overhead grew, however, he rose, breakfasted, and joined the officers watching from the bow. Just like Lingane Gulf, he said of the warship's salvos, reaching for his field glasses and looking for a place to perch. His staff, Shepard wrote, was grouped around him. He was seated in the admiral's chair with his old button cap with its tarnished gold braid and a leather jacket on. Photographers were busily engaged in taking pictures of the general while he continued to watch the naval gunfire, paying no attention to his admirers. 
Wolmy Du fell swiftly to a battalion of the 5th Marines at a cost of just 17 wounded. Told of the light casualties, MacArthur brightened and said, more people than that get killed in traffic every day. He told Doyle, say to the fleet, the Navy and Marines have never shone more brightly than this morning. Then he invited all hands to join him for coffee. Glowing, and perhaps gloating, he drafted a dispatch to the Joint Chiefs, first landing phase successful with losses slight. All goes well and on schedule. He already felt vindicated, and his mood improved even further when word arrived from the landing force that they had discovered the newly laid foundations of intense fortifications on the island. Had they waited for the next fine tide, they would have been confronted by a fortress. 79 This tide was ebbing. Stepping into a barge, MacArthur ordered the coxswain to take him ashore, but it was too late. The waters had already receded, exposing mud flats between him and the beach. The muzzles of enemy gunners less than a thousand yards away began to wink in his direction. Defiant, he stood erect in a Napoleonic pose, according to a destroyer commander who was watching him. Shepard said, General, you're getting up pretty close. Somebody's liable to take a pot shot at you. MacArthur nodded bleakly. He peered longingly across the mire between him and land, his lips inaudibly forming the words, I'm sorry, then he motioned the coxswain to turn back. Aboard the Mount McKinley once more, he told Smith, be sure to take care of yourself, and capture Kimpo as soon as you can. Seizure of the airfield could not proceed until after the main landings, at twilight, and that would be the trickiest part of the operation. Sailors had to beach eight LSTs at dusk on narrow red beach, maneuvering them side by side like cars in a parking lot, and unload them all night while the marines raced across a two-mile stone causeway, climbed the city's nine-foot seawall, and expanded a beachhead. At daybreak they fanned out inland behind but toned down tanks. MacArthur followed the course of the battle aboard ship, standing beside a map displayed on a forward bulkhead. It was Sunday before he and his entourage could go ashore, where Smith welcomed them to Concord Incheon. There, in the moment of his greatest triumph, the commander-in-chief yielded to the terrible tension that had sheathed him all week. The old familiar nausea, as he called it. The retching which had humiliated him as a West Point applicant and after his White House confrontation with Roosevelt, struck him again. Excusing himself, he turned away, staggered a few steps, doubled over, and threw up dot eighty in a moment he was again himself, contemptuous of battlefield danger. Pointing to a dead enemy soldier, he told a medical officer, there's a patient you'll never have to work on, doc. The corpse was a good sight for my old eyes, he said, climbing into a jeep. Down the road they came upon wrecks of par armor demolished by marine attack planes. Considering that they are Russian, he said grinning, these tanks are in the condition I desire them to be. To the dismay of Shepard and Smith, a marine colonel said that if the general wanted to see some freshly destroyed par tanks, there were some a little far there on small arms fire could be heard spluttering in that direction, and the last thing the Marine Corps needed was the death of the Supreme Commander in its zone. Nevertheless, he sailed recklessly ahead. An agitated Leatherneck Lieutenant tried to block him, saying, General, you can't come up here. Why not? MacArthur asked. The officer said, we just knocked out six red tanks over the top of this hill. MacArthur nodded approvingly. That was the proper thing to do, he said, and climbed the crest, where he looked down disdainfully on North Korean snipers firing in his direction. To the vast relief of the Marine commanders, he then descended the slope, remarking that a downhill grade is easier on old legs like mine. Jerking his head sideways toward the enemy riflemen, he said with satisfaction that he had been right, that these North Koreans were second-rate troops that the best par troops were down fighting Walker in front of Pusan.81 Sunday night he sent another jubilant dispatch to the Joint Chiefs, Kimpo Field had fallen. Casualty reports were still coming in, but the battle was already won, and won spectacularly. 
the final reckoning would show that Atinshan MacArthur had defeated between 30,000 and 40,000 in minutes gun defenders at a cost of 536 dead, 2,550 wounded, and 65 missing. Halsey called it the most masterly and audacious strategic course in all history. Heinl wrote, Atinshan, MacArthur was bold, judicious, assured, and unwavering. Those who doubted his judgment, the lesser men who wanted to play things safe, exemplified the reverse. The general himself described it as a classic which would be remembered as long as military strategy was studied, though he uncharacteristically qualified his prophecy. It would not be one of the short list of decisive battles of the world, he said, if the Chinese communists entered the war. Lost in all the acclaim and congratulation was one ominous note. Accompanying the troops was an army officer, James M. Gavin, the airborne hero of the Ito. Gavin represented the Pentagon's Weapons Systems Evaluation Group, and at Kimpo he had made an odd discovery. I was, he recalls, amazed to find an elaborate arrangement of hard stands and revetments all around the airfield. They were as good or better than any I had seen in the airfields of Europe in World War II. Obviously, some sophisticated thinking had gone into the planning, and much labor and effort had been expended in anticipation of using the airfield by a modern air force. Either the North Koreans were wasting their time, which seemed unlikely, or a first-class air power was about to intervene in the war. 82 Back in Tokyo the following week, Gavin laid his analysis before Willoughby, pointing out that intelligence of that sort was taken very seriously in the European war and suggesting that an intervention by the Chinese seems most likely. MacArthur's G2 rejected the idea. If the Chinese were going to intervene, he said confidently, they would have done so when we made the Incheon landing. Gavin replied that they had probably been stunned by the swiftness of MacArthur's maneuver and hadn't had time to come to the rescue of the North Koreans. But if they do plan an intervention, he argued, the preparation of Kimpo is a sure indication that this is what they are going to do, and when they are ready, they will come in. Willoughby was still unimpressed. The Chinese would never cross the Yalu and march into the peninsula, he assured Gavin. He had his own sources. He knew. 83 Peking was indeed too shocked at first to grasp the implications of the UN commander's turning movement, but Moscow reacted swiftly. On Saturday, September 23, Pravda charged that General MacArthur landed the most arrant criminals at Incheon, gathered from the ends of the earth. American bandits are shooting every sole inhabitant taken prisoner. Pravda's correspondent in Rees' capital compared the city to Stalingrad, writing that the streets were being barricaded with wagons, rice bags filled with dirt, and furniture, and that pillboxes and tank points dot the scene. Every home, is, defended as a fortress. There is firing behind every stone. When a soldier is killed, his gun continues to fire. It is picked up by a worker, tradesman, or office worker. 84 These desperate men were ineffective against X Corps, and on Tuesday Seoul fell. Meanwhile Walker's 8th Army, having broken out of the Pusan bridgehead, was racing up the Tegyakumchen Tejansa 1 axis. In 96 hours half of the in-minutes gun, 50,000 soldiers, was trapped between MacArthur's two gigantic pincers. The demoralized survivors, abandoning their equipment, fled toward the 38th parallel. After nearly three months of defeat and besiegement, MacArthur had freed all South Korea of communist domination in 15 days. His forces were on the 38th parallel, where, for the time being, he held them in check. He had no doubt that he could crush the rest of Kim Tu Sung's army if given free reign, however. Sebald reminded him of a Japanese proverb, in the moment of victory, tighten your helmet strap at the general, gesturing toward the hills north of Seoul, said confidently, they'll all evaporate very shortly. 85 The reconquest of the rock capital was an event of symbolic, political, and psychological significance and MacArthur meant to exploit it ceremoniously. Over five years earlier he had formally restored Philippine civil rule in Malacanon Palace. Now, he informed the Pentagon, 
he meant to repeat the performance in Seoul's vaulted National Assembly chamber. Objections instantly arose in the State Department, which liked Re even less than Chiang and had been planning a trusteeship of Korea. Washington warned the general that reinstating the pre-war OK administration must have the approval of higher authority. MacArthur sharply replied, your message is not understood. He reminded them that the existing government of the republic has never ceased to function, and reaffirmed his intention to return that government to its constitutional seat. This was important to him, for reasons which lay at the core of his beliefs. In Seoul, as in Manila and Taipei, he was partial to the upper classes of the Orient, but his conviction that Asians must be governed by Asians was deeply held. He had wept in Malacanon, and whence Trouble invited him aboard the Missouri at Injun, to revisit the quarter deck where he had begun his task of transforming Japan into a genuine democracy. Howard Handelman of INS saw his eyes fill. Holding out his arms to the Admiral, MacArthur said thickly, you have given me the happiest moment of my life. 86 flying home to pick up Jean, he landed at Kimpo that last Friday in September aboard the Scap, Re, on the Batan, following him in. The general, his wife, and the 75-year-old rock president climbed into a Chevrolet bearing a five-star plate while four other Chevrolets and 40 Jeeps lined up behind them. At the outset MacArthur was in a jovial mood. Crossing the Han on a new pontoon bridge, he grinned at Ri and said, this is where I came in. He waved cheerily at the Korean children waving paper rock flags beside the dusty road. But when the motorcade entered the battered city, he sobered. On either side lay charred masonry, looted stores, fire-gutted homes and schools, and flames still crackling in the blackened, windowless burned out shells of government buildings. As they rode down Mapo and Shonglo avenues, zigzagging to avoid piles of ash and rubble, the general became grim. At the stroke of noon, he and Re entered the chamber arm in arm. An aide, noticing that every officer of Scap's party was carrying side arms, jested, there haven't been so many gats in this place since the last time the legislature sat. MacArthur silenced him with a wall-eyed glance. To him this was a holy time, a time of consecration, and at the lectern he announced that, like Stonewall Jackson after his victories, and like himself in Manila, they would express their gratitude for divine intervention by reciting the Lord's Prayer. 87 Larry Bunker joined in, but he couldn't keep his mind on devotions. He recalled being here on that sunny Sunday two years earlier when MacArthur had flown in for Ree's inaugural. Now Bunker scarcely recognized the room. The mulberry-colored velvet drapes were still there, but the rest was a shambles. One wing of the building was burning, acrid smoke drifted in through the doors. Outside, heavy artillery rumbled, and this, coupled with the high wind, was shaking loose great panes of the heavy glass panels over the chamber. As they crashed down and shattered, most officers hurriedly exchanged their mud-caked fatigue caps for steel helmets, but the general finished the prayer bareheaded. With tears coursing down his cheeks but his voice strong, he told Ree that by the grace of a merciful providence our forces fighting under the standard of that greatest help and inspiration of mankind, the United Nations, have liberated this ancient capital city of Korea. Now, he said. He would leave you to the discharge of civil responsibilities. Returned from his own prepared remarks to say to MacArthur, We admire you. We love you as the savior of our race. How can I ever explain to you my own undying gratitude and that of the Korean people? After this exchange, Doyle said that if there had been any chaplains around, they would have had to have gone back to school again. According to Reginald Thompson of the London Daily Telegraph, one British correspondent was so moved that he cabled home the general's entire text, including the Lord's Prayer, at 15 cents a word. 88 Airborne on the scap once more, the Supreme Commander lit up a handsome, long stemmed, delicately shaped pipe and walked the hour with long, deliberate steps. His next move, he knew, would be crucial, though the decision wasn't his to make. 
leaving Re he had said, Mr. President, my officers and I will now resume our military duties. Defining those duties was not Sinkf's job, however. Later, millions of Americans would believe that he had provoked Red China into military intervention by ignoring White House orders to halt at the 38th parallel. That is not at all what happened. In late June the UN objective had been to push the in minutes gun back across the parallel, in Truman's words, to restore peace there and to restore the border but a subsequent UN Security Council resolution had called for the complete independence and unity of Korea. Unification seemed to mean merging North and South Korea under one government. Aixen, who was convinced that it did, argued that troops could not be expected to march up to a surveyor's line and stop. The parallel, he said, had no political validity. The general was more cautious. In 1904, he knew, the Russian government had made a Japanese crossing of the parallel Akazus Bali. He wanted precise orders before pressing northward. Until the fall of Seoul, precision had been lacking in his directives on this momentous question. The wisdom of annexing North Korea was being debated in all UN capitals, including Washington. George Kennan had advised Aixen that it was not essential to us or within our capabilities to establish an anti-Soviet regime in all of Korea. The Secretary of State disagreed. Others swung back and forth. On September 11, when Jean was packing the general's bag for Incheon, Truman had approved a National Security Council paper which was a masterpiece of evasion. MacArthur was instructed to conduct the necessary military operations either to force the North Koreans behind the 38th parallel or to destroy their forces. If there was no indication or threat of intervention by Peking or Moscow, he was then to extend his operations north of the parallel and to make plans for the occupation of North Korea. This assigned MacArthur the task of fathoming what was going on in the minds of the men in the Kremlin and Peking's councils of war. Either the United States and the UN were prepared to take the risks or they weren't. The choice was one for civilians, not soldiers. 89 Winston Churchill said, I like commanders on land and sea and in the air to feel that between them and all forms of public criticism a government stands like a strong bulkhead. You will not get generals to run risks unless they feel they have behind them a strong government. Montgomery, Churchill's most famous commander, said that generals are never given adequate directives. Both points are valid, and both should be borne in mind in retracing the course of the Korean War during the last months of 1950. Washington backed MacArthur as long as he was winning, but he was never told exactly what he was expected to do. Louis Johnson later testified before a Senate committee that when he resigned as Secretary of Defense in mid-September there was no definite policy lined out as to what our action should be and how we were to end this thing. Then came Incheon. The general's tremendous victory seemed to sustain his argument that a bold response would overpower communist aggression. On the day of the landings, the Joint Chiefs had told him to plan for the possible occupation of North Korea but to await further instructions from the president before moving. Next, on September 27, he had been directed to conduct military operations north of the 38th parallel leading to the destruction of the North Korean armed forces. Just two restraints were imposed upon him. He was forbidden to send aircraft over no russian territory, and only ROC troops could approach the Yalu. In 48 hours he replied, tacitly accepting these limitations and proposing to capture Pyongyang with the 8th Army, land X Corps at the east coast port of Wonsan, and, after wide sweeps, to effect a juncture of the two. The White House agreed, but then, having committed itself, Washington felt uneasy over its own temerity. MacArthur also had reservations. He wanted a firmer mandate, and the day after the sole ceremony the new Secretary of Defense, George Marshall, gave it to him in an eyes only cable, we want you to feel unhampered tactically and strategically to proceed north of the 38th parallel. The general replied, unless and until the enemy capitulates, I regard all Korea as open for our military operations. 90 Marshall agreed, and the issue seemed resolved. It wasn't quite. When MacArthur submitted a directive he planned to issue to the 8th Army on October 2nd, 
launching the coming offensive, Marshal wired him, we desire you to proceed with your operations without any further explanation or announcement and let action determine the matter. Our government desires to avoid having to make an issue of the 38th parallel until we have accomplished our mission. This, according to a scapade, made MacArthur raise his eyebrows. It plainly intimated that the United States intended to present its allies with a fete accompli. This impression was strengthened by Truman's responses to questions at a presidential press conference that week. A few days earlier a State Department spokesman had said that a drive north had been authorized in the UN Security Council's Independence and Unity Resolution, and a reporter asked for Truman's views. The president vaguely said that the resolution was very broad. He was reminded that on another occasion he had said that the United Nations would have to approve any movement above the parallel. Answering, he reaffirmed that the UN must endorse any such battle plan. But that was not the line state was taking. A New York Times reporter noted, this reply, suggesting further action at Lake Success, appeared to be in conflict with the position stated by the State Department spokesman and left the world with an enigma. 91 It was no enigma to the general, his orders from Marshall were definite, and on October 2 he told Sebald that rock troops had crossed into North Korea the night before. The United States correspondents cabled word of this new action home, where it was, in most instances, welcomed. Yet there was a curious hesitancy in many reactions. A lead editorial in the Times declared the issue of the parallel settled as far as the rocks were concerned but not clearly established for other UN forces. It would be foolish for the Chinese to intervene, the editorial continued, and it was to be devoutly hoped that they wouldn't. The Times suggested that it would be advantageous if units crossing the line were chiefly confined to Koreans and other Asiatics. 92 On October 7, five days later, the United Nations settled the matter. The Russians having returned to the Security Council, measures spurring MacArthur on would be blocked there, so the General Assembly, by a 47-5 vote, endorsed the United States proposal drafted in the State Department declaring that the UN objective was the establishment of a unified, independent and democratic government of all Korea. By then the rocks had pushed rapidly up the eastern coast of North Korea and were approaching once. The sole effect of the General Assembly resolution was to provide retroactive sanction to a campaign that appeared to be already half won. Because MacArthur was still adding to his string of victories, no criticism of him was heard then, long afterward, Truman would insist that he never would have moved north of the line if the general hadn't assured him in their wake island meeting that the Chinese wouldn't enter the war. But that meeting and that assurance, which was to be less than unqualified, lay a fortnight in the future when the die was cast by Truman's own administration. MacArthur hadn't been consulted about it, he had merely followed instructions from the Joint Chiefs and Secretary of Defense, speaking for the President, who, despite his press conference assurances, had acted without consulting America's allies. Walter Millis observes, perhaps the one most critical decision of the Korean War had been taken. But it had been taken in the worst way, for confused reasons, on deficient intelligence and with an inadequate appreciation of the risks. 93 Those risks were growing daily. The Chinese, fully aroused now, saw MacArthur's army thundering toward them, and despite the UN profession of plans for a peacefully unified Korea, they believed themselves to be in mortal danger. Later their response would, in retrospect, seem to have been ineluctable. At the time, however, it appeared unlikely. To be sure, as early as August 20, nearly a month before Injun, Mao's foreign minister, Chuen Lei, had telegraphed UN Secretary General Lai that the Chinese people cannot but be most concerned about the solution of the Korean question. Twice in the following week Mao's anti-aircraft guns on the Manchurian side of the Yalu had fired at the United States bombers flying on the Korean side, once near the Suiho Reservoir and once in the vicinity of Senyu, and Truman had been sufficiently concerned to express the hope on September 1 that the people of China will not be misled or forced into fighting against the United Nations and against the American people. 
but except for George Kennan, most the United States sinologists felt, in Aixen's words, that such an outcome was not a probability. The State Department persuaded the president that merely driving the in minutes gun over the parallel without annihilating it wouldn't be enough, that it would permit the enemy to rearm, rebuild, and reattack. Moreover, the diplomats saw the Peninsular War as an excellent chance to affirm the moral authority of the United Nations. Convinced that the risk was worth taking, Truman ordered MacArthur to press northward, merely cautioning him once more to avoid military action against objectives in Chinese territory. 94 On Saturday, September 30, the day after the sole ceremony, Chu had broadcast a warning that the Peking regime would not supinely tolerate a crossing of the parallel, that Mao's troops would not stand aside if MacArthur swept into North Korea. The next day the general, at Exxon's suggestion, demanded the surrender of the PAFO, the early and total defeat and complete destruction of your armed forces and war-making potential is now inevitable. I call upon you and the forces under your command, in whatever part of Korea situated, forthwith to lay down your arms. Wednesday night Sobol was rooted out of bed by an urgent telegram from Washington. Chu had summoned K. M. Panika, the Indian ambassador to Peking, and told him, somewhat enigmatically, that should the UN command across the parallel, China would send troops to the Korean frontier to defend North Korea, though this step would not be taken if only South Korean troops moved north. This word was relayed to Washington through New Delhi. In those intolerant years the American government regarded Indian neutralism with suspicion, Truman, remarking that Banika had in the past played the game of the Chinese communists fairly regularly, concluded that Chu's message was probably a bold attempt to blackmail the United Nations by threats of intervention in Korea. Accordingly, it was dismissed as a bluff. 95 five days later, after the UN General Assembly had directed him to unify all Korea, MacArthur again appealed to Kim Tu Sung to capitulate, unless immediate response is made by you. I shall at once proceed to take such military action as may be necessary to enforce the decrees of the United Nations. Kim didn't respond, but Chu did, in a broadcast that same day. The UN resolution was illegal, he said, American soldiers were menacing Chinese security, and we cannot stand idly by. The Chinese people love peace, but, in order to defend peace, they will never be afraid to oppose aggressive war. That afternoon Mao's divisions began to slip over the Yalu to prepare a counterattack. Meanwhile MacArthur's men, unaware of the Chinese build-up, continued to roll forward over the disintegrating units of Kim's army. On the morning after Chu's second broadcast, the first Rock Corps entered once. X Corps would be water lifted to reinforce them, and the 8th Army was marching on Pyongyang. MacArthur radioed the Joint Chiefs that although he saw no indications of present entry into North Korea by major Soviet or Chinese Communist forces, he proposed to use only rocks north of the line running through Chungo, Yongwon, and Hungnam, about 50 miles north of Pyongyang and Wonsan and some 60 miles southeast of the Yao's mouth. Thus far he had obeyed every instruction from the chiefs. Millis notes, in no way did he exceed orders drafted in Washington and endorsed in Lake success, and the widespread idea that the general, by appealing to military necessity, had forced a reluctant administration into a dubious political adventure was without foundation. 96 By mid-October MacArthur was approaching the line beyond which only rocks were to be used. There were signs, for those who could read them, of trouble ahead. Jawaharlal Nehru was convinced that Peking meant business, he reported that Chinese troops were massing on the Manchurian border. Lindis Parrott wrote in the New York Times that the rocks were thrusting toward the Yao River's Great Sapung Dam that provides electric power not only for North Korea but for Mukden and Dairn, a matter of considerable importance to both Manchurian and Soviet industry adding that the fighting centered along the west coast of North Korea about 60 miles from the Yalu River crossing on the international frontier. The area for centuries has been a traditional route of invasion and counter-invasion of Korea and Manchuria from the days of Genghis Khan. 
Chu was expressing his concern through every channel open to him. So was Vyacheslav Molotov, Stalin's foreign secretary. Molotov had been provoked, on October 9, in a sortie which has never been explained, two UNF-80 shooting stars had attacked a Soviet airbase near Vladivostok, 62 miles inside Russian territory. 97 Three days later, George Marshall cabled the general that President Truman would like to confer with him somewhere in the Pacific on October 15. Truman preferred Oahu, the Secretary of Defense said, but if the situation in Korea is such that you feel you should not absent yourself for the time involved in such a long trip, I am sure the President would be glad to go on and meet you at Wake Island. MacArthur was reluctant to leave his command. X Corps once an operation was coming up, and because of the possibility that Russian mines had been sown in the mouth of the harbor, he wanted to supervise the landing personally. John Gunter wrote, anything except adhesive day-to-day -day prosecution of the war seemed an irrelevance, even if the irrelevance was the President of the United States. Hawaii seemed too far to go, so Scap replied, I would be delighted to meet the President on the morning of the 15th at Wake Island. 98 Harry Truman was a forthright man, but his motive in flying two-thirds of the way around the world for less than two hours with MacArthur was mysterious then and is still puzzling. The UN cause was approaching a crisis, but neither he nor his supreme commander saw it at the time. In his memoirs the President would write, I wanted to have a personal talk with the General. That is inadequate. Sophisticated post-war communications in the White House, the Pentagon, and the Diaki had superannuated personal confrontations unless the purpose was to dramatize a summit in the press. Scapp's staff was convinced that the explanation for the wake meeting lay there, that he was heading into what one of them called a sly political ambush. They felt confirmed when they learned that although the presidential party would include White House correspondents, the general would not be permitted to bring any newsmen from Tokyo. Truman's popularity in the United States was plummeting and the, the United States congressional elections were less than three weeks away. The Supreme Commander's officers suggested to him that Truman, like FDR in 1944, wanted to bask in the reflected glow of the triumphant general. 99 MacArthur affected to reject that interpretation. He would write in his reminiscences, such a reasoning, I am sure, does Mr. Truman an injustice. I believe nothing of the sort animated him, and that the sole purpose was to create goodwill and beneficial results to the country. But that is five-star hypocrisy. Privately he agreed with his officers, he told Sebald that he regarded the trip as a political junket and in the light of subsequent events he was probably right. The press thought so. The United States News and World Report called it a good political move, and even Richard H. Rovier and Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., Truman's ablest defenders, would write that it was in all respects an odd affair. If the president wasn't looking for improved standings in the public opinion polls, the likeliest alternative is that he was distressed by the Vladivostok incident. Russia, not China, was regarded as North Korea's closest ally and the United States government feared Stalin far more than Mao. The rub here is that by all accounts no one mentioned Vladivostok on Wake Island. 100 MacArthur took off from Hanidu at 7 a.m. on Saturday, October 14, accompanied by Masio, Bunker, Whitney, and Admiral Radford. The presidential party, facing a 24-hour DC-3 flight after a stop in Missouri, was already in the air. Its key members were Bradley, Secretary of the Army Pace, Harriman, Rusk, Philip Jessup, Charles S. Murphy, and Press Secretary Charles G. Ross. Two cabinet members were conspicuous by their absence, the Secretaries of State and Defense. Marshall may have felt that he should be in the Pentagon while MacArthur was out of touch with the Daiki, but Aixon had no such alibi, and in his memoirs he acknowledges it. When the president told me of his intended pilgrimage and invited me to join him, I begged to be excused. While General MacArthur had many of the attributes of a foreign sovereign, I said, and was quite as difficult as any, it did not seem wise to recognize him as one. The whole idea was distasteful to me. I wanted no part in it.
and saw no good coming from it. One hundred and one time agreed that Truman and MacArthur seemed, at the moment, like the sovereign rulers of separate states, approaching a neutral field with panoplied retainers to make talk and watch each other's eyes. The president even bore gifts. A young army officer recently transferred from Tokyo to Washington had told the White House that Jean MacArthur liked Bloom's candy, which wasn't available in Japan. Murphy had bought five one pound boxes of it, and Harriman, during their stop in Honolulu, had picked up another five pound box, to be sure the general's wife got enough of it. There seems to have been little awareness among officers or civilians that either principal might misunderstand a casual word from the other, but the risk was real and grave. In The Edge of the Sword Charles de Gaulle described the approach to such a conference, a drama is about to begin which will be played by statesman and soldier in concert. So closely woven is their dialogue that nothing said by either has any relevance, point or effect except with reference to the other. If one of them misses his cue, then disaster overwhelms them both. 102 MacArthur arrived several hours before Truman, slept, bathed, shaved, dressed, breakfasted, and was on the field at 6.00 a.m., ready to greet the president 30 minutes before the independence landed. The general bore himself with his usual buona manner, his battered cap cocked rakishly and his khaki shirt open at the neck. Truman later told Merle Miller that he was offended by his Supreme Commander's casual uniform, if he'd been a lieutenant in my outfit going around dressed like that, I'd have busted him so fast he wouldn't have known what happened to him. In his memoirs he simply says, his shirt was unbuttoned and he was wearing a cap that had evidently seen a good deal of use. Reporters noticed that the general didn't salute his commander-in-chief, but he did give him his number one handshake beaming as he pumped his hand and saying warmly, Mr. President. Truman smiled and said, How are you, General? I'm glad you're here. I've been a long time meeting you, General. MacArthur replied, I hope it won't be so long next time, Mr. President. Truman nodded vigorously. An observer recalls that the chief executive seemed to be putting his best foot forward in his attempt to establish an entente cordiale between Washington and Tokyo. 103 While air aides readied a conference room in Wake's squat cinder block civil aeronautics outpost, the two principals entered a battered 1948 Chevrolet, climbing over the front seat because the rear doors were stuck and rattled off to a Quonset hut which a Pan-American foreman had surrendered for the occasion. The president sat on a wicker chair, the general on a rat and settee. They were alone for half an hour. Since neither took notes, and no one else could overhear their colloquy, it is impossible to determine exactly what passed between them. During Senate hearings the following year, MacArthur said, I would not feel at liberty to reveal what was discussed. He had told his staff that he and the chief executive had held a relatively unimportant conversation about, incredibly, the fiscal and economic problems of the Philippines. In his memoirs Truman was more specific. According to him, the general expressed regret over his VFW letter and the president said that he considered the incident closed. Then, in Truman's account, MacArthur said he had allowed the Republicans to make a chump of me in the last election and he wouldn't let them do it again. The president told him of administration plans to strengthen NATO, and the general assured him that in January he would be able to release one division, the second, from Korea for European duty. 104 riding to the main meeting in their dusty automotive ruin. The chief executive thought that his supreme commander seemed genuinely pleased at this opportunity to talk with me, and I found him a stimulating and interesting person. Our conversation was very friendly, I might say much more so than I had expected. In the cinder block shack, the two men sat side by side at an elongated table, with MacArthur's staff to Truman's right and the presidential advisers to MacArthur's left. There was also an eavesdropper in the building, and her presence will always be inexplicable. She was Verna Sanderson, Jessup's secretary. Afterward the White House would tell reporters that Miss Anderson found herself sitting in a tiny ante-room, 
the door to which had inadvertently been left ajar. Instead of closing it, she told Newsman several months later, she automatically started writing. I was under no one's instruction, she said. I hadn't even gone there with a regular notebook. I just happened to have a pad of lined paper and I just began notes. It seemed the thing to do. In effect the room was bugged. When the administration subsequently distributed her transcript to the press, MacArthur was deeply offended. Aixon dismissed his protests as a proverbial tempest in a teapot. To this day Rusk insists that her taking notes was an entirely proper thing for her to do, that to suggest otherwise is grossly unfair. Somehow one is unconvinced. When the President of the United States sits down with his most illustrious general, there are no chance witnesses. And her role becomes even less excusable in light of the fact that when Bunker picked up a pencil, Ross asked him to put it away because, he said, no notes were to be taken on either side. In retrospect, Gavin Long says of the concealed stenographer, this seemed to be playing politics at about its lowest level. 105 MacArthur greets President Harry S. Truman on Wake, October 1950 Truman and MacArthur chat on Wake fresh pineapple had been placed before each conferee, and as they consumed it, the President led the discussion. There seems to have been no agenda, topics were chosen at random. There was, surprisingly, no attempt to resolve the Chiang Kai-shek dilemma. Truman wondered about how much aid Rees people would need for post-war rehabilitation, the attitude of PAR prisoners, they were happy to have been caught, MacArthur said, and what progress was being made on the Japanese peace treaty. The general said he had polished and repolished the treaty draft until it shone like a diamond. All present felt that the occupation of North Korea would probably be accomplished by Thanksgiving. The general said he hoped to have the 8th Army back in Nippon before the end of the year. Near the end of the conference, in MacArthur's words, the possibility of Russian or Chinese intervention was brought up almost casually. The general said he understood that Soviet troop strength in southern Kamkatka was slight, there was no way the Red Army could mass men along the Tumen River before the onset of winter. In theory it was possible for Russian planes to support Chinese infantry, but according to Miss Anderson's account, it is the only one we have, he said that it just wouldn't work with Chinese communist ground and Russian air. Of course, he added, the Chinese could come in without tactical air support. Truman asked him what he thought the odds were I. According to Miss Anderson, the general said, very little. Had they intervened in the first or second months it would have been decisive. We are no longer fearful. We no longer stand hat in hand. Of Mao's troops in Manchuria the transcript quotes him as saying that only 50,000 or 60,000 could be gotten across the Yala River. They have no air force. Now that we have bases for our air force in Korea, if the Chinese tried to get down to Pyongyang, there would be the greatest slaughter. 106 Murphy recalls, he was the most persuasive fellow I ever heard. I believed every word of it. Later Truman would charge that MacArthur had misled him on this crucial point. He had. Willoughby's analysis was flawed. But so were those of the CIA and the State Department, sources whose responsibility for measuring the intentions of an uncommitted foreign power was far greater than that of a field commander. The president should have looked to them, not MacArthur, for guidance in what was, after all, a political issue. The Americans had been unwilling to let the communists grasp the hilt of the Korean dagger. It never occurred to them, any of them, that the Chinese would not permit an alien army to seize it. They should have provided for that possibility. But measuring Peking's intentions required talents very different from those which had wrought the victory at Incheon. It was a tenuous, complex business, all the more so because the United States did not recognize Red China and therefore had no embassy in Peking. Truman was asking the right question of the wrong man. Nehru in New Delhi, for example, could have provided better answers than MacArthur on Wake. The chief problem at Wake was the very concept of the conference. It was absurd. Here were two exhausted, 
elderly men meeting briefly on a remote island in the middle of the world's largest ocean. Neither was in shape to deal with momentous issues. The general was three time zones away from the Daiki, the president, seven time zones away from the White House. They had never met before, and in their fatigue their social antennae were understandably blunted. Probably they would have had difficulty communicating in the best of circumstances. Truman was by nature plain spoken, MacArthur, subtle and circuitous. Remembering the Joint Chief's timidity when he had proposed chromite, Scap probably did not want to subject the chief executive to any more doubts about the war. Asked for a prediction about communist intentions, he apparently made one because he was always ready to offer an opinion, even when he lacked adequate information, and once he had committed himself, he would stubbornly refuse to concede that he might be wrong. Finally, both the Commander-in-Chief of the United States and the UN Commander were about to stumble around, reeling from each other and sometimes colliding, in the purgatory of limited war, the first large-scale conventional conflict to break out since the invention of nuclear weapons. It never crossed MacArthur's mind, for example, that the President might respond differently to Chinese communist aggression than he had to North Korean communist aggression. A Daiki aide says that raising the question with Washington would have been like asking if we intended to fight the enemy with bows and arrows. Had someone suggested to MacArthur at that stage that we might suffer the Chinese Reds to strike us in full force and retaliate only by warding off the blow as it fell, without striking back on our own, he would not have believed any such preposterous notion. 107 Not only could these problems not be resolved in two groggy hours on wake, their very existence was unsuspected by either party. Pushing the pineapple plates away, they all rose and stretched. Werner Sanderson entered. Where did this lovely lady come from? A startled MacArthur asked chivalrously. No one enlightened him, the general entered a technical discussion with Bradley. Masio conferred with the civilian advisers from Washington, and the president took a constitutional. By now MacArthur was looking at his watch. The presidential party had planned on a leisurely luncheon, but if the SCAP delayed its departure until afternoon, its return to Japan would have been thrown into the night hours. Disappointed, Truman settled for a little ceremony pinning MacArthur's Fifth Distinguished Service Medal on his shirt and saying that the general had so inspired his command by his vision, his judgment, his indomitable will and his unshakable faith, that it has set a shining example of gallantry and tenacity in defense and of audacity in attack matched by but few operations in military history. These words would be remembered when, asked if he repented of firing the general six months later, Truman replied, the only thing I repent is that I didn't do it two years sooner. 108 Truman decorating MacArthur with another Distinguished Service Medal on Wake. Truman and MacArthur in car on Wake. The two then issued a bland, uninformative communique, typed by the helpful Miss Anderson. Truman told reporters, I've never had a more satisfactory conference since I've been president. MacArthur backed away from the press, saying, all comments will have to come from the publicity man of the president. Ross bridled. That wasn't his title. Gunter observed that it was unlikely the supreme commander had meant this as a slight, it is merely an example of his somewhat old style way of expressing things. Yet clearly he was uncomfortable in all this. Anthony Leviero wrote in the next day's New York Times that Truman seemed highly pleased with the results like an insurance salesman who has signed up an important prospect, while the latter appeared dubious over the extent of the coverage. The general's mood wasn't improved when the president, after wishing him happy landings, rode off with his entourage, leaving MacArthur without transportation. Story unsuccessfully tried to hail a passing jeep. Finally he flagged down a civil aeronautics pickup truck and he and the Supreme Commander bumped off in it.109 back in Tokyo, having flown 4,000 miles in 33 hours, MacArthur plunged into plans for delivering the coup de grace in Korea. He told Sabal that the meeting had gone as well as could be expected and made no comment when Masio said he and the President had conducted themselves magnificently. 
there the matter would have rested had there been no sequel. But sequels were inevitable. The public wanted to know what had happened. In the San Francisco Opera House two days after the conference, Truman said he had felt that there was pressing need to make it perfectly clear, by my talk with General MacArthur, that there is complete unity in the aims and conduct of our foreign policy. He told reporters, General MacArthur and I have talked fully about Formosa. There is no need to cover that subject again. The General and I are in complete agreement. In the Diocese Cap spokesman said, there has been absolutely no change on General MacArthur's part in any views he has held as to the strategic value of Formosa. Three weeks later Stuart Allsop reported from the White House that on wake MacArthur had assured the President there was no possibility of Chinese intervention in Korea. The editor of the Freeman wired the General, asking him to confirm or deny this. MacArthur replied, the statement from Stuart Allsop quoted in your message of the 13th is entirely without foundation in fact. MacArthur, Tokyo, Japan. 110 The possibilities for mischief raised by Wake were endless. There had been no record of the MacArthur Truman exchange in the Quonset hut. Miss Anderson's shorthand notes on the second session are suspect. Each of the two men had heard what he wanted to hear. The president needed the general's support on the Formosa question, so he would claim that it had been pledged on the island. MacArthur did much the same thing, when the Joint Chiefs radioed him that he was exceeding his instructions, he would answer that those instructions had been changed in his conversation with Truman. Aixen had been right. The meeting had been a dreadful idea. Many men would pay for it with their lives. 111 Eventually, paranoiacs exhaust their credibility. MacArthur had long since lost his. The Joint Chiefs were undismayed, therefore, when, in the autumn of 1950, he began claiming that his strategic movements were being betrayed to the Communists. That there was some leak in intelligence, he later wrote, was evident to everyone. Walker continually complained to me that his operations were known to the enemy in advance through sources in Washington. But the general had sounded the alarm so often in the past that the Pentagon ignored him. Cabell Phillips of the New York Times doubtless spoke for both the press corps and the administration when he called Scapp's claim far-fetched. 112 this time, however, his suspicions may have been justified. That fall the first secretary of the British Embassy to the United States was H. A. R. Kim Philby. The second secretary was Guy Burgess. And the head of England's American department in London was Donald McLean. Because the Commonwealth Brigade was fighting in Korea, copies of all messages between the Pentagon and the Diocese were passed along to the Attlee government through the embassy on Massachusetts Avenue and the American department in Whitehall. Philby and Burgess sat on the top secret inter-allied board, and Philby acted as liaison officer between the CIA and the UK's secret intelligence service, CIS. It is a shocking fact that all three men were communist agents. On May 25, 1951, Burgess and McLean, warned by Philby that MI5, Foreign Office, FO, Security, and Scotland Yard were closing in on them would defect to the Soviet Union. Philby himself would hold on for nearly 12 more years, finally slipping into Russia via Beirut on January 27, 1963. 113 of this roguish triumvirate The New Yorker's Rebecca West has written, every secret they learned during their official lives was certainly transmitted to the Soviet Union. Secretary of the Army Wilbur M. Brucker examined Defense Department files and reported on February 17, 1956, before Philby's defection, that Burgess and McLean had secrets of priceless value to the Communist conspiracy. James M. Gavin, an officer untainted by McCarthyism, recalls that during his service in the last critical months of 1950, the enemy repeatedly displayed an uncanny knowledge of UN troop deployment. He says, I have no doubt whatever that the Chinese moved confidently and skillfully into North Korea, and, in fact, I believe that they were able to do this because they were well informed not only of the moves Walker would make but of the limitations on what he might do. At the time, it was difficult to account for this, he continues, 
but he is quite sure now that all of MacArthur's plans flowed into the hands of the communists through the British Foreign Office. In his reminiscences MacArthur observes that after the war an official leaflet by General Lin Piao published in China read, I would never have made the attack and risked my men and military reputation if I had not been assured that Washington would restrain General MacArthur from taking adequate retaliatory measures against my lines of supply and communication. Vice Admiral A. E. Jarrell notes of this pamphlet that the Chinese general revealed that he had learned of this decision through disclosures by British diplomats Guy Burgess and Donald McLean. Assuming that MacArthur and Jarrell had acquired an accurate translation of such a leaflet, neither this writer nor Asian scholars at Harvard and Brown have been able to trace the original, it is of course possible that Lin was merely attempting to plant seeds of fresh discord between the United States and the United Kingdom, but in the light of what is known all about the Phil B. conspirators and the pattern of events on the Korean peninsula that autumn, it seems fair to suggest that the Chinese general may have been confirming what was already suspected. Certainly it would go far toward explaining the war's course after the Wake meeting. 114 The key date is November 1, 1950, 17 days after Wake. On that Wednesday McLean was appointed chief of Whitehall's American desk. As an FO department head, his name went to the top of all distribution lists for classified material reaching London from Washington. With Philby and Burgess already in position, monitoring CIA and Defense Department developments, the three men apparatus would have been able to tell the enemy, not only what the UN commander was going to do, but, as Gavin notes, what he could not do. For example, a CIA memorandum approved by Truman shortly after the president's return to Washington recommended MacArthur make no moves against Chinese units which were entering North Korea to take up positions around the Suiho electric plant and other installations along the Yalu. Philby and Burgess would have known of this vital decision a few hours after it was made, and a copy of the document itself would have been in McLean's possession the following morning. The text could have been in Moscow within a week at the outside, and it might then have been sent straight to Peking and thence to Lin Piao's headquarters. On that assumption, it is hardly surprising that Lin anticipated MacArthur's moves and was ready to foil them. Not until the UN route reached disastrous proportions, and the general was improvising so fast that Washington and the Philby agents couldn't keep up with him. Was he able to match the foe blow by blow? 115 Philby and Burgess were already relaying embassy bump to the Russians, but McLean, under a psychiatrist's care, had not yet taken over the American desk in London when the general, back from his talks with the president, mapped out the moves which, he believed, would swiftly lead to the UN occupation of North Korea. During his brief Sunday absence Russian flak shot down an American F-80 which had been patrolling the Yalu, and on Monday a Chinese regiment was spotted crossing the river and marching toward the Chosen and Fusen dams. Brushing aside these reports, MacArthur ordered a general UN advance. He planned a great double envelopment to pin the in-minute scun remnants against the banks of the Yalu with an ex-corp pincer sweeping up from once in a series of complex amphibious maneuvers on the right, an 8th Army pincer attacking from the vicinity of Pyongyang on the left, and rocks holding the center. 116 The rocks were the weak link. They were under strength and unable to maintain contact with the two wings because of the mountainous spine that divides North Korea vertically, precipices and canyons crossed by sketchy dirt trails that lead nowhere. Nevertheless the general was supremely confident. On Friday Pyongyang fell to the hard-charging 8th Army while an airborne regiment was dropped 30 miles to the north, cutting off the fleeing North Koreans' escape route. The UN commander watched from a plane overhead, accompanied by his favorite war correspondents, of course I'm partial, he said to the newsman not invited. That's my privilege and when he landed in Kim Tu Sung's lost capital he struck a pose and called out, any celebrities here to greet me? Where's Kim Buck Tu? 117 The war, he told the reporters, was virtually over, though he confided to Walker that he was worried about his overextended supply lines. Walker shared his concern, 
but power resistance was so feeble that MacArthur sent a dozen widely scattered spearheads probing toward the Chongjin River in the northwest and the Chengjin hydroelectric complex in the northeast. He advised the Pentagon that he needed no more reinforcements, ships en route to Pusan could be diverted to Japan or Hawaii, and other transports could prepare to carry the second division to Europe. It was at this point that he began to get careless. Aware that winter would be upon him in less than a month, freezing the Yalu and turning it into a highway for Chinese infantrymen, he decided to lift the restriction on non-ROC troops venturing beyond the peninsula neck the point just north of Pyongyang where it narrows to less than a hundred miles, and into the northeastern provinces bordering China and the Soviet Union. On Tuesday, October 24, four days after the seizure of Pyongyang, he ordered X Corps and the 8th Army to drive forward with all speed and full utilization of their forces. 118 This looked very much like a flouting of his September 27th orders from the Joint Chiefs. Exxon later wrote, if General Marshall and the Chiefs had proposed withdrawal to the pyongyang wonson line and a continuous defensive position under United Command across it, and if the President had backed them, as he undoubtedly would have, disaster probably would have been averted. But it would have meant a fight with MacArthur. The Pentagon was unwilling to risk that fight. Intimidated by the victor of Incheon, the chiefs timidly radioed him that while they realized that Sink undoubtedly had sound reason for his move, they would like an explanation, since the action contemplated was a matter of concern to them. MacArthur replied that he was taking all precautions, that the September 27th order was not a final directive because Marshall had amended it two days later by telling him that he wanted Scap to feel unhampered tactically and strategically in proceeding north of the 38th parallel, and that military necessity compelled him to disregard it anyhow because their rocks lacked strength and leadership. If the chiefs had further questions, he referred them to the White House. The entire subject, he said had been covered in his conference with the President at Wake Island. 119 That was news to Harry Truman. On Thursday he weekly told the press conference that it was his understanding that only South Koreans would approach the Yalu. Informed of this, the general contradicted him through the press, saying, the mission of the United Nations forces is to clear Korea. The Pentagon advised the President to ignore this challenge from SCAP because of a firmly established the United States military tradition, established by Lincoln with Grant in 1864, that once a field commander had been assigned a mission there must be no interference with his method of carrying it out. That, and MacArthur's tremendous military prestige, persuaded Truman to hold his tongue. He did more than hold it. He endorsed SCAP's strategy in a statement declaring that he would not allow North Koreans to take refuge in a privileged sanctuary across the Yalu. Later MacArthur would use that phrase in a different context, but the president said it first. 120 Aixen, deeply disturbed, was doing everything he could to assure Peking, through the United Nations and through statements of his own. A UN interim committee promised that it would fully support the Manchurian border. A six-power resolution introduced into the Security Council pledged full protection of Chinese and Korean interests in the frontier zone, and the State Department declared that Americans had no ulterior design in Manchuria. Finally, Truman declared, we have never at any time entertained any intention to carry hostilities into China, so far as the United States is concerned, I wish to state unequivocally that because of our deep devotion to the cause of world peace, and our long-standing friendship for the people of China, we will take every honorable step to prevent any extension of hostilities in the Far East. It was too late, wrote James Reston in the next day's Times, some well-informed persons here believe such a statement, if made when the United Nations troops took the North Korean capital, might have prevented intervention particularly if the United States had also offered to allow a United Nations Peace Commission to take over a buffer zone on the Korean side of the Chinese frontier. Instead, Peking had heard other, more ominous voices, re-saying, the war cannot stop at the Yalu River, 
and Senator William F. Noland of California asking, why not a neutral zone 10 miles north of the Yala River? Statements at odds with these were a mixture of honeymooned words and threats, said Peking, meant to soften up public opinion for an advance right up to the Chinese frontier and eventually across it. 121 only Chinese volunteers were crossing into Korea, a spokesman for Mao insisted, arguing that they were following such honorable precedents as Lafayette's volunteers in the American Revolution and the American and British Volunteer Brigades which fought in the Spanish Civil War during the 1930s. MacArthur at first believed that the newcomers will prove to be Manchurian-bred Koreans. One thing was certain, there were a lot of them. As early as October 26 Hanson Baldwin reported in the Times that there were about 250,000 Chinese soldiers near the Korean frontier and 200,000 actually in Korea. Baldwin reported that it is considered natural for the Chinese communists to strengthen their frontier, for Mao may believe that Manchuria is next on the timetable. What neither Baldwin nor anyone else on the UN side realized was that this massive force was stealthily encircling UN forward units as they moved north. The very presence of the Chinese there was largely unknown. Even after they had been detected MacArthur seemed not to be alert to the danger. One wonders why. At Injun he had told Howard Handelman of the United States News and World Report that I believe that an American ground invasion of China would be the worst tragedy of all. No people has ever conquered China. It is too big. Perhaps he distinguished between the Korean Peninsula and mainland Asia, or perhaps he believed a CIA assessment, which concluded that Chinese troops would stay on the defensive protecting the power plants along the Yau.122 in the last days of October a South Korean force nearing the Yau was almost wiped out by Chinese troops which seemed to come from nowhere. Next the ROC 1st Division was reported to be heavily engaged with a fiercely resisting enemy, about 40 miles south of the frontier. Elements of Mao's 40th Corps were identified. Their next corps began picking up Chinese prisoners as far south as Hamhung, on the right. MacArthur noted this on October 29, but described the situation as not alarming. Three days later a Marine Battalion in X Corps, a ROC division, and a unit of the 1st Cavalry Division along the Chongqing River, on the left, found themselves in fierce fights with Chinese riflemen and machine gunners who, after inflicting severe casualties on the UN forces, abruptly broke off action and faded into the hills. MacArthur acknowledged that temporarily, at least, he faced a fresh foe. Elements of five of Mao's divisions from the 38th and 40th Root Armies, the units which had been guarding the coast against KMT raids from Formosa, freed now by the intervention of the 7th Fleet, were mounting a scattered offensive. GIs and Chinese were now in contact. In fact, the New York Times reported, Chinese communist hordes, attacking on horse and foot to the sound of bugle calls, cut up Americans and South Koreans at Unsan today in an Indian-style massacre, and pilots reconnoitering the Manchurian border saw considerable movement north of it. 123 MacArthur's early November communiques were those of a commander shifting between optimism and pessimism. On November 1st, he said that he frankly did not know whether or not actual Chinese communist units, as such, have been committed to the Korean War, or, if they had been, whether they represent the Chinese government. It was his impression that they had only limited objectives in mind. The next day, after sifting fresh reports, he said that his analysis removes the problem of Chinese intervention from the realm of the academic and turns it into a serious proximate threat. Two days after that he concluded that the massing Chinese was sufficient in number to threaten the ultimate destruction of my command. Having predicted doom, he then backed away from it. Although it was impossible. 2. Appraise the actualities of Chinese communist intervention, he told Washington, there were many logical reasons against it. Suggesting three possible explanations for the presence of the newcomers, Mao's units were giving the in minutes gone logistical support, they were more or less volunteers, or they were there to provide a buffer south of the Yalu, he said, 
I recommend against hasty conclusions which might be premature and believe that a final appraisement should await a more complete accumulation of facts. But that accumulation was mounting hourly. The next day he appealed to world opinion, asking that it censure Peking, and the day after that he submitted a curious claim of victory. With the capture of Pyongyang, he said, the defeat of Kim Tu Sung's army had been decisive, whereupon the Chinese had committed one of the most offensive acts of international lawlessness of historic record by moving, without any notice of belligerence, elements of alien communist forces across the Yao River into North Korea. Thus a possible trap had been surreptitiously laid. Luckily the UN had detected the trap by skillful maneuvering executed with great perspicacity and skill. 124 Unaware that the real trap had not been sprung, that it had not even been discovered, the general told the chiefs that he was resuming his offensive to take accurate measure. Of enemy strength. It wasn't necessary. Before his men could move out, they were hit by new attacks. Pilots reported heavy traffic on six Yao bridges, Mao's Manchurian troops were swarming southward to join Chinese units already in Korea. On Monday, November 6, MacArthur ordered Stratmeyer, who had told Sebald that he was confident his bombers could flatten China, to mount a strike of 90 B-29S, taking out the bridges at Sinu at the northwestern tip of Korea. As the flyers suited up, Scap sent a copy of the order to Washington and went to bed. 125 at 2 a.m. He was awakened by an urgent directive from the Joint Chiefs instructing him to postpone all bombing of targets within five miles of the Manchurian border until further notice. This was the first real rift between the general and the chiefs. Bradley, assuming that Moscow and Peking were acting in tandem, suspected that the United States was being drawn into an Asian war of attrition to give the Soviets a free hand elsewhere. The other chiefs agreed, but MacArthur didn't see it that way at all. Sitting by his night table, he scrawled a sharp reply. Men and material in large force are pouring across all bridges over the Yao from Manchuria, he wrote. This movement not only jeopardizes but threatens the ultimate destruction of the forces under my command. The only way to stop this reinforcement of the enemy is the destruction of these bridges and the subjection of all installations in the north area supporting the enemy advance to the maximum of our air destruction. Every hour that this is postponed will be paid for dearly in American and other United Nations blood. I am suspending this strike and carrying out your instructions. But, I cannot overemphasize the disastrous effect, both physical and psychological, that will result from the restrictions which you are imposing. I trust that the matter be immediately brought to the attention of the President as I believe your instructions may well result in a calamity of major proportion for which I cannot accept the responsibility without his personal and direct understanding of the situation. 126 The chiefs were stunned. First MacArthur had found it impossible to evaluate Chinese intentions, and now men were pouring across the Yalu. Moreover, he was threatening to go over their heads to the president. Bradley read the message to Truman over the phone. It would have been in character if the peppery chief executive had dictated a reprimand. Instead he said mildly that since MacArthur felt so strongly, he should be given the go-ahead. Therefore the chiefs cabled Tokyo, lifting the five-mile restriction and authorizing him to bomb Sinu and the bridges up to the middle of the river adding, the above does not authorize the bombing of any dams or power plants on the Yalu River. MacArthur wasn't satisfied, flyers couldn't attack half a bridge. There was no way the spans could be demolished without violating Manchurian airspace. It cannot be done, Straitmeyer told him, and Washington must know that it can't be done. 127 The general reopened his long-distance quarrel with the Pentagon the next morning. Hostile planes were rising from Manchurian airstrips in increasing numbers, attacking UN troop formations and then flying back to safety. He asked that he be permitted, under the long-established international law rule of hot pursuit to follow these hit-and-run aircraft across the border for three minutes of flying time. This time Washington was friendlier. Marshall approved, so did Aixon, so did the President. 
Then Dean Rusk pointed out that the United States was committed to conferring with its allies with troops in the UN Army before taking any step affecting Manchuria. Consulted, all 13 of them objected. If American warplanes flew over China, they predicted, Soviet aircraft would retaliate. They were so vehement that the matter was set aside. 128 MacArthur was furious. He had called the order not to bomb the bridges the most indefensible and ill conceived decision ever forced on a field commander in our nation's history. Now, with the prohibition of hot pursuit, Manchuria and Siberia had become sanctuaries. Nor was that all. As he later wrote, he was then denied the right to bomb the hydroelectric plants along the Yalu. The order was broadened to include every plant in North Korea which was capable of furnishing electric power to Manchuria and Siberia. I felt that step by step my weapons were being taken away from me. 129 relations between Tokyo, Washington, and Lake Success were reaching the critical stage when, inexplicably, the Chinese suddenly went to ground. Their infantrymen disappeared into the mountains. Stratmeyer's pilots flew unchallenged. Elements of the 7th Fleet lay peacefully at anchor in the Sea of Japan, off Hungnam, shielding and loading transports. The generals' two wings strengthened their positions 50 miles south of the border. The 8th Army on the Chongqing and X Corps on the Chengjin Chosen Reservoir. The Supreme Commander had 100,000 seasoned men poised for a new thrust. The great mystery was the whereabouts of Lin Piao's inscrutable Chinese. Either they had withdrawn from the battlefield or they were regrouping. MacArthur characteristically took the cheerier view. He had plenty of company. Afterward, his G2 would be roasted in the world press, though a review of the cable traffic between the Daiki and the Pentagon partially vindicates Willoughby. His facts were essentially correct. He noted that the Incheon landing had left some 40,000 PA guerrillas behind UN lines and pointed out that they might join forces with an alien army from Manchuria. In staff briefings he identified major Chinese units, assessed their capabilities, and drew up accurate analyses of their order of battle. His interrogations of Chinese prisoners continued right up to November 26. When Lin Piao struck and the roof fell in on the UN Supreme Commander. Willoughby's error lay in failing to anticipate the strength and direction of this blow. The Central Intelligence Agency made the same mistake. The CIA reported to Truman that there were as many as 200,000 Chinese troops in MacArthur's path, but as late as November 24, the agency assured the President that there is no evidence that the Chinese Communists plan major offensive operations in Korea. 130 If Truman's spies were slack, those on the other side weren't. Almost certainly the enemy was now being provided with MacArthur's battle plans. Had the general known of this, he would have paused, but probably nothing short of that would have held him back. Winston Churchill a keen observer of world events though his party was out of power, had expressed the hope that MacArthur would halt his advance at the neck or waist of Korea. The Supreme Commander rejected the suggestion. He was determined to throw his whole army, including his reserves, into one big push. Asiatics love a winner and despise a loser, he had said, they respect aggressive leadership. Sinologists may disagree with him there especially in light of what was to come, but his military arguments for a great drive now were more plausible. The mountainous terrain is ruggedest at the waist, and stopping there would have limited maneuver, supply, and coordination of his two wings. In addition, he felt that time was his enemy. There were but three possible courses, he later wrote. I could go forward, remain immobile, or withdraw. Withdrawal meant acknowledgement of defeat and the failure of his mission, which, as he saw it, was to clear out all North Korea, to unify it and liberalize it as he had Japan. Immobility, he believed, was impossible. It is difficult to fault him here. Great offensive commanders, lacking imaginate alternatives, are accustomed to achieving much with little. Once one of Napoleon's marshals proudly laid before him a plan under which French troops would be carefully lined up from one end of the border to another. The emperor replied pitilessly, Are you trying to stop smuggling? 
like Napoleon in most of his campaigns, MacArthur in Korea lacked the force necessary for a defense in depth. If the Chinese meant to attack him, each passing day would bring more troops over the Yao's bridges. He realized he was taking a tremendous gamble, he told his staff, but his only hope was to strike before the Chinese superiority was too great. Therefore he cut orders for the advance, telling Sebald that in the event of the failure of this offensive he saw no alternative, from the military point of view, to bombing key points in Manchuria. 131 On November 23, when Thanksgiving dinner was served to all MacArthur's men, UN troops were deployed all over North Korea. Leading elements of X Corps, to the right, were already on the Yalu, the, the United States 7th Division had been dug in since Monday on a slope overlooking the river at Hysania. Two weeks of cautious probing and extensive aerial reconnaissance had produced no sighting of large Chinese formations, so the general decided to send X Corps and the 8th Army forward in von Moltke's classic maneuver, action by separated forces off the enemy's axis of movement. Since each was still out of touch with the other, he would be split tactically from hell to breakfast, with a yawning vacuum in the peninsula's hilly interior. It was risky, but he doesn't bear sole responsibility for it. Earlier, the Joint Chiefs, as Collins later testified, not only didn't question, but we approved the division of UN forces, because at that stage of the game there was nothing but North Koreans. And it was a wholly reasonable proposition. 132 The performance of the chiefs that week was less than resolute. They had vacillated nine days before approving the drive, displaying all the weaknesses of a corporate body dealing with a strong individual, in this case an officer with epochal seniority over all of them. Bradley and Collins, though mildly critical, deferred to the man on the spot. At no time did the Pentagon actually object to MacArthur's strategy. At most the chiefs offered suggestions which he was free to accept or reject. One suggestion, advanced at the last moment, cited the growing concern of other members of the United Nations over the possibility of bringing on a general conflict if the United Nations forces seized the entire North Korean area at the boundary between Korea and Manchuria and the USSR. The Pentagon proposed that he halt short of the border, reigning in a long terrain dominating the approaches to the Valley of the Yalu. These forces would be principally rock troops, with other units grouped in positions of readiness. MacArthur didn't like it. The hills overlooking the river were unsuitable for digging in, he replied. It was his intention to consolidate positions along the Yalu and then replace GIs with rocks as far as possible. Collins later testified, I don't agree and did not agree with General MacArthur's reply that it would not be possible to stop upon the high ground overlooking the Yalu. The river, he explained, could have been controlled by artillery fire from these heights. But although Collins was MacArthur's immediate superior, Scap was not directed to pull back his American divisions. 133 A final feeble attempt to stay the general's hand came in a Joint Chief's request for information about the gap between the 8th Army and X Corps. In military etiquette, a request for information is a broad hint that a field commander is taking unnecessary chances. In this case it was fully justified. The Chinese infantrymen who had vanished so swiftly two weeks earlier were lurking in the lofty gorges between MacArthur's two wings. But he didn't even answer this query. Instead he flew to 8th Army headquarters on the Chongjin to launch his massive compression envelopment, as he called it in his November 24 communique, one which would close the vice around the enemy. He said, if successful, this should for all practical purposes end the war. 134 Apt in a gaily checkered muffler, he chatted with officers in the snowy, bitter weather as 8th Army GIs moved toward the ominously silent precipices between them and Manchuria. The struggle would be ended very shortly, he predicted, all that was left was a clean-up. With an earshot of several war correspondents, he said to Major General John B. Coulter, if this operation is successful, I hope we can get the boys home by Christmas. Later he lamely explained that the remark was meant to encourage his soldiers, to remind Bradley that units would soon be available for European duty, 
and to reassure Peking that he had no ambitions beyond the Yalu. But he must have known that his troops would take it literally, especially when he repeated it to Brigadier Church, now with the 24th Division, I have already promised the wives and mothers that the boys of the 24th will be back by Christmas. Don't make me a liar. Get to the Yalu and I will relieve you. Newspaper men, believing this to be the last battle, were divided over whether to christen it the end of the war offensive or the home for Christmas drive. Some called it both.135 before flying back to Tokyo that afternoon, MacArthur decided on the spur of the moment to fly the length of the Yalu. His staff objected. The plane was unarmed, they would be within range of Chinese and Russian anti-aircraft batteries on the river's north bank, and he specifically said he wanted to see Sinu, where as many as 70 MiGs had been sighted. The general, obdurate, waved them aboard. The very audacity of the flight, he assured them, would be its best protection. According to Bunker, one officer unsuccessfully begged Story to take them over another river, insisting that MacArthur wouldn't know the difference. The pilot replied that he couldn't lie to the chief. All other appeals having failed, Whitney suggested that at least they should wear parachutes. The general laughed. He said, You gentlemen can wear them if you want to. But I'll stick with the plane. 136 They encountered neither flak nor enemy aircraft. In fact, they saw nothing except a dismal, glazed, empty landscape. MacArthur wrote, When we reached the mouth of the Yalu, I told Story to turn east and follow the river at an altitude of 5,000 feet. At this height, we could observe in detail the entire area of international no man's land all the way to the Siberian border. All that spread before our eyes was an endless expanse of utterly barren countryside, jagged hills, yawning crevices, and the black waters of the Yalu. If a large force or massive supply train had passed over the border, the imprints had already been well covered by the intermittent snowstorms of the Yalu Valley. 137 That is exactly what had happened. The storms, and the superb organization of the enemy, had hoodwinked MacArthur and Indeed, the rest of the world. SLA Marshall has called the Chinese army a phantom which casts no shadow. Its main secret, its strength, its position, and its initiative, had been kept to perfection, and therefore it was doubly armed. Willoughby's reports had underestimated the size of the foe's force because after slipping over the Yao bridges most of Lin's troops had avoided skirmishes with MacArthur's men. Marshall notes that both the movement and concentration had gone undetected. The enemy columns moved only by night, preserved an absolute camouflage discipline during their daytime rests and remained hidden to view under village rooftops after reaching the chosen ground. Air observation saw nothing of this mass maneuver. Civilian refugees brought no word of it. The remaining chance for its discovery therefore lay in deep patrolling combat columns, which was not done. The general hadn't done it, according to Marshall, because he did not have a sufficient troop strength to probe and prowl every corner of the outland where hostiles might be hiding. Nothing less would have sufficed, since within that hill country, a primitive army, lacking in heavy equipment, can be stowed away in less space than a hunt would use for the chasing of foxes. 138 In the beginning MacArthur's hunt went well. A communique announced that his men had swept forward 15 miles against almost no resistance. The next day he reported that the giant UN pincer moved according to schedule. An air reconnaissance. Showed little sign of hostile military activity. There was the barest hint of trouble, the left wing advanced against stubborn. Resistance. However, the right wing continued to exploit its commanding position. Our losses were extraordinarily light. The logistics situation is fully geared to sustain offensive operations. The justice of our course and promise of early completion of our mission is reflected in the morale of troops and commanders alike. 139 On Sunday, November 26, he reported that the Allied drive was continuing to roll closer to the Manchurian border without encountering even moderate resistance. Then, on Monday, there was a jarring note, strong enemy counter-attacks. 
stalled yesterday the United Nations General Offensive. The Daiki warned correspondents against unjustified pessimism, but as the hours passed, with officers' faces lengthening and urgent dispatches piling up from Walker's 8th Army and Armand's X Corps, it was evident that something had gone wrong. Willoughby didn't finish fitting fragments of information together until late that night, but long before then the substance of them was clear. On a 300-mile front, countless thousands of Chinese communists, Chicoms, as MacArthur's headquarters had begun to call them, had howled down from what the general had previously described as a rugged spinal mountain range too precipitous to shelter troops. MacArthur radioed Washington and Lake Success, we face an entirely new war. The Chinese, he said, sought nothing less than the complete destruction of his army. Bradley phoned Truman, a terrible message has come in from General MacArthur. Truman told his staff, MacArthur says he's stymied. He says he has to go over to the defensive. It's no longer a question of a few so-called volunteers. The Chinese have come in with both feet. 140 no one outside Asia knew what that entailed, because they had never waged war against a nation with China's almost limitless human resources. Walker and Armand were already fighting 300,000 Chicoms, a force that would eventually be quadrupled. Some GI regiments were outnumbered ten to one. Brutal onslaughts were exploding in their front, on their flanks, and in their rear. Chinese machine guns and mortar shells were sweeping the frozen trails and hairpin curves where GIs sought refuge. And that was only the beginning. Mao had written, enemy advances, we retreat, enemy halts, we harass, enemy tires, we attack, enemy retreats, we pursue. Once the UN troops drive faltered, the Chicoms were on their heels. 141 Limpiao's first blow had fallen on the weakest point in MacArthur's line, the juncture between the 8th Army and the Rock II Corps at Tekjin. A Chinese assault column here virtually wiped out the improperly aligned rocks. This red tide widened the gulf between Walker and X Corps, sent Church's 24th Division reeling back across the Chongjin and enveloped the right wing of the 2nd Division, which had been backing up the South Koreans. By Wednesday, November 29, the New York Times reported, Shikom cavalry had driven a deep wedge between the United States 8th Army and the X Corps on the east and might have linked up strong North Korean forces northeast of the former red capital of Pyongyang. Meanwhile, 150 miles to the east, the 1st Marine Division, which had reached the hills overlooking the chosen reservoir, had radioed that they were facing a new Chinese division. By nightfall the Marines were surrounded, cut off from their base. The port of Hungnam.142 MacArthur gazing down at the Yala River from his plane, the SCAP, November 1950 MacArthur on air inspection of the Yalu asked for the best test of a general, Wellington replied, to know when to retreat and how to do it. MacArthur almost waited too long and came close to digging a hole, as Aixen put it, without an exit. He continued to urge his field commanders forward for four days after the first enemy breakthrough, withholding pullback orders until his center had been destroyed and the foe was lapping around the inside flanks of his divided army, isolating his right wing and pushing the left wing back toward the sea. By then it was obvious that the Chinese had enough troops to surround Walker as well as Armand and still send fresh divisions south to retake Seoul. Lights burned till dawn on the sixth floor of the Daiki as the general pored over maps and aerial photographs, searching for a way to salvage his offensive. Realizing at last that there was none, he issued instructions for a series of 8th Army delaying actions while the men of X Corps, the 7th and 3rd Divisions, and the Marines, fought their way to the coast, where they could be picked up by the 7th Fleet. Peking Radio announced that the General's men were in wild flight. In reality, the withdrawal of his right wing was superb. The GIs and Marines that formed a column and hacked their bitter, bloody way through waves of Chicoms, moving ever eastward over a corkscrew trail of icy dirt in sub-zero cold. At one point they seemed utterly lost. 
confronted by an impassable abyss, then the United States pilots arrived overhead with a huge suspension bridge hanging from their flying box cars and parked it in the chasm. When the survivors reached Hung Nam, MacArthur was there to congratulate them, then they marched aboard open-mouthed landing ships and were ferried to Pusan. America's allies were unnerved by the shattering reversal of UN fortunes, and so was the American president. During that first terrible week the general repeatedly reported a fluid situation, which, Truman acidly noted, is a public relations man's way of saying that he can't figure out what's going on. Distraught himself, the chief executive told a press conference on November 30 that nuclear bombs might be used against the enemy and seemed to indicate that the decision would be MacArthur's. That brought Clement Attlee hurrying over from London. Ross issued a clarifying statement, the use of any weapon is always implicit in the possession of that weapon, and only the president could authorize the dropping of atomic bombs. That reassured America's allies, but the situation remained ghastly. At Ixon's suggestion, Truman declared a national emergency. The Joint Chiefs radioed MacArthur, we consider that the preservation of your forces is now the primary consideration. Consolidation of forces into beachheads is concurred in. 143 Before X Corps' successful disengagement, both Tokyo and Washington had considered the evacuation of all UN troops from Korea. On November 30 MacArthur concluded that holding a line against the new foe was quite impractical, and on December 3 he sent the Joint Chiefs a grim message, reporting that all his troops except the Marines were mentally fatigued and physically battered that the rocks had proved useless, and that the Chicoms had already committed 26 divisions to battle, with another 200,000 Chinese in reserve. The enemy soldiers, he said, were fresh, completely organized, splendidly trained and equipped and apparently in peak condition. Awaiting an answer, he told Sebal that the evacuation of all or part of the Americans in Japan 40,000 of them, might become necessary. 144 It was in these desperate days that the Truman administration reversed its Korean policy. MacArthur's mission was no longer the unification of the peninsula. With Mao in the war as Kim Tu Sung's ally, circumstances had altered. The British, hoping to protect their commercial interests in China, wanted to quit, and the Truman administration was feeling less conciliatory toward its more vehement grand old party critics. The Joint Chiefs were reconciled to the prospect of withdrawing the General's entire army to Japan. However, when Collins flew to Tokyo to consult MacArthur about the details, Scap told him that he had changed his mind since cabling him that uniting the forces of the 8th Army and the X Corps was impossible. The Union had in fact been achieved, the troops were tightly knit, the men wise, now, to Chicom combat tricks. Pyongyang was about to fall to Lin Piao, and the temporary loss of Seoul was inevitable, but after that the general could form a firm sea to sea line below the 38th parallel. The hysteria about evacuation, as Aixen noted, had subsided. 145 American and British newspapers gave their readers the impression that UN forces had been ingloriously crushed, which was true, and had suffered staggering casualties, which was not at all true. Indeed, MacArthur's South Korean retreat was one of his most successful feats of arms. Of the, the United States divisions hit by the Chinese in that first rush, only the second had been badly hurt, and its 25% casualties were hardly comparable with the 60% losses of some GI units in the Battle of the Bulge. The fallback had been orderly, in 1945 Iwo Jima had been twice as expensive, and the number killed and wounded on Okinawa. 65,631, had been five times the General's Eighth Army and X Corps casualties, 12,975. In fact, during MacArthur's nine and a half months in Korea, his total losses were just a fifth of World War II Seto casualties during a comparable period. And the price the Chinese had paid for the ground yielded to them was shocking. Unfortunately, the general couldn't bring himself to leave it at that. Napoleon once said, I have so often in my life been mistaken that I no longer blush for it. 
Scap didn't blush because he refused to concede that the forfeiture of 300 square miles of hard-won territory was a calamity, refused to acknowledge that his end the war, home for Christmas push had been ill-advised. As far as I can see, he said, no strategic or tactical mistakes were made of a basic proportion. There, disposition of United Nations troops, in my opinion, could not have been improved upon had I known the Chinese were going to attack. His attack northward had not been an offensive at all, he now said, it had been a reconnaissance in force as though a commander would use his whole army for a patrol. The enemy had hoped to quietly assemble a massive force till spring, and destroy us with one mighty blow. Had I not acted when I did, we would have been a sitting duck doomed to eventual annihilation. 146 He had never responded gracefully to fault finders and now they had multiplied tenfold. The concept of a UN expeditionary force to punish an aggressor was turning out badly. Korea had never been more than a peripheral theater to the Joint Chiefs. Their principal concern was the Soviet threat to Europe. Later Bradley summed this up in calling the Korean conflict the wrong war, at the wrong place, at the wrong time, and with the wrong enemy. America's allies felt this even more strongly. As long as the delinquent nation had been North Korea, they had been willing to discipline it, buying justice on the cheap. But an involvement with the world's most populous country, with an army far larger than any force they were prepared to put in the field, was another matter. They were ready to cash in their chips now and depart from the peninsula with the least possible loss of face. At the same time, however, the rout of their troops had humiliated all of them, including the United States. They needed a scapegoat, and the general who wouldn't own up to his blunder seemed cast for the part. 147 Certain themes recurred in the global criticism of the UN's field commander. It was argued that his division of his forces had been irresponsible, that he had failed to prepare strong defensive positions, that launching an offensive after Chinese units had been identified in North Korea had been a foolish tempting of fate. Atli, Nehru, and Canada's Lester Pearson implied that SCAP had become the tool of powerful forces in the United States bent on the destruction of communist China. The new statesman and nation, England's shrillest voice of anti-Americanism, charged that the supreme commander had acted in defiance of all common sense, and in such a way as to provoke the most peace-loving nation. Left-wing Labourites took up the cry. And one of them said that if the Chinese fell a long way back without being pushed which hadn't happened, they were ready to sit down and talk to somebody. Just head of anybody going along and sitting down and talking with them, General MacArthur chose that moment to launch an enormous attack bang in the middle of a first class blizzard. 148 The argument that MacArthur, not the Chinese, was responsible for their woes was echoed by some American intellectuals including, of all people, McGeorge Bundy, who later became one of Lyndon Johnson's chief Vietnam hawks. Bundy wrote then that neither the United States nor UN policy required the occupation of all North Korea and this MacArthur knew. The decision was his, it was provocation. Few of his countrymen were prepared to brand the general an instigator of violence, but many, including conservatives, felt he had let them down. Henry Luce's time called him responsible for one of the greatest military catastrophes of all time, the worst the United States ever suffered. Gardner Cowles's look said that he had grossly miscalculated the intentions, strength, and capabilities of the forces against him, and that no nation in the spot we are in now can string along with a leader whose ill-considered decision precipitated and magnified the swift disaster. The New York Herald Tribune blamed Scap for one of the greatest military reverses in the history of American arms because he had compounded blunder by confusion of facts and intelligence. Homer Bigot, a Herald Tribune correspondent in Korea, wrote that the general's unsound deployment of UN troops made no sense. It was an invitation to disaster. David Bruce felt that MacArthur had erred in not working for a fixed line in Korea and a neutral zone and Chip Boland told C. L. Salzberger that the Supreme Commander had made a terrible mistake in pushing this latest Korean offensive. If, as he now claims, 
he did it to force the Chinese into action before they had built up an even larger force, he was a fool to send isolated units way up to the northeast. He was caught with his pants down and disregarded the basic military assumption that the enemy will always do what he appears capable of doing, and it was evident from the last bloody nose we received in Korea that they were capable of plenty. 149 Heraldics said, MacArthur talks too much. The general's old gadfly was right. There was a great deal to be said in his defense, but since others were saying it, he should have left the field to them. Some were making points which would have been far less telling from him. Military analysts pointed out that Lee had divided his forces again and again. James Reston told his readers that Truman had shared the general's conviction that the Chinese wouldn't intervene, and Stuart and Joseph also wrote that the administration had been afraid of restraining MacArthur because of grand old party charges that its policy toward Peking was soft. Other columnists noted that it was nonsense to argue that MacArthur's Thanksgiving offensive had provoked the Chicoms into a counterattack, intervention with over a quarter million men required weeks of planning. The proposition that the foe was merely shielding Kim Tu Sung's hydroelectric facilities also crumbled under examination. The Chinjin Reservoir, for example, had been dismantled a full month before the arrival of GIs. And anticipating so momentous a move as full scale Chinese intervention was scarcely within the competence of Tokyo's G2. As Willoughby pointed out in Stars and Stripes, although his intelligence had erred, one can hardly blame the United Nations Field Command for the Chinese coming en masse at their own time and place. That monumental decision was beyond the local military intelligence surveillance, it lay behind the Iron Curtain and the secret councils of Peiping, sick. 150 but the thin-skinned, deeply wounded general could no more leave the rebuttal to others than he could recognize that he had fallen victim to his own legend of invincibility, that he had demonstrated the wisdom of dried den, even victors are by victory undone. Instead he lashed out at the disaster school of war reporting, denouncing irresponsible correspondents at the front, aided and abetted by other such unpatriotic elements at home. They should have confined their stories, he said, to comments about the superior manner in which he had executed his tactical withdrawal. Then he began giving his version of what had happened to friendly journalists. On November 28 he sent a self-serving cablegram to Ray Henn of the Three Star Extra News broadcast, two days later he answered a letter from Arthur Crock of the New York Times, and the day after that he gave a lengthy interview to the editors of David Lawrence's The United States News and World Report and dispatched a long message to Hugh Bailey, President of the United Press. Meanwhile he was talking, or writing, toward Price of the London Daily Mail, to Barry Farries, managing editor of the International News Service, and to selected members of the Tokyo Press Corps. 151 The morale of his troops, he said, was being sabotaged by misleading anonymous gossip. He told Bailey that European leaders preoccupied with the safety of their continent were short-sighted. Croc had asked him whether it was true that he had been advised to halt at the 38th parallel, the general replied, there is no validity whatever to the anonymous gossip to which you refer. I have received no suggestion from, any, authoritative source that in the execution of its mission the command should stop at the 38th parallel or Pyongyang, or at any line short of the international boundary. To Farris he complained that he was the victim of one of the most scandalous propaganda efforts to pervert the truth in modern times. Any impression that as United Nations commander I am more than an agent to implement policies determined upon a much higher level is perfectly fantastic. The statement that agreement was made at Wake Island to a British proposal that the United Nations forces stop 40 miles short of the international boundary is a pure fabrication. Answering the United States News and World Report he accused Washington of giving enemy aircraft safe refuge in Manchuria and called this an enormous handicap for him, one without precedent in military history. 152 among his fascinated audience was the occupant of the White House. Truman tartly told his advisers that MacArthur was making it quite plain that no blame attached to himself or his staff. He was right. 
But it was also true that the administration was unwilling to shoulder its own share of the blame. No one had recommended that he draw up at the parallel, by all accounts nothing had been said about such a proposal at Wake. Yet that was what administration spokesmen, not for attribution, but for publication, were telling reporters, Reston among them, in the capital. Unlike them, the general was willing to be quoted, and that was the rub. His accusations were embarrassing the government. Truman said that while MacArthur was no more to be blamed for the fact that he was outnumbered than General Eisenhower could be charged with the heavy losses of the Battle of the Bulge, his verbal barrage might lead many people abroad to believe that our government would change its policy. Then Truman said, every second lieutenant knows best what his platoon ought to do. He thinks the higher-ups are just blind when they don't see things his way. But General MacArthur, and rightly too, would have court-martialed any second lieutenant who gave press interviews to express his disagreement. 153 The President didn't propose to court-martial the general, but he did consider relieving him then and there. He didn't, he later wrote, because he knew a general couldn't be a winner every day in the week, and because he did not wish to have it appear as if he were being relieved because the offensive failed. I have never believed in going back on people when luck is against them, and I did not intend to do so now. Nor did I want to reprimand the general, but he had to be told that the kinds of public statements which he had been making were out of order. Truman said he could not permit such confusion to continue. Therefore, to shut MacArthur up, he instructed Aixon and George Marshall on December 6 to issue two directives to all field commands and embassies abroad. The first ordered that no speeches, press releases, or other statements should be distributed until they had been cleared by the State or Defense Department, to ensure the information made public is accurate and fully in accord with the policies of the United States government. The second directive specified that officials overseas, including military commanders and diplomatic representatives, should exercise extreme caution in public statements clear all but routine statements with their departments, and refrain from direct communication on military or foreign policy with newspapers, magazines or other publicity media in the United States. 154 In a press conference Truman praised MacArthur's splendid leadership and denied curbing his right to speak freely about the war, but everyone knew the general was the target of the new regulations. The first test of them came when MacArthur told the Pentagon that he wanted to reply to correct factual inaccuracies in a Herald Tribune editorial criticizing Willoughby. The Department of the Army turned him down, explaining that it is felt that we should avoid entering any controversies in the press. The editorial represents the writer's opinion. Your proposed refutation could be quoted out of context to the detriment of your own intentions. Therefore it is necessary to disapprove your statement. Next a war correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor filed a wild story reporting that one UN division had been declared unfit for combat after bolting the field in disorder, that the Chinese were so short of ammunition they had to search the bodies of the fallen, and that MacArthur's mechanized army was fleeing in jeeps and trucks from an overwhelming horde of poorly equipped Chinese. Following on mules, ponies and camels. The general prepared a retort which he hoped would restore the proper perspective to the overall course of events in Korea and reassure the American people. This, too, was sent to Washington for clearance and rejected by the Department of the Army on the ground that it did not conform with the intent of the President. 155 The intent of the President, Robert A. Taft told the Senate, was to gag Douglas MacArthur, and he was right. The White House, under heavy fire from Taft's party, was trying to avoid a second front in Tokyo. Indeed, the tension between the chief executive and the apocalyptic figure in the Daiki during the months ahead can only be grasped if it is seen in the context of American politics that year. On November 7, the day the general had asked for hot pursuit, the United States voters had reduced the number of Democratic seats in the Senate by 10 and cut the Democratic majority in the House by two-thirds. 
the chief issue in the campaign had been foreign policy. Disillusioned by casualty lists, the battlefield deadlock, and the eagerness of allied governments to conciliate China, the electorate had strengthened the Republicans, and they, scenting the public's mood, were rallying around the General. 156 on Capitol Hill. The two parties had begun what was being called the great debate over whether more GIs should be stationed in Europe and, if so, whether the administration could send them there without congressional approval. Taft, supported by Herbert Hoover, argued that pledging 20% of the gross national product to the military budget, together with the Joint Chiefs' tremendous emphasis on the conducting of a land war in Europe, might gut the American economy. Appealing to isolationist distrust of entangling alliances, Taft and Hoover proposed what was variously called the principle of Fortress America, or continentalism. It wasn't as lonely as it sounded. They proposed to hold the Atlantic and the Pacific, in Hoover's words, with one frontier on Britain and the other on Japan, Formosa, and the Philippines. Because the United States was already committed in Korea, Taft was of two minds about the peninsula. GIs should either pull back to Nippon, he said, or wage all out war and win. The one approach which he and the rest of the grand old party leadership would never accept was the Truman Aixen concept of a limited military action. Because MacArthur agreed with them, the president had muzzled him, hoping to decrease the pressure on the administration to adopt the opposition's policy. Given the general's temperament and his convictions, this was bound to fail. Sooner or later the administration would be confronted by the fearful spectacle of a popular general appealing over its heads to his countrymen, thereby launching a bitter, exhausting, greater debate. 157 In the Attic tragedies of Aeschylus, Euripides, and Sophocles, the hero is a figure of massive integrity and powerful will, a paradox of outer poison in a passion who recognizes the inevitability of evil, despair, suffering and loss. Choosing a perilous course of action despite the counsel of the Greek chorus, he struggles nobly but vainly against fate, enduring cruelty and, ultimately, defeat, his downfall being revealed as the consequence of a fatal defect in his character which, deepened by tumultuous events, eventually shatters him. So it was with Douglas MacArthur. Brave, brilliant, and majestic. He was a colossus bestriding Korea until the nemesis of his hubris overtook him. He simply could not bear to end his career in checkmate. It would, in his view, be a betrayal of his mission, an acknowledgement that MacArthur was imperfect. Politics had always been his eve, a lure and a threat, fascinating but ill-boding. Now, as he saw it, his political enemies, and anyone who barred his way was an adversary, worth warting his last crusade. Believing that Washington was denying him the tools to finish his job, that he had been relegated to what he called a no man's land of indecision, scornful of what he regarded as the Joint Chief's loss of a will to win, he grappled through that winter holding the Chinese at bay while trying to persuade his superiors to see things his way. 158 They couldn't do it. The telecon circuits between Tokyo and Washington chattered around the clock, and the National Security Council met almost every day, but there was no way that the leaders of the administration could accept his goals without abandoning their own. There simply were not enough young men in the United States, and not enough ardor in America's allies, to conquer China and still man NATO's defenses. Six months earlier, the United Nations had been quick to condemn the in minutes gun but now world opinion was reversing itself. The hazards of following MacArthur's road were too forbidding, the resumption of the struggle between Chiang and Mao, the intervention of Peking's Soviet ally, an atomic holocaust. Thus the general faced a blurry future. The Joint Chiefs could tell him neither to win nor to quit, they could only order him to hold, vaguely explaining that if necessary he should defend himself in successive lines that successful resistance at some position in Korea would be highly desirable, but that Asia was not the place to fight a major war. Inevitably, Trumbull Higgins notes, United States government policy was less acquiescent to MacArthur in defeat than it had been during the general's brief honeymoon with victory. The glow of Incheon had gone glimmering. 
Truman was fighting a two-front war, two, the general had the Chinese, and the president had the Republicans. With Alger Hiss in prison, the grand old party was demanding the resignation of Dean Nixon, who had told a press conference that he wouldn't turn his back on Hiss. Truman wrote, General MacArthur had given these aches and haters an argument behind which they could gather their forces for the attack. In other words, they wanted Aixon's scalp because he stood for my policy. The president felt that MacArthur had, as he had in previous wars, displayed splendid leadership. But I wanted him to accept, as a soldier should, the political decisions which the civil authorities of the government had determined upon. Because the general's convictions prevented that, the Tokyo Washington axis was wobbly. As differences between the White House and the Daiki grew, the polls testified to the public's disenchantment with the administration. George Gallup found that Truman was trailing Taft, and Leviero observed in the Times that his prestige happens to be on one of those down curves. Leviero added, yet there is no question that his essential confidence remains intact. The president, in short, had no intention of surrendering to the general. 159 Nevertheless he was embattled. He wrote that attacks on him had become vitriolic. Most of the criticism came from those members of the Senate who have sometimes been called the China First Bloc. These men kept repeating the completely baseless charge that somehow Aixon had brought about the communist victory in China, and they now charged that it was Aixon who was depriving General MacArthur of the chance of gaining victory. A siege mentality was reflected in government leaders' waspish, sometimes even malicious views of the general. Deputy Secretary of Defense Robert A. Lovett complained that MacArthur was preparing posterity papers alibis for failing to win the war. Aixon went further, writing that the general was near panic and in a blue funk. The effort to stabilize the Korean War, Aixon said, involved nearly simultaneous efforts on three fronts, the front in Korea, the front in the United Nations, and the front in Tokyo. The most intractable was the last. 160 on the whole, historians have sympathized with the administration. Walter Millis concludes that the general would not play unless both the policy and the strategy were transformed in accordance with his liking. John W. Spanier infers that what he seemed to be saying was that he would cooperate with the administration only on his terms. That is true, but it is equally true that his instructions from the Pentagon were murky. Clark Lee notes that a state of paralysis gripped Washington, for weeks MacArthur continued to fight under his first, now meaningless orders, and the only positive action taken thereafter was to attempt to silence MacArthur. To Gavin Long the leaders in Washington seemed to have been spellbound. Already MacArthur had disobeyed one order, to employ only Korean troops in the frontier provinces. What would he do next? 161 Actually that order had been less than pellucid. When the general had cited Marshall's alteration of it, feel unhampered tactically and strategically. North of the 38th parallel, the Pentagon had dropped the matter. The fact is that America's high command appears to have been afraid of the general. Aixon tells us that Bradley and Collins defended MacArthur and said that a war could not be run by a committee. If that was true, the Joint Chiefs should have been disbanded. It was their job to supervise theater commanders, and the only explanation for their negligence in this instance is that Scap's fame had intimidated them. In his History of the United States Army, R. F. Wagley observes that MacArthur long retained his very free hand. The Joint Chiefs deferred to his experience, rank, and reputation, to his intense emotional involvement in the Far East an involvement they did not share, and to his unmeasured but possibly dangerous political potency as a man cultivated and admired by Republican Party leaders. Wagley continues, so reluctant were they to interfere with MacArthur on a matter of military judgment that they urged Secretary of State Dean Aixon to intervene with the President, so that Truman might instruct MacArthur to consolidate his forces. But Aixon, and Marshall, were equally wary. 
Rigway describes a Pentagon conference during which his suggestion that the general be bluntly told to toe the line was followed by a frightened silence on the part of the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and the chiefs. Leaving the meeting, Ridgway told Hoyt Vandenberg, a close friend, that he didn't understand why they didn't tell MacArthur exactly what to do. Vandenberg replied, what good would that do? He wouldn't obey the orders. What can we do? Ridgway said, you can relieve any commander that won't obey orders, can't you? He recalls that Vandenberg looked puzzled and amazed and walked away. 162 Ridgway became a key figure in the growing controversy on December 23, 1950, when Walker was killed in a jeep accident on an icy Korean road. Relinquishing his role as Collins's deputy, Ridgway flew out to assume command of all UN ground forces. The Eighth Army, with which X Corps had just been merged, MacArthur said wearily, Eighth Army is yours, Matt. Do what you think best. What Matt did was to demonstrate that the Supreme Commander was not indispensable to the fighting. Four days before Walker's death MacArthur had radioed Washington that if his men were to stabilize a front, he would need four fresh divisions. Ridgway said that he believed he could handle Lin Piao's 484,000 Chikompa troops with the 365,000 soldiers he already had. It turned out that in the head-on, positional struggles now being fought around the parallel, the forthright Ridgway was at least as good as Scap, who needed a larger arena to work his strategic miracles. The UN line was straightened out with no help from the Daiki, and cautious. Probing patrols were sent forth, backed by strong armored spearheads. Phillips writes, the enemy was dug in securely and in depth, taking full advantage of the deep snows and murderous cold of the Korean winter. For weeks the two lines surged futilely against each other like conflicting sea currents, punching through for a gain of a few miles here, giving up a few bloody acres there. But little by little, almost mile by mile. Ridgway's men moved forward, never giving up quite as much today as they gained yesterday. 163 Meanwhile, as his new field commander battled the enemy, MacArthur continued to fight Washington. The cable traffic between Tokyo and the Pentagon in those months reveals the formation of painful patterns. The general requests permission to bomb a specific target, a Chikom Road junction in Manchuria, or an important North Korean supply depot near the Russian border. The chiefs turn him down. He asks for clarification. They explain that they want no wider war. That triggers a series of angry MacArthur arguments. Keeping hands off the foe's bases makes no sense, he says, the Chinese are building up a million man striking force, Peking has committed itself fully and unequivocally and nothing the United States does now can further aggravate the situation. This small command, he says, is facing the entire Chinese nation in an undeclared war. Neither side is approaching a solution. Continuing this kind of fighting will mean a savage slaughter, and, because of Mao's inexhaustible manpower, it will militarily benefit the enemy more than it would ourselves. He cannot save his army unless he is allowed to carry the war to China. Fear of Russian intervention is unjustified, nothing short of an invasion of Siberia will bring the Soviets into the war. So he goes, on and on, repeating himself endlessly. The chiefs never say in so many words that they are prepared to leave the Chikoms in possession of the field, he isn't the only one writing posterity papers, but that is implicit in their replies. 164 at years and the Chinese, as Willoughby puts it made one last convulsive, bloody effort to discredit him, MacArthur, in the field. Temperatures along the parallel fell below zero and stayed there. The Chicoms and the Inminits gone attacked every night. The UN lines bent and began to buckle, and on New Year's Eve, at the very hour of Old Lang Syne, a great onslaught came billowing down through the dense snow and sailed into Sinkf's defenders. Seoul fell for the second time on January 4. Once more the enemy achieved a major breakthrough, cutting off the United States division at Wonju in the center and rupturing the entire UN front. 
In Washington Aixen was sickened by the stench of spiritless defeat, of death of high hopes and broad purposes. 165 Scaps spirits at this time are difficult to assess. Willoughby writes that the general had made his own lucid appraisal, and accurately forecast the slow deterioration of the Chinese hordes, and MacArthur himself claimed that while the press of Europe and much of that of the United States cried hysterically that the United Nations forces are going to be pushed into the sea, the thought of defeat in Korea had never been entertained by me. Nevertheless, he clearly warned that unless some positive and immediate action is taken, steady attrition leading to final destruction, of his command, can reasonably be contemplated. And Truman notes in his memoirs that it was the general's opinion that if we did not intend to expand the war the only other choice would be to contract our position in Korea gradually until we were reduced to the Pusan beachhead. Despite the fact that this would have a poor effect on Asian morale, Probably MacArthur was hoping to win support for a more aggressive policy by threatening the administration with the specter of grand old party accusations that, having lost China, Truman and Aixen were now losing Korea as well. Certainly Washington felt threatened. Yet there was no possibility that the administration would cave in under this kind of pressure. The root of the matter was that the United Nations resolution calling for the unification of the peninsula by force had by mutual consent of its members, been quietly abandoned. If Ridgeway could hold on, the UN was ready to settle for the status quo anti-helium, two Koreas, mutually distrustful, a denouement which MacArthur couldn't accept. 166 but he was never explicitly told to accept it. What I needed, as much as more men and supplies, he wrote afterward, was a clear definition of policy to meet this new situation. When he asked for it, they responded, typically, it is not practical to obtain significant additional forces for Korea from other members of the United Nations. We believe that we should not commit our remaining available ground forces to action against Chinese communist forces in Korea in face of the increased threat of general war. However, a successful resistance to Chinese North Korean aggression at some position in Korea and a deflation of the military and political prestige of the Chinese communists would be of great importance to our national interest, if they could be accomplished without incurring serious losses. As inspiration, that was somewhat less moving than the Atlantic Charter. It gave MacArthur no concrete objectives no guidelines, no lofty purpose except the flannelly suggestion that he tarnish Peking's public image, provided the effort didn't cost too much blood. Having failed to exploit his inch in victory, American diplomats were equally helpless now that the fortunes of war had turned against him. As the gulf of misunderstanding and suspicion widened between him and them, he felt, according to one of his aides, that the defiant rallying figure that had been Franklin Roosevelt in World War II was gone, and in his place was a group of figures of smaller stature who seemed more interested in temporizing than in fighting it through. 167 The crucial period in the continuing dialogue between Washington and Tokyo began during the 1950 year end holidays. On the day after Christmas, Truman, Aixen, Marshall, Bradley, and Secretary of the Treasury John W. Snyder conferred in Blair House, and three days later the Pentagon, on their instructions, asked MacArthur what course of action he would recommend if the UN position became desperate. On the evening of Saturday, December 30, 1950, he replied that there was no point in waiting until their plight was hopeless. Should the United States or the United Nations choose to recognize the state of war which has been forced upon us? He said, they should now authorize him to, 1, blockade the coast of China, 2, destroy through naval gunfire and air bombardment China's industrial capacity to wage war, 3, secure appropriate reinforcements from the nationalist garrison on Formosa to strengthen our position in Korea if we decide to continue the fight for that peninsula, and, 4, release existing restrictions upon the Formosa garrison for diversionary action possibly leading to counter-invasion against vulnerable areas of the Chinese mainland. These measures, he said, 
would severely cripple and thereby neutralize China's capacity to wage aggressive war and would not only assure victory in Korea, but also save Asia from the engulfment otherwise facing it. The alternative to his proposals, he said, was defeat, with a tactical plan of successively contracting defense lines south to the Pusan beachhead as the only possible way in which the evacuation could be accomplished. 168 consternation followed the receipt of this message in Washington. Apart from the possibility that these steps might lead to world conflict, many sinologists doubted that they would work. The proposal to accept Chiang's offer of troops was surprising, since MacArthur himself had called the Kuomintang force ineffective. World War II experience with strategic bombing indicated that it would not work without a massive slaughter of Chinese civilians, which would outrage world opinion. And a naval blockade wouldn't disrupt Peking's main line of supply, which was overland from Russia. Moreover, as the State Department pointed out, a blockade off the coast of China would require negotiations with the British in view of the extent of British trade with China through Hong Kong. 169 Truman called an emergency session of the National Security Council to weigh the general's program and phrase the answer to him. Aixen, who left a sick bed to attend it, wanted MacArthur told that he ought to confine himself to inflicting maximum losses on the enemy. The president felt he should be reminded that his primary task was the safety of his troops and his basic mission of protecting Japan, to which he must retreat if the price of holding a Korean bridgehead was too high. On January 9 the Joint Chiefs, with the approval of the president and the secretaries of state and defense, wired the general that while his suggestions have been and continue to be given careful consideration. There was little possibility of policy change or other eventuality justifying strengthening of our effort in Korea. Apart from the need for approval from London, a blockade, if undertaken, must await either stabilization of our position in Korea or our evacuation from Korea. Bombardment of Chinese cities could be countenanced only if the Chinese communists attack United States forces outside of Korea. Use of KMT units was rejected in view of the improbability of their decisive effect. And their probable greater usefulness elsewhere. Therefore he should persevere on the peninsula, avoiding severe losses of men and materiel. If that proved impossible, if he was overwhelmed, he should withdraw from Korea to Japan. 171 Scapade calls this a booby trap an attempt to put the responsibility for disaster on him. The general, in his own words, shot a query right back. Believing he had not been given a clear answer, he cited the self-evident fact that my command as presently constituted is of insufficient strength to hold a position in Korea and simultaneously to protect Japan against external assault. If his army continued to be locked in a seesaw stalemate, he said, he could not guarantee the safety of Nippon, he should be either reinforced or permitted to leave the peninsula. He continued, there is no doubt but that a beachhead line can be held by our existing forces for a limited time in Korea, but this could not be accomplished without losses. Whether such losses were regarded as severe or not would to a certain extent depend upon the connotation one gives the term. The issue really boils down to the question whether or not the United States intends to evacuate Korea, and involves a decision of highest and international importance far above the competence of a theater commander. He did suggest that the issue should not be decided by the initiative of enemy action, which in effect would be the determining criteria, sick, under a reasonable interpretation of your message. Then, having stuck the knife in, he twisted it, under the extraordinary limitations and conditions imposed upon the command in Korea. Its military position is untenable, but it can hold if overriding political considerations so dictate, for any length of time up to its complete destruction. Your clarification requested. 171 This, Aixen felt, was a posterity paper if there ever was one, with the purpose not only of clearing MacArthur of blame if things went wrong, but also of putting the maximum pressure on Washington to reverse itself and adopt his proposals for widening the war against China. That is one reading of it, and it is understandable that the Secretary of State, beset by congressional critics, saw it in that light. 
a less partisan interpretation would exonerate all parties, or hold all equally accountable. They were in an impossible situation, and they knew it, so all were trying to get out from under. The administration believed MacArthur was willing to risk war with Russia to save his military reputation. In the light of what we now know about Sino-Soviet relations, that threat was small, but at the time caution seemed wise. The general, on the other hand, saw his men dying for nothing. If their sacrifice was to have any meaning, the UN's political purpose needed re-examination. MacArthur's critics pointed out that defining it wasn't his job, and they were right. But someone had to do it. He didn't try until his civilian superiors, despite his goading, had failed. 172 Washington's reaction to MacArthur's clarification request is a tribute to the administration's eagerness to accommodate him. First, the Joint Chiefs issued him an order repeating previous directives, in other words, as Bradley later testified, telling him to stay in Korea. Next it was decided to send him a copy of a memorandum, a new 16-point fallback program which had been drawn up by the chiefs for the consideration of Secretary of Defense Marshall and other policy makers. This top-secret document, which had evolved out of staff studies begun in November, and which was to cause trouble later, set forth options courses of action which might be pursued if and when the UN was forced to withdraw completely from the peninsula. Third, at the request of Ixon, Marshall, and Bradley, President Truman wrote MacArthur a long personal letter to set down our basic national and international purposes in Korea. The President's tone was polite, almost deferential, he assured the General that the Korean situation was receiving his utmost attention listed ten objectives to be served by resisting aggression, praised the general's splendid leadership and superb performance, and said, our course of action should be such as to consolidate the great majority of the United Nations. Pending the build-up of our national strength, we must act with great prudence so far as extending the area of hostilities is concerned. Steps which in themselves might be fully justified and which might lend some assistance to the campaign in Korea would not be beneficial if they thereby involved Japan or Western Europe in large-scale hostilities. He said he wanted to strengthen the UN, America's allies, and resistance to aggression everywhere. Aixen regarded the polished document as an imaginatively kind and thoughtful letter for the chief of state to write his theater commander. If ever a message should have stirred the loyalty of a commander, this one should have done so. Clark Lee, on the other hand, thought it a classical example of buck passing. Ambiguous and equivocal. In fact, it was couched in broad generalities, all of them familiar to the principles in the unfolding drama. 173 Collins and Hoyt Vandenberg flew to Tokyo to deliver the order, the memorandum, and Truman's letter and to answer any questions the Supreme Commander might have. After reading the presidential missive, MacArthur said, we will do our best. In fact, he seems to have done his best to misunderstand everything he was being told. Truman, he thought, was directing him to fight on until the foe had been vanquished, and although Collins read the chief's memorandum to him aloud, to be sure MacArthur's staff didn't distort it. The general chose the interpretation which suited him. Among its 16 possible courses of action, to be weighed if the UN army was driven off the mainland, were blockade, aerial reconnaissance of the China coast, and the use of Chiang's men. The chiefs had tentatively approved laying these alternatives before the next meeting of the National Security Council, scheduled for January 17. Truman, Aixen, and Marshall hadn't been consulted and, as it turned out, all three were opposed to them. MacArthur came to the extraordinary conclusion that they were now U.S. policy. He exultantly told his staff that the chiefs had finally overcome their illusions that fighting back against China would bring on global war. It was an incredible mistake, and characteristically he never acknowledged the error. Testifying on Capitol Hill the following spring, he said, this was the recommendation, the study made by the Joint Chiefs of Staff which was submitted to the Secretary of Defense. 
Senator Richard Russell asked, Did you get any instructions that it was not to be put into effect? MacArthur replied, No, sir. Russell, so, if that was a recommendation of the Joint Chiefs, it encountered a veto somewhere along the line, either from the Secretary of Defense or the President of the United States? The General, I would assume so, sir. On Capitol Hill it was a short hop from that to the charge, which soon was made by administration critics, that the Pentagon had endorsed a plan to win the war and Dean Nixon had torpedoed it. That was the savage way of politics in the bitter early 1950s. 174 As things turned out, the controversial memorandum was never pondered by the National Security Council, because by January 17 Collins and Vandenberg had submitted their report. If MacArthur had been muddled during their stay, they had seen things clearly, and had returned to Washington greatly enlightened. Most of their five days had been spent in Korea. The general had promised them that if ejected from the peninsula he would continue to fight on a string of offshore islands, the literal island chain, he called it. After touring the front, they had concluded that such an eventuality was extremely unlikely. G.I. morale was fine, Ridgeway, in fact, considered his position impregnable. That discovery marked the beginning of the end of MacArthur's ascendancy over the Joint Chiefs. Thereafter he ceased to be a force in strategic planning. Until then the Pentagon had believed his direful warnings of tragedy were his advice ignored. If he could be wrong on so crucial a point, they concluded, he was far more fallible than they had thought. Millis writes, it seems not too much to say that with Collins' arrival in the Far East, MacArthur's influence was largely finished. Perhaps this was the real end of that overshadowing career. Collins is represented. As having been under the impression when he landed in Tokyo that evacuation was inevitable. If so, he realized by the time he reached the front in Korea that the peril had been grossly exaggerated. MacArthur had provided for every contingency save one, the contingency of success. Henceforth the Pentagon would see him as a peevish, stubborn old man, pouting in Tokyo, despising politicians while they, supported now by the Joint Chiefs, ignored his sententious forecasts of doom. The General's prophecy of an anti-MacArthur conspiracy, it seemed, had at last become self-fulfilling.175 and yet, Ridgway continued to strengthen his defenses. Plugging the Wanju gap, throwing in his reserves, exploiting his superiority in the air, and adroitly moving in troops from his flanks, he waited until the fury of the enemy's New Year's Eve drive had been spent, and in the last week of January he reformed for a counter-offensive. Eight days after the two chiefs flew home from Canada, he rolled northward on a two-cal front in a thrust which, in his words, was never stopped until it had driven the enemy back across the parallel. After Seoul had been recaptured, Truman wrote, the tide of battle began to turn in our favor. Even MacArthur conceded that no one is going to drive us into the sea, which prompted Aixon to note delightedly, Mirabile Dictu. In Paris, c. L. Salzburger wrote, it appeared that the general had been proved wrong three times, misinterpreted his intelligence about the Chinese, split his forces unnecessarily, predicted we couldn't hold. 176 MacArthur and Matthew B. Ridgway touring the Korean front, January 1951 MacArthur visiting the Korean front, February 1951 MacArthur in Seoul, March 1951 and yet, MacArthur persuaded Ridgeway to write Collins, strongly urging him to permit KMT replacements to sail from Formosa and join the 8th Army. The proposal was brusquely rejected. In the Daiki the general glumly told Sebald that unless he was permitted to strike boldly at the enemy, his dream of a single Korean nation under Rhee would be impossible. Desperately, realizing that his stock was falling in Washington, he cabled back his boldest plan yet on February 11. First he would clear the enemy rear all across the top of North Korea by massive air attacks. Next. If I were still not permitted to attack the massed enemy reinforcements across the Yalu, or to destroy its bridges, 
I would sever Korea from Manchuria by laying a field of radioactive wastes, the byproducts of atomic manufacture, across all the major lines of enemy supply. Finally, I would make simultaneous amphibious and airborne landings at the upper end of both coasts of North Korea, and close a gigantic trap. The Chinese would soon starve or surrender. Without food and ammunition, they would become helpless. It would be something like Incheon, he concluded, reliving that shining hour, but on a much larger scale. The Joint Chiefs curtly replied that all this was out of the question. Once more, on February 13, he vainly protested that he was crippled by the enemy's unprecedented military advantage of sanctuary protection for his military potential against our counterattack upon Chinese soil. Aixen notes laconically, Generals Vandenberg and Collins had reported that this was not the case. Once again MacArthur was refused authority to attack Chinese territory. Clearly the administration considered the general a discredited commander.177 and yet, and yet. And yet it was all a delusion, the belief that a solution had been found, that MacArthur had been refuted, that the UN had somehow triumphed. At the end of Ridgeway's counteroffensive, the two squatting armies, glaring at one another, occupied roughly the same positions the North and South Koreans had held at the outbreak of the war. If the general's solutions were unacceptable, so was Ridgeway's. The Eighth Army's new field commander had averted the debacle which MacArthur had so rashly predicted, thereby offering his critics an Achilles heel which they could hardly have been expected to resist but his successor at the front had won nothing but a few barren miles of shell-churned earth and the ruins of Seoul. That was no more of a victory than Pius is at Esculum, but Ains at Verdun, or Hague's at Passkendale. Before the guns fell silent in Korea, an estimated 5 million people, including 54,246 GIs, would have died, pointlessly. MacArthur had not found a way out of the Ampas, but at least he had defined the problem. Wars, he argued, are waged to be won, an indecisive stalemate makes no sense. He was ridiculed for that, yet subsequent events were to demonstrate that he understood the fiber of his countrymen better than those who scorned him. America's misgivings over limited war, Wagley writes, proved, in the presidential election of 1952, the political undoing of the administration that had sponsored the war. 178 Rovier and Schlesinger taxed Truman with failure to set forth convincingly to the American people why they were in the fix they were in. That they must learn to live with crisis. They never did learn. Fifteen years later another generation of statesmen led the country into another war to contain Asian communism, another conflict in which MacArthur's advice would be spurned. Once more the people were torn, uneasy, and rebellious. Their previous protest at the polls having proved futile, they took to the streets, bringing the country to the brink of insurrection. 179 In both the Korean and the Vietnam Wars, the nation's leaders, presidents of both parties, concealed their own doubts. But they felt thwarted, all the same. Truman, in his way, was just as frustrated as MacArthur. Checkmated in the spring of 1951, each sought a target for his suppressed hostility. It is a historical fact that they found each other. Ten recall 1951 during the controversy between the president and the general, much was said about the military mind. There is such a thing, but MacArthur did not possess it. Those who do tend to be blunt, insensitive men who believe war is inevitable and shy away from ideologies. The general believed that war could be, and should be, abolished. As long as it endured, however, he saw it in romantic, mystical, and religious terms, as a Manichaean struggle between Christianity and the Antichrist. The professional soldier, writes Samuel P. Huntington, exists in a world of greys. MacArthur's universe was one of blacks and whites and loud and clashing colors. MacArthur preferred the warlike spirit to the military spirit. One in short, his was a warrior's mind. That was the fundamental difference between him and George Marshall, who was more of a Marshall administrator. 
In 1918, while MacArthur was winning nine decorations for heroism, Marshall had been awarded a single silver star for obtaining information and contributing to the training and morale of Doughboys. Comparing the two, Pershing, who liked Marshall and disliked MacArthur, said, Marshall is a great chief of staff. MacArthur knows his troops. He's a fighter, a fighter, a fighter. In 1931 MacArthur had told a congressional committee that the objective of any warring nation is victory, immediate and complete. Twenty years later, testifying before another committee, he rejected the idea that when you use force, you can limit that force. Thus he was closer to Ludendorff than to Clausewitz, he saw war, not as an extension of politics, but as the consequence of a complete political collapse which threw governments, so to speak, into a kind of military receivership. Such a bankruptcy of peacetime policies should be temporarily replaced, he reasoned, by the concentration of all power, political, economic, and military, in the hands of professional soldiers, whose sole mission should be eventual triumph. Warriors, no less than diplomats, had the right, indeed the duty, to manipulate civilian populations. If a commander found it necessary to retreat, for example, he must save face. This was particularly true in Asia. Fleeing Corregidor, he had vowed to return, having withdrawn from North Korea, he insisted that he be permitted to retake it. He hadn't challenged the administration's pre-war policy of abandoning South Korea, but once he had been sent into battle, he contended, he must be allowed to win. If a nation wasn't willing to make that total military commitment, he said, it shouldn't fight at all. To this, not fanatical anti communism on his part, was the bone of contention between him and Truman. From the reaction to it, one might have thought that conflict between soldiers and civilians over war policy was a new issue in the history of the world. In fact, the annals of warfare are rich in instances of it. Before 1951, the most conspicuous American military protagonists in such confrontations had been Winfield Scott. George B. McClellan, Arthur MacArthur, and Billy Mitchell. I can't tell you how disgusted I am becoming with these wretched politicians, McClellan wrote in October 1861, and again, on the following May 3rd, I feel that the fate of the nation depends on me, and I feel that I have not one single friend at the seat of the government. Any day may bring me an order relieving me from my command. If they simply let me alone I feel sure of success, but will they do it? They, or rather, President Lincoln, didn't. Lincoln later established a more satisfactory relationship with Ulysses S. Grant. He instructed Grant, you are not to decide, discuss or confer with anyone or ask political questions, such questions the President holds in his own hands, and will submit them to no military conferences or conventions. Grant wrote, so long as I hold my present position, I do not believe I have the right to criticize the policy or orders of those above me, or give utterance to views of my own, except to authorities in Washington. Three traditionally, American officers with conflicting loyalties have resigned their commissions. Billy Mitchell said, I became so fed up with the way things were being conducted that I thought I could do more outside the service than in it. MacArthur's attitude toward soldier-civilian rhubarbs was ambivalent. On the one hand, he frequently said that he did not believe that senior officers should be silenced for disagreeing with their superiors. On the other hand, he had testified in 1932 that strategic decisions in wartime should be made by the head of state acting in conformity with the expressed will of Congress adding that any transfer of this authority to generals or admirals would not constitute delegation, but rather abdication. Of course, in 1951 the issue was not that clear-cut. Congress had not declared war in Korea, and by the ninth month of the war it was obvious that its members were having grave second thoughts about Truman's decision to send troops and without consulting them. For probably MacArthur should have followed Mitchell's example early in 1951, voluntarily relinquishing his command and touring the country in Mufti, taking his cause to the people. But like Charles de Gaulle in 1940, he felt he could best state his case by remaining in uniform. 
the parallels between MacArthur and de Gaulle are fascinating, both were extreme egoists, both saw themselves as symbols of national destiny, and the Frenchman's apologia for his own insubordination might have been repeated by the American eleven years later, the man of character, in relation to his superiors, finds himself in a difficult position. Sure of his own judgment and conscious of his strength, he makes no concessions to the desire to please. More than that, those who do great things must often ignore the conventions of a false discipline. Thus in 1914 Lyotti kept Morocco despite orders from above, and after the Battle of Jutland, Lord Fisher bitterly commented on Jellicoe's dispatches, he has all Nelson's qualities, except one, he has not learned to disobey. 5. Significantly, de Gaulle was MacArthur's chief European defender in 1951. Continental critics, the Frenchman said, were castigating the man who was fighting their battles for them. He described the American general as a foreign military leader whose daring was feared by those who profited by it and suggested that instead they pay deserved tribute to the legendary service of a great soldier. But, as C. L. Salzburg pointed out, all the Allies detested MacArthur. Aixon wrote, what lost the confidence of our Allies were MacArthur's costly defeat. His open advocacy of widening the war at what they rightly considered as unacceptable risks, and the hesitance of the administration in asserting firm control over him. The general had no illusions about the European diplomatic community's opinion of him, but he believed that America's NATO partners needed the United States more than the United States needed them, that, in Sidney Elmire's words, it was highly unlikely that they would have repudiated the United States if MacArthur had bombed Manchuria to unify Korea. 6 de Gaulle said, bred on imperatives, the military temperament is astonished by the number of pretenses in which the statesman has to indulge. The terrible simplicities of war are in strong contrast to the devious methods demanded by the art of government. This accounts for much of the confusion between Washington and Tokyo that winter but in the United States both military and civilian leaders are bound by one absolute, their oath of allegiance, and it was here, given their differing interpretations of their pledge, that Truman and MacArthur collided. The president later wrote, if I allowed him to defy the civil authorities in this manner, I myself would be violating my oath to uphold and defend the constitution. The general later told the Senate committee, I find in existence a new and heretofore unknown and dangerous concept, that the members of our armed forces owe primary allegiance or loyalty to those who temporarily exercise the authority of the executive branch of the government rather than to the country and its constitution which they are sworn to defend. 7 His critics had little patience with this line of reasoning, inferring that he was presuming to decide which orders he would, and which he would not, obey. He himself stoutly maintained that he had violated no directives, that no more subordinate soldier ever wore the uniform. That was absurd. It would have been wiser to acknowledge his mutinous conduct and set forth his reasons for it. If Nuremberg taught the world any lesson, it is that the principle of superior orders the proposition that a subordinate must comply with all commands, however outrageous, is discreditable. The real issue was MacArthur's motives. He had several, all of them defensible, or at least arguable, including the one which infuriated the White House most. His political convictions. Briefly recalled to Washington in early 1951, Sebald found strong support in Congress for bombing Chinese supply lines and using Chiang's troops in Korea. There is no question that the administration's congressional critics, the Dafts, Wherries, and Nolands, represented a body of political opinion which was strongly held by millions of Americans. Isolationists until 1941, they still distrusted European alliances. They further believed that the domestic programs of Roosevelt and Truman were betrayals of American traditions, self-reliance, solvency, strong legislatures, and the least possible intrusion by government in the private lives of citizens. These congressional conservatives saw themselves as defenders of sacred customs, and since the military was the national institution most rooted in the folklore of the past, 
it was inevitable that MacArthur should have found common cause with them. Eight, doubtless the general's champions on Capitol Hill encouraged him to believe that he was untouchable. Even without them he might have been convinced of it. After all, in World War II the Joint Chiefs had given him more latitude than any other theater commander. They had deferred to him again in Korea, remaining submissive when, ignoring their instructions, he had sent GIs right up to the Yalu. He knew he had strong support, and not only on Capitol Hill, here and the draft boards were already threatening to refuse to call up more men until he had been given a free hand in the war. Chen Alt had publicly taken the position that the Chinese were peculiarly vulnerable to the process of blockade, and two the United States admirals had agreed with him. The general's belief that containment wouldn't work in Asia had been seconded by Walter Lippmann, who had written that in the Far East it was a strategic monstrosity. In Tokyo, MacArthur's staff shared his confidence in his political invincibility. Huff told Sebal that he hoped the general would be recalled to Washington for the purpose of clarifying some of the fuzzy thinking there. Sebal asked, do you think that the old man could stand the public criticism he would get if he pushed his ideas at home? Huff nodded, he said he felt sure that he could easily handle these problems in his stride. Sebal recalls that Huff had come to believe implicitly in the general's capacity to overcome any challenge. Nor. Sebald notes, was Huff alone, in SCAP headquarters there was little tendency to believe that MacArthur could be punished, let alone dismissed, for his actions. Instead, there were many who thought, or hoped, that Washington could be converted to MacArthur's view. These were military officers, for the most part, involved in what was certainly one of the most disheartening campaigns in American military history. When MacArthur protested the restrictions on his operations and demanded the chance to win a victory of arms, he spoke generally for most of the officers in his command. Nine and so, Aixen writes, MacArthur pressed his will and his luck to a shattering defeat. Like many another proconsul in history, he had been moving ever closer to a revolt against his superiors studying his orders, writes one of George Marshall's biographers, like a scholar deciphering a palimpsest and interpreting them according to his own established theories. Almost certainly he would have followed the same course even if he had known that he would be relieved. With his field commanders reporting 1300 casualties a week, he felt it his duty to try to change the United States policy. According to John Osborne, he told a luncheon guest at the embassy that as an old man of 71 he had nothing to fear or lose by risking removal from his command. Therefore, at some point in March, he decided to incite retaliation by challenging the president openly. Ten Britons Field Marshal Lord Alan Brooke, who admired what he called the general's grand seigneur manner, said afterward, the decisions MacArthur finally arrived at as regards the war in Korea were, I think based on a Pacific outlook and, as such, in my opinion were right. He has been accused of taking actions without previous political approval, but he had been unable to obtain the political policy and guidance he had sought. To my mind a general who is not prepared to assume some responsibility on his own, when unable to obtain political direction, is of little value. This general was now prepared to assume plenty. He began on March 7, when, returning from an inspection of the front lines, he called a press conference and predicted that unless he received major additions to his army, the battle lines in the end will reach a point of theoretical stalemate, which, because of the enemy's complete contempt for the sanctity of human life, would be followed by savage slaughter. To avert this, he urged decisions on the highest international level steps which he, as the military commander, could not take. 11 Washington ignored this violation of the president's gag rule, so eight days later MacArthur contacted Hugh Bailey of the United Press and denounced halting the Eighth Army short of accomplishment of our mission in the unification of Korea. Aixen fumed that the general had been told over and over again that this was no longer his mission, but the White House again remained silent. Truman was hoping to keep MacArthur in the Far East if at all possible determined not to be aroused by any move short of a flagrant provocation. 
The general, for his part, had reached the conclusion that Truman's nerves were at the breaking point, not only his nerves, but what was far more menacing in the chief executive of a country at war, his nerve. A week later, therefore, MacArthur perpetrated, in Nixon's words, a major act of sabotage of a government operation. Twelve both the State Department and the Pentagon thought the time propitious for proposing a truce to the Communists. With that in mind, a carefully worded statement was drawn up and sent to each of America's UN allies for approval on March 20. It dwelt on a restoration of the status quo and avoided any suggestion of threats or recriminations. Aggression against South Korea having been repelled, it said, every effort should be made to prevent the spread of hostilities and to avoid the prolongation of the misery and the loss of life. The UN was therefore prepared to enter into arrangements which would conclude the fighting and ensure against its resumption. Such arrangements would open the way for a broader settlement in Korea, including the withdrawal of foreign forces from Korea. The Joint Chiefs sent a copy of this document to the Daiki, explaining, state planning a presidential announcement shortly that with clearing of bulk of South Korea, there, feeling exists that further diplomatic efforts toward settlement should be made before any advance with major forces north of the 38th parallel. Time will be required to determine diplomatic reactions and permit new negotiations that may develop. MacArthur replied that with his present forces a new offensive was completely impracticable anyhow, he merely hoped that no further military restriction would be imposed upon his command. Then, four days later, he took an extraordinary step. He issued what he called a military appraisal. Actually it was an ultimatum to the enemy. Its tone was taunting. China, he declared obviously lacks the industrial capacity for the conduct of modern war. Its troops had displayed an inferiority of ground firepower. These military weaknesses, he continued, have been clearly and definitely revealed since Red China entered upon its undeclared war in Korea. Even under the inhibitions which now restrict the activity of the United Nations forces China had shown its complete inability to accomplish by force of arms the conquest of Korea. The enemy, therefore, must by now be painfully aware that a decision by the United Nations to depart from its tolerant effort to contain the war would doom Red China to the risk of imminent military collapse. Therefore he stood ready at any time to confer in the field with the commander-in-chief of the enemy forces in the earnest effort to find any military means whereby realization of the political objectives of the United Nations in Korea, to which no nation may justly take exception might be accomplished without further bloodshed. 13 This was a threat, an attempt to intimidate Peking on pain of sanctions which neither the United States nor any other member of the UN was prepared to apply. It mocked China's soldiers. It did more, it intimated that the enemy would be wiped out unless it submitted. Walter Lippmann wrote, Regimes do not negotiate about their survival. There is nothing to negotiate about. Radio Peking's reaction was what one might have expected. MacArthur, it said, had made a fanatical but shameless statement with the intention of engineering the Anglo-American aggressors to extend the war of aggression into China. MacArthur's shameless tricks will meet with failure. The people of China must raise their sense of vigilance by doubling their effort for a sacred struggle. Andrei Vyshinsky, speaking for the Kremlin, condemned the general as a maniac, the principal culprit, the evil genius of the war. 14 In torpedoing a diplomatic initiative of which he had been privately advised, the general clearly believed that, given the power to open a second front in China, he could win, reversing the recent course of history on the mainland. Because the communists feared he might be right they called him a warmonger, the London Economist observed the following month because most Europeans and many Americans feared he might be wrong, they called him dangerous and irresponsible. The Europeans distrusted his commitment to total victory and his dabbling in political issues which they felt were none of his business. The Observer reported some doubt in Whitehall over whether, given MacArthur's strong support on Capitol Hill, the White House could continue to resist demands for a wider war. Paris's Frank Tyra commented, 
an Asiatic war is too serious to be left in the hands of a military man whose years exacerbate his turbulence. A parade of NATO ambassadors called at the State Department to demand an explanation of what the Norwegian envoy called the general's pronunciamento. Fifteen state hurriedly issued an assurance that the UN field commander had exceeded his responsibilities and that diplomatic initiatives were still being handled by the United States government in consultation with its allies. In fact the president's ceasefire appeal was shelved. The general's message, in Truman's words, was so entirely at cross purposes with the one I was to have delivered that it would only have confused the world if my carefully prepared statement had been made. Ridgway said MacArthur had cut the ground from under the president, enraged our allies, and put the Chinese in the position of suffering a severe loss of face if they so much as accepted a bid to negotiate. Sixteen news of MacArthur's quit or else manifesto had first reached the capital on the evening of Friday, March 23, March 24 in Tokyo. At 11 p.m. a group of senior government officials gathered in the living room of Aix and Georgetown House. All agreed that MacArthur must go. Their host quoted Euripides, whom the gods destroy they first make mad. But when one of them suggested that they phone Truman at once, Aix and demurred, he suggested that they break up and sleep on it. Meanwhile the president had been reading and re-reading the text of the general's ultimatum which had been rushed to his second floor study from the White House newsroom. He was, he later recalled, deeply shocked. He had never underestimated my difficulties with MacArthur, but this was an act totally disregarding all directives to abstain from any declarations on foreign policy. A challenge to the authority of the president under the Constitution. It also flouted the policy of the United Nations. By this act MacArthur left me no choice. I could no longer tolerate his insubordination. Seventeen Truman remembered a story which Lincoln had told during his difficulties with McClellan, Lincoln said the situation reminded him of the man whose horse kicked up and stuck his foot in the stirrup. He said to the horse, if you are going to get on, I will get off. Afterward Truman said he decided during the next 48 hours to dismiss the general. That is doubtful. He had plenty to say about the supreme commander that weekend, much of it choice, but he never mentioned dismissal. In later years he probably preferred to think, or have it thought, that he had resolved the issue on the high ground of diplomacy, rather than in the political quagmire which lay dead ahead. That Saturday he did, however, lay the foundation for a possible court-martial. Conferring with Ixon, Rusk, and Robert Lovett at noon, he instructed the Joint Chiefs to dispatch a priority message to the Daiki from JCS personnel for MacArthur 24 Mar 51 The President had directed that your attention be called to his order as transmitted 6 December 1950. In view of the information given you 20 March 1951 any further statements by you must be coordinated as prescribed in the order of 6 December. The President has also directed that in the event communist military leaders request an armistice in the field, you will immediately report that fact to the JCS for instructions. Bradley 18 Later MacArthur, as determined to reshape the past as Truman, vehemently denied during testimony on Capitol Hill that he had acted improperly. In a colloquy with Senator Wayne Morse, the maverick Republican, he said, the notice I put out was merely that which every field commander at any time can put out, that he would confer with the opposing commander and chief in an endeavor to bring hostilities to an end. Asked whether he knew of the presidential proposal which was being circulated among America's allies, he replied, yes. I received such a message. It had nothing to do with my statement whatever, though. There is nothing unusual or unorthodox or improper that I can possibly read into the statement that I made on March 24. Years afterward he wrote that twice before, I had called upon the enemy commander to surrender as he had, though under vastly different circumstances and at Exxon's suggestion, and in neither instance had there been the slightest whisper of remonstrance from any source. Indeed, quite the contrary. Actually, less than four months later the Russian initiation of a proposal for a conference to arrange an armistice was avidly accepted. 
19 This would be a telling point were it not a fact that MacArthur hadn't merely asked for an armistice in place, he had demanded that the enemy commanders admit that they had been beaten. Willoughby's explanation, that the general had seen his offer as a smart stroke of psychological warfare and an effort to back up the peace campaign that was being waged in the United Nations is even less persuasive. His supporters denied that he was aware of the extent to which he had damaged that campaign. Clark Lee wrote, seen from the Washington viewpoint, MacArthur was clearly guilty of an improper act. Whether he himself realized this is at least debatable. Indeed, he apparently thought it an admirable act, though for dubious reasons. Upon receipt of word that Truman was seeking a ceasefire in place, Frazier Hunt writes, it was obvious to MacArthur that a big sellout was about to take place. It must have seemed to him that this was his last chance to help check a political move that might well be disastrous to both Korea and America. And MacArthur himself seemed to confirm this when he told the American Legion the following October 17 that he had uncovered one of the most disgraceful plots in the United States history. 20 If the president's help to end the fighting by suggesting that both armies lay down their arms was a plot, then the general had certainly wrecked it. Goaded by his contempt for them, the Chinese swore they would fight to the end. But they could not remove the UN commander from the battlefield. Truman, who could, had to face the fact that his supreme commander had dealt his armistice hopes a stunning blow. Whether or not he then made up his mind that the general must be relieved, George Marshall appears to have made up his. Marshall later told the Senate committee why, it created a very serious situation with our allies, along the line of their uncertainty as to just how we were proceeding, the president bringing something to their attention engaging their action to find agreement with him, and before that can be accomplished, the leader in the field comes forward with a proposition that terminates that endeavor of the chief executive to handle the matter. It created, I think specifically, a loss of confidence in the leadership of the government. Afterward Truman echoed this, once again, General MacArthur had openly defied the policy of his commander-in-chief, the President of the United States. 21 His defiance did not end there. All that month's gap had been setting little time bombs ticking to let it be known that he would continue his fight in the court of public opinion, striving to forestall a UN settlement short of triumph on the Yalu. His efforts now seem to have been barren of hope, but that is because there is a law of inertia in history, whatever happened usually seems to have been inevitable. The later division of Korea, the consequence of the armistice talks at Panmunjom, now seems to have been the only possible outcome of the war for the peninsula. It wasn't. Spanier writes that it was by no means certain that he had been wrong in believing that Korea was the free world's test whether it could deter future aggression by punishing the aggressor now, and in October 1962 the British Intelligence Digest concluded, had the Korean War been taken to a decision there can be no reasonable doubt that their enemy would have collapsed. The general was sure of it. His conviction was so strong that he was laying his career on the line in interviews and letters which amounted to a one-man revolt, as arrogant in its way as the gauntlet he had flung down to Peking. Later he would insist that he hadn't the faintest idea of why he was relieved, but this is surely untrue. What he probably meant was that he could not grasp why a country's leaders would cashier its greatest general for waging water wind. 22 On Thursday, April 5, the day upon which Bradley would conclude that scap must be fired, three MacArthur bombshells exploded in the world press. The Freeman, a conservative periodical, had noted that many unarmed South Koreans were eager to fight with UN troops and had asked the general why they were being denied guns. He replied that the explanation was to be found in basic political decisions beyond my authority. In fact he himself had vetoed arming more ox on January 6, preferring to issue weapons to Japanese police recruits, that morning the London Daily Telegraph published a Hong Kong dispatch which reported that a recent British visitor to the Daiki had been told by MacArthur that United Nations forces were circumscribed by a web of artificial conditions in a war without a definite objective. It was not the soldier who had encroached upon the realm of the political, but the other way around.
The true object of a commander in war was to destroy the forces opposed to him. But this was not the case in Korea. The situation would be ludicrous if men's lives were not involved. 23 These lapses, sufficient in themselves to justify strong action in Washington, paled beside a thunderbolt unleashed shortly before noon by Joe Martin in the House of Representatives. On February 12 Martin had delivered an inflammatory speech in New York, charging that the president was preventing 800,000, sick, trained men on Formosa from opening a second front in Asia, declaring that there was good reason to believe that MacArthur and people in the Pentagon favored this as the cheapest operation which could be mounted in the Far East, and ending, if we are not in Korea to win then this Truman administration should be indicted for the murder of thousands of American boys. On March 8 the congressman had sent MacArthur a copy of his remarks, accompanied by a note inviting comment on a confidential basis or otherwise. 24 The general's answer, in which he omitted any reference to confidentiality, was dated March 20, the day he learned that Truman was prepared to settle for a deadlock in Korea. Defending his reply to Martin, he later said that he had always felt duty bound to reply frankly to every congressional inquiry into matters connected with my official responsibility, and that this one was merely a routine communication, such as I turn out by the hundreds. When its contents were divulged, he told Sabal that he didn't even remember writing it, that he had to search his files to refresh his memory. This is unbelievable. There was only one minority leader in the House. Even in those days of political passion, it was not every day that one of the most powerful leaders of the Grand Old Party publicly accused the President of homicide. And it is inconceivable that MacArthur could have forgotten his ringing endorsement of Martin's charges. Thanking him for the copy of his address, he began, the latter I have read with much interest and find that with the passage of years you have certainly lost none of your old-timed punch. He then commented that the minority leader's views on the utilization of Chinese nationalists were in conflict neither with logic nor the tradition of invariably meeting force with maximum counterforce. Then, in what Truman later called the real clincher, he continued, it seems strangely difficult for some to realize that here in Asia is where the communist conspirators have elected to make their play for global conquest, and that we have joined the issue thus raised on the battlefield, that here we fight Europe's war with arms while the diplomats thus still fight it with words, that if we lose the war to communism in Asia the fall of Europe is inevitable, win it and Europe most probably would avoid war and yet preserve freedom. As you point out, we must win. There is no substitute for victory. 25 When word reached the Pentagon that Martin had taken the floor to read this into the record, explaining that he felt he owed it to the American people to tell them the information I had from a great and reliable source, George Marshall called it the most recent of an accumulation of outrages which had brought to a head the question of MacArthur's continuing to serve as commander in the Far East. The rest of the non-communist world felt that a resolution of the issue was long overdue. The general's letter was front-page news on every continent. The Times of London called it the most dangerous of an apparently unending series of indiscretions, the observer reported that the British government had taken the strongest possible exception to the general's letter, which it described as foreshadowing an extension of the war to the mainland of Asia. Another British newspaper described Scap's position as calculated to spread the war. Attlee's Foreign Secretary, Herbert Morrison, formally objected to any use of Chiang's troops. The Quai d'Orsay followed Whitehall, and once more a cavalcade of black limousines drew up in foggy bottom to discharge indignant allied envoys. The Grand Coalition forged at Lake's success the previous summer appeared to be in imminent danger of dissolution. 26 In Congress, the reaction followed partisan lines. Oklahoma's Robert Kerr said of MacArthur, I think the prolonged performance of his one man act is wearing the patience of the rest of the team mighty thin, and Morse remarked that the United States had two foreign policies, that of General MacArthur and that of the President. On the other side, Taft observed, it is ridiculous not to let Chiang Kai-shek's troops loose. It is utterly indefensible and perfectly idiotic. 
Homer Ferguson proposed that a congressional committee fly to Tokyo and ask the general how the war should be conducted. The comments from Ferguson and Taft, as much as anything, decided Truman. To the chief executive, Clark Lee writes, the exploitation of MacArthur's letter by the Republican leadership was too much to take. In addition, Truman doubtless felt, and with reason, that the office of the presidency was at stake. He was prepared to defend it. Most of the officials in Washington, like all of those in Tokyo, felt that the general was irrepressible. A Washington Post headline read, MacArthur recall ruled out by President, Hill hears, reprimand is still seen possible, but when the president notified Aikson that he wanted to confer with him and several others before next morning's cabinet meeting, I was, Aikson writes, in little doubt what the subject of our discussion would be. Douglas MacArthur had done what, given his character and his convictions, he had to do. It was Harry Truman's turn to do what he must do. 27 Thursday afternoon Bradley had also been alerted to attend the Friday morning meeting, he cannot remember by whom, and he briefly convened the Joint Chiefs, warning them that they had better begin weighing the military aspects of MacArthur's action. All of them promptly left town, pleading previous commitments. But there would be no refuge that week for any of the administration South Korea policy makers. It was showdown time. Four men attended the President's Friday kickoff conference, Harriman, Bradley, Marshall, and Aikson. The first two recommended instant dismissal of the general. Harriman thought it should have been done in 1949, when MacArthur had been reluctant to withhold approval for a bill. Contrary to the United States economic policy, which had been submitted to the Japanese Diet, Bradley doubted that the general had been intentionally insubordinate, then or now, but he said that, had he been MacArthur, and had his advice been similarly rejected, he would have turned in his uniform. At all events, he pointed out, the president had the right to fire any officer at any time he sees fit, 